Hi guys, my name is Arya and I'm going to be your instructor for this course today. So in this ethical hacking full course video, we'll be learning almost everything that is required for you to get started as an ethical hacker. So come, let's quickly go over the topics that we are going to be covering today. Firstly, we're going to be going through the basics of cybersecurity and cryptography, where we'll be learning the key concepts of confidentiality, integrity and availability, and how the cryptographic concepts also tie into the whole picture. Next, we'll be looking at some cyber threats. We'll be seeing how these cyber threats actually affect our computer and then we'll also see how we can mitigate them. After which, we'll be looking into the history of ethical hacking. We'll learn how this all began in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and then we'll be looking into the fundamentals of networking and ethical hacking. In this, we'll be learning the various tools that are used in ethical hacking and also the network architectures that these tools are used in. After this, we'll be having a look into one of the most famous operating systems that is there, that is Kali Linux. Kali Linux is used by ethical hackers and penetration testers all around the world. We'll be learning how to install this on our local systems. We'll be learning the tools that come along with it and where we should be using them. After that, we'll be learning about penetration testing. And penetration testing is a subset of ethical hacking. So in this, we'll be learning about a tool called Metasploit and using Metasploit, we'll be learning more about vulnerability analysis and how we can install backdoors in different computer systems and take advantages of these vulnerabilities. Now, NMAP is also another tool that we are going to be discussing in this course. We'll be learning how we can use NMAP to gather information from our networks and how we can use this information to our advantage. After that, we'll be learning deeply about three cyber attacks that are there in this industry. First is cross-site scripting, secondly, distributed denial of service, and thirdly, SQL injection attacks. Now, we'll be doing these attacks ourselves on dummy targets and learning more about these attacks and how they're orchestrated. And thus, we'll be learning more about how we can mitigate them if we actually become ethical hackers. Now, we'll also be discussing some very advanced cryptographic methods called steganography, which is basically used for hiding digital code inside images. Last but not the least, we'll be also discussing how you could become an ethical hacker yourself. So we'll be discussing a roadmap, we'll also be discussing the job profiles that are there in the industry, and we'll also be discussing the companies that are hiring for these job profiles along with the salaries that they are trying to offer. Also, we won't be leaving hanging right there, we'll also be discussing the 50 most common interview questions that come along with these job profiles so that you can snag that job interview. And if you do like our content in the end, please leave us a like. Please leave a comment if you want to and do hit the subscribe button so that you can join our ever-growing community of learners. It can be rightfully said that today's generation lives on the internet and we general users are almost ignorant as to how those random bits of ones and zeros reach securely to our computer. It's not magic, it's work and sweat that makes sure that your packets reach to you unsniffed. Today, I, Arya Paul from Edureka, I'm here to tell you guys about how cybersecurity makes this all possible. Now, before we begin, let me brief you all about the topics that we're going to cover today. So basically, we're going to ask three questions that are important to cybersecurity. Firstly, we're going to see why cybersecurity is needed. Next, we're going to see what exactly is cybersecurity. And in the end, I'm going to show you all through a scenario how cybersecurity can save a whole organization from organized cybercrime. OK, so let's get started. Now, as I just said, we are living in a digital era. Whether it be booking a hotel room, ordering some dinner, or even booking a cab, we're constantly using the internet and inherently constantly generating data. This data is generally stored on the cloud, which is basically a huge data server or data center that you can access online. Also, we use an array of devices to access this data. Now, for a hacker, it's a golden age. With so many access points, public IP addresses, and constant traffic and tons of data to exploit, Black Hat hackers are having one hell of a time exploiting vulnerabilities and creating malicious software for the same. Above that, cyber attacks are evolving by the day. Hackers are becoming smarter and more creative with their malwares and how they bypass virus scans and firewalls still baffle many people. Let's go through some of the most common types of cyber attacks now. So as you guys can see, I've listed out eight cyber attacks that have plagued us since the beginning of the internet. Let's go through them briefly. So first on the list, we have general malwares. Malware is an all-encompassing term for a variety of cyber threats, including trojans, viruses, and bombs. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on the computer. Next on the list, we have phishing. Often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party, 
Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years, making it difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for information from a false one. Phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are more harmful than just a simple ad. Next on the list, we have password attacks. A password attack is exactly what it sounds like, a third party trying to gain access to your system by cracking a user's password. Next up is DDoS, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service. A DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service of a network. Attackers send high volumes of data or traffic through the network that is making a lot of connection requests until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. Next up, we have man-in-the-middle attacks. By impersonating the endpoint in an online information exchange, that is the connection from your smartphone to a website, the MITM attacks can obtain information from the end users and entity he or she is communicating with. For example, if you're banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. The man in the middle would then receive all the information transferred between both parties, which could include sensitive data, such as bank accounts and personal information. Next up, we have drive-by downloads. Through malware on a legitimate website, a program is downloaded to a user's system just by visiting the site. It doesn't require any type of action by the user to download it, actually. Next up, we have mal advertising, which is a way to compromise your computer with malicious code that is downloaded to your system when you click on an affected ad. Lastly, we have rogue softwares, which are basically malwares that are masquerading as legitimate and necessary security software that will keep your system safe. So as you guys can see now, the internet sure isn't a safe place as we might think it is. This not only applies for us as individuals, but also large organizations. There have been multiple cyber breaches in the past that has compromised the privacy and confidentiality of our data. If we head over to the site called Information is Beautiful, we can see all the major cyber breaches that have been committed. So as you guys can see, even big companies like eBay, AOL, Evernote, Adobe, have actually gone through major cyber breaches, even though they have a lot of security measures taken to protect the data that they contain. So it's not only that small individuals are targeted by hackers and other people, but even bigger organizations are constantly being targeted by these guys. So after looking at all sorts of cyber attacks possible, the breaches of the past, and the sheer amount of data available, we must be thinking that there must be some sort of mechanism and protocol to actually protect us from all these sorts of cyber attacks. And indeed, there is a way, and this is called cybersecurity. In a computing context, security comprises of cybersecurity and physical security. Both are used by enterprises to protect against unauthorized access to data centers and other computerized systems. Information security, which is designed to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, is a subset of cybersecurity. The use of cybersecurity can help prevent against cyber attacks, data breaches, identity theft, and can aid in risk management. So when an organization has a strong sense of network security and an effective incident response plan, it is better able to prevent and mitigate these attacks. For example, end user protection defends information and guards against loss of theft while also scanning computers for malicious code. Now when talking about cybersecurity, there are three main activities that we are trying to protect ourselves against, and they are unauthorized modification, unauthorized deletion, and unauthorized access. These three terms are very synonymous to the very commonly known CIA triad, which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The CIA triad is also commonly referred to as the three pillars of security, and most security policies of bigger organizations and even smaller companies are based on these three principles. So let's go through them one by one. So first on the list, we have confidentiality. Confidentiality is roughly equivalent to privacy. Measures undertaken to ensure confidentiality are designed to prevent sensitive information from reaching the wrong people while making sure that the right people can in fact get it. Access must be restricted to those authorized to view the data in question. It is common as well for data to be categorized according to the amount and type of damage that could be done should it fall into unintended hands. More or less, stringent measures can then be implemented across to those categories. Sometimes safeguarding data confidentiality may involve special training for those privy to such documents. Such training would typically include security risks that could threaten this information. Training can help familiarize authorized people with risk factors and how to guard against them. 
Further aspects of training can include strong password and password-related best practices and information about social engineering methods to prevent them from bending data handling rules with good intention and potentially disastrous results. Next on the list, we have integrity. Integrity involves maintaining the consistency, accuracy, and trustworthiness of data over its entire life cycle. Data must not be changed in transit, and steps must be taken to ensure that data cannot be altered by unauthorized people, for example, in a breach of confidentiality. These measures include file permissions and user access controls. Version control may be used to prevent erroneous changes or accidental deletion by authorized users becoming a problem. In addition, some means must be in place to detect any changes in data that might occur as a result of non-human caused events, such as electromagnetic pulses or server crash. Some data might include checksums, even cryptographic checksums for verification of integrity. Backup or redundancies must be available to restore the affected data to its correct state. Last but not least is availability. Availability is best ensured by rigorous maintaining of all hardware, performing hardware repairs immediately when needed, and maintaining a correctly functional operating system environment that is free of software conflicts. It's also important to keep current with all necessary system upgrades. Providing adequate communication bandwidth and preventing the occurrences of bottlenecks are equally important. Redundancy, failover, and even high availability clusters can mitigate serious consequences when hardware issues do occur. Fast and adaptive disaster recovery is essential for the worst case scenarios. That capacity is reliant on the existence of a comprehensive disaster recovery plan. Safeguards against data loss or interruption in connection must include unpredictable events such as natural disasters and fire. To prevent data loss from such occurrences, a backup copy must be stored in a geographically isolated location, perhaps even in a fireproof water safe place. Extra security equipments or software such as firewalls and proxy servers can guard us against downtimes and unreachable data due to malicious actions such as denial of service attacks and network intrusions. So now that we have seen what we are actually trying to implement when trying to protect ourselves on the internet, we should also know the ways that we actually protect ourselves when we are attacked by cyber organizations. So the first step to actually mitigate any type of cyber attack is to identify the malware or the cyber threat that is being currently going on in your organization. Next, we have to actually analyze and evaluate all the affected parties and the file systems that have been compromised. And in the end, we have to patch the whole treatment so that our organization can come back to its original running state without any cyber breaches. So how is it exactly done? This is mostly done by actually calculating three factors. The first factor is vulnerability. The second factor is threat. And the third is risk. So let me tell you about the three of them a little bit. So first on the list of actual calculations, we have vulnerability. So a vulnerability refers to a known weakness of an asset that can be exploited by one or more attackers. In other words, it is a known issue that allows an attack to be successful. For example, when a team member resigns and you forget to disable their access to external accounts, change logins, or remove their names from the company credit cards, this leaves your business open to both unintentional and intentional threats. However, most vulnerabilities are exploited by automated attackers and not a human typing on the other side of the network. Next, testing for vulnerabilities is critical to ensuring the continued security of your systems by identifying weak points and developing a strategy to respond quickly. Here are some questions that you ask when determining your security vulnerabilities. So you have questions like, is your data backed up and stored in a secure offsite location? Is your data stored in the cloud? If yes, how exactly is it being protected from cloud vulnerabilities? What kind of security do you have to determine who can access, modify, or delete information from within your organization? Next, like you could ask questions like, what kind of antivirus protection is in use? What are the license currents? Are the license current? And is it running as often as needed? Also, do you have a data recovery plan in the event of vulnerability being exploited? So these are the normal questions that one asks when actually checking their vulnerability. Next up is threat. A threat refers to a new or newly discovered incident with potential to do harm to a system or your overall organization. There are three main types of threat. Natural threats, like floods or tornadoes, unintentional threats, such as employee mistakenly accessing the wrong information, and intentional threats. There are many examples of intentional threats, including spyware, malware, adware companies, or the actions of disgruntled employees. 
In addition, worms and viruses are categorized as threats because they could potentially cause harm to your organization through exposure to an automated attack, as opposed to one perpetrated by human beings. Although these threats are generally outside of one's control and difficult to identify in advance, it is essential to take appropriate measures to assess threats regularly. Here are some ways to do so. Ensure that your team members are staying informed of current trends in cybersecurity so they can quickly identify new threats. They should subscribe to blogs like Wired and podcasts like the TechGenix Extreme IT that covers these issues as well as join professional associations so they can benefit from breaking news feeds, conferences, and webinars. You should also perform regular threat assessment to determine the best approaches to protecting a system against a specific threat along with assessing different types of threat. In addition, penetration testing involves modeling real-world threats in order to discover vulnerabilities. Next on the list, we have risk. So risk refers to the potential for loss or damage when a threat exploits a vulnerability. Examples of risks include financial losses as a result of business disruption, loss of privacy, reputational damage, legal implications, and can even include loss of life. Risk can also be defined as follows, which is basically threat multiplied by the vulnerability. You can reduce the potential for risk by creating and implementing a risk management plan. And here are the key aspects to consider when developing your risk management strategy. Firstly, we need to assess risk and determine needs. When it comes to designing and implementing a risk assessment framework, it is critical to prioritize the most important breaches that need to be addressed. Although frequency may differ in each organization, this level of assessment must be done on a regular, recurring basis. Next, we also have to include a total stakeholder perspective. Stakeholders include the business owners as well as employees, customers, and even vendors. All of these players have the potential to negatively impact the organization, but at the same time, they can be assets in helping to mitigate risk. So as we see, risk management is the key to cybersecurity. So now let's go through a scenario to actually understand how cybersecurity actually defends an organization against very manipulative cybercrime. So cybercrime, as we all know, is a global problem that's been dominating the news cycle. It poses a threat to individual security and an even bigger threat to large international companies, banks, and governments. Today's organized cybercrime far outshadows lone hackers of the past, and now large organized crime rings function like startups and often employ highly trained developers who are constantly innovating new online attacks. Most companies have preventative security softwares to stop these types of attacks, but no matter how secure we are, cybercrime is going to happen. So meet Bob. He's the chief security officer for a company that makes a mobile app to help customers track and manage their finances. So security is a top priority. So Bob's company has an activity response platform in place that automates the entire cybersecurity process. The ARP software integrates all the security and IT software needed to keep a large company like Bob's secured into a single dashboard and acts as a hub for the people processes and technology needed to respond to and contain cyber attacks. Let's see how this platform works in the case of a security breach. While Bob is out on a business trip, irregular activity occurs on his account as a user behavior analytics engine that monitors account activity, recognizes suspicious behavior involving late night logins and unusual amounts of data being downloaded. This piece of software is the first signal that something is wrong. An alert is sent to the next piece of software in the chain which is the security information and event management system. Now, the ARP can orchestrate a chain of events that ultimately prevents the company from encountering a serious security disaster. The ARP connects to a user directory software that Bob's company uses, which immediately recognizes the user accounts belong to an executive who is out on a business trip and then proceeds to lock his account. The ARP sends the incident IP address to a threat intelligence software which identifies the address as a suspected malware server. As each piece of security software runs, the findings are recorded in the ARP's incident, which is already busy creating a set of instructions called a playbook for a security analyst to follow. The analyst then locks Bob's accounts and changes his passwords. This time, the software has determined the attempted attack came from a well-known cybercrime organization using stolen credentials. Bob's credentials were stolen when the hacker found a vulnerability in his company's firewall software and used it to upload a malware infected file. Now that we know how the attack happened, the analyst uses the ARP and identifies and patches all the things. The ARP uses information from endpoint tool to determine which machines need to be patched, recommends how to patch them, 
and then allows the analyst to push the patches to all the computers and mobile devices instantly. Meanwhile, Bob has to alert the legal departments of the breach and the ARP instantly notifies the correct person of the situation and the status of the incident after the attack is contained and Bob's account is secured. The analyst then communicates which data may have been stolen or compromised during the incident. He identifies which geographies, jurisdictions and regulatory agencies cover the users and information affected by the attack. Then the ARP creates a series of tasks so the organization can notify the affected parties and follow all relevant compliances and liability procedures. In the past, a security breach this large would have required Bob's company to involve several agencies and third parties to solve the problem, a process that could have taken months or longer. But in a matter of hours, the incident response platform organized all of the people processes and technology to identify and contain the problem, find the source of the attack, fix the vulnerability and notify all affected parties. And in the future, Bob and his team will be able to turn to cognitive security tools. These tools will read and learn from tens of thousands of trusted publication blogs and other sources of information. This knowledge will uncover new insights and patterns, anticipate and isolate and minimize attacks as they happen and immediately recommend actions for security professionals to take, keeping data safe and companies like Bob's out of the headlines. Cryptography is essentially important because it allows you to securely protect data that you don't want anyone else to have access to. It is used to protect corporate secrets, secure classified information, and to protect personal information to guard against things like identity theft. And today's video is basically going to be about cryptography. Now, before we actually jump into the session, let me give you guys a brief on the topics that we're going to cover today. So first of all, we're going to cover what is cryptography through the help of a very simplistic scenario. Then we are going to go through the classifications of cryptography and how the different classificative algorithm works. In the end, I'm going to show you guys a nifty demo on how a popular algorithm called RSA actually works. So let's get started. Now I'm going to take the help of an example or a scenario to actually explain what is cryptography. All right. So let's say we have a person and let's call him Andy. Now suppose Andy sends a message to his friend Sam, who is on the other side of the world. Now, obviously, he wants this message to be private and nobody else should have access to the message. Now he uses a public forum, for example, the internet for sending this message. The goal is to actually secure this communication. And of course, we have to be secure against someone. Now let's say there is a smart guy called Eve who has secretly got access to your communication channel. Since this guy has access to your communication, he can do much more than just eavesdrop. For example, he can try to change the message in itself. Now this is just a small example. What if Eve actually gets access to your private information? Well, that could actually result in a big catastrophe. So how can Andy be sure that nobody in the middle could access the message sent to Sam? The goal here is to make communication secure and that's where cryptography comes in. So what exactly is cryptography? Well, cryptography is the practice and the study of techniques for securing communication and data in the presence of adversaries. So let me take a moment to explain how that actually happens. Well, first of all, we have a message. This message is firstly converted into a numeric form and then this numeric form is applied with a key called an encryption key and this encryption key is used in an encryption algorithm. So once the numeric message and the encryption key has been applied in an encryption algorithm, what we get is called a ciphertext. Now this ciphertext is sent over the network to the other side of the world where the other person who the message is intended for will actually use a decryption key and use the ciphertext as a parameter of a decryption algorithm and then he'll get what we actually sent as a message and if some error had actually occurred he'd get an error. So let's see how cryptography can help secure the connection between Andy and Sam. So to protect his message Andy first converts his readable message to an unreadable form. Here he converts the message to some random numbers and after that he uses a key to encrypt his message. After applying this key to the numerical form of his message, he gets a new value. In cryptography, we call this ciphertext. So now if Andy sends the ciphertext or encrypted message over communication channel, he won't have to worry about somebody in the middle of discovering the private message. Even if somebody manages to discover the message, he won't be able to decrypt the message without having a proper key to unlock this message. So suppose Eve here discovers the message and he somehow manages to tamper with the message and message finally reaches Sam. 
Sam would need a key to decrypt the message to recover the original plain text. So using the key, he would convert a ciphertext to numerical value corresponding to the plain text. Now after using the key for decryption, what will come out is the original plain text message or an error. Now this error is very important. It is the way Sam knows that message sent by Andy is not the same as the message that he received. So the error in a sense tells us that Eve has tampered with the message. Now the important thing to note here is that in modern cryptography, the security of the system purely relies on keeping the encryption and decryption key secret. Based on the type of keys and encryption algorithms, cryptography is classified under the following categories. Now cryptography is broadly classified under two categories, namely symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography, popularly also known as public key cryptography. Now symmetric key cryptography is further classified as classical cryptography and modern cryptography. Further drilling down, classical cryptography is divided into two, which is transposition cipher and substitution cipher. On the other hand, modern cryptography is divided into stream cipher and block cipher. In the upcoming slides, I'll broadly explain all these types of cryptography. So let's start with symmetric key cryptography first. So symmetric key algorithms are algorithms for cryptography that use the same cryptographic keys for both encryption of plain text and decryption of ciphertext. The keys may be identical or there may be some simple transformation to go between the two keys. The keys in practice represent a shared secret between two or more parties that can be used to maintain a private information link. This requirement that both parties have access to the secret key is one of the main drawbacks of symmetric key encryption in comparison to public key encryption, also known as asymmetric key encryption. Now symmetric key cryptography is sometimes also called secret key cryptography and the most popular symmetric key system is the data encryption standards, which also stands for DES. Next up, we're going to discuss transposition cipher. So in cryptography, a transposition cipher is a method of encryption by which the positions held by units of plain text, which are commonly characters or groups of characters, are shifted according to a regular system so that the ciphertext constitutes a permutation of the plain text. That is, the order of units is changed, the plain text is reordered. Now, mathematically speaking, a bijective function is used on the character's position to encrypt and an inverse function to decrypt. So as you can see that there is an example on the slide. So on the plain text side, we have a message which says meet me after the party. Now this has been carefully arranged in the encryption matrix, which has been divided into six rows and the columns. So next we have a key, which is basically 421635. And then we rearrange by looking at the plain text matrix and then we get the cipher text, which basically is some unreadable gibberish at this moment. So that's how this whole algorithm works. On the other hand, when the cipher text is being converted into the plain text, the plain text matrix is going to be referred and it can be done very easily. Moving on, we are going to discuss substitution cipher. So substitution of single letters separately, simple substitution can be demonstrated by writing out the alphabets in some order to represent the substitution. This is termed a substitution alphabet. The cipher alphabet may be shifted or reversed, creating the Caesar and Abstash cipher respectively, or scrambled in a more complex fashion, in which case it is called a mixed alphabet or deranged alphabet. Traditionally, mixed alphabets may be created by first writing out keyword, removing repeated letters in it, then writing all the remaining letters in the alphabet in the usual order. Now consider this example shown on the slide. Using the system we just discussed, the keyword zebras gives us the following alphabets from the plain text alphabet, which is A to Z. So the ciphertext alphabet is basically zebras, then followed by all the alphabets we have missed out in the zebra word. So as you guys can see, it's zebras followed by S, C, D, F, G, H, and so on. Now suppose we were to actually encrypt a message using this code. So as you guys can see on the screen, I've shown you an example, which is a message, flee at once we are discovered, is being actually encrypted using this code. So if you guys can see out here, the F letter actually corresponds to S and then the L letter actually corresponds to I out here. Then we actually get the cipher text, which is S I A A Z Q using the code and the process that I just discussed. Now, traditionally, the cipher text is written out in blocks of fixed length, omitting punctuations and spaces. This is done to help avoid transmission errors to disguise the word boundaries from the plain text. Now these blocks are called groups and sometimes a group count that is the number of groups is given as an additional check. 
Now, five letter groups are traditional. As you guys can see that we have also divided our ciphertext into groups of five. And this dates back to when messages were actually used to be transmitted by telegraph. Now, if the length of the message happens not to be divisible by five, it may be padded at the end with nulls. And these can be any characters that can be decrypted to obvious nonsense. So the receiver can easily spot them and discard them. Next on our list is stream cipher. So a stream cipher is a method of encrypting text to produce ciphertext in which a cryptographic key and algorithm are applied to each binary digit in a data stream one bit at a time. This method is not much used in modern cryptography. The main alternative method is block cipher in which a key and algorithm are applied to block of data rather than individual bits in a stream. Okay, so now that we've spoken about block cipher, let's go and actually explain what block cipher does. A block cipher is an encryption method that applies a deterministic algorithm to the symmetric key to encrypt a block of text rather than encrypting one bit at a time as in stream ciphers. For example, a common block cipher AES encrypts 128 bit blocks with a key of predetermined length that is either 128, 192 or 256 bits in length. Now block ciphers are pseudo random permutation families that operate on the fixed size of block of bits. These PRPs are functions that cannot be differentiated from completely random permutation and thus are considered reliable until proven to be unreliable by some source. Okay, so now it's time that we discuss some asymmetric cryptography. So asymmetric cryptography also known as public key cryptography is any cryptographic system that uses pair of keys, which is a public key which may be disseminated widely and private keys which are known only to the owner. This accomplishes two functions authentication where the public key verifies that a holder of the paired private key sent the message and encryption where only the paired private key holder can decrypt the message encrypted with the public key. In a public key encryption system, any person can encrypt a message using the receiver's public key. That encrypted message can only be decrypted with the receiver's private key. So to be practical, the generation of public and private key pair must be computationally economical. The strength of a public key cryptographic system relies on computational efforts required to find the private key from its paired public key. So effective security only requires keeping the private key private and the public key can be openly distributed without compromising security. Okay, so now that I've actually shown you guys how cryptography actually works and how the different classifications are actually applied, let's go and do something interesting. So you guys are actually watching this video on YouTube right now. So if you guys actually go and click on the secure part besides the URL, you can actually go and view the digital certificates that are actually used out here. So click on certificates and you'll see the details in the details tab. Now, as you guys can see, the signature algorithm that is used for actually securing YouTube is being SHA-256 with RSA. And RSA is a very, very common encryption algorithm that is used throughout the internet. Then the signature hash algorithm that is being used is SHA-256. And the issuer is Google and Internet Authority. And you can get a lot of information about sites and all their authority key identifiers, their certificate policies, the key usage, and a lot of thing about security just from this small little button out here. Also, let me show you a little how public key encryption actually works. So on the site, which is basically cobwebs.cs.uga.edu, you can actually demo out public key encryption. So suppose we had to send a message. First, we would need to generate keys. So as you can see, I just click generate keys and it got me two keys, which is one is the public key, which I will distribute throughout the network and one the private key, which I will actually keep secret to myself. Now I want to send a message saying hi there. When is the exam tomorrow? So now we are going to encrypt it using the public key because that's exactly what's distributed. So now, as you can see, we have got our ciphertext. So this huge thing right out here is ciphertext and it absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. Now, suppose we were to actually then decrypt the message. We would use the private key that goes along with our account and we would decode the message. And as you guys can see, voila, we have hi there, when is the exam tomorrow? So we have actually sent a message on the internet in a very secure fashion. Above that, there's also RSA that needs some explaining because I had promised that too. Now RSA is a very, very commonly used algorithm that is used throughout the internet and you just saw it being used by YouTube. So it has to be common. So RSA has a very unique way of applying this algorithm 
there are many actual parameters that you actually need to study. Okay, so now we're actually going to discuss RSA, which is a very popular algorithm that is used throughout the internet. And you also saw that it's being used by YouTube right now. So this crypto system is one of the initial system. It remains the most employed crypto system even today. And the system was invented by three scholars, which is Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Len Adelman. Hence the name RSA. And we will see the two aspects of the RSA crypto system. Firstly, generation of key pair, and secondly, encryption decryption algorithms. So each person or a party who desires to participate in communication using encryption needs to generate a pair of keys, namely public key and private key. So the process followed in the generation of keys is as follows. First, we have to actually calculate N. Now N is actually given by multiplying P and Q, as you guys can see out here. So P and Q are supposed to be very large prime numbers. So out here P will be 35, but for some very strong encryption, we are gonna choose very large prime numbers. Then we actually have to calculate phi. Now phi, as you can see, the formula goes is P minus one into Q minus one. And this helps us determine for the encryption algorithm. Now, then we have to actually calculate E. Now E must be greater than one and less than phi, which is P minus one into Q minus one. And there must be no common factors for E and phi except for one. So in other words, they must be co-prime to each other. Now to form the public key, the pair of numbers N and E form the RSA public key system. This is actually made public and is distributed throughout the network. Interestingly though, N is a part of the public key and the difficulty in factorizing a large prime number ensures that the attacker cannot find in finite time the two primes that is P and Q that is used to obtain N. This actually ensures the strength of RSA. Now in the generation of the private key, the private key D is calculated from P, Q, and E. For given N and E, there is a unique number D. Now the number D is the inverse of E modulo phi. This means that D is a number less than phi such that when multiplied by E, it gives one. So let's go and actually fill up these numbers. So N should be 35 out here. And if we generate them, we get the value of phi, which is 24, which is basically four into six. And then we should also get E. So now E should be co-prime, so we are gonna give it 11, as 11 is co-prime to both. So now for the actual encryption part, we have to put in E and N out here. So E out here for us is 11 and N is 35. And then we are gonna pick a letter to actually cipher, which is A. And then we are gonna encode it as a number. So as you guys can see, we've encoded it as one. And out here, now after we've given the message its numerical form, we click on encryption and we get it. Now to actually decrypt the message, we are gonna need D and N. Now D for us was five and N was 35. So five and 35. And then we're gonna take encrypted message from above and we're gonna decrypt this message. So after you decrypt it, we have the numerical form of the plain text and to then decode the message, just click here, decode message. And as you guys can see, we have decoded a message using RSA. So guys, that's how RSA works. I explained all the factors that we actually use in RSA from N to five to E to D. And I hope you understood a part of it. If y'all are still more interested, y'all can actually research a lot on RSA. It's a very in-depth cryptographic system. E and N. Now D for us was five and N was 35. So five and 35. And then we're gonna take encrypted message from above and we're gonna decrypt this message. So after you decrypt it, we have the numerical form of the plain text and to then decode the message, just click here, decode message. And as you guys can see, we have decoded a message using RSA. So guys, that's how RSA works. I explained all the factors that we actually use in RSA from N to five to E to D. And I hope you understood a part of it. If y'all are still more interested, y'all can actually research a lot on RSA. It's a very in-depth cryptographic system. Just as pollution was a side effect of the industrial revolution, so are the many security vulnerabilities that come with the increased internet connectivity. Cyber attacks are exploitations of those vulnerabilities. For the most part, individuals and businesses have found ways to counter cyber attacks using a variety of security measures 
and just good old common sense. We're going to examine eight of the most common cybersecurity threats that your business could face and the ways to avoid them. So before we actually jump into the session, let me give you how the session will actually work. We are going to discuss the most eight common cyber threats. We're going to discuss in particular what they are, how the threat works and how to protect yourself. OK, so now let's jump in. Now cyber attacks are taking place all the time. Even as we speak, the security of some organization, big or small, is being compromised. For example, if you visit this site out here that is Threat Cloud, you can actually view all the cyber attacks that are actually happening right now. Let me just give you a quick demonstration of how that looks like. OK, so as you guys can see out here, these are all the places that are being compromised right now. The red parts actually show us the part that is being compromised and the yellow places actually show us from where it's being compromised from. OK, as you guys can see now that Someone from the Netherlands is actually attacking this place and someone from USA was attacking Mexico. It's a pretty interesting site and actually gives you a scale of how many cyber attacks are actually happening all the time in the world. OK, now getting back, I think looking at all these types of cyber attacks, it's only necessary that we educate ourselves about all the types of cyber threats that we have. So these are the eight cyber threats that we're going to be discussing today. Firstly, we're going to start with malware. So Malware is an all encompassing term for a variety of cyber attacks, including Trojans, viruses, and worms. Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on the computer. The way malware goes about doing its damage can be helpful in categorizing what kind of malware you are dealing with. So let's discuss it. So, first of all, viruses. Like their biological namesakes, viruses attach themselves to clean files and infect other clean files, and they can spread uncontrollably, damaging a system's core functionality and deleting or corrupting files. They usually appear as executable files that you might have downloaded from the internet. Then there are also Trojans. Now, this kind of malware disguises itself as legitimate software or is included in legitimate software that can be tampered with. It tends to act discreetly and creates backdoors in your security to let other malwares in. Then we have worms. Worms infect entire networks of devices, either local or across the internet, by using the network's interfaces. It uses each consecutive infected machine to infect more. And then we have botnets and such, where botnets are networks of infected computers that are made to work together under the controller of an attacker. So basically, you can encounter malware if you have some OS vulnerabilities, or if you download some illegitimate software from somewhere, or you have some other email attachment that was compromised with. OK, so how exactly do you remove malware or how exactly do you fight against it? Well, each form of malware has its own way of infecting and damaging computers and data. And so each one requires a different malware removal method. The best way to prevent malware is to avoid clicking on links or downloading attachments from unknown senders. And this is sometimes done by deploying a robust and updated firewall, which prevents the transfer of large data files over the network in a hope to weed out attachments that may contain malware. It's also important to make sure your computer's operating system, whether it be Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uses the most up-to-date security updates. And software programmers update programs frequently to address any holes or weak points. And it's important to install all these updates as well as to decrease your own system weaknesses. So next up on our list of cyber threats, we have phishing. So what exactly is phishing? Well, often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party, Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years and making it difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for an information from a false one. Now, phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are way more harmful than just a simple ad. So how exactly does phishing work? Well, most people associate phishing with email message that spoof or mimic bank, credit card companies, or other businesses like Amazon, eBay, and Facebook. These messages look authentic and attempt to get victims to reveal their personal information. But email messages are only one small piece of a phishing scam. From beginning to end, the process involves five steps. The first step is planning. The phisher must decide which business to target and determine how to get email addresses for the customers of that business. Then they must go through the setup phase. Once they know which business to spoof and who their victims are, fishers create methods for delivering the messages and collecting the data. Then they have to execute the attack. And this is the step most people are familiar with. 
that is the fisher sends a phony message that appears to be from a reputable source after that the fisher records the information the victims enter into the web page or pop-up windows and in the last step which is basically identity theft and fraud the fishers use the information they've gathered to make illegal purchases or otherwise commit fraud and as many as a fourth of the victims never fully recover so how exactly can you be actually preventing yourself from getting fished well the only thing that you can do is being aware of how phishing emails actually work so first of all a phishing email has some very specific properties so firstly you will have something like a very generalized way of addressing someone like dear client then your message will not be actually from a very reputable source so out here as you can see it's written as amazon on the label but if you actually inspect the email address that it came from it's from management at maisoncanada.ca which is not exactly a legitimate amazon address third you can actually hover over the redirect links and see where they actually redirect you to now this redirects me to www.fakeamazon.com as you can see out here so basically you know this is actually a phishing email and you should actually report this email to your administrators or anybody else that you think is supposed to be concerned with this also let me give you guys a quick demonstration on how phishing actually works from the perspective of an attacker so first of all i have actually created a phishing website for harvesting facebook credentials i simply just took the source code of the facebook login page and pasted it and then made a backend code in PHP, which makes a log file of all the Facebook passwords that get actually entered onto the phishing page. Now, I've also sent myself an email as to make sure this looks legitimate, but this is only for spreading awareness. So please don't use this method for actually harvesting credentials. That's actually a very illegal thing to do. So let's get started. First of all, You'll go to your email and see that you'll get some email saying your Facebook credentials have been compromised. So when you open it, it looks pretty legit. Well, I haven't made it look all that legit. It should look legit. But the point out here is to actually make you aware of how this works. So as you guys can see, it says, dear client, we have strong reasons to believe that your credentials may have been compromised and might have been used by someone else. We have locked your Facebook account. Please click here to unlock. Sincerely, Facebook associate team. So if we actually click here, we are actually redirected to a nice looking Facebook page, which is exactly how Facebook looks like when you're logging in. Now, suppose I were to actually log into my Facebook account, which I won't, I'll just use some random ID, like this is an email, gmail.com and let's put password as admin123, and we click login. Now, since my Facebook is actually already logged in, it'll just redirect to facebook.com and you might just see me logged in. But on a normal computer, it'll just redirect you to www.facebook.com, which should just show this site again. Okay, so once I click login out here, all that the backend code that I've written in PHP out here will do is that it's gonna take all the parameters that I've entered into this website, that is my email address and the password, and just generate a log file about it. So let's just hit login and see what happens. So as you guys can see, I've been redirected to the original Facebook page that is not meant for phishing. And on my system out here, I have a log file. And this log file will show exactly, as you can see, I've fished out the email address. This is an email at gmail.com. And it's also showed the password that is admin123. So this is how exactly phishing works. You enter an email address and you're entering the email address on a phishing website and then it just redirects you to the original site. But by this time, you've already compromised your credentials. So always be careful when dealing with such emails. So now jumping back to our session, the next type of cyber attacks we're going to discuss is password attacks. So an attempt to obtain or decrypt a user's password for illegal use is exactly what a password attack is. Hackers can use cracking programs, dictionary attacks, and password sniffers in password attacks. Password cracking refers to various measures used to discover computer passwords. This is usually accomplished by recovering passwords from data stored in or transported from a computer system. Password cracking is done by either repeatedly guessing the password, usually through a computer algorithm in which the computer tries numerous combinations until the password is successfully discovered. Now, password attacks can be done for several reasons. 
but the most malicious reason is in order to gain unauthorized access to a computer with the computer's owner's awareness not being in place. Now, this results in cybercrime, such as stealing passwords for the purpose of accessing bank information. Now, today, there are three common methods used to break into a password protected system. The first is a brute force attack. A hacker uses a computer program or script to try to log in with possible password combinations, usually starting with the easiest to guess password. So just think if a hacker has a company list, he or she can easily guess usernames. If even one of the users has a password 123, he will quickly be able to get in. The next are dictionary attacks. Now a hacker uses a program or script to try to log in by cycling through the combinations of common words. In contrast with brute force attacks where a large proportion key space is searched systematically, a dictionary attack tries only those possibilities which are most likely to succeed, typically derived from a list of words, for example, a dictionary. Generally, dictionary attacks succeed because most people have a tendency to choose passwords which are short or such as single words found in the dictionaries or simple easy predicted variations on words such as appending a digit or so. Now, the last kind of password attacks are used by keylogger attacks. A hacker uses a program to track all of the user's keystrokes. So at the end of the day, everything the user has typed, including the login IDs and passwords, have been recorded. A keylogger attack is different than a brute force or dictionary attack in many ways. Not the least of which the key logging program used is a malware that must first make it onto the user's device. And the keylogger attacks are also different because stronger passwords don't provide much protection against them, which is one reason that multi-factor authentication is becoming a must-have for all businesses and organizations. Now, the only way to stop yourself from getting killed in the whole password attack conundrum is by actually practicing the best practices that are being discussed in the whole industry about passwords. So basically, you should update your password regularly. You should use alphanumerics in your password and you should never use words that are actually in the dictionary. It's always advisable to use garbage words that make no sense for passwords as they just increase your security. So moving on, we're going to discuss DDoS attacks. So what exactly is a DDoS or a DOS attack? Well, first of all, it stands for distributed denial of service and a DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service to a network as the name suggests. Attackers send high volume of data of traffic through the network until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. So there are a few different ways attackers can achieve DOS attack, but the most common is the distributed denial of service attack. This involves the attacker using multiple computers to send the traffic or data that will overload the system. In many instances, a person may not even realize that his or her computer has been hijacked and is contributing to the DOS attack. Now, disrupting services can have serious consequences relating to security and online access. Many instances of large-scale DOS attacks have been implemented as a single sign of protest towards governments or individuals and have led to severe punishment, including major jail time. So, how can you prevent DOS attacks against yourself? Well, firstly, Unless your company is huge, it's rare that you would be even targeted by an outside group or attackers for a DOS attack. Your site or network could still fall victim to one. However, if another organization on your network is targeted. Now, the best way to prevent an additional breach is to keep your system as secure as possible with regular software updates, online security monitoring, and monitoring of your data flow to identify any unusual or threatening spikes in traffic before they become a problem. DOS attacks can also be perpetrated by simply cutting a table or dislodging a plug that connects your website server to the internet. So due diligence in physically monitoring your connections is recommended as well. Okay, so next up on our list is man in the middle attacks. So by impersonating the endpoints in an online information exchange, the man in the middle attack can obtain information from the end user and the entity he or she is communicating with. For example, if you are banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. The man in the middle would then receive all of the information transferred between both parties, which could include sensitive data such as bank accounts and personal information. So how does it exactly work? Normally an MITM gains access through a non-encrypted wireless access point, which is basically one that doesn't use WAP, WPA or any of the other security measures. Then they would have to access all of the information being transferred between both parties by actually spoofing something called address resolution protocol. That is the protocol that is used when you are actually connecting to your gateway from your computer. 
So how can you exactly prevent MITM attacks from happening against you? So firstly, you have to use an encrypted WAP, that is an encrypted wireless access point. Next, you should always check the security of your connection because when somebody is actually trying to compromise your security, he will try to actually strip down the HTTPS or HSTS that is being injected in the website, which is basically the security protocols. So if something like this HTTPS is not appearing in your website, you're on an insecure website where your credentials or your information can be compromised. And the last and final measure that you can actually use is by investing in a virtual private network, which spoofs your entire IP and you can just browse the internet with perfect comfort. Next up on our list is drive-by downloads. So gone are the days where you had to click to accept a download or install a software update in order to become infected. Now just opening a compromised web page could allow dangerous code to install on your device. You just need to visit or drive by a web page without stopping or to click accept any software and the malicious code can download in the background to your device. A drive by download refers to the unintentional download of a virus or malicious software onto your computer or mobile device. A drive by download will usually take advantage or exploit a browser or app or operating system that is out of date and has security flaws. This initial code that is downloaded is often very small and since its job is often simply to contact another computer where it can pull down the rest of the code onto your smartphone, tablet or other computers. Often a web page will contain several different types of malicious code in hopes that one of them will match a weakness on your computer. So how does this exactly work? Well, first you visit the site and during the three-way handshake connection of the TCP IP protocol, a backend script is triggered. As soon as a connection is made while the last ACK packet is sent, a download is also triggered and the malware is basically injected into your system. Now the best advice I can share about avoiding drive-by downloads is to avoid visiting websites that could be considered dangerous or malicious. This includes adult content, file sharing websites, or anything that offers you a free trip to the Bahamas. Now some other tips to stay protected include keep your internet browser and operating system up to date, use a safe search protocol that warns you when to navigate to a malicious site, and use comprehensive security software on all your devices like McAfee All Access and keeping it up to date. Okay, so that was it about drive-by downloads. Next up is maladvertising or malvertising. So malvertising is the name we in the security industry give to criminally controlled advertisements which intentionally infect people and businesses. These can be any ad on any site, often ones which you use as a part of your everyday internet usage and it is a growing problem as is evident by a recent US Senate report and the establishment of bodies like trust in ads. Now, whilst the technology being used in the background is very advanced, the way it presents to the person being infected is simple. To all intents and purposes, the advertisement looks the same as any other, but has been placed by criminal. Like you can see the mint ad out here, it's really out of place, so you could say it's been made by a criminal. Now, without your knowledge, a tiny piece of code hidden deep in the advertisement is making your computer go to the criminal servers. These then catalog details about your computer and its location before choosing which piece of malware to send you. And this doesn't need a new browser window and you won't know about it. So basically you're redirected to some criminal server, the malware injection takes place and voila, you're infected. It's a pretty dangerous thing to be in. So how exactly can you stop malvertising? Well, first of all, you need to use an ad blocker, which is a very must in this day and age. You can have ad blocker extensions installed on your browser, whether it be Chrome, Safari, or Mozilla. Also, regular software updates of your browser and other softwares that work peripheral to your browser always help. And next is some common sense. Any advertisement that is about a lottery that's offering you free money is probably going to scam you and inject a malware too. So never click on those ads. So the last kind of cyber attacks we are going to discover today and discuss about is rogue software. So rogue security software is a form of malicious software and internet fraud that misleads users into believing that there is a virus on their computer and manipulates them into paying money for a fake malware removal tool. It is a form of scareware that manipulates users through fear and a form of ransomware. Rogue security software has been a serious security threat in desktop computing since 2008. So now, how does a rogue security software work? These scams manipulating users into download 
the program through a variety of techniques. Some of these methods include ads offering free or trial versions of security programs, often pricey upgrades, or encouraging the purchase of the Elox versions. Then also pop-ups warning that your computer is infected with a virus, which encourages you to clean it by clicking on the program. And then manipulated SEO rankings that put infected website as the top hits when you search. These links then redirect you to a landing page that claims your machine is infected and encourages you a free trial of the rogue security program. Now, once the scareware is installed, it can steal all your information, slow your computer, corrupt your files, disable updates for legitimate antivirus softwares, or even prevent you from visiting legitimate security software vendor sites. Well, talking about prevention, the best defense is a good offense. And in this case, an updated firewall makes sure that you have a working one in your office that protects you and your employees from these type of attacks. It is also a good idea to install a trusted antivirus or anti-spyware software program that can detect threats like these. And also a general level of distrust on the internet and not actually believing anything right off the bat is the way to go. Clean is infected and encourages you a free trial of the rogue security program. Now, once the scareware is installed, it can steal all your information, slow your computer, corrupt your files, disable updates for legitimate antivirus softwares, or even prevent you from visiting legitimate security software vendor sites. Well, talking about prevention, the best defense is a good offense. And in this case, an updated firewall makes sure that you have a working one in your office that protects you and your employees from these type of attacks. It is also a good idea to install a trusted antivirus or anti-spyware software program that can detect threats like these. And also a general level of distrust on the internet and not actually believing anything right off the bat is the way to go. The keyword of this video is ethical hacking course, but in reality, it's just an expansive video on the fundamentals of ethical hacking. There is no such thing as an ethical hacking course, to be honest, because no course can teach you a discipline like ethical hacking. All the best that you can do in creating content for ethical hacking is that you can tell people about the fundamentals that are followed in this discipline. Okay, now before we start, let me just give you a general idea of the topics that I intend to cover throughout this video. Okay, now to be honest, we're going to cover a pretty broad range of material. We are firstly going to be going over footprinting and reconnaissance where you get an idea of what's involved in the ethical hacking engagement that you're working on and information about the target that you're engaged with. Then we're going to talk about networking fundamentals and here we're going to get our hands dirty with packets and the understanding of TCP IP at a deeper level and also understanding how the different protocols work and why they work that way. Now, we are also going to be talking about cryptography, where we talk about different cryptographic ciphers. We're going to deal with web encryption to SSL and TLS. We are also going to talk about certificates and the creation of certificates and how they actually operate. We will also talk about public key cryptography and we are also scanning and enumeration, so Nmap and dealing with Windows servers and using SNMP and LDAP and all that sort of stuff. Then we're going to be talking about penetration, where we deal with different ways of getting into systems and also go over using Metasploit, which is an exploit framework. And we're going to talk about how to use Metasploit and you actually get into systems and make use of the exploits that they have. Then we're going to talk about malwares, viruses and worms and rootkits and all of that sort of stuff. We're going to take a look at the different pieces of malware and how you would pull that apart in order to understand what is doing and potentially make use of that malware during an ethical hacking engagement. Then we're going to talk about different types of denial of service attacks or DOS attacks and the difference between a denial of service attack and a distributed denial of service attack. And there is a difference there. So we're going to go over those attacks. Now, we're also going to go over web application hacking and the types of tools that you would use during web application hacking and the different vulnerabilities that web applications have and how to make use of these exploits and those vulnerabilities. We're going to talk about wireless networking, how to probe wireless networks, what wireless networks are doing and how to secure wireless networks. We're also going to talk a little bit about detection evasion. And to be honest with you, Detection evasion kind of comes up in a lot of different areas through the many of the topics that we're also going to talk about programming, programming attacks, and how to protect oneself against programming attacks. Okay, so that was the 
number of topics that we are actually going to cover through this video. Now, the approach that I'm going to be taking in the series of videos is whenever possible, we're going to be going to use a hands on approach. So we're going to show you the actual tools I'm going to make use of and the tools to do some sort of demonstration and how they actually work. I am a big believer in getting your hands dirty as the best way to learn anything. So as we go through the series of videos, I strongly encourage you to get access to the tools that I'm going to be demonstrating wherever possible and dig in and get your hands dirty along with me. And there are places where we're going to be going over some theoretical material and I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint slides, but sometimes there are necessary evil in order to convey certain types of information. So wherever possible, I'm going to minimize their use, but you will run across places where they're just a necessity. And we are going to have to go through some slides where in order to get some particular points across, they are primarily of a theoretical nature. So that's the approach that we'll be taking through this video. And I hope you have fun as you go along the way. Okay, so let's begin. Now the first topic that we're going to tackle is what is hacking? Okay, so let us take a trip to the early days of hacking to start with. Now the Internet Engineering Task Force is responsible for maintaining documentation about protocols and various specification and processes and procedures regarding anything on the Internet. They have a series of documents called the Request for Comments or the RFCs. And according to RFC 1389, it says a hacker is a person who delights in having an intimate understanding of the internal workings of a system, computers and computer networks in particular. While the expression hackers may go back a long time and have many different connotations or definitions, as far as computers go, some of the earliest hackers were members of the Tech Model Railroad Club at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And what those people did and the various things that they did and were involved in are detailed in Stephen Levy's book called Hackers for Our Purposes. Now, for our purposes, we'll be talking about other types of hackers. Although the spirit of what we do goes back to those early days, now the definition of hacking or hackers has changed particularly in the 1980s and in part as a result of a couple of people, namely Robert T. Morris, who was a Cornell graduate, who unleashed a piece of software that was called a worm on what was an early version of the internet worm, went on to cause a lot of damage and create a lot of downtime on systems across the country and across the world. Now, the Morris worm did end up resulting in something good, however, that is the computer emergency response team at Carnegie Mellon was created primarily in response to the Morris worm. Now, there's also Kevin Mitnick, who is another well-known hacker who was responsible for various acts of computer crime over a couple of decades. He was the first convicted in 1988. So the definition of hacker or hacking moved from something benign to something far more sinister in popular culture. Now, we see hacking or hackers in all sorts of popular culture. We've seen them in hacker movies called War Games, also the movie Hackers. Of course, you also see it in the Matrix movies, where you can see, if you look really closely, that they are using a tool called Nmap, which we will get into the use of in great detail later on as we go on. Now, also the movie Sneakers and the movie Swordfish, and on television, in addition to other places, you can see the agents at NCIS regularly doing things like cracking complex cryptography in just a matter of seconds or minutes. So what is hacking really? Well, hacking is about a deep understanding of something particularly with relation to computers and computing. It's also about exploring and the joy of learning new things and understanding them very clearly and being able to manipulate those things in ways that maybe other people haven't before. It's also about digging into problems to find out solutions in creative and interesting ways and sometimes finding problems where there weren't problems previously. And that's a little bit about what is hacking. OK, so now that we have talked about what exactly is hacking and how the meaning and connotations of that word has changed over time, how it came into existence, how it was coined. Let's go over the reasons that people normally hack. Now, you may want to hack just for fun. As discussed previously, hacking is a tradition that goes back several decades at MIT, even preceding the computer related definition of hacking. Now, MIT has a long and storied history of hacking, 
and sometimes of a computer related nature which in this case happens to be true and sometimes of a non computer related nature instance now here you can see that MIT's homepage has been hacked or you might even say defaced to indicate that Disney is buying MIT this was an April Fool's Day prank in 1998 and again this is just the kind of hacking that you would do for fun rather now sometimes you might want to hack just to prove a political point or any point for that matter in this case again Bill Gates had donated some money to the MIT which allowed them to have a new building and he was coming to MIT to visit and give a talk about Microsoft Windows and its systems and as you can see the the Windows systems that were installed in the entryway at the building were hacked to be running Linux instead and you can see here that Tux the penguin is saying welcome to the William H Gates building again that some students who decided that they wanted to make a point about Linux and Microsoft and Windows to Bill Gates and they thought hacking was the best way to go about it sometimes you hack just for the challenge here's an example again at MIT where some students turned the facade of a building into a Tetris game board now this was a reasonably difficult hack and the students went after it just for the challenge of completing it and it just so they could have some pride of ownership and to be able to say that they were able to pull this off you know the things that teenagers do to show off to other teenagers it just increases with increase in scale now in spite of its difficulties and its challenges and all the obstacles and planning that had to go into it they were able to pull it off and now they have those bragging rights so that was one of them and one of the instances where somebody would hack just for the challenge and for the fun in it now sometimes you want to hack to prevent theft and this is where we get more specifically into computer related hackings you see a lot of articles and stories in the news over the last few years about cybercrime and here's an example of data theft compromised and a few than one and a half million cards for global payments so there are some attackers who got into this company global payment and they were able to pull out about a million and a half credit card numbers during the intrusion there so what you may want to do is you may want to learn how to hack in order to find these holes in your systems or applications or employer systems so that you can fix these holes and prevent these compromises from happening because of the reputational hit that your company takes wherever things like these happen you have the risk of completely running out of business so just to protect your job to protect your company and to protect your own desire of business you may just want to learn to hack and that's a very good reason now you may also want to find all the problems that exist in your system before putting them out and deploying them so that you can keep these attackers from getting in and stealing critical or sensitive information sometimes you may want to hack to get there before the bad guys and the same sort of idea is the last one where we're just going to talk about and that exactly is ethical hacking now we were just talking about how sometimes you may want to hack into your own system before publishing it out to the public let's take Internet Explorer for example now Internet Explorer was actually published to the public with some critical error in the code and these flaws were heavily exploited by people who actually found them now a number of people in the world go out looking for these flaws and they call themselves security researchers and they get in touch with the vendors of their they found a flaw or a bug and work with the vendors to get it fixed what they end up with is a bit of reputation they get a name for themselves and that name recognition may end up getting them a job or some speaking engagements or a book deal or any number of ways that you could cash in on some name recognition from finding these sort of bugs and getting them fixed if you want to get there before the bad guys you may think you're helping out a vendor you may want to just make a name for yourself you want to find these sort of bugs before the bad guys do because the thing about the bad guys finding them is they don't announce them and they don't get them fixed and that makes everybody a little less secure finally you may want to protect yourself from hacked computer companies and fight cyber criminals and this is a new headline from june 18 2012 and we're starting to see these sort of news headlines show up as companies are starting to retaliate against attackers in order to retaliate against attackers now in order to retaliate against attackers you need to be able to have the same sort of skills and techniques and knowledge and experience that those attackers have and where your company may want you to learn to hack 
or the company may want to bring in people who are skilled at these sort of activities so that they can attack the attackers and hopefully you end up with more steely exterior and you get a reputation for not being a company that people want to go after those are several reasons and there we go i gave you around a bunch of reasons as to why you may want to hack for fun to prove a point to protect yourself to protect the company to not run out of business and along with another bunch of reasons okay so now that we have talked about why you would want to hack let's move on to the types of hackers that exist now we're going to be talking about the different types of hacking and the first type of hacking that i want to discuss is ethical hacking and ethical hackers which is really what we're going to be talking about through the rest of these lessons now an ethical hacker is somebody who thinks like a black hat hacker or thinks like somebody who's intent on breaking into your systems but follows a moral compass that's more in line with probably the majority of the population so their intent isn't to do bad things their intent is to look for bad things and get them fixed so that bad things don't happen ethical hackers aren't out to destroy anything and they're not out to break anything unless it's deemed to be acceptable as a part of the engagement and also necessary in order to demonstrate a particular vulnerability to the organization that they're working with so that's an ethical hacker and there's a certification that's available from the ec council it's a certified ethical hacker and you know if you find certifications valuable and this sort of thing is what you want to do for seeing a certif certified ethical hacker maybe something you might want to look into now let's talk about black hat hacker there's a plenty of cases of black hat hackers through years and let's talk about a guy in particular called kevin mitnick this guy right here is a particularly good example probably because he was a black hat hacker for a lot of his years his goal was to cause mischief, to steal where necessary, and just to be engaged in the lifestyle of being a hacker and doing whatever was necessary to continue doing whatever it crossed, doing whatever he was doing. It crossed moral boundaries or ethical boundaries. And so Kevin Mitnick here was involved for well over a decade in computer crime and was finally picked up by the FBI. And he was charged and prosecuted. And he was eventually convicted of some of the activities that he was involved with. Now, you may be able to argue that Kevin is a gray hat hacker and as well. And a gray hat hacker is somebody who kind of skirts the line between black and white hat hacking and white hat hacking is really what an ethical hacker is. So instead of saying ethical hacker, you could say white hat hacker. It's the same idea. A white hat hacker is somebody who hacks for good. If you want to think of it like that, if you want to think of it as a good versus evil, and what they're really doing is they're in it for the technical challenge. They're looking to make things better, make things more efficient, improve them in some way. On the other hand, a black hat hacker is out for the money, for the thrill. It's really a criminal activity. And a gray hat hacker is somebody who may employ the tactics and technique of a black hat hacker, but have sort of a white hat focus, in other words. They're going to do things that may be malicious and destructive in nature, but the reason they're doing it is to improve the security posture of an organization that they are working with. So you can see there's actually a book called Gray Hat Hacking. It's a pretty good book and it details a lot of the tactics and strategies and techniques we'll be going over in subsequent lessons in this video. Now, one other type of hacking that I want to talk about is a thing called hacktivism and you'll find hacktivism all over the place. And one example in the last year or so, and certainly in recent memory, is called Lulz Security. Yeah, you heard that right. It's called Lulz Security. And you can argue that Lulz is actually a response to another type of hacktivism. An organization called Anonymous started hacking companies like Sony to protest their involvement in a lawsuit regarding a PlayStation 3 hacker. Now, Lulz Security was supposedly protesting the treatment of Anonymous or was hacking in support of this group. Anonymous, so they hacked a number of companies and did things like pulled information, usernames and password from the databases at these companies. And they said that the reason was to shine a light on the security of these companies and also theoretically to embarrass the companies with their weak or poor security postures. And the problem with that, that they were doing this through were posting information that they had found online. And that information often included details about customers for these particular corporations. And for an ethical hacker, a white hat hacker that would cross the boundary of causing harm. So there's no reason for me as an ethical hacker to post information in a public forum about somebody because I could be doing damage to them. 
But in this case, Lal Security and Anonymous, specifically Lal Security, were engaged in a form of hacktivism. And what they were doing was not only damaging to the corporation that certainly was detrimental to those people. So different types of hackers and different types of hacking. We've got ethical or white hat hacking. We've got black hat, gray hat, and then we have finally got hacktivism. It's really the goal and the means that vary from one to the other. OK, so now that we've discussed the types of hackers, let's also discuss the skills necessary to become one. So what we're going to discuss in this part are the different skills that are required or will be learned as a part of this video. So initially, just for basic computing, you need a basic understanding of operating systems and how to work them. There are going to be several fundamental types of tasks that I won't be going into any detail at all or and you'll need to know how to run programs and do things like open up a command prompt without me walking you through and how to do that. So I am going to assume that you have some basic understanding of how to do these sorts of tasks. Also, you need an understanding of the basic system software and you'll need a basic understanding of how to use command line utilities. There are a number of tools and programs that we're going to be going through this video and many of them use the command line. Now, whether it's on Windows or Linux, you'll need to be familiar with typing and being able to run programs from the command line and the various command line switches and parameters that those programs or types of programs are going to use. Now, from a networking perspective, you need a basic understanding of some simple networking concepts. You need to know what cables are and switches and hubs and how systems are networked together. You don't really need a deep level of understanding. I'll be going through some protocols at a reasonably deep level because I think it's important as an ethical hacker to understand what's going on at the protocol level so that you can know better what you are doing and how to achieve the goals and tasks that you have before you. So we're going to be going over some protocols. So just understanding what protocols are and how they go together. Those sort of things are necessary from a networking perspective. Now we're going to also be learning a bunch of life skills. Yes, there are some life skills that it's important to have. I think the most important one is the ability to accept failure and persevere. And by that, I mean you're going to be just running across several things that just don't work the first time around. And it's going to take a little bit of time and stick to itiveness to plug away and keep going until you get something to work. And the way that you get things to work is having an ability to problem solve. And sometimes solving problems requires being a little creative. Sometimes you need to think out of the box and come at a problem from a different perspective in order to find a solution. Throughout the course of this video, you're going to run across a lot of sticky problems through the course of learning about being an ethical hacker and just doing the work because it's not as simple. So here's a little recipe for how to do this. Now go follow this recipe every time and you're going to be successful. Every situation is different. Every system is different. You're going to run across some pretty sticky problems and you're going to have to just wait and get your hands dirty and keep failing and failing and failing and failing until you find a way to succeed. So I think those skills are very necessary to learn how to be an ethical hacker, digging through some of the material that will be going over in this video. As far as what you're going to be learning, you're going to be learning about how to use a lot of tools. You're going to learn networking. And by that, I mean, we're going to be talking about different protocols that are involved in networking systems together. You're going to learn about security and security postures. Security is the heart and soul of ethical hacking. It's why we do ethical hacking in order to make systems and networks more secure than they were previously. That's the goal from a networking perspective. We're going to be talking about how to read packets from network captures. We're going to be going into TCP IP related protocols in a fairly significant amount of detail. And you're going to understand how protocols interact with one another. So we're going to do all that and the reading packets is going to be really important and we're going to do a fair amount of that in addition to just a fundamental approach to learning how to read packets in several lessons. We're going to read packets as a way of understanding the different tools that we're using and how they're going to learn tactics and methodologies and you get to learn to use the information you've gathered in order to get more information and information is really what is this all about. You can't do much anything without information and sometimes it takes a fair bit of digging in order to find that information and what you're going to learn is the entry points and the stepping stones to get the information that you need and then once you have that information you're going to be learning about ways to exploit it in order to get deeper into the target you're going to learn security awareness we're going to talk about risk and understanding risks and vulnerabilities 
primarily recognize the difference between a vulnerability and an exploit, and there's a significant difference. There's so security awareness and understanding what a risk is and how that impacts your target. And it's going to be key to a lot of things that we talked about. So it sounds like a lot we're going to cover a fair bit of ground, not all of it at a deep level. Sometimes we're going to skim the surface, but there's an awful lot of material to be covered. So let's get started into talking about the different skills that are required or will be learned as a part of the series of video. So initially, just for basic computing, you need a basic understanding of operating systems. So it sounds like a lot we're, that we're going to cover. And a fair bit of it is going to be at a very deep level. And sometimes we're just going to skip the surface. But there's an awful lot of material to cover. So let's get started. OK, so that was all about the skills that, that we are going to develop throughout this video. And that might be necessary for you to become an ethical hacker. Now let's talk about the types of attacks that you might be dealing with as ethical hacker yourself. So now we're going to be talking about the types of attacks. Now, one type of attack that you'll find common, particularly in cases of hacktivism, for example, or cases where people are trying to make a particular point or just be a general pain, is this idea of defacing. Now, defacing goes back for quite a while. It's the idea of sort of digital graffiti where you've left your mark or your imprint behind so that everybody knows you were there. Primarily a website thing, and it's really just making alterations to something that used to be pretty common a long time ago. Now, it's very particular for businesses or people or just organizations in general to have their home pages be replaced by this other thing that was along the lines of, hey, I was here and I took over your web page. We also have a pretty common one, or certainly has been common over the years, and it's a pretty good path towards quality exploits and high profile vulnerabilities, and that's buffer overflow. Now, a buffer overflow is a result of the way programs are stored in memory. When programs are running, they make use of a chunk of memory called a stack. And it's just like a stack of plates when you put a bunch of plates down. When you pull a plate off, you're going to pull the top plate. You're not going to pull the oldest plate. You're going to pull the one that was on top. So the same thing with the stack here. We're accessing memory, and this has to do with the way functions are called in memory. When you call a function, a chunk of memory gets thrown on top of the stack, and that's the chunk of memory that gets accessed. And you've got a piece of data in memory within that stack, and that's called a buffer. And when too much data is sent and tried to put into the buffer, it can overflow. Now, the bounds of the configured area for that particular buffer, it can overflow the bounds of the configured area for that particular buffer. Now, the way stacks are put together, we end up with a part of the stack where the return address from the function is stored. So when you overflow the buffer, you have the ability to potentially override that return, at which point you can control the flow of execution of programs. And if you can control the flow of execution of the program, you can insert code into that memory that could be executed. And that's where we get buffer overflow that turns into exploits that creates the ability to get like a command shell or some other useful thing from the system where the buffer overflow is running. So that's a buffer overflow in short. Sometimes we also have format string attacks and sometimes these can be precursors to buffer overflow formats. Now format strings come about because the C programming language makes use of these format strings that determines how data is going to be input or output. So you have a string of characters that define whether the subsequent input or output is going to be an integer or whether it's going to be a character or whether it's going to be a string or a floating point, that sort of thing. So you have a format string that defines the input or the output. Now, if a programmer leaves off the format string and just gets lazy and provides only the variable that's going to be output, for example, you have the ability to provide that format string. If you provide that format string, what then happens is the program starts picking the next piece of data off the stack and displays them because that way we can start looking at data that's on the stack of the running program just by providing a format string. And if I can look at the data, I may be able to find information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack. I may be able to find some information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack. I may be able to find some information like a return address or some other useful piece of information. There is also a possibility of being able to inject data into the stack using this particular type of attack. Now moving on to our next type of attack is a denial of service. A denial of service 
this is a pretty common one and you'll hear about this a lot this is not to be confused though with the one that i'll be talking about after this and that is a distributed denial of service so this one that you see is a, this is a denial of service attack and a denial of service is any attack or action that prevents a service from being available to its legitimate or authorized users so you hear about a ping flood or a sin flood that is basically a sin packet being sent to your machine constantly or a smurf attack and the smurf attack has to do something with icmp echo requests and responses using broadcast addresses that one's been pretty well shut down over the last several years you can also get a denial of service simply from a malformed packet or a piece of data where a piece of data is malformed and sent into a program now if the program doesn't handle it correctly if it crashes suddenly you're not able to use that program anymore so therefore you are denied the service of the program and thus the denial of service now as i said a denial of service is not to be confused with a distributed denial of service and i know it's pretty trendy particularly in the media to call it any denial of service a ddos or any denial of service a ddos now it's important to know that any denial of service is not a ddos a ddos or as you might know a distributed denial of service is a very specific thing a distributed denial of service is a coordinated denial of service making use of several hosts in several locations so if you think about a botnet as an example a botnet could be used to trigger a distributed denial of service where i've got a lot of bots that i'm controlling from a remote location and i'm using all these bots to do something like sending a lot of data to a particular server when i've got a lot of systems sending even small amounts of data all of that data can overwhelm the server that i'm sending it to so the idea behind a distributed denial of service attack is to overwhelm resources on a particular server in order to cause that server not to be able to respond now the first known ddos attack used a tool called stockhold rot which is german for barbed wire now stockhold rot came out of some work that a guy by the name of mixter was doing in 1999 he wrote a proof of concept piece of code called tfn which was the tribe flood network let me just show that for you so you can see on the wikipedia page that the tribe flood network or tfn is a set of computer programs that is used to conduct various ddos attacks such as icmp floods sin floods udp floods and smurf attacks now i know many people don't really consider wikipedia a really good source of any sort of knowledge but it's a good place to start off so if you want to read about all these types of attacks like icmp floods and what exactly is a sin flood you can always do that from wikipedia it's not that bad place of course you shouldn't use wikipedia as your final rosetta stone moving on so this program called old rod which was it was used to attack servers like ebay and yahoo back in february of 2000 so that attack in february of 2000 was really the first known distributed denial of service attack which is not to say that there weren't denial of service attacks previously so to that there were certainly plenty of them but they were not distributed now this means there weren't a lot of systems used to coordinate and create a denial of service condition and therefore we get the distributed denial of service attack so that's a handful of type of attacks and some pretty common attacks that you're going to see as an ethical hacker when you become an ethical hacker or if you're trying to become an ethical hacker you should always know about these types of attacks okay so in this lesson we're going to be talking about penetration testing and some of the details around how it works and logistics and specifically things like scope so what exactly is penetration testing so well not surprisingly it's testing to see if you can penetrate something which means you're going to check to see whether you can break into a particular thing whether it's a server or in applications depending on the type of engagement you've got you may have the ability to try to break in physically to a location but primarily what you're going to be doing with penetration testing is you're going to be trying to break into systems and networks and applications and that's the kind of what it's all about and this may actually involve social engineering attacks so it may require you to make a phone call to somebody and get them to give you their username and password or some other type of social engineering attack where maybe you send a URL via a crafted email. Sometimes it's just strictly a technical approach where you're running scans and you're running Metasploit and you're gaining access that way or maybe some other type of technical application sort of connection. Sometimes it's physical access that you need. 
So in order to get access to a particular system, if you can get physical access, then maybe you can get in. So that was all about, that's what exactly penetration testing is. It's checking whether you can get into a system, whether it be physically or on a network. So what are the goals of penetration testing? The goals would be to assess weakness in an organization, security postures. You want to figure out what they're vulnerable so that they can go and fix these problems. You want to help them understand their risk positions better and what they can or may be able to do to mitigate those risks. And ultimately, you want to be able to access systems in a particular way to find weaknesses. So those are really sort of the goals of penetration testing. Now, from a result standpoint, when you're done, your testing, what you are going to do, well, you're probably going to generate a report. And by that, I don't mean you're going to run some automated tool and you're going to get it to generate a report for you. You're actually going to give that to the client. You're actually going to give your report to the client and then they're going to write you a really large check. So that's not really how it works. You're going to write a report detailing the findings in a detailed way so that it includes what did you do to find out what you actually found out and how you can actually mitigate that particular risk. So you should really include remediation activities in order to fix this vulnerabilities that you find. And it's pretty easy to walk around saying, hey, that's a problem and that's a problem and that's a problem. That's really not a lot of value in that where there's a value is that, hey, that's a problem and here's how you can go about fixing it. So let's talk about the scope of penetration testing. So firstly, you want to actually realize how big is the bread box and how specifically what is it that the you two of the two of you have agreed that being you, the ethical hacker and the other guy being the authorized person to give you permissions to ethically hack have specifically agreed that you can do penetration testing and you can target them as an organization or the client. And what you have agreed to are any exclusions or any sort of areas that they say you're not allowed to touch. So anything so, like if they've got a database server maybe, or there's a lot of really sensitive data on it, and there's a little hesitant, and they may put a don't touch this thing clause in the scope. So there are a lot of different reasons why they may exclude areas from the scope. And if they exclude them, then trust their reason and listen to them. What they have to say in terms of this is what we want you to accomplish. So along those lines, you really need to get a sign off from the target organization. Now we've talked about this before, and this is certainly all about the ethics and the trust. And it's also about legality, because if you do something that you don't have permissions to do, you could be prosecuted for that. So definitely get the scope very clear in writing and with signatures attached to it as to what you can and what you can't do and always get approval from the right people and make sure you get somebody who has the right level of permissions and is the right level of management so that they can sign off on its understanding and accept the risk that is associated with a penetration test. So let me talk a little bit about security assessments and how they differ from penetration tests. The security assessment is a hand in hand approach with clients. So you would walk in doing a collaborative thing where you're a trusted partner and you are ally with them and your goal isn't to penetrate them and point out all the things that are really bad, but it's to get a full assessment of the risk that the organization is exposed to. And you would probably provide more details about fixes that maybe you would in a penetration test. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to walk in and make sure that the policies and procedures they have in place are really what they need for the organization and the risk appetite that they've got. And we're going to make sure that the policies and procedures have controls that can tell us whether they are being actually adhered to or not. So the procedures and policies are being followed. A security assessment is probably a little bit more comprehensive than a penetration test. And you would look at more factors to assess the security postures of the organization in their overall risk. And you would tailor the output based on their risk appetite and what they're most interested in. And that's not to say that I'm going to tell them what they want to hear. But if there's something that they know and I know that they're just not going to do, I'm not going to be making a big deal out of it because they're already aware of it. And I'll make a note of it in the report just for a complete sake. But I'm not going to go out in a lot of detail. So it's really kind of a hand in hand collaborative approach where again, you're not just saying that they want us to say we are providing some real security and risk guidance towards their activities and other things. So it may provide an unrealistic view. So you've got a week, let's say, to do this penetration test against your target. Now you're going to have to go in. You're going to have to get set up. You're also going to have to start doing a bunch of scans and make sure that you're gathering information and screenshots and data for your reports. 
You're going to have to do all sorts of activities. Also, during the course of that week, you're going to be engaged in probably beginning to write your report and getting a sense of what is going to say and what's going to be in it. If you don't actually get any major penetration during the course of that week, the organization may feel like they're quote unquote secure. That's one of the reasons why penetration testing, while really sexy and show, is nice and all. But if an organization walks out of it believing that in a week you didn't manage to get to know, get the keys of the kingdom, then they might must be secure. That's really a misguided view because a dedicated skill and motivated attacker isn't going to just take a week or some portion of that week. They're after something, they're going to dedicate themselves to, to it and really go after it. So just because you didn't find a penetration in some subset of a week doesn't mean that they are secure and, invul and invulnerable to attacks. It just means that during the course of that particular week and other circumstances that were in place, you didn't get a penetration that was really significant or major. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. And if an organization walks away feeling like they're secure, they're going to end up not fixing the real vulnerabilities that may be in place that could expose them to significant risks. So that's penetration testing, its scopes, its goals, and how it differs to security assessments. Now it's time to go over footprinting. So what is footprinting? Well, footprinting is getting an idea of the entire scope of your target. That means not just the scope that you were given which may be an address block or it may be a domain name that even may be a set of address blocks. Now what you want to do is you want to figure out all the information that's associated with that in great detail as you can possibly get. So you want a list of domain names as you're going to go through this. You probably want some sort of database or Excel spreadsheet or something to keep track of all the information because you're going to have a lot of it at the end. You want to be able to find the information quickly. So having some sort of either notepad going with your notes or as I said, a spreadsheet or a database. So if you can get uh, organized in that way, you want to keep all those sorts of things down. So in this case, I want to do some sort of search on suppose, let's say edureka.co. Now I need network blocks. So, so far we found out that just made up IP addresses because I'm just putting information down. But I need network blocks. So you may have one IP address that you can find externally, or you're going to want a whole range of internal blocks. And you can do a little bit of digging if you aren't provided those. You want specific IP addresses for critical systems, web servers, email servers, databases, if you can find any of these things of those sorts. And you want system architectures. And what kind of stuff are they running? Are they running Intel? Are they running Windows? Are they running some Unix systems? What are they running? What kind of access control list they have? These are going to be hard to get, but you may be able to guess them. And you can guess these by doing port scans. So what sort of responses you get back from the port scans with the filters and or what you don't get back will tell you about if there's an IDS around or some you want to do a system enumeration or you can get access to a system somehow. You want to know usernames, group names, so on. So the basic idea of footprinting is gathering information. Now, if you can get access to systems somehow, you want to know usernames, group names. So you want system banners, routine tables, SNMP information, if you can get it. DNS host names, if you can get those. So now, this is for both internal and external on the side. If you're doing an internal penetration test or ethical hacking engagement, you want to know the networking protocols that are there. Are they using TCP IP or are they using some UDP or are they on IPX or SPX? Are they using DECnet or Apple Talk? Or are they using some sort of split DNS? In other words, do they have internal DNS servers that give different form for their external? And will it give different information if you want to check for remote access possibilities? Now, in the footprinting process, you want to be very exhaustive. You might want to try and take out email addresses, server domain name services, I mean, IP addresses, or even contact numbers. And you want to be very exhaustive with your approach. You don't want to miss anything out. Because if you do that, you can continue and also provide some some launching points for additional attacks or tests that you may be able to do. But this is definitely a starting point of the types of information that you need to have as you go about footprinting your target. Now, next thing that we are going to see is very interesting. This is one of the many common tools that are out there on the Internet, and that is the Wayback Machine or also known as archive.org. Now, well, it might not give you all the information that you need, but it gives, certainly gives you a starting point. And what we're talking about out here is the Wayback Machine or archive.org. So let me just give you a quick look at what archive.org looks like. 
Okay, I already have it open out here. So out here, what you can see is how a website looked like around some time ago. So for example, if you want to look at what Google look like, so you just have to search for Google out here and wait for results to come back. Okay, so we see that Google goes way back to 1998. So that was the last capture or the first capture rather. It was the first capture by the Wayback Machine and we can see that it has a screenshot of November 11th and how Google looked. So let's see what Google looked like in November 11th of 1998. So this is what Google looked like. It was, there was actually nothing to it. It just said, welcome to Google, Google search engine prototypes and it has some link. So yeah, this is what the Google search engine looked like. It had a Stanford search, it had a Linux search and you could do all sorts of stuff. You could just put the results. Now, what I'm trying to tell you all is you can see the evolution of a website through time through the Wayback Machine. And this gives you rather in, a, informative look into how website has actually evolved. Okay, now that we know what footprinting is and how it falls into the whole reconnaissance process. So let's go over a couple of websites to do a little bit of historical digging about companies and the types of infrastructure that they may be using. And this information, of course, is useful so that we can narrow down our focus in terms of what we want to target against them for attacks. Now, over time, we've improved our awareness about what sorts of information we may want to divulge. So several years ago, you may have gone to a company's website and discovered that you could get email addresses and names of people in positions that you may find relevant. And there were all sorts of bits of information that could be used against the company. And over time, we have discovered that those sorts of pieces of information probably don't belong on a website where they can be used against a company. And so they've been pulled off. Now, it used to be also that Google had the ability to pull up information that it had cached so far. For example, if a website was no longer available or if it was temporarily down and offline, there was a little cache button that you could click when you did and the Google search and you could pull up that cached information. So even though the website wasn't available, you could still get information from Google's servers. Now Google's removed that so we don't have that ability any longer. However, there is an internet archive that we can use. So this thing is called the Wayback Machine and I have it open out here. So it's archive.org slash web. So archive.org is a website that gives us information about other websites and how they looked like in years ago. And by so I'm going to go to the Wayback Machine, which you can see is at the archive.org and I'm going to go and try and search for edureka.co. So now we're going to take a historical look at edureka.co's website and you can see we've got some years and they've got information going back up to 2013. So let's look at what this website looked like when it was just 2013. Okay, there don't seem to be any snapshots out here. I wonder what's going on. Okay, so. Let's go to 2014 and the first snapshot seems to be on the September 12th of 2014. Actually, it's on May 17 too. So let's see what that look like. Okay, so this is what Eddie Reka looked like back in 2013 or rather 2014, September 12th, 2014 to be actually exact. Now you can see that we have some live classes and all these pictures are there and they've got this weird picture of this guy out here. I don't know why that was a thing back in 2014. Now we can browse more advanced screenshots or rather the screenshots that were taken later on and see how this company has evolved with this infrastructure and the way it actually lays out its content. Okay, so it still hasn't evolved, but I can go a couple of years ahead and see what this has actually evolved into. So if I were to go to December 2016, so this is what it looked like in 2016. And we can see that they've added this weird box out here about browsing courses. They have added a search bar that kind of looks weird, but uh, it's mostly because my internet is slow and it's not loading all the elements. They've also changed how they've actually laid out the courses. We can also see a change in the prices, I guess. So yeah, this tells us about how it evolves as a complete website. Now this other website that I want to talk about is called Netcraft. Now Netcraft does internet research, including the types of web servers that companies run. And they have a web server surveys. You can see here as we scroll that Apache web servers has 64.3% of the internet market, of course, and that's followed by Microsoft with 13%. Interesting information may be useful information, but even more useful than that is looking at what different companies run for their websites and you can see here. Okay, so let's try and search for edureka.co out here. So let's just put in the website URL 
and let netcraft generate the site report so as you can see that some of the stuff is not available we know that the net block owner is by amazon technologies the name server is this thing right here the dns admin is aws dns host master we also have the ip address we can go for a wire look up the ip on virus total we can do that there is no ipv6 present so that's some information that we can see so we can obviously opt out to not target ipv6 ranges then there's also reverse dns then we also have a bunch of hosting history so this is a history of it and we know that it's hosted on a linux system with an apache web server and it was last seen and this was when it was last updated so this is some very useful information you can also get information on stuff like netflix so if you just type okay i i, I just spelled that wrong so let me just change it from the url out here so if you go and type for netflix.com and you'll see that it'll show you all sorts of information so as you see that it's on an aws server it's an amazon data services ireland and this is all the hosting history that it goes along with it has some send a policy frameworks domain-based message authentication and reporting confirmations and there's all sorts of information that you can get about websites and their web servers from netcraft so the Wayback Machine along with Netcraft make up for some interesting tools that are available on the internet from which you can do a little bit of your reconnaissance process. Okay, now that we have gone over Netcraft and the Wayback Machine, now it's time to actually get to know how to use the little information that this site actually provides. So what the next topic that we're going to go over is using DNS to get more information. Now we're going to be going over a tool and this is called Whois, and it is a utility that is used to query the various regional internet registries to store information about domain names and IP addresses. And let me just show it to you about all the internet registries that are there. So I have Aaron.net open out here, and these are the internet registries that provides the ISPs and looks over the internet control as a whole. So out here we have Afrinic, we have Apnic, we have Aaron, we have Lacnic, and we have Ripe NCC. So these are all the regions and all the different types of stuff that they support all the different countries. You can look at the map that it is supporting out here by just hovering over the providers. So as you can see, all these brown region out here is Africa, Afrinic. Then we have Apnic, which is this black or grayish thing, which is India and Australia and quite a lot of Asia. Then we have Aaron, which is a lot of North America and the United States mostly. Then is Lacnic, which is mostly the Latino side, which is the South American part. Then we have the rest of Europe, which is Ripe NCC. And this is the part that Ripe NCC is providing internet to. Okay, so that was all about the internet registries. Now let's get back to the topic and that is using DNS to get more information. Now for this, we're going to be using a Linux based system. So I have Ubuntu running on my virtual machine out here and let me just log into it. So firstly, we are going to be using this query called Whois that looks up these internet registries that I just showed you. Let me just quickly remove this. Okay. So for querying information from the regional internet registries that I just talked about, you can use Whois to get information about who owns a particular IP address. So for example, I could do Whois and let's see, I could do who is Google or rather Netflix.com and we can get all sorts of information about Netflix. So we can see that we have the visit mark monitor. Then let's see, let's go up and look for all sorts of information that is being given to us by this who is query. So as you guys can see, I just went a little bit too much. Okay, so registry domain ID. We have the domain ID where it is registered. The registered URL is mark monitor. Okay, so this is for marking actually. Now the creation date is 1997. So if you haven't realized Netflix been around for a long time and it's been updated on 2015 and the registry expiry date as we see is 2019 so it's going to actually go off this year then this is all useful information so we can see all sorts of domain status the name server the URL the DNS sec that it says unsigned this is very useful information that is being provided by a very simple query now if you want to know who owns a particular IP address so let's see did we get back the IP address out there? We should have got back the IP address, but it's kind of lost on me. So to get back the IP address also for a domain name service that you know, so you could use this command called dig. So you dig netflix.com. 
Now, as you guys can see, that it has returned a bunch of multiple IP addresses. So these are all the IP addresses that Netflix is. So I could do something like if I was trying to check out who owns a certain IP address. And for example, I have got one of these IP addresses, but let's just assume I don't know that it actually belongs to Netflix. So I can go who was 54.77.108.2 and it'll give me some information. So as you guys can see, it is giving us a bunch of information as to who this is and how it is happening. So we see that it is from Aaron.net. And so it, we can very smartly assume that it's from the North American part. Now, we can also see that it's in Seattle. So our guess was completely right. So it also gives us a range. So this is something very useful. So if you see, we now have the range of the IPs that might be being used by this guy. So we indeed have 54 and it says it goes up to the 54. There's also 34. Now let's check that out and see what information we get. So who is, and let's check it out. What was the IP that we were just seeing? It's 34.249.125.167. So 34.249.165. Dot dot dot, I don't know. Let's see. You can also put in a random IP address. It doesn't really matter. And it'll give you the information. So let's see. Is this in some IP address? Even this seems to be an Aaron IP address. And it's also based in Seattle. And we get a bunch of information. So that's how you can use the whois query and the dig query to actually get all sorts of information about the domain name service and get information from a DNS, basically. So now let's go over some theoretical part that is for DNS. So using DNS to get information. So firstly, what is a domain name service and why do we need it? So a domain name service is a name given to an IP address so that it's easy to remember. Of course, you it's easy to remember names and mnemonics rather than a bunch of random weird numbers. Now, this was mainly so that we can map names to IP addresses and we can get the a bunch of information from the hostname resolution. So that's the purpose of IP addresses. Now, we will also be looking at how to find network ranges. Okay, now before we get on to actually moving on to how to find out the uh, network ranges, let me just show you how you can also use who is. So who is, suppose you want to know the domains with the word foo in it. So you could go who is foo. And this will give you a whole bunch of things about how foo exists and all the sorts of foos that there is on the internet. So that was one interesting flag. And if you want to know how to use more about who is, you could just go dash dash help, I guess. Yeah, so this is all the types of stuff that we can do with who is. So we can set the host, we can set the port that we want to search for. Then we can set with the L flag, we can find one level less specific match. And we can do an exact match, do an inverse lookup for specified attributes. Then we can also set the source. We can set verbose type and we can choose for a request template. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff they can do. So you could suppose say who is verbose and suppose edureka.co. And it'll give you a verbose version of this is a ripe database query service. The objects are in RPSL format. The ripe database is subject to the so, okay, let's try something else, like who is Netflix.com. Okay, I'm sorry, I was supposed to do verbose, and I kept doing H, silly me. So you do V, and it'll give you a much more, like this is a ripe database, again, I think I'm doing something wrong. Okay, just for that thing. Okay, V and type, okay. Or let's just see, That's let me just show you how to use it. A primary keys are return, only primary keys. Okay, let's see, let's try that out. Okay, so it seems to be that this is a ripe database query service and the objects are in RPSL format, so it won't really work for that thing. And it also says that no entry is found because it's this error. So this is for some later lesson. So for now, I hope I gave you a good idea of how to use who is. Like you could just go who is, then some IP address, like 192.168.101, or some gateway address like that. Or you could just go for a domain name service like Facebook and get all sorts of information about Facebook when the query actually returns you something. Okay, so let's move on to network ranges now. Now, in this part of the video, we're gonna be going over the utility called Whois, which is used for getting information from the DNS. Now, 
let me just show you a website out here. So this is the regional internet registries. So the internet registries are used to store information about domain names and IP addresses, and there are five regional internet registries. First is Aaron, which is responsible for North America, so that would be the US and Canada. Then we have LACNIC, which is responsible for Latin America and portions of the Caribbean. Then there's RIPE, that's responsible for Europe and Middle East and Central Asia. There's AFRINIC, which is responsible for Africa. And finally, we have APNIC, which is responsible for Asia Pacific Rim. So that's the regional internet registries. And as I said, who is, is responsible for acquiring information from the various regional internet registries as you can use? Who is to get information about who owns a particular IP address? So for example, let me just open up my Ubuntu system. Let me clear this out first. So as I was just saying, for example, you could go who is Facebook.com. Okay, so as you guys can see, we could find out pretty quickly about who owns a particular IP address. So for example, I could do who is and just go Facebook.com. It tells me about who it belongs to. It also gives you who owns a particular IP address and who's responsible for them. From the information, you can get email addresses that belong to a particular company. This one has an email address for tech contact of IP reg, ad rate. So you can get all sorts of email addresses, tech contacts, and all sorts of stuff out there. The registry database contains only .com and .net and all sorts of information. Now, I want to query a different IP address and different information belongs in the different regional internet registries, of course. So if I want to go to a particular database, I would have to use the minus H flag. So I could do who is Aaron net and remember the IP address. And I'm going to query that again. And of course, I get the same information back because I went there. So you could just go who is H and then follow it with an IP address. So something like 34.205.176.98. So that's just some random IP address I just made up. And it says that who is option. Okay, so it's a, it's a capital H. Okay, so let's see that. And we get all sorts of information back from that. So area 8, Aaron, and all sorts of stuff. Now I can get information about domains as well. So if I can query something like netflix.com and I can find out that this is that actually Netflix and there's an administrative contact and a technical contact and you can see the different domain servers. So the servers that would have authority of information about the DNS entries for that particular domain. You can also see other information like when the record was created and a whole bunch of different phone numbers that you can contact. And additional to storing information about IP addresses and domain names, sometimes it will store information about particular host names. And there may be other reasons why you would store a host name or particular information about a host name on the system with one of the RIRS. Now, if I want to wanted to look up something specifically, once I had found that, I could now do a lookup on who is, suppose, let's say, something like who is Foo. So let's say who is Foo. Now, if you already don't have who is installed, you can easily install it by just going apt install uh, who is on your Unix system. And that should do the trick. And then you can start use this really nifty tool. OK, so that was all about using who is. Now let's get on to actually using how to find out network ranges for a domain. OK, so now let's talk about how we are going to be going over and finding network ranges. So suppose you've got an engagement and you only know the domain name and you don't know much beyond that. And you're expected to figure out where everything is and what everything is. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you use some of the tools that we either have been talking about or will soon be talking about in more detail. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the domain name edureka.co and I'm going to look up edureka.co and see if I get an IP address back. So let's just head over there and go who is edureka.co or we could use the host keyword. So as you see, we get an IP address back and that is 34.210.230.35 and that is the IP address. And you see that I've got back an IP address. So here's just an IP address and I don't know what that IP address belongs to. And I also don't know how big the network range or network block is and that's associated with. So what I'm gonna do is a who is and I'm gonna look up with Aaron who owns that IP address. So you can basically go who is 34.210.230.35. So as you guys can see, that gives us a bunch of information and the who is. Now, this doesn't seem to have a very big network range, but unlike something like Netflix, so uh, suppose we were to do something like host netflix.com and See, now we have a bunch of IP addresses. So suppose we were to do who is, 
let's see, who is 52.19.40.147. Now I'm expecting Netflix to be a much larger company and have a better, yeah, now see, we get net range. So this is the network range that we are talking about. So we had a random IP address and now we have found the network range. So that's how you find network ranges and this can be very useful. So this gives me evidence that Netflix.com has a presence on different addresses. The one I have also located by looking up that particular host name. So I've got one address here that I can look at and let's take a look at the website because there may be a different address. Now, if I didn't have that, I could also go and do something like an MX flag. So let's see, I could go dig and this will give us all the mails. So dig MX and let's see, let's see what MX does actually. You go help. So we could do dig hyphen H for a list of options. So these are all the options that we have. And the one that we're gonna use is something like this, a dig MX and we say mm, something like netflix.com. So these are all the mailings and MXs that we have gotten from Netflix. And this is information regarding it's still producing information. That's a big thing to produce. Okay, so as I was just saying, you can use the MX flag and I could get back all the mail handlers in this case and their mail is being handled by Google. And uh, let's see, wait, let's go on to Then it's gonna tell me that Google's not particularly surprising and other things that you can do is check for different host names since I'm assuming DNS probably doesn't allow zone transfers since most DNS servers don't anymore. Although they used to, you may have to start guessing so I could do something like webmails that we find out here. So uh, this shows us a dump of all the outstanding memory stuff. Okay, so that was all about finding network ranges. Now moving on to our next topic is using Google for reconnaissance. Now some people also call this Google hacking. Now if you know how to use Google to exactly target and find what you are looking for. Google is an excellent tool for reconnaissance purposes. And today I'm gonna to show you how you could use Google exactly for your searches. So first of all, let's open a tab of Google. Um, let's open up here. So let's go to google.com. Okay, so now we're gonna be talking about how we can use Google to actually gain some information or some targeted information. So this is in general called Google hacking. Now, when I say Google hacking, I'm not meaning by breaking into Google to steal information. I'm talking about making use of specific keywords that Google uses to get the most out of the queries that you submit. So for example, a pretty basic one is the use of quotations. You quote things in order to use specific phrases. Otherwise, Google will find pages that have instances of all those words. Rather than the words specifically together in particular order, so I'm gonna pull this query up and this shows a list of, let me just show it to you. So if you go index, off. Now this is showing us an index of all the films. Now this is basically all those index of sites that you want. So as you guys can see, this shows us an index of all sorts of films that are there. Now you can use the index of, and you see that we have also an index of downloads or something like that, hyphen.com slash download. And it is an index of all sorts of stuff. Now you can go into some folder and check them out. G. Jones, G. Worthy, G. Perico. I don't know what these are, but some sort of stuff. And this is how you can use Google. Now, let me just show you some more tricks. So you can use this. So suppose you're using Google to find for something like a presentation. So you could use something like file type PPTX and it'll search for every type of file there that is PPT. Okay, let's try some other side, dot PPT. So config. Okay, so this brings up all the types of files that have some configs in them. So this is some gaming configuration as we see, this is some digital configuration of Liverpool. Now you could also use something like this thing in URL and you could use something like root and this will give you all the things with root in their URL. So kingroot.n, digital trends and how to root Android. So that's in the root and Suppose you want to say something like all in file type or suppose you want um, some extension. So, so dot PPT, dot PPTX, does that work? Um, let's search for JavaScript files. Okay, I think it's JS. 
Okay, that doesn't seem to work either. This shows us all the things with JS in it. No, it's just external JS. I'm doing this wrong. So you could use file type. So let's see, file type, and we go, let's see, doc. So these are all the documents that you could find with the file type thing. And you could also do JS, I guess. Yep, and this will give you all the JavaScript files that are there. So this is how you can use Google to actually narrow down your searches. So suppose you want a particular set of keyword and we want to make sure we get the passwords file from Google. Okay, so now let's go into more details about the various things you can find using Google hacking techniques. Now, while Google hacking techniques are really useful for just general searching in Google, they're also useful for penetration testers or ethical hackers. You can narrow down information that you get from Google you get a specific list of systems that may be vulnerable. So we can do things like look for error pages that do in the title error. So I'm going to get a whole bunch of information. So suppose like we go in title and we say error. So as that, we get all sorts of stuff and we can do the minus Google part. So if you do a minus Google, it'll not show you the stuff that's from Google. So we get various documentation pages about different vendors and the errors that they support. So here's one doc about Oracle, about Java error. If you know something more specific, we may be able to get errors about all sorts of other stuff. So this is how you could use the Google hacking technique to your own advantage if you're a penetration tester. Now, let's also show you something called the Google hacking database. Now, this is very useful for an ethical hacker. Now, the Google Hacking Database was created several years ago by a guy called Johnny Long, who put this Google Hacking Database together to begin to compile a list of searches that would bring up interesting information. Now, Johnny has written a couple of books on Google Hacking, so we're at the Google Hacking Database website here, and you can see them talk about Google Docs and all sorts of stuff. Now, you can see that we can do all sorts of searches like in URL, SAP, BC, BSP. This brings up some portal pages. Now, out here, you can bring up some password, APS password in URL. Now, this will give you all sorts of stuff on Google. So suppose you go in URL, so like APS password. Now, you can get all sorts of stuff like which have passwords in the URL. So maybe you can just guess a password from there too. Now, that was Google hacking. So Google hacking entries, and they also have a number of categories and that you can look through to find some specific things. So you may be interested in, of course, and you can search specific information that you may be looking for with regards to a specific product. For example, let me just show you exploit database. These are all the types of stuff you can go through out here. And as you see, we have all sorts of stuff like this is an SQL injection thing. This is something regarding peer archive TARS. So these let you get a foothold into some password cracking attempts and you can do some brute force checking and you can see here if it talks about the type of search it is and what it reveals, you can just click here on Google search and it will actually bring up Google with a list of responses that Google generates. So let's look at this one here. This type is a log. So this is something about cross-site scripting logs and we can also see some party logs if I was not wrong. So there's some denial of service POC. And we can see a bunch of stuff. And if you continue to scroll down, there are a lot of interesting information in here. So somehow somebody's got a party log that has log a lot of information. They've got it up on a website. And it's basically a bunch of information that you can see. You can also get some surveillance videos sometimes, and you can look into them. And this is basically how you could use Google. So it's basically a list of queries that you can go through. And this is a very useful site if you are a penetration tester and looking for some help with your Google hacking terminologies. So that's it for Google hacking. Now let's move on. OK, so now it's time for some networking fundamentals. And what better place to begin with TCP IP. Now we're going to be talking about the history of TCP IP and the network that eventually morphed into the thing that we now call the Internet. So this thing began in 1969 and it spun out of this government organization called ARPA, which Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they had an idea to create a computer network that was resilient to a certain type of military attacks. And the idea was to have this network that could survive certain types of war and warlike conditions. So ARPA sent out this request for proposals to BBN, which is Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, and they were previously an acoustical consulting company, and they won the contract to build what was called the ARPANET. The first connection was in 1969, 
So that's where we get the idea that the internet began in 1969. And the internet, as we call it now, didn't really begin, but ARPANET did. And ARPANET has a long history that goes through NSF net in 1980s and after ARPANET was sort of decommissioned and a lot of other networks were folded into this this thing called NSF net that then turned into what we now call the internet and once a lot of other networks were connected into its first protocol on the ARPANET initially there were 18 to 22 protocols which was very first protocol defining communication on ARPANET and it was called 1822 protocol because BBN report 1822 which describes how it worked shortly and after that, there was this thing called the Network Control Program. And the Network Control Program consisted of ARPANET's host-to-host -host protocol and an initial control protocol. Now, there's certainly not a direct correlation or an analogy here, but if you want to think about it in particular, where you could say that the ARPANET host-to-host -host protocol is kind of like UDP and the Initial Connection Protocol, or ICP, it's kind of like TCP. So the host to host protocol provided a unidirectional flow control steam stream between hosts, which sounded a little bit like UDP. And ICP provided a bidirectional pair of streams between two hosts. And again, these aren't perfect analogies, but the host to host protocol is a little like, bit like UDP and ICP is a little bit like TCP now. Now, the first router was called an interface message processor, and that was developed by BBN. It was actually a ruggedized Honeywell computer that had special interfaces and software. So the first router wasn't a ground up built piece of hardware, but it was actually an existing piece of hardware that was specially purposed for this particular application. So Honeywell had this computer that they made out and BBN took that and made some specific hardware interfaces and wrote some special software that allowed it to turn into this interface message processor, which passed messages over ARPANET from one location to another. So where did IP come in here in 1973? So IP came in here as well in 1973, as I just said, and a guy by the name of Vint Cerf and another guy by the name of Robert Kahn took the ideas of NCP and what the ARPANET was doing, and they tried to come up with some concepts that would work for the needs that the ARPANET had. And so by 1974, they had published a paper that was published by the IEEE, and they proposed some new protocols. They originally proposed a central protocol called TCP, Later on, TCP was broken into TCP and IP to get away from the monolithic concept uh, that TCP was originally. So they broke it into more modular protocols and thus you get TCP and IP. So how do we get to our version 4, which is IPv4, since that's the kind of internet that we're using right now. Version 6 is coming and has been coming for many, many years now, but we're still kind of version 4. So how did we get here between 1977 and 79? And we went through version 0 to 3 by 1979 and 1980, we started using version 4. And that's eventually became the de facto protocol on the internet. In 1983, when NCP was finally shut down because of all the hosts on the ARPANET we were using TCP IP by that point in 1992, uh, work began on an IP next generation. And for a long time, all of the specifications in the RFCs talked about PNG eventually, and IPNG became known as IPv6. You may be wondering where IPv5 went. Well, it was a specially purpose protocol that had to do something with streaming and certainly not a widespread thing. One of the differences between IPv4 and IPv6 is that IPv6 has a 128-bit address, which gives us the ability to have some ridiculously large numbers of devices that have their own unique IP address. IPv4 by comparison has only 32-bit addresses, and as you probably heard, we're well on our way to exhausting the number of IP addresses that are available, and we've done a lot of things over the years to conserve address space and reuse address space so we can continue to extending to the point till where we completely run off IPv4 addresses. Another thing about IPv6 is it attempts to fix some of the inherent issues in IP, and some of those has to do with security concerns, and there are certainly a number of flaws in IPv4. And when they started working on IP next generation or IPv6, they tried to address some of those concerns in some of those issues. And they may not have done it perfectly, but it was certainly an attempt. And IPv6 attempted to fix some of the issues that were inherently in IP. And so that's the history of TCP IP till where we reach today. Okay, so now that we've discussed a brief history on TCP IP and how it came about to the TCP IP version 4, let's discuss the model itself. Now we're gonna be discussing two models and those are the OSI model and the TCP IP model. Now, as I said, we'll be talking about the OSI and TCP models for network protocols and the network stacks. OSI, first of all, is the one that you see out here. 
It's the one on the left hand side of the screen. And OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnect. And in the late 1970s, they start working on a model for how a network stack and network protocols would look originally. The intent was to develop the model and then develop the protocols that went with it. But what ended up happening was after they developed the models, TCP IP started really taking off. And the TCP IP model was what went along with it and matched better. What was going on with TCP IP, which became the predominant protocol, and as a result, the OSI protocols never actually got developed. However, we still use the OSI model for a teaching tool, as well as a way of describing what's going on within the network stack. And in networked applications, you'll often hear people talking about different layers, like that's a layer two problem, or we're under a layer three space. Now continuing through these lessons, I'll refer occasionally to the different layers. And when I do that, I'm referring to the OSI model. So let's take a look at the OSI model. Starting from the bottom, we have the physical layer, which is where all the physical stuff lives. The wires and cables and network interfaces and hubs, repeaters, switches, and all that sort of stuff. So all that sort of physical stuff is sitting in the physical layer. Now sitting above this is the data link layer, and that's where the Ethernet protocol, ATM protocol, frame relay, those sort of things live. Now I mentioned the switch below the physical, the switch lives at layer one, but it operates at layer two. And the reason it operates at layer two is because it looks at the data link address and the layer two or physical address, and that's not to be confused within the physical layer. It does get a little mixed up sometimes, and we refer to the MAC address. Now, the MAC address is not the physical address that I'm talking about. It is the message authentication code address on a system as so uh, the MAC address on a system as a physical address because it lives on the physical interface and bound physically. However, that MAC address or media access control address lives at layer two at the data link layer. The network layer, which is right above at layer three, that's where the IP lives as well as ICMP, IPX, and from IPX, SPX suite of protocols from novel routers operate at layer three. And at layer four above that is the transport layer. That's the TCP, UDP, and SPX again from the IPX, SPX suite of protocols. And above that is the session layer, and that's layer five. And that's Apple Talk, SSH, as well as several other protocols. And then there's a presentation layer, which is layer six. And you'll often see people refer to something like JPEG or MPEG as examples of protocols that live on that layer. And then there's a presentation layer, which is the final layer, which is layer six. And you'll often see people refer to something like JPEG or MPEG as examples of protocol that live at that layer. And then they live at that layer, which is the presentation layer. Finally, we have layer seven, which is the application layer. And that's HTTP, FTP, SMTP, and similar application protocols, whose responsibility is to deliver and use the functionality. So that's basically the OSI model, and that's the seven layers of the OSI model. And there's some important thing to note here. That is when we are putting packets onto the wire, the packets get built from top of the stack down by, from the top of the stack to the bottom of the stack, which is why it's called a stack. Each layer sits on top of the other, and the application layer is responsible for beginning the process and then that follows through the presentation session and transport layer and down through the network data link until we finally drop it on the wire at the physical layer. When it's received from the network, it goes from the bottom up and we receive it on the physical and it gets handled by the data link and then the network and till the application layer. So basically when a packet is coming in, it comes in from the application, goes out from the physical and then when it's going out also, it goes from the physical through the data link then the network, transport session, presentation, and application, and finally to the target system. Now what we're dealing with is an encapsulation process. So at every layer on the way, down the different layers, add bits of information to the datagram or the packet. So that's when it gets to the other side. Each layer knows where its demarcation point is. While it may seem obvious, each layer talks to the same layer on the other side. So when we drop a packet out onto the wire, the physical layer talks to the physical layer, and in other words, the electrical bits that get transmitted by the network interface on the first system are received on the second system. On the second system, the layer two headers that were put by the first system get removed and handled as necessary. Same thing at the network layer. It's the network layer that puts the IP header and it's the network layer that removes the IP header and determines what to do from there and so on and so on again. While it may seem obvious, it's an important distinction to recognize that each layer talk to each layer while it may seem obvious, it's an important distinction to recognize that each layer talk to each layer. And when you're building a packet, you go down through the stack. And when you're receiving, you come up through the stack. And again, it's called a stack. 
because you keep pushing things on top of the packet and they get popped off the other side. So that was detailed and brief working on how the OSI model is set up and how the OSI model works. Now let's move on to the TCP IP model, which is on the right hand side. And you'll notice that there's a really big difference here. That being that there are only four layers in the TCP IP model as compared to the seven layers of the OSI model. Now we have the network access layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, and the application layer and the functionality. Now we have the access layer, the internet layer, the transport layer, and the application layer. The functionality that the stack provides is the same. And in other words, you're not going to get less functionality out of the TCP IP model. It's just that they've changed where different functionality decides and where the demarcation point between the different layers are. So there are only four layers in the TCP IP model, which means there are a couple of layers that have taken in functions from some of the OSI models. And we can get into that right here. The difference between the models at the network access layer in the TCP IP model that consists of the physical and the data link layer from the OSI model. So on the right here, you see the network access layer that takes into the account the physical and the data link layers from the OSI model. And the left hand side, similarly, the application layer from the TCP IP model encompasses all the session presentation and the application layer of the OSI model. So on the right, the very top box, the application layer encompasses the session presentation and application layer. And on the left hand side, that of course leaves the transport layer to be the same. And the OSI model, they call it the network layer. And then TCP IP model, it's called the internet layer. Same sort of thing. That's where the IP lives. And even though it's called the internet layer as compared to the network layer, it's the same sort of functionality. So those are the really big differences between OSI and TCP IP model. Anytime I refer to layers through the course of this video that I'm going to be referring to the OSI model and in part because it makes it easier to differentiate the different functionality. If I were to say layer one function in the TCP IP model, you would necessarily know if I was talking about a physical thing or a data link thing. Since there's more granularity in the OSI model, it's better to talk about the functionality in terms of the layers in the OSI model. And that's the predominant model, the OSI model and the TCP IP model for network stacks, network protocols and applications. Okay, so now that we've discussed the TCP IP model, let's go over another important protocol and that is UDP. So what you see out here on your screen right now is Wireshark and we'll be going over the uses of Wireshark and what it's useful for in the uh, upcoming lessons. But for now, let me just show you a UDP packet. Okay, so before we get into um, the analysis of the packet while it's still filtering, let me just tell you a little bit about UDP. So UDP is a protocol in the TCP IP suite of protocols. It's in the network layer. That's the network layer in the OSI. So a seven layer reference model, the IP network layer carries the IP address and that has information about how to get packets to its destination, the transport layer sits on top of the network layer and that carries information about how to differentiate network layer applications and that information about how those network application gets differentiated is in the form of ports. So the transport layer has ports and the network layer has in this case an IP address and UDP is a transport layer protocol and UDP stands for user datagram protocol and it's often called connectionless or sometimes unreliable. Now unreliable doesn't mean that you can't really rely on it. Unreliable means that you can't trust that what you send is reaching the other side. So what means actually that there's nothing in the protocol that says it's going to guarantee that the datagram that you send or the packet that you send is going to get where you want to send it. So the protocol has no sort of safety feature like that. So you shouldn't use this protocol that is UDP if you want some sort of safety net. And if you needed that type of safety net, you would have to write it into your own application. So basically UDP is a fast protocol and that's one of the reasons why it's good. It's also one of the reasons why it's unreliable because in order to get that speed, you don't have all of the error checking and validation that messages are getting there. So because it's fast, it's good for things like games and for real time voice and video, anything where speed is important and you would use UDP. So right here, I have a packet capture. So I'm using Wireshark to capture some packets and let's check out a UDP packet. So out here you see that there are some frames that says 167 bytes on wire, 167 bytes have been captured, but we're not really interested in the frame part. We're interested in the user datagram protocol part. So out here you can see that the source port is 1853 and the destination port is 52081. Now it has a length and it has a checksum and stuff. 
So as you guys see out here, well, we don't really see a bunch of information. What you only see is the source port and the destination port, the length, and there's also a checksum. So UDP doesn't come with an awful lot of headers because it doesn't need any of the things that you see in the other packet headers. The only thing it needs is to tell you how to get the application on the receiving host. And that's where the destination port comes in. And once the message gets to the destination, the destination needs to know how to communicate back to the originator. And that would be through the source port or a return message. So a return message would convert the source port to a destination port and send back to that port in order to communicate with the originator. So we have a source port and destination port and the length is a minimal amount of checking and to make sure that if the packet that you received is a different from the length that's specified in the UDP header, then there may have been something wrong. So you may want to discard the message to check for more messages. So the checksum also makes sure that nothing in the middle was tampered with, although it's if there's some sort of man in the middle attack or something like that, a checksum is pretty easy to manufacture after you've altered the packet. So you can see here in the message that there's a number of UDP packets. Some of them just say UDP. The one look at happens to be from some Skype application, I guess. So talking to Skype servers and we've already got the DNS. Now DNS also needs some fast response times because you don't want to send a lot of time looking up information about servers that you're going to before because just to go to them. So DNS servers throw up, throw out their queries onto the wire using UDP hopping to get fast sponsors. They don't want to spend a lot of time setting up connections and during all the negotiating that comes with a protocol like TCP, for example. So here you see that the DNS is using UDP and what we've got here is another UDP packet with port destination and all sorts of stuff. So you can see it out here. So you can see the checksum, it's unverified checksum status. So you can check out all sorts of stuff using Wireshark. So that was about UDP or the user datagram protocol. Okay, so now that we're done with the use data cram protocol, let's talk about addressing modes. So addressing modes is how you address a packet to your different destinations. So there are three kinds of addressing modes. The first kind of addressing mode is unicast. This is a pretty simple one to understand. So there is one destination and one source and the source sends the packet to the destination. And it's it depends on the protocol that you're using to actually address. So if it's Something like TCP IP, you're probably using a bi-directional stream. So the blue computer can talk to the red computer and the red computer can talk back to the blue computer. But you can also use a UDP stream, which is like one directional stream. So it's I'm not sure if I'm using the correct word. So it's a stream that's in one direction. I guess I'm driving home the point here. So if it's UDP, only blue is talking. And when blue stops talking, then red can talk. But if it's TCP IP, blue and red can talk simultaneously at the same time. Now moving on, there's also broadcast. Now broadcast means that you are sending your packet to everybody on the network. So broadcast messages are very common from mobile network providers. So when you get those advertisements saying something like you have a new postpaid plan from Vodafone or Airtel or something like that, those are broadcast messages. So it's one server that is sending out one single message to all the other systems. Now there's also multicast. Now multicast is like broadcast, but selective. Now multicast is used for actually casting your, your screen to multiple people. So something like screen share when you are doing it with multiple people is multicast because you have the option to not show a particular computer what you are actually sharing. So those are the three modes of addressing, unicast, broadcast, and multicast. Okay, now moving on. Let's look into the tool that we just used to understand UDP, that is Wireshark. So what exactly is Wireshark? So this utility called Wireshark is a packet capture utility, meaning that it grabs data that's either going out or coming in of a specific network. And there are a number of reasons why this may be useful or important. One of the reasons why it's really important is what's going on in the network is always accurate. In other words, you can't mess around with things once they're on the network or you can't lie about something that's actually on the network as compared with applications in their logs, which can be misleading or inaccurate. Or if an attacker gets into an application, they may be able to alter the logging. Now, several other behaviors that make it difficult to see what's really going on and the network, you can really see what's going on once it hits the wire. It's on the wire and you can't change that fact. Now, once it hits the wire, so what we're going to do here is a quick packet capture. So let me just open up Wireshark for you guys. So as you guys can see, I have already Wireshark open for us. Let me just remove this UDP filter that was there. So Wireshark is recapturing. 
So let us go over the stuff that you can see on the screen. Some important features of Wireshark so that we can use it later. So what I'm doing here is a quick packet capture and I'm going to show some of the important features of Wireshark so that we can use it later on. Now when we're starting to do some more significant work, I select the interface that I'm using primarily, which is my Wi-Fi, and I'm going to be go over here and we'll bring up a Google page so that we can see what's happening on the network. So let me just quickly open up a Google page. As you guys can see, it's capturing a bunch of data that's going around here. Now let me just open up a Google page and that's going to send up some data. Let's go back. So it's grabbing a whole bunch of stuff off the network. I'm just going to stop that. I'm going to go back and go back and take a look at some of the messages here. So some of the features of Wireshark, as you can see on the top part of the screen, here there's a window that says number, time, source, destination, protocol, length, and info. And those are all of the packets that have been captured. And they're numbering starting from one and the time has to do with being relative to the point that we've started capturing. And you'll see the source and destination addresses and the protocol, the length of the packet and bytes and some information about the packet. The bottom of the screen, you'll see detailed information about the packet that has been selected. So suppose I'm still selecting this TCP packet out here. So we can go through the frames. The frame also has some interface IDs, the encapsulation type, and all sorts of information is there about the frame. Then we can look at the source port, the destination port, the sequence number, the flag set, the checksums. We can basically check everything about a packet because this is a packet analyzer and a packet sniffer. Now you'll see some detailed information about the packet that has been selected. So I'm going to select. So as I've selected this TCP IP packet, we see that in the middle frame it says frame 290. It means that it has a 290 A flag packet and the packet that was captured is 66 bytes. And we grab 66 bytes and it's 528 bits later. So you, what you see out here was the source and the destination MAC address of the layer to layer address. And then you can see the IP address of both source and destination and it says it's a TCP packet and gives us a source port, destination port. And we can start drilling down into different bits of the packet. And you can see when I select a particular section of the packet down at the very bottom, you can see what's actually a hex dump of the packet. And on the right hand side is the ASCII. So this is the hex, the hex dump and this is the ASCII that you're looking at. What's really cool about Wireshark it, is it really pulls the packet into its different layers that we have spoken about, the different layers of the OSI and the TCP IP model. And the packets are put into different layers and there's a couple of different models that we can talk about with that. What Wireshark does really nicely is it demonstrates those layers for us as we can see here. It is actually four layers and in this particular packet here we can also do something. So I've got a Google web request so what I want to do here is I want to filter based on HTTP. So I find a filter. So let's see. We can do an HTTP. And what I see here is it says text input and it's going to get an image. So that's a PNG image. And this is a request to get the icon that's going to be displayed in the address bar. So you also see something called ARP out here, which I'll be talking about very soon. So let just the filtering be done. Now in the web browser, it's a favicon.ico that I can do here. I can select, analyze, and follow TCP streams. You can see all the requests related to this particular request, and it breaks them down very nicely. So you can see we've sent some requests to Spotify because I've been using Spotify to actually listen to some music. Then you can see all sorts of stuff like this was something to some not found place. So let's just take the Spotify one, and you can see that we get a bunch of information from the Spotify thing at least. Uh, you can see the destination, the source, it's an Intel Core machine. So the first part of the MAC address, the first few digits is, lets you tell if it's what what is the vendor ID. So Intel has its own vendor ID. So F496 probably tells us that it's that's an Intel Core. So Wireshark does this very neat little thing that it also tells us from the MAC address what type of machine you're sending your packets to from the MAC address itself. So it's coming from a Sophos 4C and going to an Intel core and the type is IPv4. So that was all about Wireshark. You can use it extraneously for packet sniffing and packet analysis. Packet analysis comes very handy when you are trying to actually figure out how to do some stuff like IDS evasion where you want to craft your own packets and you want to analyze the packets that are going into the IDS system to see which packets are actually getting detected as some intrusion. So you can craft your packet in a relative manner so that it doesn't get actually detected by the IDS system. So this is a very nifty little tool. We'll be talking about how you can craft your own packets just in a little while, but for now, 
let's move ahead. Okay, so now that we are done with our small little introduction and a brief use on history of Wireshark, now let's move on to our next topic for the video, that is DHCP. Okay, so DHCP is a protocol and it stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So DHCP is a network management protocol used to dynamically assign an internet protocol address to any device on a network so they can communicate using IP. Now DHCP automates and centrally manages these configurations rather than requiring some network administrator to manually assign the IP addresses to all the network devices. So DHCP can be implemented on small or small local networks as well as large enterprises. Now DHCP will assign new IP addresses in each location when devices are moved from place to place, which means network administrators do not have to manually initially configure each device with a valid IP address. So if a device with a new IP address is moved to a new location of the network, it doesn't need any sort of reconfiguration. So versions of DHCP are available for use in the Internet Protocol version 4 and Internet Protocol version 6. Now, as you see on your screen is a very simplistic diagram on how DHCP works. So let me just run you down. DHCP runs at the application layer of the TCP IP protocol stack to dynamically assign IP addresses to DHCP clients and to allocate TCP IP configuration information to DHCP clients. This includes subnet mask information, default gateways, IP addresses, domain name systems, and addresses. So DHCP is a client server protocol in which servers manage pool of unique IP addresses, as well as information about client configuration parameters and assign addresses out of those address pools. Now DHCP enabled clients send a request to the DHCP server whenever they connect to a network. The clients configured with DHCP broadcasts a request to the DHCP server and the request network configuration information for a local network to which they're attached. A client typically broadcasts a query for this information immediately after booting up. The DHCP server responds to the client request by providing IP configuration information previously specified by a network administrator. Now this includes a specific IP address as well as for the time period, also called a lease, for which the allocation is valid. When refreshing an assignment, a DHCP client requests the same parameters, but the DHCP server may assign a new IP address based on the policy set by the administrator. Now a DHCP server manages a record of all the IP addresses it allocates to networks, nodes. If a node is reallocated in the network, the server identifies it using its media access control address. Now which prevents accidental configuring multiple devices with the same IP address. Now DHCP is not a routable protocol, nor is it a secure one. DHCP is limited to a specific local area network, which means a single DHCP server per LAN is adequate. Now larger networks may have a wide area network containing multiple individual locations depending on the connections between these points and the number of clients in each location. Multiple DHCP servers can be set up to handle the distribution of addresses. Now if network administrators want a DHCP server to provide addressing to multiple subnets on a given network, they must configure DHCP relay services located on interconnecting routers that DHCP requests to have to cross. Now these agents relay messages between DHCP client and servers. Uh, DHCP also lacks any built-in mechanism that would allow clients and servers to authenticate each other. Both are vulnerable to deception and to attack where rogue clients can exhaust a DHCP server's pool. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic and that is why use DHCP. So I just told you that DHCP doesn't really have any sort of authentication, so it can be fooled really easily. So what are the advantages of using DHCP? So DHCP offers quite a lot of advantages. Firstly is IP address management. A primary advantage of DHCP is easier management of IP addresses. In a network without DHCP, you must manually assign IP address. You must be careful to assign unique IP addresses to each client and to configure each client individually. If a client moves to a different network, you must make manual modifications for that client. Now when DHCP is enabled, the DHCP server manages the assigning of IP addresses without the administrator's intervention. Clients can move to other subnets without manual reconfiguration because they obtain from a DHCP server new client information appropriate for the new network. Now apart from that, you can say that DHCP also provides a centralized network client configuration. It has support for boot TP clients. It supports of local clients and remote clients. It supports network booting 
and also it has a support for a large network and not only for short like small scale networks but for larger networks as well so that way you see dhcp has a wide array of advantages even though it doesn't really have some authentication so because of these advantages dhcp finds widespread use in a lot of organizations okay so that winds up dhcp for us so let us go into the history of cryptography now so let me give you a brief history of cryptography. Now cryptography actually goes back several thousand years before shortly after people began to find ways to communicate. There were some of us who were finding ways to make the understanding of that communication difficult so that other people couldn't understand what was going on. And this led to the development of Caesar cipher that was developed by Julius Caesar. And it's a simple rotation cipher. And by that, I mean that you rotate a portion of the key in order to generate the algorithm. So here's an example. We've got two rows of letters and that are alphabetical in order and means we basically written the alphabets down and the second row is shifted by three letters. So a B is a Z actually because if you move that way, a B is a Z from the first row gets shifted back to the second row and then the letter D becomes the letter C. So there's, that's an example of how encryption works. So if you try to encrypt a word like hello, it would look completely gibberish after it came out of that algorithm. So if you count the letters out, you can see that the letter H can be translated to letter L. So that's a Caesar cipher. Now you must have heard of things like ROT13, which means that you rotate the 13 letters instead of three letters. That's what we can do here again. And this is just a simple rotation cipher or Caesar cipher. That's what of course the rot stands for. It's rotate or rotation. Now, coming forward a couple thousand years, we have the Enigma cipher. Now, it's important to note that the Enigma is not the word given to this particular cipher by the people who developed it. It's actually the word given to it by the people who were trying to crack it. The Enigma cipher is a German cipher. They developed the cipher and the machine that was capable of encrypting and decrypting messages so that they could messages to and from different battlefields and war fronts, which is similar to the Caesar cipher. Caesar used it to communicate with his battlefield generals and the same thing were with the Germans. You've got to get messages from headquarters down to where the people are actually fighting and you don't want it to get intercepted in between by the enemy. So therefore you use encryption and lots of energy was spent by the allies in particular the British trying to decrypt the messages. One of the first instances that we are aware of where a machine was used to do the actual encryption and we're going to come ahead a few decades now into the 1970s where it was felt that there was a need for a digital encryption standard. Now the National Institute of Standards and Technology is responsible for that sort of thing. So they put out a proposal for this digital encryption standard and an encryption algorithm. What ended up happening was IBM came up with this encryption algorithm that was based on the Lucifer cipher. That was one of their people had been working on on a couple of years previously in 1974. And they put this proposal together based on the Lucifer cipher and in 1977 that proposal for an encryption algorithm was the one that was chosen to be the digital encryption standard. And so that came to be known as DES over time. And it became apparent that there was a problem with DES and that was it only had a 56 bit key size. And while in the 1970s that was considered adequate to defend against brute forcing and breaking of code by 1990s it was no longer considered adequate and there was a need for something more and it took time to develop something that would last long for some long period of time. And so in the meantime a stop gap was developed and this stop gap is what we call the triple DES. The reason it's called triple DES is you apply the DES algorithm three times in different ways and you use three different keys in order to do that. So here's how triple DES works. Your first 56 bit key is used to encrypt the plain text just like you would do with the standard digital encryption standard algorithm where it changes and you take that cipher text that's returned from the first round of encryption and you apply the decryption algorithm to the cipher text. However, the key thing to note is that you don't use the key that you use to encrypt. You don't use the first key to decrypt a bit because otherwise you'll get the plain text back. So what you do is you use a second key with the decryption algorithm against the cipher text from the first round. So now you've got some cipher text that has been encrypted with one key and decrypted with the second key and we take the cipher text from that and we apply a third key using the encryption portion of the algorithm to that cipher encryption portion of the algorithm to that cipher text to receive a whole new set of cipher text obviously to do the decryption you do the third key and decrypt it with the second key you encrypt it and then with the first key you decrypt it 
And so you do reverse order and the reverse algorithm at each step to apply triple desk. So we get an effective key size of about 168 bits, but it's still only 56 bits at a time. Now I said triple desk was only a stopgap. What we were really looking for was the advanced encryption standard once again. And NIST requested proposals so that they could replace the digital encryption standard in 2001. After several thousands of looking for algorithms and looking them over, getting them evaluated and getting them looked into, NIST selected an algorithm and it was put together by a couple of mathematicians. The algorithm was called Raindoll and that became the Advanced Encryption Standard or AES. It's one of the most advantages of AES is it supports multiple key lengths. Currently, what you'll typically see is as we are using 128-bit keys. However, AES supports up to 256-bit keys. So if we get to the point where 128-bit isn't enough, we can move all the way up to 256 bits of key material. So cryptography has a really long history. Currently, we are in a state where we have a reasonably stable encryption standard in AES. But the history of cryptography shows that with every set of encryption, eventually people find a way to crack it. Okay, so that was a brief history of cryptography. Now what I want to do is let's go over and talk about AES, triple DES and DES in themselves because they are some really key cryptographic moments in history because there are some really key historic moments in the history of cryptography. Now we're going to talk about the different types of cryptographic ciphers and primarily we're going to be talking about DES, triple DES and AES. Now, DES is the digital encryption standard. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s and originally it was cryptographic cipher named Lucifer. And after some modifications, IBM proposed it as the digital encryption standard and it was selected by the digital encryption standard ever since then it's been known as DES. Now, one thing that caused a little bit of controversy was during the process of selection, NSA requested some changes and it hasn't been particularly clear what changes were requested by the NSA. There has been some speculation that wondered if the NSA was requesting a backdoor into this digital encryption standard, which would allow them to look at encrypted messages in the clear. So basically, it would always give the NSA the ability to decrypt DES encrypted messages. It remained the encryption standard for the next couple of decades or so. So what is DES and how does it work? Basically, it uses 56 bit keys rather than a stream cipher. It's a block cipher and it uses 64 bit blocks. And in 1998, DES was effectively broken. When a DES encrypted message was cracked in three days, a year later, a network of 10,000 systems around the world cracked the DES encrypted message in less than a day. And it's just gotten worse since then with modern computing power being what it is. Since DES was actually created, we already had come to the realization that we needed something else. So along came triple DES. Now triple DES isn't three times the strength of DES necessarily. It applies DES just three times. And what I mean by that is what we do is we take a plain text message, then let's call that P and we're going to use a key called K1 and we're going to use that key to encrypt the message and use a key that will we will call K1 and we're going to use that to encrypt the message. And that's going to result in the ciphertext and we'll call the C1. So C1, the output of the first round of encryption, we're going to apply a second key and we'll call that K2 with that second key. And we're going to go through a decryption process on C1. Since it's the wrong key, we are not going to get plain text out on the other end. What we are going to get is another round of ciphertext and we will call this C2. What we do with C2, we are going to apply a third key and we will call this K3 and we're going to encrypt ciphertext C2 and that's going to result in another round of ciphertext and we will call that C3. So we have three different keys applied in two different ways. So with key one and key three, we do a round of encryption and with key two, we do a round of decryption. So it's an encrypt, decrypt, encrypt process with separate keys while that doesn't really yield a full 168 bit key size. The three rounds of encryption yields an effective key size of 168 bits because you have to find 356 bit keys. So speaking of that technical detail for triple DES, we're still using the DES block cipher with 56 bit keys. But since we've got three different keys, we get an effective length of around 168 bits. Triple DES was really just a stopgap measure. We knew that if DES could be broken, triple DES could surely be broken with just some more time, I guess. And so the NIST was trying to request a standard that was in 1999 and in 2001, NIST published an algorithm that was called AES. So this algorithm that was originally called Raindoll was published by NIST as the advanced encryption standard. Some technical specifications about AES. 
is that the original Rindall algorithm specified variable block sizes and key lengths. And as long as those block sizes and key lengths were multiples of 32 bits, so 32, 64, 96, and so on, you could use those block sizes and key lengths. When AES was published, AES specified a fixed 128-bit block size and key length of 128, 192, and 256 AES with three different key lengths, but one block size. And that's a little bit of detail about DES, triple DES, and AES. So when AES was published, AES specified a fixed 128-bit block size and a key length of 128, 192, and 256 bits. So we've got with AES three different key lengths, but one block size. And that was a little bit of detail about DES, triple DES, and AES. We'll use some of these in doing some hands-on work in the subsequent part of this video. Okay, so now that I've given you a brief history of how we have reached to the encryption standards that we are following today, that is the advanced encryption standard, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about DES, triple DES, and AES. So DES is a digital encryption standard. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s. And originally, it was a cryptographic cipher named Lucifer. And after some modifications, IBM proposed it as the digital encryption standard. It was selected to be the digital encryption standard. And ever since then, it's been known as DES or DES. One thing that caused a little bit of controversy was during the process of selection, the NSA requested some changes. And it hasn't been particularly clear what changes were requested by the NSA. There has been some sort of speculation that wondered if the NSA was requesting a backdoor into this digital encryption standard, which would allow them to look at encrypted messages in the clear. So basically, it would always give the NSA the ability to decrypt this encrypted messages. It remained the encryption standard for the next couple of decades or so. And what is this and how does it work? Now, DES remained the digital standard for encryption for the next couple of decades. So what does it do and how does it work? So basically, it uses a 56-bit key rather than a stream cipher. It's a block cipher and it uses 64-bit blocks. And in 1998, if you know, DES was effectively broken when a DES encrypted message was cracked in three days. And then a year later, a network of 10,000 systems around the world cracked a DES encrypted message in less than a day. And it's just gotten worse since then with modern computing being what it is today. Now, since DES was created and broken, we knew we needed something. And what came in between advanced encryption standards and DES is triple DES. Now, triple DES isn't three times the strength of DES necessarily. It's really DES applied three times. And what I mean by that is we take a plain text message, then let's call that P, and we're going to use a key called K1. And we're going to use that key to encrypt the message. And that's going to result in the ciphertext 1. So we'll call that C1. Now, C1 is the output of the first round of encryption. And we're going to apply a second key called K2. And with that second key, we are going to go through a decryption process on C1. Now, since it's the wrong key, we are not going to get the plain text out of the decryption process. On the other end, we are going to get another round of ciphertext. And we're going to call that C2. Now with C2, we are going to apply a third key and we are going to call that K3 and we're going to encrypt ciphertext C2 and that's going to result in ciphertext C3. So we have three different keys applied in two different ways. So with key one, key three, we do a round of encryption. With key two, we do a round of decryption. So it's basically an encrypt, decrypt, encrypt process with three separate keys. But what it does really is it doesn't really yield a 168-bit key size because in effectiveness, it's basically 56-bit keys that are being used thrice, whether it be three different keys. So in effectiveness, you could say that it's a 168-bit key, but it is not the same strength because people realize that triple DES can be easily broken because if DES is broken, you can do the same thing with three different ways with whatever key that you use. So it just takes longer time to decrypt if you don't know the key and if you are just using a brute force attack you know that triple DES can be broken if DES can be broken. So triple DES was literally a stopgap between DES and AES because people knew that we needed something more than triple DES. And for this, the NIST or the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 2001, they chose AES as the algorithm that is now called the Advanced Encryption Algorithm. So it was originally called the Raindoll Algorithm. And a, the main thing about the Raindoll algorithm and the advanced encryption standard algorithm is that the Raindoll algorithm specifically states in its papers that it has a variable block size and a variable key size as long as they are in multiples of 32. So 32, 64, 96, like that. 
But what AES does differently is that it gives you one block size that is 128 bits and gives you three different key sizes that is 128, 192, and 256. So with AES, three different key lengths, but one block size. Okay, so that was a little bit more information on AES, DES, and Triple DES. And we are going to be using this information in some subsequent lessons. Okay, now moving on. Okay, so now that we've discussed the different history of cryptography and the more important cryptographic algorithms, let's discuss the different types of cryptography. Now, the first type of cryptography I'm going to talk about is symmetric cryptography. And by symmetric cryptography, I mean that the key is the same for encrypting or decrypting. So I use the same key whether I am encrypting the data or decrypting the data. One of the things about symmetric key cryptography is that they use a shorter key length than for asymmetric cryptography, which I'll get into a couple of minutes. It's also faster than asymmetric, and you can use algorithms like DES or AES, as those are both symmetric key cryptography algorithms, and you can use a utility like AES script. Uh, let me just demonstrate how symmetric key cryptography works. So for this, we can use a tool called AES script. So in AES script is actually available for Linux and Windows and Mac, all the systems. So I'm using it on the Windows one and I'm using the console version. So first of all, I have a text file called text.txt. So let me just show that to you. So we, as you guys can see, yeah, I have this thing called text.txt. Now to do text.txt, all I, let me just show what text.txt contains. So as you guys can see, it has a sentence called the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. So that's the sentence that has all the alphabets in the English language rather. So now we are going to try and encrypt it. So we can use something like AES or DES because both of them are symmetric key ciphers, symmetric key algorithms rather. So we are using AES in this case. So what we're going to do is say AES script. We're going to encrypt it and we're going to use the password of, let's say, um, Pokemon. So we're going to call it Pokemon and we're going to do text.txt. We're going to encrypt that file. So now we have encrypted that file. Now let's go see. We must be having a new file. So this is called text.txt.aes. So that is our encrypted file. And this is what we would generally send over the network if we are sending it to anybody. So let's assume the, uh, the person who's received it also knows our encryption algorithm. I mean encryption algorithm and the key that goes along with it. So let's try to decrypt it now. Now before I decrypt it, let me just show you what an encrypted message looks like. So this is what the ciphertext looks like. Type AES, no, no text dot txt dot AES. So yeah, as you guys can see, the Windows console can't really read everything, but if I were to go here, if I were to just go into the file and just error with notepad plus plus, you'll see that it's a bunch of crap. You really can't make out anything. What is being made here? We can't really decipher much. So that's the point of using encryption. Now, if you were to decrypt it, all you have to do is AES script. Uh, we're trying to decrypt. We're trying to give the password is going to be, what was the password? Pokemon. Okay, so, and we're going to try and decrypt text.txt.aes. Let's DIR that again. Okay, so that just decrypts our message for us. So this is how you would use AES script for encryption and decryption. So that just decrypts it. And that's how you would use symmetric key encryption to encrypt a file for this example. Symmetric key uses the either a stream cipher or a block cipher. And the differences between stream or block ciphers is that block takes a block of bits at a time and it's a fixed length. So for example, 64 bits, if I were to use a block cipher with 64 bits, I would need to take in 64 bits before I could start encrypting. Now, if I didn't have 64 bits to encrypt, I would have to fill it with padding in order to get up to 64 bits a stream cipher. On the other hand, it will encrypt a bit at a time, so it doesn't matter how many bits you've got. You don't need to have some multiple of the block length in order to encrypt without padding. And another type of cryptography is asymmetric. Now, asymmetric, as you would expect, uses two different keys, and that's where we have public key and private key. Asymmetric key cryptography uses a longer key length and it also has more computation and the encryption process is slower with a symmetric key encryption. And the encryption process is slower than with the symmetric key encryption. One of the uses for symmetric key is for signing documents or emails, for example, where I would have the private key sign something and the public key would be used to verify a signature. And another reason for using asymmetric key encryption is to ensure that you got it from who actually sent it. Since you've got two keys, you always know who the other end of the equation is. 
Where with symmetric key, since it's just one key, if you can intercept the key, you can decrypt and also encrypt messages. And so if somebody can figure out the key, you can break into a communication stream using symmetric key encryption. So asymmetric gives you the advantage of ensuring that the other end is who the other end says. And they are since they're the only ones who should have the private key. And in this particular instance, in practice, however, however, hybrid encryption models tend to be used and that's where you would use asymmetric encryption to encrypt asymmetric session keys. So basically you encrypt the message that you are sending using uh, symmetric key encryption. And then you, when you're exchanging the key with somebody else, you use asymmetric key encryption. So this is gonna be a slower process. You probably won't want to use it for smaller files in order to do that. Fortunately, the file example that I have is a smaller one. So I'm gonna try and generate a key right now. So for this, we have to head over to our Ubuntu system. So let's see, let me show you how public key encryption actually works. And we are gonna first create a key. So let me just clear this out for you. So first of all, let's create a file and let's call that text.txt. Now, if you see, we are gonna edit text.txt to have some file. So we'll have some text in it. So there seems to be a warning with the GTK. I'll just use echo instead. So now let's see if that is in our file. Okay, so let me just show you how asymmetric key encryption or public key cryptography works. So first of all, we need a text file. So let me see, do we have a text file? So there seems to be a text.txt. So let's see what this text.txt says. So it says that this is a random text file. Now, what we want to do is we want to create a public key first. So I'm going to use OpenSSL for doing this. So we go OpenSSL and we are going to use it with RSA. So we're trying to generate a key. So gen RSA and we're going to use des3 to use this and we're going to output it into a file called private.key. So we are also going to be using a 4096 bit. So this is going to be our private key. So this will create a private key using RSA algorithm. So let it work its way out. So first of all, it's asking me for a passphrase now. So since you can protect your keys with a passphrase, so I'm just going to use my name. Okay, so now we see if we ls and we have a private dot key, I guess. Yep. So we have this private dot key. Now we're using this private key, we are going to generate a public key. So for this, I'm again going to be using OpenSSL. And OpenSSL is a Unix based, so you will need a Unix system. So you go RSA UTL, that's RSA utility. And what we want to do is encrypt. And we want the public key in, in key. And we want to use the public key that we just generated. I'm sorry, guys. So we are going to be using RSA. So first of all, we need to generate a public key. So for that, we use the private key. So we will give the private key as an argument after the in flag. So private dot key, and we are trying to get out a public key. So pub out, and we are going to call it public dot key. Okay, so there seems to be. Okay, uh, I messed it up a little. Uh, I forgot to give the output. So you go out, and then you use public dot key. So it's asking me for a passphrase. And now it's writing the RSA key. And since the password was correct, we have a public key too. So if you see, now we have a public key and a private key. So we are going to encrypt our file using the public key. So we go open SSL and we go RSA UTL and we go encrypt and we can do pub in. So we are going to use the public key and we want to put the text.txt as the file to be encrypted. So text.txt. And what we want to output is an encrypted file. So encrypted.txt. Okay. I call it open SLL. I need to go and edit that out now. Yeah, so that makes it a correct command. And now we have an encrypted file. So let's see. LS and yep, encrypted.txt. So if you just cut that out, so we see it's a bunch of garbage and we really can't read it unless we decrypt it. So for decrypting the key, all we have to do is again, use OpenSSL. Let's clear this out first. So OpenSSL, 
and we are going to be using the RSA utility again. So RSA UTL, we're going to decrypt this time. So we go with the decrypt flag and then we are going to be giving the in key and that is going to be the private key. And what we want to decrypt is encrypted.txt. And what we want to output it is as, let's say, plain text.txt. So it's going to ask me for my passphrase, which is my name. And I've entered the passphrase. And now we have a plain text.txt. Now, if we are to go in ls, we see that we have a plain text.txt out here, just with like info.txt. Now let me just cat that out. So plain text.txt. So this is a random text file. And if you go up, we see that it was a bunch of garbage. And before that, it was a random text file. Now you can also run this command called diff plain text.txt text.txt. So this will give you a difference in the text strings. So it's zero, so it gives you that's the difference. So both the files are the same, and that's how public key cryptography works and how symmetric key cryptography works. Okay, now moving ahead of cryptography, let's talk about certificates. Okay, so now that we're done with cryptography, let's talk about digital certificates. So what is a digital certificate? Well, a digital certificate is an electronic password that allows a person organization to exchange data securely over the internet using public key infrastructure. So digital certificate is also known as a public key certificate or an identity certificate. Now, digital certificates are a means by which consumers and businesses can utilize the security application of public key infrastructure. Public key infrastructure comprises of the technology to enable and uh, secure e-commerce and internet based communication. So what kind of security does a certificate provide? So firstly, it provides identification and authentication. The person or entities with whom we are communicating are really who they say they are. So that is proved by certificates. So then we have confidentiality. The information within the message or transaction is kept confidential. It may only be read and understood by the intended sender. Then there's integrity, there's non-repudiation. The sender cannot deny sending the message or transaction in the receiver. We'll get to non-repudiation and I'll explain how non-repudiation comes into digital certificates. So digital certificates are actually issued by authorities who are business who make it their business to actually certify, certify people and their organization with digital certificates. Now you can see these on Google Chrome. Now let me just open Chrome for you guys and you can see it out here. You can see certificates and you can go into the issuer statements and you can go into all sorts of stuff. So you can see it's issued by Encrypt Authority X3. So that's an issuing authority for digital certificates. Now that was all about the theory of certificates. Let's go and see how you can create one. So to create a digital certificate, we are going to be using the open SSL tool again. So first of all, let me show you how to create a certificate. So we are going to be using the open SSL tool for that. So first of all, let me clear the screen out. So in this case, I'm going to generate a certificate authority certificate. So I'm doing an RSA key here to use inside the certificate. So first of all, I need to generate a private key. So to do that, as I had just showed you guys, we can use the open SSL tool. Uh, you go open SSL and gen RSA and we're going to use test three. Then we're going to out it and let's call it ca.key and we're going to use 4096 bits. So I'm doing an RSA key here to use inside the certificate. So I'm generating a private key and the private key is used as a part of the certificate. And there's a public key associated with the certificate. So you've got public and private key and data gets encrypted with the public key and then gets decrypted with the private key. So they are mathematically linked that the public and private key because you need one for the end of the communication the, and the other for the other end of the communication. And they have to be linked so that the data that gets encrypted with one key gets to be decrypted with other key. So this is asking for a passphrase. And so I'm going to be giving my name as a passphrase. So that has generated the key for us. So now I'm going to generate the certificate itself. So I'm going to be using the open SSL utility. So first of all, you say open SSL and you say request. So it'll be a new request and it's going to be an X509 request. It's going to be valid for 365 days. And let's see, the key is going to be CA.key. And we're going to output it into CA or let's call it edureka.crt. So this is a certificate that I'm producing in the name of the company that I'm working for. So that is edureka. 
so it says it's unable to load the private key. Let me just see, is the private key existing? Uh, I had a previous private key, so let me just remove that. Does it have a CA dot key? Seems like I put the name differently. So let me just try that again. Open SSL, then we do request. So we're requesting a new certificate. And it's gonna be X509. And it's gonna be there for 365 days. And key is CA dot key. Apparently that's for a call out here. So and it's gonna be out into edureka.crt. Let's see if that works. So let's enter the passphrase. So it's my name. So now it's gonna ask me a bunch of information that's gonna be inside the certificate. So let's say it's asking the country name. Again, so let's put in the state. Okay, so IN, uh, state province name, some state. So Bangalore, uh, locality, let's say Whitefield. Organization name is edureka. Unit name, brain force, common name, let's leave that out. Email address, let's leave that out too. And we have our certificate. So if you go and list out your files, you'll see that there is a certificate called edureka.crt out here, which is highlighted. Okay, so now if you want to view this file, you could always use the open SSL. You can always use the open SSL uh, utility. So you say you want to read an XO59 request and you want it in text. And what you want to see is edureka.crt. Okay, so that is the certificate. So you see that it has all the signature, it has signature algorithm, it has all the information about the certificate. And it says signature issuer is CIN in state Bangalore in location Whitefield. I direct our brain force validity. It has all sorts of information. So that was all about digital certificates, how who issues digital certificates, where are they useful? So this is basically non-repudiation. So if nobody can say it with this certificate, like if this certificate is included in some sort of a website and that website tends to be supposed malicious and there's a complaint. Now the website can't go to a court of law and say they didn't know about this because the certificate that was included had their private key and the private key was only supposed to be known to the company. So that is non-repudiation. You just can't deny that you didn't do it. Okay, so that was all about certificates. Now moving on. Okay, so moving on, we are gonna be talking about cryptographic hashing. Now, while the word cryptographic is in the term, cryptographic hashing, and uh, it does lead you to believe that there is encryption involved. There is no encryption involved in a cryptographic hash. There is a significant difference between hashing and any sort of encryption, and that is primarily that encryption is a two-way process. When I encrypt a piece of data or a file or anything else, what I'm doing is putting it into a state where I expect it to be able to get it back, out again, in other words, when I encrypt a file, I expect it to be able to decrypt the file and get the original contents. Hashing is a one-way function on the other hand. Once I've hashed a piece of data or a file, there is no expectation and ability to get the original piece of data back. Hashing generates a fixed length value and different types of hashing will generate different length values. For example, MD5 will generate a different length value than SHA-1. And they're both hashing algorithms, but they generate different length values and the resulting value from a hash function should be in no relation at all to the original piece of data. As a matter of fact, if two inputs generate the same hash value, it's called a collision. And if you can generate collisions, you may be able to get a point where you can generate a piece of data that are going to generate the same hash values, and that leads you to the potential ability to break the particular hashing algorithm that you're using. So what we can use hash is for, well, one thing we can use hash is for file integrity. We can run a hash on a file and get a value back and later we can check that the value to make sure if it's the same. If it's the same, I can be sure that the same file was hashed in both instances. So let me just show you an example of what I just said that if we hash a file, we'll get the same hash every time. So remember the certificate that we just created? Let me just log in again. So we are gonna hash this uh, certificate and it will create a certain hash and we are gonna see that every time we hash it, we are getting the same hash. So we can use this command called md5sum and we can do edureka.crt. So this is the hash produced after you've hashed edureka.crt. So if I do an md5 again, so md5 is a hashing algorithm that you should know of. 
So edureca.crt, and it will produce very similar hash. Let's see if SHA-1 works like this. So SHA-1 edureca.crt. Okay, SHA-1 is SHA, the SHA from the SHA utils package. Okay, so I proved my point that with MD5, which is a cryptographic hashing algorithm, we are getting the same hash back. So if you are able to produce the same hash, that means you have broken the algorithm in itself. So if you run MD5 on Linux, you can get a version of MD5 and MD5 summation program on Windows and Mac OS, where with the utility MD5, which does the same thing. So I just showed you the file and I hashed it. And another reason we use hashing is we are storing passwords. So Passwords are stored after hashing. We hash the passwords and the reason for hashing passwords is so you're not storing the password in clear text, which would be easily seen even if you got it protected with permissions. If I hash the password every time I hash that password, I'm going to get the same value back from the same algorithm. So what I do is store the hash in some sort of password database. Since it's a one way function, you can't get the password back directly from the hash. Now, what you can do with most password cracking programs, do some variation of this, and you just generate hashes against a list of words, and you'll get a hash value. That matches the one in the password. Once you get the hash that matches the one in the password, you know what password is there and here, and we come back to the idea of collisions. If I can take two different strings of characters and get the same values back, then it's easier to crack the password because I may not necessarily get the password, but if the hash that I get back from a particular string of data is the same, as that I get from the original password, then it doesn't matter whether I know the password because the string of data that I put in is going to generate the same hash value that you're going to compare when you log in. And this hash value will just give you that it's valid and you'll be able to log in. So suppose the password that you chose while making your account is dog and the dog word produces this hash value. And if I were to like hash cat with the same algorithm, and if the algorithm was prone to collisions, it might produce the same hash value as dog. So with the password cat, I could open up your password. I mean, I could open up your account. So that was all about hashing and hashing algorithms. Let's move on now. Okay, so in this part of the video, we are gonna go over SSL and TLS. Now SSL and TLS are ways of doing encryption and they were developed in order to do encryption between websites, web servers and clients or browsers. SSL was originally developed by a company called Netscape. And if you don't remember, Netscape eventually spun off their source code and became Mozilla Project, where we get Firefox from. So back in 1995, Netscape released version 2 of SSL, and there was a version 1, but nothing was ever done with it. So we got to version 2 of SSL, and that was used for encryption of web transmission between the server and the browser to do a whole number of flaws between the server and the browser. Now, SSL version 2 had a whole number of flaws, and SSL 2 has the type of flaws that can lead to decryption of messages without actually having the correct keys and not being the right endpoints. And so Netscape released SSL version 3 in 1996. And so we get SSL 3.0, which is better than 2.0, but it still had some issues. And so in 1999, we ended up with TLS. Now, SSL is secure socket layer and TLS is transport layer security. They both accomplish the same sort of thing and they're designed for primarily doing encryption between web server and web browsers because we want to be able to encrypt the type of traffic. So let me show you what kind of traffic looks like. So first of all, let me open Wireshark. And out here, I already have a TLS a scan ready for you guys that you can see we have all sorts of TLS data. So you can see that here's my source and it's 1.32 and destination is 7612.4059.46 doing a client key exchange and the change cipher spec and an encrypted handshake message, and then we start getting application data. So there are some other steps involved here, and you're not seeing all of it with this particular Wireshark capture, because again, you know we get fragmented packets, and at some point it starts getting encrypted. And you can't see it anyways, because Wireshark without having the key can't decrypt those messages. But what ends up happening is the client sends a hello, and the server responds with a hello, and they end up exchanging information as a part of that. Now, including version numbers supported and you get random number and the client's going to send out a number of cipher suits that may want to support an order and it can support the server and it's going to pick from those suite of ciphers. Now, then we start doing the key exchange and then do the change cipher spec and from the client and server and eventually the server just sends a finished message. And at the point, we've got this encrypted communication going on, but there's this handshake that goes on between the two systems. And there's a number of different types of handshakes depending on the type of endpoints that you've got. But that's the type of communication that goes on between servers and the client one. Important thing about using SSL and TLS is, as I mentioned, 
some of the earlier versions had vulnerabilities in them and you want to make sure that the servers aren't actually running those. So you want to run some scans to figure out the type of calls and ciphers that different systems use. So for this, we can use something called SSL scan. So this is available for Unix. I'm not really sure uh, if there is something that is similar for Windows or Mac, but on a Unix based system that is Linux, we can use SSL scan. So let me just show you how to use that. Clear this part out. So we, what we can do is run SSL scan again, suppose www.edureca.co. So I'm gonna do an SSL scan here against the website and you can see it's going out and probing all the different types of ciphers that we know on this system start with SSL v3 and are going to TLS version one. And we could force SSL scan to try to do an SSL v2 if I scroll back up. Here I get the surface ciphers, which is SSL version three, it's using RSA and it's using RSA for the asymmetric. Now, in order to do the key exchange and once we get the session key up, we're going to do use AES-256 and then we're going to use the secure hash algorithm to do the message authentication or the MAC. It's something called the HMAC for the hashed message authentication code. And what it does is simply hashes the MAC address that you would check one side against the other to make sure that the message hasn't been fiddled with in transmission. You can see here all the different types of cipher suits that are available. Here's TLS running RC4 at 40 bits using MD5. So that would be a pretty vulnerable type of communication to use. And between the server and the client, the 40 bit cipher using RC4 is a low strength cipher. And we would definitely recommend that clients remove those from the supported ciphers that they have on their server. All that configuration would be done at the web server as well as when you generated your key and your certificates. Normally certificates would be handled by a certificate authority. Now you can also self sign certificates and have those installed in your web server in order to do communications with your clients. That the challenge with that is browsers today warn when they see a certificate against a certificate authority that is entrusted of it and it doesn't have any certificate authority at all. So you'll get a warning in your browser indicating there may be a problem with your certificate if your clients are savvy enough. And if the users are savvy enough, you may be able to make use of these self signed self signed certificates and save yourself some money. But generally, it's not recommended simply because clients are starting to get these bad certificates. And when they run across one, that's really a problem, a real rogue certificate. They're going to ignore the certificate message in their browser and just go to these sites that could have malicious purposes in mind and may end up compromising the clients or your customers or users. So that's SSL and TLS and how they work and negotiate between servers and endpoints. OK, so now that we've talked about TLS and SSL, let's talk about disk encryption. Now, disk encryption is actually something that was not really difficult to do, but sort of out of the reach of normal desktop computers for a really long time. Although there have long been ways to do encryption of files and to a lesser degree, maybe entire disks. As we get faster processors, certainly encrypting the entire disks and being able to encrypt and decrypt on the fly without affecting performance is something that certainly comes with within reach. And it's a feature that shows up in most modern operating systems to one degree or another. Now these days we are going to look at a couple of ways here of doing disk encryption. I'm going to tell you about one of them first and it's not the one I can show. I can't really show the other one either. So with Microsoft, their Windows system have this program called BitLocker. Now BitLocker requires either Windows Ultimate or Windows Enterprise. I don't happen to have either version, so I can't really show it to you, but I can tell you that BitLocker has ability to do entire disk encryption and they use AES for the encryption cipher. And the thing about BitLocker is that they use a feature that comes with most modern systems, particularly laptops. They'll have a chip in them that's called the Trusted Platform Module or TPM. The TPM chip is part, what it does is it stores the keys that allows the operating system to be able to access the disk through this encryption and decryption process. And they use a pretty strong encryption cipher, which is AES, but you have to have one of the couple of different versions of Windows in order to be able to use BitLocker. And it's one of those things you would normally run in an enterprise. And so that's why they include it in on its enterprise version. Now on the Mac OS side, they have this thing called File Vault and you will see in the system preferences on the security and privacy, if you go to File Vault, you can turn on File Vault. Now, I, if you have the little button that there says turn on file wall, then uh, you can turn on the file wall and it would ask you about setting up keys and it works similar to Windows BitLocker. Now, PGP happens to have the ability to do disk encryption and you can see that in the case of this, you burn the system. They've got a package called GDE Crypt, which is a GUI that allows you to map and mount a created encrypted volume. So I could run GDE Crypt and it would help me set up the process of encrypting the volumes that I've got on my system. 
Now, this transcription is a really good idea because when you are working with clients, the data is normally very sensitive. So as I mentioned, you can always use things like BitLocker and Windows Vault or other such softwares for disk encryption. So what I mentioned before is now not only possible, it's very much a reality with current operating systems. Now let's talk about scanning. Now scanning refers to the use of computer networks to gather information regarding computer systems, and network scanning is mainly used for security assessment, system maintenance, and also for performing attacks by hackers. Now the purpose of network scanning is as follows. It allows you to recognize available UDP and TCP network services running on a targeted host. It allows you to recognize filtering systems between the users and the targeted host. It allows you to determine the operating systems in use by assessing the IP responses. Then it also allows you to evaluate the target host TCP sequence numbers and predictability to determine the sequence prediction attacks and the TCP spoofing. Now network scanning consists of network port scanning as well as vulnerability scanning. Network port scanning refers to the method of sending data packets via the network to a computer system specified service port. This is to identify the available network services on that particular system. This procedure is effective for troubleshooting systems issues or for tightening the system security. Vulnerability scanning is a method used to discover known vulnerabilities of computing systems available on a network. It helps to detect a specific weak spot in an application software or the operating system, which could be used to crash the system or compromise it for undesired purposes. Now, network port scanning as well as vulnerability scanning is an information gathering technique, but when carried out by anonymous individuals, they are viewed as a prelude to an attack. Network scanning processes like port scans and ping swipes and return details about which IP address map to active live hosts and the type of service they provide. Another network scanning method known as inverse mapping gathers details about IP addresses that do not map to live hosts, which helps an attacker to focus on feasible addresses. Network scanning is one of the three important methods used by an attacker to gather information during the footprint stage, and the attacker makes a profile of the target organization. This includes data such as organization's domain name systems and email servers in addition to its IP address range. And during the scanning stage, the attacker discovers details about the specified IP addresses that could be accessed online, their system architecture, their operating systems and services running on every computer. Now, during the enumeration stage, the attacker collects data, including routing tables, network user, and group names, simple network management protocol data, and so on. So now let's talk about intrusion detection evasion. So before we get into IDS evasion, let's talk about what exactly is an IDS. Now, an intrusion detection system, or IDS, is a system that monitors network traffic for suspicious activity and issues alerts when such activity is discovered. While anomaly detection and reporting is primary function, some intrusion detection systems are capable of taking actions when malicious activity or anomalous traffic is detected, including blocking traffic sent from suspicious IP addresses. Although intrusion detection systems monitor network for potentially malicious activity, they are also prone to false alarms or false positives. Consequently, organizations need to fine tune their IDS product when they first install them. That means properly configuring their intrusion detection system to recognize what normal traffic on their network looks like compared to potentially malicious activity. An intrusion prevention system also monitors network packets for potentially damaging network traffic, but where an intrusion detection system responds to potentially malicious traffic by logging the traffic and issuing warning notification, intrusion prevention systems respond to such traffic by rejecting the potentially malicious packets. So there are different types of intrusion detection systems. So intrusion detection systems come in different flavors and detect suspicious activities using different methods. So kind of intrusion detection is a network intrusion detection system. So that is NIDS is a deployed at a strategic point or points within the network where it can monitor inbound and outbound traffic to and from all the devices on the network. Then there is host intrusion detection system that is HIDS which runs on all computers or devices in the network with direct access to both the internet and the enterprise internal network. HIDS have an advantage over NIDS in that they have, may be able to detect anomalous network packets that originate from inside the organizations or malicious traffic that NIDS has failed to detect. HIDS may also be able to identify malicious traffic that originates from the host itself as when the host has been infected with malware and is attempting to spread to other systems. Signature-based intrusion detection system monitors all packets traversing the network and compares them against a database of signatures or attributes of known malicious threats, much like antivirus softwares. So now let's talk about into IDS evasion. Okay, so now let's talk about IDS evasion. Now IDS is an intrusion detection system as we just spoke about and is there to detect exactly the types of activities that we are engaged in sometimes. And sometimes you may be called in to work on a target 
where your activities are known and should be known by the operators or the operations people involved in monitoring and managing the network. And the idea being not only do they want to assess the technical controls that are in place, but they also want to assess the operational procedures and ensure that the systems and processes are working the way that they are supposed to be working. Now, when you are engaged with a target that you are in full cooperation with, you don't need to do these types of evasion tactics. All these techniques may be actually avoided, but if you're asked to perform an assessment or a penetration on a target where they are not supposed to see your activities, then you need to know some different techniques to evade detection from an IDS. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things that you can do. So one thing that you can do is manipulate packets to look a particular way. Now for this, there is a tool called Packet. So Packet is a really good way to actually manipulate traffic and by actually manipulating the contents of a packet, like you can specify the destination and source. So it's a really useful tool to set up packets, look a particular way. One thing it can do is allow you to spoof IP addresses. So I could set a source IP address here that was something completely different from mine. Now if I'm using TCP or UDP, I'm not going to see the response back. And in this case, TCP, I'm not even going to get the three-way connection made because the responses are going to go back to the source IP. But what you can do is, in addition to spoofing, you can set up particular ways that a packet may look, like changing the type of service or by changing the fragmentation offset or by different flag settings that may allow you through an IDS without maybe getting flagged. And it may also allow you through a firewall. Now, it's a slim possibility, but it's a possibility. Now, another thing you can do is use Packet to generate a lot of really bogus data. And what you might do is hide in the noise generated by Packet. So you can could create some really bogus packets that are sure set of IDS alarms, and then you can run some legitimate scans underneath and hopefully be able to get some responses different from mine. Now, if I'm using TCP or UDP, I'm not going to see the response back. And in this case, TCP, I'm not even going to get the three-way connection made because the responses are going to go back to the source IP. But what you can do is, in addition to spoofing, you can set up particular ways that a packet may look, like changing the type of service or by changing the fragmentation offset or by different flag settings that may allow you through an IDS without maybe getting flagged. And it may also allow you through a firewall. Now, it's a slim possibility, but it's a possibility. Now, another thing you can do is use Packet to generate a lot of really bogus data. And what you might do is hide in the noise generated by Packet. So you can could create some really bogus packets that are sure set of IDS alarms, and then you can run some legitimate scans underneath and hopefully be able to get some responses. Kali Linux is the industry's leading Linux distribution in penetration testing and ethical hacking. It offers tons and tons of hacking and penetration tools and different kind of softwares by default. It is widely recognized in all parts of the world, even among window users who may not even know what Linux is. Well, to be precise, Kali Linux was developed by Offensive Security as the rewrite of Backtrack. Backtrack, just like Kali Linux, was a Linux distribution that focused on security. It was used for digital forensics and penetration testing purpose. But the question here is, why should you choose Kali Linux when you have other choices like Parrot Security Operating System, Backbox, Black Arc, and many more out there? Let me list out a few reasons as to why Kali Linux is the best choice. First and foremost, it offers more than 600 penetration testing tools from different kinds of security fields and forensics. Secondly, Kali Linux is customizable. So if you're not comfortable with current Kali Linux tools or features or graphical user interface, you can customize Kali Linux the way you want. It is built on a secure platform. The Kali Linux team is actually made up of small group of individuals. Those are the only ones who can commit packages and interact with repositories, all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. So Kali Linux is definitely a secure platform. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, Kali includes multilingual support. This way, more users can operate in the native language and locate the tools that they need for the job that they are doing on Kali Linux. And lastly, Kali Linux, just like Backtrack, is completely free of charge. On top of all these benefits, Kali Linux offers different installation options. One way of installing Kali Linux is by making a Kali bootable USB drive. This is the fastest way of installing Kali Linux and the most favorable as well. We will discuss why in a while. You can also install Kali Linux using hard disk. Installing Kali Linux on your computer using a hard disk is a very easy process, but you should make sure that your computer has compatible hardware. You can also install Kali Linux alongside your operating system. It could be Windows or Mac. 
but you should exercise caution during setup process because it might mess up with your default bio settings. Lastly, you can use different kind of virtualization software such as VMware or VirtualBox to install Kali Linux on your preferred operating system. Well, apart from all this, you can also set up Kali Linux on advanced risk machines or ARM like Raspberry Pi, Trim Slice, Cube Truck, and many more. So there you go, guys. Now you know what Kali Linux is and why it is a leading Linux distro for ethical hacking and penetration testing. In today's session, we will explore different ways to install Kali Linux. Let's get started then. Earlier, I said that the fastest method for setting up Kali Linux is to run it live from a USB drive. But why? First of all, it's non destructive. It makes no changes to the host system's hard drive or the operating system that it is installed on. So once you remove USB, your operating system will return to its original state. Secondly, it's portable. You can carry Kali Linux in your pocket and can run it whenever you want, just in few minutes. It's customizable. You can create your own Kali Linux ISO image and put it into USB drive using a simple procedure, which we will discuss later. And lastly, it's potentially persistent. You can configure your Kali Linux live USB drive to have persistent storage so that the data you can collect is saved and you can use it across different reboots. Now let's see how to create a bootable Kali USB drive on Windows. Guys, actually the process is very simple. It's just a three step process. First of all, you need to plug your USB drive into an available USB port on your Windows PC. Next, you need to note down the destination drive it uses once it mounts. For example, it could be F drive. After that, you will have to download and launch a software called Win32 Disk Imager. On this software, you'll have to choose Kali Linux ISO file that needs to be imaged and verify that the USB drive to be overwritten is the correct one. Lastly, once the imaging is complete, you need to safely eject the USB drive from Windows machine. So like I said, it's very simple, right? Well, I'm not going to show you demo on this one because like I said, it's very easy and I'm sure you guys can pull it off. If you have any doubts, you can post them in the comment section. We'll get back to you. And as for the demo part, we'll be doing four installations here. First of all, we'll see how to install Kali Linux using VMware on Windows operating system. Then we'll see how to install Kali Linux on Mac using VirtualBox. Moving on, we'll see how to install Kali Linux tools on different Linux distributions. I'll be showing how to install it on Ubuntu. Well, the procedure is same for every other Linux distribution, so you can go ahead and use the same procedure for the Linux distribution that you're using. And lastly, we'll see how to install Kali Linux on Windows 10 using Windows subsystem for Linux. So I hope it's clear that what we'll be learning in the session. Let's get started with the first demo. In this demo, we'll see how to launch Kali Linux using VMware. So guys, you can install Kali Linux using any virtualization software. It could be VMware or VirtualBox. In this demo, I'll show you how to install it using VMware. So first of all, obviously, we'll have to install VMware, right? So just type of VMware. And it's the first link that you find. You can go ahead and download VMware Workstation Pro. You have it in the downloads. Here you can download Workstation Player as well, or you can download VMware Workstation Pro. Now, once that is downloaded, you'll have to download a Kali Linux ISO image. For that, you'll have to go for official Kali Linux website. Just type for Kali Linux, and it's the first link. You can see downloads option here. Click on download. And yeah, you can see different download options here. You have Kali Linux Lite for 64 bit as well as 32 bit. And then there is Kali Linux 64 bit and 32. And you have separate images for VMware and VirtualBox as well. Suppose you want to skip the entire lengthy procedure of installing it and you want to just use the image, then you can go ahead and use this Kali Linux 64 bit for VMware or VirtualBox. Same goes for the 32 bit as well. But since we are focusing on installing right now, let's just go ahead and download our ISO file and install it from the beginning until last step. I've already downloaded it, so I have a ISO file downloaded on my computer. So all you have to do is just click on the torrent link, it'll be downloaded. Let's open VMware then. So as you can see, I have VMware Workstation Pro installed here. So I already have two about two virtual machine installed on my VMware Workstation. As you can see on the home page, three different options. It says create a new virtual machine or open a virtual machine and connect to remote server. So if you want to create a Kali Linux or any other virtual machine from step one, you can use this create a new virtual machine option. Well, if you have an image of an virtual machine already, and if you want to just use it and avoid installation procedure, 
then you can go ahead and use this open a virtual machine option. Well, just click on this create a new virtual machine and click on next. As you can see here, you have an option which says install a disk image file ISO file you'll have to attach here. So click on browse. Let's see where I've stored my color Linux. As you can see, I already have it here. And there's one file here. Let me click on that and open. So yeah, don't bother about this error. It usually shows that. And then click on next here. So it's asking which operating system will be installed on this virtual machine. I want it to be Linux. So make sure you select Linux 64 bit and click on next. You have an option to name your virtual machine. Let's say Kali Linux. And where do I want to store it? In my documents under virtual machines, Kali Linux. Sure. And click on next. It says it already exists. Let me try this one then. Let's say Kali Linux 1. And next, yeah. So basically, your Kali Linux will need about a 20 GB. Let's assign some 40 GB here. That's the maximum disk size that you can allot. Well, you can allot more than that as well, but minimum it needs about 20 GB. And you have an option which says store virtual disk as a single file or multiple files. Let's just select store virtual disk as a single file to avoid complications and click on next here. So as you can see, you can review your virtual machine settings here. You have an option to make changes to the settings. You can make changes right now or you can do it later as well. Let's just go ahead and make changes now. Click on this customize hardware option here. Well, as for the memory for this virtual machine, it totally depends on what you're using virtual machine for. If you're not using it for heavy works, then you can assign least amount of memory. Let's say I want to assign about 2 GB. There we go. And as for the processors, number of processors one, and the number of core processors, you can choose as many as you want. Let's say two. This will increase the performance of your virtual machine. So and again, it totally depends on whatever you want to choose. And yeah, we have already attached the image. Network adapter, you can set for NAT. USB controller and sound card, you can retain the default settings. And as for the display, click on accelerated 3D graphics since what Cal Linux has a graphical user interface. And it says 768 MB is the recommended amount of memory that you can use for graphics. So let's go ahead and select that and click on close. Well, you can actually make all the settings after installing Kali Linux as well. No problem there. Once you've done that, click on finish here. As you can see, my Kali Linux image is ready for installation. You have two options to power up. As you can see, you have this option here. You can click on that to power on this virtual machine or you can go ahead and click on this. Let me click on this. So once you click on that, you should be greeted with this Kali boot screen. As you can see, there are a lot of options here. We did discuss live option earlier, right? So if you don't want any trace of Kali Linux on your operating system, you can go ahead and use live option here. You have live USB persistence mode and live USB encrypted persistence as well. Suppose you want to store some data and save it for a later reboots. You can use live persistent option here. And most of the time people get confused with this install and graphical install. Just don't go ahead and click on install option. Do it only if you're well versed with command line interface. So basically that install option is for command line interface. So you'll be greeted with Kali Linux command line interface. Since if you are doing it, if you're using Kali Linux for the first time, go ahead with graphical install. Select the graphical install and click enter. So as you can see, it will start mounting storage devices. Whole installation process might take about 10 minutes. So it's prompting you to select a language. So select your preferred language, then your country location. Let's say English and click on enter. And it's asking you for the country location. Just give United States and enter. And I want the keyboard to be configured with American English. You can choose any native language. Like I said earlier, it supports multilingual or it supports multiple languages. So go ahead and choose it. But it might complicate the way you use Kali Linux later. So you can always go ahead and stick ahead with English only. Well, it doesn't matter. So as you can see, it's configuring the network. So it will detect the ISO file and load installation component and then prompt you to enter a host name for your system. Well, in this installation, let's just enter Kali and click on enter. You can give the name you want. And next it's asking you for the domain name. Suppose you have a set of virtual machines and if you want to give all of them a domain name, you can assign a domain name as well, but it's optional. Let's not give any domain name here and click on enter. The next thing it does is it will prompt you for the password that you'll have to enter every time you launch your Kali Linux. So just give some password of your choice. And click on continue. 
The best thing about Kali Linux is you can set up date and time as well. You can make it later as well, but you can choose it here. So just click on Eastern or whichever choice you like and click on enter. So the installer will now probe your disk and offers you four different choices. As you can see, it says guided use entire disk. Guided use entire disk can set up LVM, which is logical volume manager. Same thing, which is encrypted and manual. So if you are an expert, if you've already used this color Linux before, you can go ahead and select any of these three options from the bottom. That's LVM or manual or encrypted LVM. Otherwise, you can always go ahead and choose guided use entire disk option here if you're a beginner and click on enter. So this is the disk partition where the, all the data will be stored and click on continue. It's asking if you want to store all files in one partition or if you want to make partitions. So depending on your needs, you can go ahead and choose to keep all your files in single partition, which is default or you have separate partition for one or more of the top level directories. Let's just choose the first option and click on enter. So once you've done that, you'll have one last chance to review our disk configuration. Once you're sure that you've given correct details, click on enter here. It's asking if the changes that you make to Kali Linux should be written to the disk or not. So say yes. So it will start partition and install the virtual machine. It took a while, but as you can see, installation is almost done. It's asking me to configure the package manager. Well, if you select no in this session, you will not be able to install packages from Kali repositories later and click on continue. So suppose if you want to install other repositories or updates later on, you can always go and click on yes. Otherwise, it's always otherwise you can go for no as well. Now it's going to configure the package manager. It'll install package manager and configure it. Then it'll install grub bootloader. And it's asking if you want to install grub bootloader to master boot record. Definitely yes. So select yes and click on continue. So it's asking to select the device manually. You can click this select the device. So yeah guys, we're done here. So you can finally click on continue option to reboot your new Kali installation. So as you can see the entire process took about 10 to 11 minutes. So yeah, let's go ahead and click on continue here. It's going to finish the installation. So guys, as you can see the installation process from the step where we select the language till the last step is same. It's just the medium on which you're installing is different. For example, right now we used VMware. Later on, I'll show you how to use VirtualBox. But once your Kali Linux image is ready to boot, the rest of the installation process is similar to this. So it's finished installing. It's loading the image. So if you have done everything right during the installation process and according to your needs, you land up in this page username. So we've given it this Kali, right? K A L I and password. As you can see, it's showing an error. It says that didn't work. Please try again. This is mostly because if first time when you log in, you should use word root as your default username. But later on, once you have already logged in, you can change the username according to your need. So root and password. You can use the same password which you set during installation process. So as you can see, login is successful. And here I go. My Kali Linux is up and running. So I can start using Kali Linux according to my needs. So once you've done that, you can go ahead and install VMware tools so that you can maximize it full screen and all that stuff. You can also go ahead and change the date and time settings. As you can see here, you can go for the settings option here and do the settings. And you can start using Kali Linux for hacking and penetration testing purposes. So it's as easy as that guys. So please go ahead and try installing it. Well, if you find any errors during installation process, let us know in the comment session. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Now let's move on to our second demo. Now we'll see how to launch Kali Linux on Mac operating system using VirtualBox. In the previous demo, we used VMware and now we'll be using VirtualBox. But actually I'm not using any Mac system here operating system, but I'll show you how to install using VirtualBox. The procedure is very similar. So all you have to do is on your Mac operating system, go ahead and click off for VirtualBox download. So this is the VirtualBox official page. You can go ahead and click on downloads here. As you can see, you have different options here. It says Windows for Windows operating system, OS X host, Linux and Solar host. Since if you're using Windows, then go ahead and select Windows host. But as for Mac, you'll have to select this. It's mostly a .exe file. Once you've done that, you can install VirtualBox. It's just click on next, 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 and it'll work out and provide settings according to your need. I already have installed VirtualBox. The next thing you do is similar as what you've done with VMware. 
go ahead and download official Kali Linux image. Make sure you don't download any duplicate versions of ISO file from other websites. Make sure you download it from original website. If you want to do it from the beginning, go ahead and install ISO file here, torrent, or you can just go ahead and download just the image for v virtual box here for 64 bit and you have option for 32 bit as well. I've already done that. So let me open my virtual box. Yeah, here are this. The procedure for VMware and virtual box is almost same. Just slight difference. Let me maximize the screen for you guys. As you can see, I already have a virtual machine launched up here. I haven't powered it up yet. Anyway, I'll show you how to install new one. Just click on new option here. This is your virtual box home page guys. So click on new here and just give a name. We've already given color Linux earlier, right? For the virtual machine. So let's give it some other name. Let's say capital K L Linux and choose the type of operating system. That's Linux and here is 64 bit minus 64 bit. According to your operating system needs, you can go ahead and choose 32 bit as well. Click on next. And again, like I said earlier, depending on what you're doing on color Linux operating system or virtual machine, you go ahead and assign the memory. Since I'm just showing you how to install, I'm not assigning much memory here. Huh? So let's just retain the default 1024 MB. That's one GB and click on next. And it's asking you have a three options here. You have not to add virtual hard disk, create a virtual hard disk now, and you can go ahead and add a virtual hard disk here. Use an external virtual hard disk. Go ahead and select the second option. Click on create and use virtual box image. Like I said earlier, we downloaded ISO image, right? And it's an ISO file with extension dot ISO. So basically it's nothing but image. So click on next. And I want to the storage on physical hard disk to be assigned dynamically and click on next. So this is the name of the virtual machine which we just gave earlier. It's asking you to choose the path wherever you want to store your virtual machine. Let's say documents and virtual machines. Click on open and save. So that's the path I've set up. And as for the memory, Kali always needs you to assign at least 20 GB. So let's go ahead and give 20 GB. You can always assign more than that and click on create. So this is the one we just created, right? It's ready. Just click on settings before you power up. You'll have to make certain settings. So if you want to change name or type and version, you can always go ahead and do that here. We don't have anything in advance. It's just the folder where your virtual machine will be stored. Go for systems. We won't be using any floppy disk here. So right. So untick it or uncheck it. And yeah, this is memory. If you want to go ahead and change or assign more memory because the performance of your virtual machine is not that great. You can go ahead and do that for the processor. Make sure you enable this extended features. So basically, if you want to increase the performance of your virtual machine, the number of processors you assign should increase. Well, for now, since I'm just showing you how to install, I'm just going to assign one. You have option to increase to say two like that. And as for the display, you can enable 3D acceleration display storage settings. This is the most important one right now. We don't have any image attached here, so click on this empty and click on the CD image that you see here and choose virtual disk and attach the image or the ISO file, torrent file which you just downloaded. Click on open and audio no settings default network. By default you can always set it for NAT since we're using only one virtual machine here. But if you want to use the color Linux with any other virtual machine like Metasploitable 2, you can go ahead and use this host only adapter option here. Because when you use NAT and when you have two virtual machines, both of them will be assigned with same IP address, which will definitely be a problem because both of these virtual machines need to interact, right? So yeah, well, I'm just saying all this for the information. So you can go ahead and click on host only adapter if you're using two virtual machines and you want them to interact. As for now, I'm just retaining it NAT and rest. You can you don't have to make any changes and click on. OK, once you've made all the settings, click on this or you can go ahead and click on start option here. You can light click on it and start. Again, like I said, the installation process from step one is very similar to that we did using VMware. So again, you'll be greeted with Kali boot screen and you have multiple options. Again, I'm not repeating the entire thing here. So go ahead and click on graphical install. And if you're a pro and using command line, you can always go for install option. And if you want to just use it for one time purpose, you can always go for live option here. That's all guys. I'm sure you can catch up from here, right? Because it's almost similar for the ones we did using VMware. If you have any doubt, just go back and take a look at it. Yeah, well, like I said, I showed you on how to use VirtualBox to install Kali Linux on Windows operating system. Well, it's same for the Mac as well. You just have to download your stuff there instead of Windows. 
you have another option with this operating system. You can dual boot your Kali Linux with Windows or Mac. It's not as easy as these installation process because it will involve you setting the BIOS changes that you get to see when you power up your computer initially. So make sure you refer to Kali Linux official documentation and make sure you've done the installation properly so that you won't mess up your default settings. So guys, we are done with two ways of installing Kali Linux, one on Windows and one on Mac. We saw how to install it using VMware as well as VirtualBox. In the third part, we'll see how to install Kali tools on any Linux distribution. It could be Ubuntu, Fedora, Peppermint operating system, or any other version or distribution of Linux. The procedure is actually similar in every Linux distribution. So if you follow up on one Linux distribution, you can go ahead and do it on the Linux distribution of your choice or the one that you're using. One thing you should remember is that Kali Linux is not for the daily Linux purposes. Well, it's only for ethical hacking or web application penetration testing for these purposes. So guys, we'll be using a tool called Catulin. Let me spell it for you guys. It's K-A-T-O-O-L-I-N. So let's just search for that. There we go. It's a script that helps you to install Kali Linux tools on your Linux distribution of your choice. So it's usually the GitHub script. So click on the first link that you find. So for those of you who like to use penetration testing tools provided by Kali Linux development team, you can effectively do that on your preferred Linux distribution using this tool, which is Kotlin or K-A-T-O-O-L-I-N. So as you can see, once you've installed Kotlin properly on your operating system, you should be greeted with this page. I'll show you how to do that. Don't worry about it. So the purpose of asking you to see this page is to take a look at prerequisites. So first thing you need to have a Python of version 2.7 or above installed in your operating system and you need a Linux distribution system. It could be Ubuntu or it could be Fedora or Peppermint, any other Linux distribution. I have Ubuntu here. I'll be using VMware Workstation Pro. It's already open, but let me just go back. All you have to do is search for Ubuntu and click on the first link. So as you can see, there are a lot of options for to install Ubuntu. Just click on this and you'll be able to download a file ISO image. I've already done that. I'm not doing it again. Let's go back to VMware Workstation. As you can see, I already have my Ubuntu operating system installed. Installing Ubuntu is very straightforward. So just take a look at the instructions that you need to know when you're installing Ubuntu. Once you've done the installation, it should look something like this. So let me power up my Ubuntu operating system. So as you can see, once you install, you'll land up on this page and it's asking for the password. You set up this username and password during the installation process, so don't worry about it. Click on enter. So let's say you are a Unix lover, you like using Unix platform, but right now you want to use certain tools for performing application penetration testing and ethical hacking. You just don't need all the tools, you need few tools. In that case, instead of installing Kali Linux on your operating system, Installing only certain Kali Linux tools will be the best option, right? For that, like I said earlier, we'll be using Kotlin. I have a set of four or five commands that you need to use to install Kotlin. First of all, you need to have Git on your operating system. Let me check if I have it or not. Anyway, I have these five or four set of commands which we'll be using. I'm going to attach them in the description below. So if you want, you can use them. As you can see, install Git first command. It says unable to use it because I have to log in as a root user. So let me just, it's asking for the password. Yeah, now I'm a root user. So let me try the command again. That's apt get install git. Yeah, installing git. It's just going to take a few minutes. While this is happening, let's go ahead and explore Kotlin tool. Let me go for Firefox here. Let's search for Kotlin. So it's the first link, guys, like I said earlier. So let me scroll down. As we saw, this should be the home page. And we did take a look at the requirements. So let's just go back and see if it's done. It's still happening. So one thing, guys, make sure you have a Python of version 2.7 or above. Otherwise, the entire thing won't work at all. Yeah, guys, it's done. Now we are done with the first step. We need to install or we need to clone the Kotlin, right? So what you do, like I said, I have a command right here. Just copy this and place it over there. Control C. Let's go back to terminal and let me clear the screen for you guys. Yeah. And paste. 
So basically, I'm cloning it here. And the next command is I'm copying the Python file to this directory and click on enter. It's done. It's just quick process. Now we'll have to change permissions so that we have access to use Kotlin. For that, basically, we are giving execute permission. So chmod plus x. Make sure you take a look at that. Plus x and enter. We are ready, guys. Now our Kotlin is installed. Say lin. So as you can see, it's all ready. But the first thing that you should do is before you upgrade your system, it says please remove all the Kotlin repositories to avoid any kind of problems. So as you can see, it shows you like five options here. First one, it says add Kali repositories and update. Next, view categories. Like I said, Kali Linux has 600 plus tools, right? So you have different tools categorized under different headings. Then you have classic menu indicator. It's nothing here. As you can see, I have a small icon here. If you click on that, it'll just show you different menus. That's all. And if you want to install Kali menu for easy access, you can do that as well. So let me just click one. Under one, it says add color Linux repositories, update, remove, and view all contents. So let's try removing them. Let's try with adding repositories. It says there are certain duplicate signatures removed and all that. So let's just try to remove like they suggested earlier. They've been deleted. Now one. So if you guys want to go ahead and update the repositories, already existing ones, you can go ahead and do that. I'm not doing it now because it's going to take a while. So if you want to go back, just click back. It's as easy as that. Now let's say I want to view categories and install one tool of it. As you can see, there are like number of huge number of categories here. So I have uh, web application penetration tools here. I have password attacks. I have exploitation tools. Well, if you are interested, there's an introduction video of what is Kali Linux by Dureka in the cybersecurity playlist. So go ahead and take a look at that. We have explained like about five to six popular tools in Kali Linux. Anyway, getting back to today's session, let me just say four. As you can see, it lists all the web application tools. So if I want to install all tools, there's an option that's zero. But let's just say I want to install a tool called SQL Map. I'm sure you might have heard of SQL Map. If not, it's OK. It's a tool which you use for checking out vulnerabilities that are present in application database system. So anyway, it asks insert the number of the tool that you want to install. Let's say 27. So as you can see, it's installing. So it's as easy as that, guys. So once you're done installing, I'll get back to you. Any tool, I just showed you how to use, how to install SQL map, which is there in web application tools. You can go ahead and do that for other different types of tools as well. Suppose you want to install all the tools, you can go for zero as in click on zero option. So there you go, guys. I just showed you how to install one tool. So you can go ahead and do that for any kind of tool under any category. So if you just want to go back, click back and go for other types of tools. Let's say eight. There you can see. So whatever different type of exploitation tools you want, you can go ahead and install them. Let me just click back and the back. Sometimes when you try to install all the tools, you might get an error saying that the file doesn't exist or repository doesn't exist. All you have to do is go for one first option here. As you can see here, you have option two, which is update. So update your repositories. Make sure the Kali Linux mirror, which is present for the updation, is the right one. Once you've done that, you won't get any errors. All the tools will be installed properly. So suppose you want to get back from these Kotlin easy, just press Control C. And yeah, as you can see, it says goodbye. So that's as easy as it is to use Kali Linux tools on any kind of Linux distribution. While I've showed you on Ubuntu, the procedure is same on any other Linux distribution, guys. So there we go, guys. We're done with three things. First, we did on Windows using VMware, then on Mac using VirtualBox. And third, I showed you how to install Kali Linux tools on any kind of Linux distribution. And finally, there's one last demo. Here, we'll see how to install Kali Linux on Windows operating system using Windows subsystem for Linux feature. So let me get back to my operating system. We won't be needing VMware workstation anymore. So guys, We'll be using a feature called Windows Subsystem for Linux, which is by default present in all the current versions of Windows 10. This is actually for those who prefer using Kali Linux command line interface. So make sure to listen to me properly. Who we'll use this option only if you are a pro in using command line interface or if you have any experience using command line interface. Otherwise, just go ahead and use VMware or VirtualBox and install Kali Linux graphical user interface option. So yeah, this Windows subsystem for Linux allows you to run Linux distributions as subsystem on your Windows operating system. 
This feature is really a new feature. It exists only in Windows 10. So you need to use latest version of Windows 10 to perform this demo or use this option. And in addition to that, we also have other prerequisites, especially we need to have Git installed or you can go ahead and zip the file, which is Windows subsystem for Linux files normally, but having Git is also a nice thing. Secondly, you need to have Python of version three or above. Make sure you've installed Python and set up the path to check if your Python is installed properly or not. Just say CMD, go for your command prompt and just type for Python version. It should show you version properly. Only then you can be sure that your Python is properly installed. As you can see for me, it's showing 3.6.7, which is definitely above three and it's properly installed and the path is set. The first thing you need to do is enable WSL or Windows subsystem for Linux. Just go for the control panel and there click on programs and turn Windows features on or off. Make sure not to touch any other features. It might mess up your operating system. So scroll down. It's usually at the bottom. By default, it's never enabled. If you're using it for the first time, you need to enable it. So first thing you do is enable it. As you can see here, it says Windows subsystem for Linux. Make sure you enable it. Check mark it and click on OK. Once you have done that, run your command prompt or terminal as an administrator. All you have to do is right click on it and click on run as administrator and yes. Now we'll be enabling base distribution. That is like I said, Windows subsystem for Linux allows you to run a Linux distribution as subsystem, right? But for that, we need to enable this base distribution. For that, you need to install the base distribution or any kind of Linux distribution that you need. So just use LX run and install. So once you type that, this is the output which you get. It says it's the legacy Windows system for Linux distribution. So you can go ahead and install other Linux distribution which are available in Microsoft Store. But unfortunately, Kali Linux is not available, but it doesn't matter, right? We are anyway installing it using the procedure. Just click on Y here saying yes. I've already installed, so it's showing legacy Windows system for Linux distribution is already installed on my system. For you, it might take a while. After installing, the most important thing is it'll ask for you to set up a password and username. Don't skip that step, wait for a while, and make sure you set up the password and username properly. Only then the entire thing will work out. Once you've done that, we are done here. You can close the command prompt. The next thing you need to do is install Git. I already have it installed. It's very easy. Install.exe file and click on the installation process. It's very straightforward. And open Git bash. Yeah. Before that, let me go ahead and create a folder called text here. And as you can see, it's stored on my desktop. Right now it's empty. Anyway, let me go back to Git here and CD desktop. DST. Earlier we enabled Windows subsystem for Linux, but now we have to download the script, right? For that, search for Windows subsystem for Linux Witcher. And the first link is the GitHub link. Click on that. There you go, guys. It says uh, Windows subsystem for Linux distribution switcher. It says that the purpose is to let you easily download and install Linux distribution as subsystem on your Windows operating system. So yeah, as you can see, you have different options here for the base operating systems. So yeah, copy this link here. Control C and go back to Git. Git clone and paste the link which you just downloaded. Paste it. It shouldn't take very long. It's done, guys. So now if you check your test folder, Windows subsystem for Linux will be downloaded properly. Let's just go back and check that. Here is our test folder. As you can see, Windows subsystem for Linux is already there. Now open your command prompt. CD, let's go for the text file. And if you search for the directories under that, you can see WSL here. Now let's go for that as well. You can just press tab directories under that. So as you can see, the two things, the most important things is this get prebuild.py and install py. This get prebuild.py will fetch Kali Linux Docker files and install.py will install Kali Linux for you. I already have it installed, but I'll just show to you how to do it. So go back to the browser and type Docker file. Click on the second link. I just wanted you to copy the command easily so that you won't make mistakes. This is the one which you'll have to copy to fetch the Kali Linux Docker file. So you can just copy this part and go for command prompt. Let me maximize this for you. Here you can say, so if you remember, I said Python is must 
So make sure you install it properly and set up the path. Python get pre-built. Let me just pre-built.py and copy it. As you can see, it's installing. It's going to take probably like two minutes. So it says it's done. It says it's saved to this file in the text folder. Let's go back and check if it's happened. Here is a test folder under WSL. You have Python. Yeah, as you can see, you have a Python folder, a zip folder of Kali Linux installed or fetched. You'll have to install it now, right? So let me now just type Python. This is the command that you want to use. That's install.py, install.py. And copy this or just type and enter tab root fs tab and click enter. So as you can see, it took a while, but it did install, right? Now all you have to do is it's installed. So you can close the CMD and open your command prompt and run it as an administrator. Click yes. Let me maximize the screen. You'll have to set the root password of the default user as root. So set default. It's the command that you need to use. Set default user as root. As you can see, it's now set to root and click bash. Done, guys. Right now we are running on Kali operating system on command line interface. If you want to make sure if you're actually running on Kali, just type cat etc and issue. It shows that Kali Linux rolling. So as you can see, we have successfully installed Kali Linux command line interface or how to use command line interface on Windows using Windows subsystem for Linux. And I'm telling it to you again, just use it if you know how to use command line interface very properly. Otherwise, it might be a little overwhelming for beginners. Default, it's the command that you need to use. Hit default user as root. As you can see, it's now set to root and click bash. Done guys. Right now we are running on Kali operating system on command line interface. If you want to make sure if you're actually running on Kali, just type cat etc and issue. It shows that Kali Linux rolling. So as you can see, we have successfully installed Kali Linux command line interface or how to use command line interface on Windows using Windows subsystem for Linux. And I'm telling it to you again, just use it if you know how to use command line interface very properly. Otherwise, it might be a little overwhelming for beginners. So now it's time that we go through the command line basics of any Linux terminal. Now the Linux terminal is a very powerful tool. It allows you to move around the whole operating system through the files and folders. It allows you to create files, change their permissions, change how they behave and a bunch of other things. You can do filtering, you can grab stuff, the specific stuff from a specific file, and there's a bunch of interesting things that you can do. And as an ethical hacker, you will be working with a Linux distribution most of the time, whether it may be Kali Linux or some other thing like Parrot OS, but you will be working on Linux most of the time because it's a powerful tool for networking analysis and scanning and all sorts of stuff that you want to do as an ethical hacker. So the first essential step is to actually know how to use the tool that is available to you. And that is out here, which is the terminal. Now, as I'm running this on a virtual machine, you might find it that my execution times are much slower. And that is because I have a very, very slow laptop because my virtual machine is actually eating up a lot of my RAM and I have a bunch of other processes that are also rendering. I do this on my free time. So let's go ahead and go through the commands that we are going to actually go through. Now, let me actually make a list of commands that I want to teach you guys. So let me see if leafpad is available. Firstly, leafpad is basically a text editor. So the first command that we are going to start off with is CD. Now CD stands for change directory. Now at this moment, we are in the root directory. As you guys can see, we can print the current working directory with this thing called pwd and that is a current working directory as you see it's called root and suppose we want to change our directory to the home directory so all we have to do is cd which stands for change directory as i just said and specify the path now cd slash home 
Okay, so once we're in home, I want to make a list of commands that are used on the CLI that I want to teach to you guys. So what would I do? I would firstly see if any files are available that I can edit. Okay, so these files are available, but let's create a new file for ourselves. So firstly, let's do nano list.txt. Now what nano does is nano will open up a small command line text editor. Now command line text editors are very much used by ethical hackers because they save a bunch of time. If you're always switching between GUI and command line because you'll be doing a bunch of stuff on the command line and suppose you want to write something, you're always switching to GUI. It's a waste of time and you want to save time as an ethical hacker. So you can use this thing called a command line editor and it's, it can basically do most of the stuff a GUI editor would do. Now you say nano and the name of this file. So nano basically has created this file now and it has opened up this new fresh window which overrides the command line that we were in the bash. And this is a place where you can actually edit what goes into the file. Now let's see the list of commands that I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you ls. ls will be the list of files. We did cd. We saw a pwd. So that was the print working directory. We'll be looking at how you can copy stuff with the cp command. Then we'll be looking at mv, which is basically move. Then we'll be looking at cap, and that's an interesting one. And also less, which is another interesting thing. Then we'll be looking at grep which is actually used for grepping or grabbing things from files that you might want to see. You'll see what I mean in a short while. We'll see echo, which probably does what you think if you have any experience with Linux. Then we'll be doing touch and we'll be doing make dir, which is make directory. And then we'll do in chown, chmod, then one of the most dangerous commands that is rm. And then you can do man plus help. Okay. So these are the list of commands that we are going to go through in this part of the video. So suppose I was making this video and I wanted to save this somewhere. So if you see down here, there are a bunch of options that are shown to you. Now this carrot sign might be not what you're thinking that the shift six one, it's not shift six. It's actually a control. So carrot is control and then G of course means G. So if you go control G, it will actually get help. Now what we want to do is save the file and that is control O and that is write out. So what we want to do is say control O and now it's going to say if we want to name the file list.txt and we want to name the file and it says that we have written down 15 lines. So that's how you save a file. Now all we want to do is exit out of here. Okay. So first let's go LS and let's go through whatever there is. So LS shows us the list of files that are there in that directory. Now LS can also show you the list of files in a directory with the path that you specify. Like if I say LS var, it'll show me everything that is in var. Okay, there are a lot of interesting things in var. So let's head over to var. So CD slash var and you hit enter. And now we are in the folder var. So now to actually demonstrate how powerful LS is, we have a few flags. Now to see the flags of any command, you can just do dash dash help universally throughout the Unix command line. So out here you see some information that is kind of tough to read, but if you go on top and scroll out here, you'll see all the flags that you can use with the command that is LS and how you can use them. So you can see what to use and you can read a little bit about it. So if you use all, it ignores entries starting with dot. So suppose we were to do ls in var, let's see. So it shows us like this. Now, if we do lsl, it'll show a long list with more information. So these are the permissions that you see out here. We will be seeing how we can change the permissions of files soon enough. And this is who owns the file, the user and the user group. This is the file number, I guess. I'm not sure. This is when they were created. This is the name of the file. This is the time when the file was created, I guess. Okay, so that's how you get very detailed information about all the files. Now, there's another thing you might want to use with ls, and that is the a tag. So you can go lsa, and it will show you all the hidden files also. So now you see some two files that were not shown out here. Our file list begins from backup. But when we do ls slash, I mean hyphen la, we see two more files that is dot and dot dot. So let's see if we can move into that cd dot. So we can't even move into that. So that's interesting. So these are hidden files. So 
these are not seen to random users and we can actually do stuff with them we'll see how we can use hidden files later on so if you want to show hidden files to ls you all you have to do is ls and hyphen la so that was all about ls so let's move back to slash home where our list of commands that i want to show you all was so cd home let's ls and see what was it called it's called list and suppose i want to see the contents of list.txt all i have to do is say list.txt now it shows us whatever this file is containing it'll read it out for you so we've done cd we've done ls and its various forms we've done pwd now it's time to do cp so cp is basically used for copying files from one place to another so suppose i want to copy this address file that is there into some other directory let's say var so all i would have to do is cp name.txt and then you specify which location you want to actually copy it to so cd slash var so this is where i want to copy my file to and you hit enter and it's copied but that was a very small file now we can actually check if it was copied before i move on and pour some more knowledge into you so let's go into var so cd slash var hit enter and you're in var again and you see ls and now you see a name.txt so let's remove name.txt from here because i want to copy it again and show you all a difference between a flag that i'm going to use right now so the hyphen and letters that you use are called flags technically in the linux terminology so let's go back to home now instead of the name of the file and moving back to home just like i did you can type out the complete name of the file out here so you could have gone cd slash home slash name.txt and copy it to slash var but this time what we're going to do is we're going to use the hyphen v which is basically used for a verbose output of whatever you're doing so most of the commands that we're going to using will have a hyphen v with them so let's see how this actually affects the output so what we're going to do is we want to copy so p and verbose and we want to copy the file name.txt and we want to copy it to the folder called var right so now you'll see that it will give us what is being moved rather that is name.txt and where it is being moved to so this is a very good way of knowing what is actually happening because if you do it without the verbose part and suppose name.txt was just a 20 gb file and you just don't know if it has finished or not so if it's a 20 gb file it'll continuously update you on where what is being copied so basically all you have to do is type hyphen v if you want to know where your file is being copied and the exact path okay so that was about how you can copy files from here and there now what was the next command that we want to see so cat so let me just go and see the next command that is there so list.txt so after cat i want to show less okay so we've done cp we also have to do mv now as you guys can see that cp is basically a copy copy is as you would expect it leaves a copy of the file that in the original directory while also maintaining a copy in the directory that you specified but if you want to move the file completely all you would have to do is use the command mv so mv is for moving the file now let's see what all goes with mv so you can type help and as i said you get the verbose option and you get suffixes you can force things to happen so suppose you don't have the permission do not prompt before overwriting so it'll give you a prompt and you can completely overlook the prompt with the f thing so let me just show you how that looks like we'll be doing a verbose and we will be copying the address the txt file and okay so every time i've been actually typing so you can do address.txt by just pressing tab and it'll autocomplete so address.txt to slash var now it'll show you that it is actually renamed address.txt to var address.txt now if you go and do ls out here you will see that address.txt is not actually here but if we were to move to var so cd slash var okay i've also been typing out commands that i've been previously using and you can simply toggle through all the commands that you've used by the up and down keys so ls mv mvv help cat list i did cd home and now i have to go through all this just to prove a point so cd var we want to change there now we're in the variable folder and we also want to see what we have out here so address should be out here and ls and as you guys can see address.txt is the first file that has come up 
And it is basically the same file, and I can prove that to you by just catting the file and address.txt. And you see that is some random address for some random person. Okay, now let's quickly clear out our file, our window. You can do that with the control L, or you can just type out clear. Now, what we want to do is move back to home. So, yes, yeah, CD home. Okay, so now that we're back in home again, let's cat out our next file. So, list.txt. And after move, I want to go through cat. Now, cat, as you guys can see, is printing out the contents of a file. And there's also less, which does something very similar to cat. So, let's see what it does. So, if you go less and do list.txt, you actually see the contents of the file in a completely new window, which overlays on the previous window. And this is a very neat way to actually see the contents of a file, which is through less. If you want to keep your main command line interface not so cluttered, which cat clutters it completely. So if you want to get out of this place, this less place, and all you have to do is press Q. And Q gets you back. And as you see, nothing was printed out on our main interface. So this is a very cool way to actually keep your command line interface neat and tidy when you're doing work. OK, so grep. So grep is used for actually filtering out stuff from a file. So suppose we want to see whether a command has some verbose option to it or not. So now I know that MV has a verbose command, but suppose I didn't know that. So MV dash dash help, then you use the pipe sign. So what the pipe sign means is you have to take this command, the first command, and then you pipeline it through the second command. And you want to see grep hyphen V if that exists. OK, so let's see grab verbose. Yep, so a verbose exists, and that is hyphen V, and that's hyphen hyphen verbose. So explaining what is being done. So what happened out here is basically we took this first command, and then we filter it. And filtering is done through the piping. So basically think about taking some information and pipelining it through something else, which funnels it out of this command, which is grep. So you can use MV slash help in conjunction with a bunch of other commands, just on grep. And I'll leave the creativity up to you. So grep is basically used for getting what you want from a file. And grep is used very, very much throughout this course of this video, through this Carl Linux tutorial that you're going to be watching. So that is a very easy way to see if you have a particular option or let me do something else also. So cd slash var. Now we're in the var folder and let's ls. We actually have name.txt. Now let's also go into backup. So cd b and tab, and that brings us to backup folder. And we're now in the backup folder. Let's do an ls out here. Okay, so we have a bunch of files. Okay, we have some password dot back. Now see if you have cat and you go password dot back, you can see the entire thing. Now what if you didn't want this entirety of it, or if you want something in particular? You want to be very neat. So you can do that same command. You can pipeline it and you can say grep and you want everything with no login. So we can see that there are a bunch of things that say no login and we only want those. And these are all the things that say no login in them. And it's a much lesser list and it gives us a very particular list that you are looking for. So that is how you use grep. So now let's head back to home. Uh, okay, I typed that wrong. And Again, let's see what the next command is. So now let's start the XT. So we've done grep. We now have to do echo. Echo and then touch. OK, let's go back. Q. We press Q and we get out of there. So what did I have to teach again? I'm such a dummy. We have to do echo. OK, so what is echo used for? So suppose you were to say echo and open code hello world. It would basically do what command says. And that is echo whatever you say. Now it'll say echo hello world, and that will basically echo whatever you typed out in the quotations that is hello world, spelled very wrong. Okay, now suppose you want to actually put this into a file. So you could do echo hello world, let's spell it properly this time. And you want to insert into a file. We had a phone number, I guess, phone number.txt, yep. And we can echo it into that thing. Now that was done. Now let's see what is in phone number.txt. Phone number.txt. And it says hello world. So you can basically input text into a certain file with the echo command. And that's how you do it. OK, now let's also see how you can make directories. And that is with the make directory command. 
So, okay, we also have to do touch before that. I forgot. Now, touch is used for quickly creating files. So, touch, you could say touch and then the file name. So, we can create a name file again, name.txt, or that will create a name.txt. Let me just show it to you, lsl, and we have a name.txt. We can also create multiple files with touch, and you could say file one, file two, and file three. So like this, you can create multiple files and let me just LS that out and show it to you, LSL. And we have file one, file two, and file three. Now we can also create a directory. So make dir and the name of the directory. So suppose you wanted to save all your movies in one directory, so you make directory movie. And now you have a directory called movies and you can also move into movies. So CD movie. Okay, so that's how you create directories and you can move into them with the change directory folder. Now let's see what the next command was. So cd and dot dot. So with cd dot dot, you can move back to the previous folder if I've already not told you that. And since we're in movies, we can just go back to home with cd dot dot after. Now let's see what else is there. So cat list dot txt. And okay, now ch own ch mod. Now ch own will be a little tough to show because we don't have any sort of other user out here. The root user is the only user that we have on this virtual box that is set up. But if you want to change the ownership of a file, so let's say, so you can see the ownership of a file through the LSL command and you see that root and root. So this is the owner name and this is the owner group and they're mostly the same thing. So our next command that we're going to actually see is called ch own. So let's see how ch own is actually used. ch own is used for changing the ownership of a file. So I actually don't remember how to use ch own. So if you actually don't remember or you're getting stuck somewhere, just use the help function. So if a command line argument is symbolic, so let me just go through this once. So this is how you use it owner and then colon group. Okay, and then the file name. So you go ch own and then you want to say the name of the owner and the group you want it to belong to that is root and root and then you specify the name of the file. So suppose I want to change file one that already belongs to root and root. So it doesn't really matter because I don't have any other username to actually change the ownership to. So this is how you would normally change ownership. So let me just show you where you can see the ownership and that is ls hyphen L and out here the root and root you see on file one is basically this is the owner and this is the owner group. They're normally the same thing and the same name, but if you had some different owner like a guest, you could change it by actually using the ch own method or the command. Methods are different things. I always get confused because of the programming. Okay, now the next command that is left is called chmod. To actually show you how chmod works, let me show you an interesting file. So suppose, let me just do this once. Okay, now echo. What we want to echo is, let's echo hello world. And uh, let's put that in quotation and we want to put this in test. Now, once we've done that, let's ls and we see that we have a test file out here. And we want to move test to test.sh. So test.sh is the executable file that is used in bash scripting. So we move test to test.sh and the way you actually execute bash files on your command line is with the dot and the slash. So you say dot slash and if I press T and I press tab, you see that there is no options that's coming up. That is because test.sh is not an executable file. So test.sh is don't have the executable permission. So let me just show that to you. LS and you see test.sh. It doesn't have the executable. Now you see movie, it is executable. I don't know why it is a directory. So it is an executable. You can move into it. So it's blue in color. So the way you actually can make this an executable is by changing its permission. So the way you do that is ch mod and basically you change it to an executable. So plus X uh, that is making an executable. If you do plus R, it'll make it readable. And if you do plus W, it'll make it writable also. So if you do plus X and do test.sh and now you go and do LSL, you'll see that test.sh has become green because it is an executable file now. And now if you do dot slash and you press T, you get test.sh if I press tab. So now it is an executable file and if I execute it, it presses out hello world under my screen. So that's how you can use the chmod or which is basically the change of permissions of files. 
and we'll be changing permissions of files throughout the course of this video. It'll be very useful for us, and you'll see as we go along with this video. Okay, so the next thing that I want to show you all, only to our left, and I remember those now, and it is RM, and RM is used for actually removing files. So you should be very careful while using RM or any sort of removing command on a Linux system because once you remove something, it is very difficult to get it back and it's almost near impossible. It's not like Windows where it's basically just disappeared in front of your eyes, but it's still there in the memory cluttering it all up. That's why Linux always trumps Windows. That's one of the reasons. I'll make a video on that later on. But for now, let's focus on RM. Now we can remove file one. So let's see. So file one is going to be removed. So if we LS now, you see file one doesn't exist, but let me show you. RM and if I do movie, it'll say cannot remove movie is a directory. But if you go into the help menu, I bet there will be a option that you can just forcefully remove it. So RM force will just remove. So RM slash R and you can do movie and it'll recursively remove everything. And if you go here and do LSL, you'll see that there is no movie directory anymore. And that is how you can remove movies. Now that prompt that you see out there is actually a safety measure because once you remove a directory and it's not retrievable, that's a very sad scenario. And you don't want to get yourself in such a scenario in whatsoever possibility. Okay, moving on, so on and so forth. That was all about the RM folder. Now you can do RM and the address of anything. So RM, I know we moved an address.txt. So into the var folder, we can go RM var and address.txt. And that will remove address.txt from the folder of var. Let me just show you that worked. So cd var and ls, and you see that there is no address.txt out here. Okay, another way to get help for any command that you want is man. And suppose you want to see about RM. It'll show everything about RM that is there to show to you. It'll show you how to use it. It'll give you a description, synopsis, the name, remove files or directories. It's a very useful way. So out here you see this is a manual page. So that is where it means man. And you can press line one or edge or you can press Q to quit. So that's very much helpful. Okay guys, so that was all about the command line interface and how we can use it to go about the operating system and change file permissions, copy files, move files, and a bunch of other stuff. Now it's time to get on with the interesting stuff and that is Firstly, we're going to be learning how you can actually stay anonymous with proxy chains. Okay, guys, so now that we are done with the command line basics, it's time that we move forward with proxy chains. So before we move forward with proxy chains, let us head back to our PowerPoint presentation and see what exactly proxy chains are. Okay, so proxy chains. Now, as the name suggests, Proxy chains are basically a chain of proxies. Now, where is a proxy used? A proxy is used whenever you want to anonymize yourself on the wire or the network. You do not want to know, or you do not want your others to know what the source IP address was for your client system. And to do this, all you have to do is send your packets through a bunch of intermediary systems. And these intermediary systems carry the packet out and they transmit it to the target system. And this is much slower. And let's see how we can use this in Kali Linux now. In combination with Tor, to in order to anonymize traffic, not only on web browsing traffic, but rather instead on all networks related traffic generated by pretty much all your applications. But you can also change this in the settings. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to open up the proxy chain configuration file and we're going to understand all its options that are available. So to do that, all you have to do is say nano. You go into the etc folder and then you go for the proxy chain .conf. And what you see out here is the nano editor. And we had spoken about the nano editor when we were discussing the CLI part. I hope you haven't skipped that. Now what you see out here is a bunch of instructions and options. So let me just zoom in into this command line interface and now you can read everything much well. So what proxy chains is, well, it gives you the ability rather to route your traffic through a series of proxy servers and stay anonymous in such a fashion by hiding behind them or by having them forward your requests. So it looks that on the other side that your requests are coming from them as opposed to you. Now, surprisingly enough, there are a large amount of these proxy servers out there that you can use, but they're not very stable. You know, they go up and down and they're not very fast. 
So for specific targets, they can be useful, but not for brute forcing and not for any sort of computing attack. So suppose you're doing something to a certain target. If you're trying to log in or you're already logged in, you can definitely do it through proxy chains. And it will be reasonably fast and reasonably stable as well. But if you're doing some sort of mass scanning or you're brute forcing a password or something of a kind of a proxy chain with a list of proxies selected from the internet, especially the free proxies, it's not going to work. I mean, it's going to work out eventually in a technical sense, but it will consume more time than you can spare. And by that, I mean, it can be very, very long time. It can take about months or two to do a simple scan. So that's not an option. And there are other ways of doing that. But for the time being, I just want you to know how you can use proxy chains and how you can configure it. And actually, because it's really useful and I use it fairly often and a lot of people do. And it's a fantastic piece of software. So first off, we have the types of proxies. So you see HTTP, SOX4 and SOX5. Now, there are fundamental differences between these protocols. And you always want to find yourself a SOX5 proxy as that's the best possible one. And that has the ability to anonymize all sorts of traffic. HTTP, well, as the name it says, it's for HTTP traffic. And SOX4 is very similar to SOX5, but it does not support IPv6 protocol and it does not support UDP protocol. So this can be SOX4 and can be rather problematic. And you always want to make sure that you're using SOX5 wherever and however. Anyway, down below, you have these other options which we will go over. So basically how you enable these options is that uh, you don't need to type some complex lines of code or anything of any kind. Basically, all you have to do is just delete the hash out here. Let me just show you. So suppose we wanted to actually activate dynamic chains option. So all we have to do is delete the hash, but let's put in the hash right now. So after you delete the hash, all you have to do is save the file and the option is enabled. This hash presents a commented outline, meaning that the system reading this will Ignore if there is a hash and if there isn't a hash, it will take it into consideration and interpret it accordingly. Anyway, what we have here are statements which allow us to specify how we want our traffic to be routed. So first off, we have dynamic chain. Now dynamic chain is a sum and is an option which you will find people using the most. It is most commonly used option and a preferable one too at that. And honestly, I think it's the best one out there primarily because it's the most stable one. And here's why. Now suppose you have A, B, C, D proxies. So those are some servers with IP addresses, with open ports. And if you have a strict chain policy, which is enabled on this computer right now, as you see, if you have a strict chain policy, we can only be able to access any site on the internet in general by going through A, B, C, D. So you have to go through all of them and you have to go through them in that specific order, that is A, B, C, D. And that's not always a good thing, I mean. If you're paying for five proxies, that's not a problem because they will always be operational and they will always be up. And why not? That's not a bad idea or an option. But there are, however, people who use proxies for free and they don't tend to pay for them. Why would you pay for like five proxies for a simple scan or something of that kind? They're not free and they cost money and they're rather expensive also. But still, I mean, the act of paying itself identifies you and kind of diminishes the amount of anonymity you have on the internet. So some complex payment methods can still be used to actually anonymize yourself, but it's fairly simpler to just use a dynamic chain. So firstly, we're going to go ahead and uncomment the dynamic chain option, and we're going to comment out the strict chain option. So strict chain will no longer be used, and I will be using dynamic chains. And one more thing to note here is that if you want to use proxy chains in combination with Tor, if you want to route all your traffic through the Tor network, not just web traffic, you must be enabling dynamic chains. I mean, there is a chance that it will work with strict chains, but due to the instant instability of Tor nodes, it is highly unlikely you will need dynamic chains, and that is why I'm using them. Anyway, if you are using dynamic chains, just give you the ability to go from A, B, C, D to your desired destination by not having to adhere to any order. So let's say C is down and you would go a B, D, and it would work with no problems. Even if B was down, you would go to a D and you would go and still reach the destination. So as long as one single proxy is functional, it's going to work and you don't require any specific order to do it down below. Now down below, you have some other options too. So first is random chains. Now random chains in effect are basically the same thing as resetting your service. I mean, if you're resetting your Tor, you will be now assigned new IP address. In Tor assigns your new IP address every 10 minutes or so. Anyway, with the random chain, you can specify a list of IPs and then you can tell your computer, okay, I want you to try and I want you to connect to this point. And every time you connect, every time you transmit a packet, I want you to use a different proxy and we can do that as well. 
And that's one of the options, definitely. And you can say, okay, use this as phone five times and then change to another one or some kind of like that. There are a lot of options to specify there, primarily the chain length. Anyway, down below there's quiet mode. Uh, you don't really need that. Then that's proxy DNS request no leak from DNS data. This is very important. You cannot have any DNS leak. And let me explain to you what DNS leaks are. And even though somebody cannot get your particular IP address, they can get the IP address of the DNS server that you are using. And that DNS servers do is resolve the main domain to the IP address and vice versa. So for example, if you typed in youtube.com, the DNS server of your local ISP provider will resolve that into some sort of IP address that YouTube has, and it will make a request, no problem. And you do not want that happening because your local DNS server will be discovered and that is information that can be used in order to figure out your personal IP address. And when that is done, your physical location is pretty much compromised and that's a no-go and you definitely need proxy DNS here. It might slow you down a bit, but without that, you're practically not anonymous and it's just a matter of time before somebody finds you. Now, if you go down below, we have some other options here, but we're not really interested in them at the moment. What we hear are for the formats for entering proxies, and I'm gonna leave it at that. So what you see out here is first the type of the proxy, that is SOX5, then the IP address, then the port number, and then two words, that is Lama secret, and then juice to hidden. Okay, so now what you see out here, as I just said, is how you would actually write down your proxy chains. And now, as I had already also said, you always want to be using SOX5 and you don't want to be using HTTP because they're not really that safe. And SOX5 doesn't support a lot of options anyway. And this is the IP address of the proxy server that we will enter a few of them manually later on. And this here is the port number that you see on which the proxy server is listening. And that port is open over here. These two words now, what some proxy servers, especially paid ones, will always have a username and password. So you can just type them here in plain text. Unfortunately, it is assumed that only you and you alone have access to this computer besides this file. And besides this file is you, not, not everybody can read this file. Anyway, so if you can just type in the username here and password here, you will gain access to a certain proxy that you have chosen or that you have paid for. Anyway, these are just some examples and we won't actually be using these proxies or anything of a kind. We need to go down below here, out here you see, and at the end of the file, so if I just press enter a couple of times, there we go. So here is only one proxy active at the moment and it's in SOX4 and all traffic being routed here through Tor by default. So let's set to Tor now and Tor default listens on this port. So this uh, 905 report is where Tor listens on. Now, what we want to do is we want to add a SOX5 proxy address. So what you want to do is just type in SOX5 and the same IP address, SOX5. And you want to be keeping the spacing correct, just use tab. So 127.0.0.1. And then you want to specify the port number also, so 9050. So what you see out here, the 127.0.0.1, this is the loopback address of your computer. So this is for into device communication and if you ping this address and if you're pinging yourself basically and usually people ping this address in order to make sure that the IP port protocol is set up correctly even though they don't have internet connectivity. So let's just type in 1.27.0.0.1 and the same port number and 9050. So now we have to press control O to save our file and we're gonna save under the same name and we wrote 65 lines of codes down and that's written. And now you have to press Control X and you exit out. So let's press Control L and clear out our screen. Now we just edited our proxy chains configuration in a very neat environment. So to go ahead and type in our service door status. So we want to check status of our Tor service. So service Tor status. So Tor service could not be found. So do we have the Tor service installed? Okay, so Tor service is not installed. Just give me a little moment, I'll quickly install it. Okay, so now that we have set up our proxy chains configuration file and we have put in a SOC5 proxy chain giving it the Tor service. Now what we need to do first is start up our Tor service. Now to actually check if Tor is running or not or if the Tor service is running or not, let me just clear that out. We need to go service Tor status. And you see it says it's inactive. So what you have to do is say service tor start and that will start the tor service. 
it might take some time depending on the system that you're using and voila, that it has started it for me. Now, what you have to do to actually use proxy chains before you go to any website. So all you have to do is say proxy chains, then you specify the browser that you're using. So we're going to be using Firefox and you could say something like www.duckduck.com. So now here you will see how your thing is being transmitted to duckduckgo.com. When I say thing, I mean your packets and your requests. I'm sorry for my vocabulary. So now your packets are going to be directed through a bunch of IP addresses, but we haven't actually put a bunch. We just have put the loop back for the Tor network. So we will let Tor do the rest of the things for us. Okay, so depending on your system, this might take a little bit of time to actually open up. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what's actually happening on the terminal while this thing is loading up. Okay, as you can see, it's going through a bunch of proxies out here and some are denying it and some are saying it's okay. So as you guys can see, most of the time you might get denied and it'll be a lesser number of okays and that is exactly what we're looking for. Because primarily we have gone a great extent for the anonymity and what you want to do is stay like that. So this is basically how you use proxy chains. Now, if this computer just decides to open up TalkTalkGo.com on Mozilla, I could actually show you some interesting stuff, but it seems my computer has kind of given up on actually opening DuckDuckGo. It's still waiting for DuckDuckGo's actually confirmation, but that's about it. So this is how you can actually configure proxy chains. I'm really sorry that my computer isn't working right now so well and nothing is actually opening on Mozilla. It's mostly because my RAM is overloaded. I think I should go ahead and get myself a new RAM, but for now, let me just also say that we can put some custom proxy lists and instead of just saying, let me just go ahead and open up that file again. As you guys can see out here, I'm going to end this right now because my computer can't really take all this pressure. See, it's lagging so hard. Okay, let me just quit out of that and let me just open up a new one. Now, as I had said that you can put up some custom proxy lists. Not really going to do that, but let me just show you how you can do that. You go nano and you go etc and proxy so you basically have to go into the proxy chain okay so i think i have to put this again yeah now if you just go in and edit out here all you have to do is set up dynamic chains and you can go online and search for free proxy list and that will give you everything with the port number to the ip address let me just show it to you free proxy server list so all you have to do is search for free proxy server list and you can see out here the proxy type is HTTPS and you basically want to find a SOC5 proxy. To find SOC5 proxies, just add that into your keyboard. And once you find those proxy addresses, all you have to do is take down this IP address and followed by the port number and you go ahead and just put it down in this configuration file. And then you hit control O and you just save it and then you just go back so that was all about proxy chains and how you can set up proxy chains to set make yourself very anonymous i'm sorry the whole mozilla part didn't work that's your sad state of my computer but moving on let's go ahead and study about mac changes okay guys so that was all about proxy chains let's move ahead to mac changer okay now before we go into the tool called mac changer let's just see what a mac address is now, MAC address actually stands for Media Access Controller Address of a device and is a unique identifier assigned to a network interface controller for communication purposes. Now, MAC addresses are used as a network address for most IEEE A02 network technologies, including Ethernet, Wi Fi, and Bluetooth. Now, in this context, MAC addresses are used in the Media Access Control Protocol sublayer and, as typically represented as MAC addresses, are not recognizable as six groups of two hexadecimal digits each. Now these are separated by a colon and the first three hexadecimals are actually the organizationally unique identifier. So they actually represent your vendor and the next three hexadecimals actually represent your network card uniquely. Okay, so when you are actually on a network, you are recognized on something called an ARP table. Let me just show you the ARP table, how you can see it. Let's go in. So the password is root. So an ARP table is basically an address resolution protocol table and well, this is a virtual machine and it doesn't really know many machines on the local network. But if I were to go on my Windows system and show you my ARP table, let's see. Okay, so if I show you the ARP table of my Windows machine on any machine that has a TCP IP protocol suit installed, you will have this command that is working called ARP. 
and you give the hyphen A and now you see that your IP address or somebody else's IP address is actually mapped to a physical address. Now the MAC address is very commonly used in the art protocol and this is how you are actually identified on a network. Now sometimes what you want to do is be unknown on this network. There are various reasons why you want to do that. Let me just give you an example of a very malicious reason that was done in my college. So we as students would actually change the MAC address of our own computer to the professor's computer. So we would somehow look up the professor's IP address and then come to know about his MAC address. And then we would spoof our MAC to be his MAC address. And then we would do some type sort of malicious activity on the college internet. And then the internet administrators of our college would come to know that that MAC address is doing some sort of malicious activity. And that MAC address would get permanently banned for that session on the college network. So basically our professor would not be able to use the wireless projectors that he would use to actually show us his presentations. And we would end up getting a free class. Now I am not actually promoting any sort of bad activity like this. I have just experienced this in my own college life. So that was something, but there are many other reasons that you might want to spoof your Mac. Now Mac changer is an amazing tool for actually spoofing your Mac. So first of all, how do you come to know your Mac address? So let's see you go IF config and this will give us our Mac address. Now this address that you see out here is the Mac address of this machine. So you can also check out the Mac address by going Mac changer. Then let's type in the help options and this will show us how to get the Mac address. So if you see there's a show flag so we can go Mac changer and you can put the S and then you put the interface. Now the interface is where it's working. So at zero is where we are actually getting. We don't want the loop back one. So at zero and this will give us the Mac address. So our current Mac address is 080027. Let's see if that was the same one shown. Where is that Mac address? Okay, so Ether 080027. So I'm sorry, this was the Mac address. I selected the wrong thing. What I was showing you is the IPv6 address and you can see that it's very, very long. So this is our Mac address. Now what you might want to do to change your Mac address? Well, let's see. With V, we can get the version. With S, you can show. We can do the E. And as I said, if you remember that the first three bits is about the vendors, so you can also get the vendor list by going hyphen L. So you go hyphen L, and this will give you a list of uh, MAC addresses and which vendor they belong to. So sometimes if you know the vendors that are actually being used on the network of your college, for example, and you want to just stay anonymous and not raise any flags of suspicion. So you could hide yourself as a Cisco router. So suppose your college was using all sorts of Cisco routers and you decided that today I'm going to spoof myself as a Cisco router and I'm going to screw around with the network. So it would not raise any flags before you actually decided to do some malicious activity. In some deeper inspection of your MAC address, people would actually realize that you are actually spoofing the address. And after some investigation, they would indeed take some time to actually reach to you and how you spoofed it. But the point of changing your Mac is not raising any flags. And that is exactly what you should try to do. So Mac changer is also very useful for getting the list of all the Mac addresses and their vendor IDs. Now let me just clear the screen out quickly. So we go clear and let's bring back the help. So we go Mac changer and dash dash help. Now what we want to do is give ourselves a random Mac address now Mac changer. So that is done with the R flag and we want to do it on each zero. So once you run that you will be given a new Mac address. So our new Mac address is F6 C649. Now you can verify that by running IF config. Now we could just do IF config and you see our new Mac address is on ether. So we could also do something like this IF config and you could grab ether. So that is telling you the Mac address and this is completely new. Also, you could show it through the Mac changer tool itself. OK, so we need to give it the E0. I forgot that. Now you see that this is our current Mac address and this is our permanent Mac address and they two are completely different. Sometimes you also might want to actually change your Mac when your laptop is or your system is booting up because you might want to stay anonymous all the time. Who knows? And sometimes you might think I'll actually change it when I want to change it. But let's face it. We are forgetful as human beings and we tend to forget things that we are supposed to do. 
So what else is better than to actually automate the whole process yourself and forget about remembering all these stupid nitty gritty stuff. So you can tell Linux or Kali Linux to actually change your MAC address on boot up is use this tool called crontab. Now crontab is actually used for scheduling tasks on Linux. So let me show you how to do that. Firstly, let's clear our screen and go crontab and go help. Now you see it's a pretty small menu. So first we start with the U flag, which user this file is going to work for. Then we got the E flag, which is for editing crontab users, the users crontab list. And you can see the list of users crontab. And let's see. So do we have any crontab list? So there is no crontab at this moment. So we can set up one for ourselves by going to the E. Then there's the R, which is delete users crontab. And I want to tell you all, be very careful when deleting anything of that sort, because once you delete something from Linux, as I've already said that it is very, very difficult to actually retrieve it back. You might get fragmented pieces of what you had actually deleted, and that will only leave you with sadness and devastation. Now, what you want to do is go through crontab and press E, and this will bring us to select an editor to change later run select editor. So we'll do it with nano. So what you have out here is the readme file of crontab. And if you read this entire thing, you will get how to use crontab completely. But if you have any sort of doubts, even after reading it, you can leave them down in the comment section below. Now, what you want to do is actually set up a crontab so that you can change your MAC address whenever you reboot your computer. So all you have to do is say at reboot, what you want to run is Mac changer. And if you remember, we want a random Mac address and we want it on ETH zero. So that's done. Now all you have to do is save this thing. So you go control O and that will write it out to cron tab and you press enter and you have written down one line. Now you go control X and you have exited out. So now let's us clear the screens by pressing control L and enter and let's go ahead and get our Mac address. So if we go ahead and run that, our MAC address is set to F6, C649. So just remember the first few letters, F6, C6, and 49. Uh, now let me just reboot my computer, and you will see after I reboot and run ifconfig again with grep etho, we will see a different MAC address. Now rebooting might take some time because I'm actually using a virtual machine, but still now it's given problems with the Firefox, but let's hope this won't take much time. Okay, so now that our computer has booted up and we have actually opened up our terminal, let's go in and type ifconfig and let's get in our ether that is the MAC address. So if you remember the MAC address, now you see that it has completely changed and that's how you can spoof your MAC address on your local network. And this will basically help you in staying anonymous on our protocols and anything that actually maps your IP address to the MAC address. Okay, so that was all about MAC changers. I'll meet you in the next section now. So in this section, we'll be talking about a uh, wireless encryption protocol cracking. So that is basically Wi-Fi cracking. Now, Wi-Fi in today's day and age uses pins or passwords to normally encrypt their data usage. Basically, if you want to access the wireless access point, you need a password or a pin to actually gain authorization. Now, this authorization is done using a four-way handshake which we will try to capture using a tool called aircrack ng and then we will try to crack into the password using a wordless generator called crunch now you can use aircrack ng to crack wpa and wpa2 there's also another protocol called wep or web and that is not normally used these days if you find anybody using that you should always advise them to actually upgrade to wpa or wpa2 because WEP is actually very easily cracked in these days and people are generally punished for using WEP by hackers all around the world. Okay, so now you can actually go ahead and go into a terminal and type ifconfig to actually look at your network card name. As you guys can see out here, it's called WLO1. So the first step that we need to do to actually go into the process of Wi-Fi cracking is set up our network access card or our access point into monitor mode. So as you guys can see out here after typing ifconfig, it shows me that my Wi-Fi access card is WLO1 interface. Now our process of cracking passwords is pretty simple. What we want to do is actually monitor for all sorts of access points that are nearby to us. Once we have chosen the access point that we want to actually penetrate into and find the password, what we want to do is run an arrow dump scan on it, and then we will try and deauthenticate any device that is connected to that access point. 
Now, one assumption out here is that the password is saved in that device and it will automatically try to re-authenticate itself with the access point. And we want to catch and log this re-authentication process, which will actually have a four-way handshake between your device and the access point. So this is basically the procedure we are going to follow. Now, another thing that you need to know before actually using this process to gain any access to any Wi-Fi is that you need to know a little bit about what the password is. Maybe it could be the length or it could be something like a specific character at a specific place. Maybe you know a series of characters. So you just can't really guess the password out of thin air. That is not how cracking works unless you have some unlimited potential of processing power. In that case, you can very well brute force it and just find the password. But if you are not somebody who has unlimited processing power and you're trying to use Aircrack NG, you need to know a little bit about the password. Also, before we proceed with this wireless encryption protocol cracking, what I want to say is if you want to get into somebody's Wi-Fi network or you want to actually test for vulnerabilities, it's better that you test for router vulnerabilities than actually cracking a Wi-Fi password because you're more likely than not to find more router vulnerabilities than actually successfully crack a Wi-Fi password if you don't know anything about it. If you don't know anything about the password, just go ahead and run some vulnerability tests on the router itself. And more often than not, you will just find something you can abuse. OK, now let's talk about the two tools that I'm going to be using. Now, these two tools, one of them is already installed on Kali Linux. But if you are not using this on Kali, you can also use this on any Linux based system. So what you have to do is download and install Aircrack NG, which is easily installed with the command apt-get install Aircrack NG. And you also have to install this word list generator called Crunch. Now Crunch is easily downloadable by just Googling the name. And the first link will be a SourceForge link. And all you have to do is go inside that and install it. And once you've figured out how to install Crunch, you can make sure that it's installed. Now, once you have installed both the softwares, you can check out if the manual pages are opening up. Let me just open the manual page of Aircrack NG and show you that it has been properly installed. Now, as you guys can see, the manual page of Aircrack NG opened up and the manual page of Crunch is also opening up. So that means both of our softwares have been successfully installed on our system. Now, before we go ahead, let me just show you how Crunch actually works. So Crunch is basically a word list generator. What you would do is you try and generate a word list with given characters. So what you can see out here is I've typed in Crunch 3.5. So that means the minimum length is three and the maximum length is five. And I've given it a series of numbers. So it will use these numbers and generate all the words that are possible from length three to length five. So the way we are going to use Crunch in conjunction with Aircrack is that we are going to use Crunch to generate the word list and then we are going to pipe the word list through Aircrack NG when we are actually trying to capture and crack what we will capture in a certain log file. Now what you want to do first is actually put your network interface card on a monitor mode. Now you can do that by typing in ifconfig and then the interface name which happens to be WL01 and first you have to put it down. So I've config WL01 down. Now to put your interface card into monitor mode, you have to type in iwconfig and you go the name of the interface and then you go mode monitor. Okay, it seems I've spelled it wrong, so let me just do it once again. So that has put our network interface card into monitor mode. And what we need to do after that is we need to start up our network interface. So all we have to do is type in ifconfig wl1 up. Now, once it is up and running, you can check by typing in ifconfig that indeed your network interface card is up and running. Don't worry, it's running in monitor mode if it's up and running. What we want to do next is pretty important to the whole process. So what we want to do now is check for some services that might still be running in the background that might hamper with our whole scanning process. So we do this by actually typing in the command airmonng 
check and then the name of the interface. So as you guys can see, nothing is exactly running right now. But if there were any process running, you would only add the command airmon ng check. And instead of writing the interface name, all you have to do is say kill. And it will kill any processes. Now, if you see any process named the network administrator, you want to kill that process first separately and then kill any other child processes. You may need to actually run this command a few times before all the processes are killed and then you're good to go. Okay, so now that we have finished killing all the sub processes, what we want to do is run an error dump scan on the network card. So that is WLO1. So for this, we go error dump hyphen ng and then we put in the name of the interface and this will start up a scan that will look something like this. So after you run the error dump scan on your interface, what you see out here is a result of all the access point that is found out through the monitoring mode. Now, if you see, we have a bunch of columns out here. First of all, we have the BSS ID column. Now the BSS ID column is basically the MAC address of all the routers that are found. Now every router obviously has a MAC address. So those are the MAC address that is tied to the router names, which is shown by the ESS ID. Then we have the PWR column. We have the beacons column. We have the data packets column. Another important column is the channel column. It's important to know which channel your router is working on. Then we can see the cipher column, the authentication. So out here we can see the encryption that is used. So most of it is using WPA2. So what we will be cracking is basically WPA2. So from this list, what you need to recognize is basically the Wi-Fi router that you want to crack into. Now I'm performing this particular test in my office and I don't really have the permission to actually go in and test them for these vulnerabilities. I'm not the security analyst of here. So I don't really have the permissions to penetrate into them. So what I have done is I have run a similar test at home using my own Wi-Fi and I will show you the results for that. But for this working example, you will see the scans that I'm running in this office. So as we intend to stay ethical, what we are going to do out here is we are going to capture whatever we find in our office for only educational purposes. But when we are doing the actual cracking step, that is the last step of this whole procedure. I'll be running it on a file that I had generated at home, as I just said, because I have permissions to do whatever I want with my own Wi-Fi and passwords. Okay, so for this example, I'm going to pick this Wi-Fi that is called EduTracker Wi-Fi and it's running on channel number six. So what we want to pick from here is the BSS ID and the channel number. We need to remember these two things. First, the BSS ID and second, the channel number. Now, what you want to do after that is open up a new window on your terminal and log in as root. Now what we want to do here is run a separate error dump scan on this specific BSS ID and check for all the devices that are actually connected to this access point. Now we do this by running the command error dump ng and while we are doing this, we also want to capture all the scan outputs that we actually get into a certain file. So we'll be actually storing it in a file called capture and then we just have to pass in the BSS ID and the interface. We also have to specify the channel. So let's see what the channel is one. So the channel is channel six. So that's what we want to do. And we specify the channel with the hyphen C flag. So after you have identified the MAC address, all you need to do is copy it down and place it with after the BSS ID flag. Okay. So we're going to run our command out here and we just want to say our file is going to be called test out capture. Now that our scan is up and running, all we want to do is wait till someone is actually connected to this access point. So I forgot to mention this for this process to actually work properly. Somebody needs to be connected to that access point because what we are going to try and do is disconnect that certain device and let them reconnect and capture that log file. Okay. So it seems like nobody is actually connecting to it. So at this time, all I'm going to do is go back to our error dump scan that we had run on our network interface and look for some other MAC address or other access point to actually penetrate into. And let's see if something has actually connected to that. Okay, so, oh, voila. Now what you see out here is that somebody has actually connected to this access point and his MAC address can be seen under the station tab. Now what we want to do is run a deauthentication broadcast message on that station and deauthenticate that guy. 
Now to actually run the deauthentication process, all you have to do is go ahead and open up a new terminal window again and let the scan be running in the background. Don't close any scan at this moment. Okay, so the information that we need to remember is the BSS ID or rather the MAC ID of the station. Now you also want your monitoring to be running on the same channel so that your deauthentication message is being already broadcast on the same channel. So we can do that easily by going airmon ng and saying wl1 and you can say start on the specified channel. So what we want to be doing is running this on channel six. Then we want to go and use the third suit of tools that is air replay. Now air replay is used for broadcasting deauthentication messages and all sorts of stuff. Now you can see all this in the help menu also, and you can do that by typing in dash dash help. If you go down, you see that you can send a deauthentication message using the hyphen zero flag, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Then we say zero again because we want to constantly send a broadcast of deauthentication. So it's looping basically, and until and unless we stop the scan, nobody will actually be able to access the Wi Fi. So it's basically like a small DOS attack. And then we want to specify the BSS ID. Okay, so it seems like I forgot the whole A tag before the BSS ID, and that should get it working. Okay, so it seems like I have copied some wrong BSS ID, I guess. So let me just go ahead and copy that once properly. Okay, so now that we have the proper BSS ID, as you guys can see, we are running a deauthentication broadcast message on that particular network access card. And now you want to run this for around a couple of minutes so that you become sure that all the devices have disconnected. Now, while this is happening, what you're doing is basically sending a DOS attack to that small little Wi-Fi, and you want to catch the handshake that occurs between devices and the router that it is connected to while reconnecting themselves. Okay, so now that we've let the scan run for a couple of minutes, let us just stop it. Let's stop this other scan too. Now, if I go and list out the files on my desktop, you should see that there's something called the test capture. Now, the test capture is given to us in various formats. We have the capture format, which is test capture hyphen zero one dot cap, and then we have test capture CSV. We have a Kismet CSV. So it gives you a bunch of formats to actually run your cracking on. Now, if you remember, I had told you all that I have already generated a similar file at home, basically, when I was trying to crack into my own home password. So I will be running the test on that file or the cracking procedure on that file. And that is the last step of this whole procedure. So let me just go ahead and move into that folder. So I go CD scan. Now, as you guys can see out here, if I list down the files, you can see a capture1.cap, capture1.csv, there's a Kismet CSV, and there's a net XML. So I was not lying when I said that I have already done this at home. So we are going to run our cracking process on capture01.cap. Now, let me just tell you guys, the password for my home Wi-Fi is sweet ship 346 So you can say that I know the entire password, but I'm going to act like somebody who only has a general idea of what my password looks like. So let's say I know that my password contains sweet ship, but I don't really know the last three numbers or letters or whatever they may be. Okay, so we are going to use crunch once again to generate a list of words that might include sweet ship 346. And let me just open the crunch manual for once. Now, if you go down in the crunch manual, what you'll see is the hyphen T. So as you guys can see, there is a pattern that is specified like add the rate, add the rate God, and then followed by four other ad rates and all the ad rates will be replaced by a lowercase character. Now you can remove ad rate and use a comma and it'll be replaced with an uppercase character or you can use percentages which in case it'll be numbers or you could use the caret sign in which case it'll insert symbol. So when you know the length of the password and also a certain degree a few letters you can use the hyphen T flag. So that is exactly what we're going to use with crunch out here for this example. So let me just remind you guys that the password for my home Wi-Fi is sweetship346. Now what we can do is we can ask Crunch to actually generate something that looks like sweetship346. So what I could do is say Crunch. So the minimum length is 12. I already know that. And the maximum length is also 12. Now let me just input in the pattern. 
So we put in the pattern after hyphen T. So now I'm gonna just show you how long it can take. So we are just gonna say sweet and then put in some other rates and then also get, try and guess in the numbers. So after you put in the pattern, you wanna also input which letters and numbers they could be. And I'm just gonna input my entire keyboard out here. Now what you wanna do is pipe this command through aircrack ng's cracking procedure. Okay, so now what we want to do is pipe this command through aircrack ng and we want to write from or rather read from the capture file. So what we go is hyphen w and then hyphen and then the capture file name. So capture01.cap and then we also have to specify the ESS ID which is given to the E flag and the ESS ID for my home Wi-Fi is nestaway underscore C105. So that's exactly what I'm going to type in and this will start up the cracking process on my Wi-Fi from the captured file. So as you guys can see, this is going to take a long, 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 long time and I'm not really actually going to complete it. So in this time, I'm actually just going to try and explain why this is not very feasible on a virtual network. So basically this is not feasible because at this moment my computer is using all four of its cores and all the memory that is possible. So what this means is on a virtual box, this is not really possible. Your virtual box doesn't really have that much power. If you are using a four core processor computer, only two of its maximum cores can be actually allotted to your virtual box machine. Above that, you can't really give it the entire memory because that will make your computer crash. So if you want to do something like this, you, it's better that you install Kali Linux as a dual boot or as your own daily driver, and then you can do this. So this is why I have not done this on a virtual machine and instead done this on Deepin Linux, which is my daily driver operating system. Now, as you guys can see, it is constantly trying to actually guess the password by actually going through all the permutations and combinations. That is basically, it's taking in all the words generated from crunch, piping it into the current command, that is the aircraft ng command, and it's comparing everything. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna end this because this will take a very, very, very long time. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually try and shorten the command of the, or the amount of guessing that we're trying to do. So let me just try and do that. So as you guys can see out here, I have reduced the number of alphabets that might be actually tested. But even in this case, this will take a humongous amount of time and let me just show that to you. So as you guys can see, the test is running, running, running and running and there's not really much you can do. You can just let this run, go out for a cup of coffee and then come back and you might still see that running. It really depends on what the password is and how much time it takes to crack it and how much processing power you have directly affects how much time this will take. So let me just show you guys that this is taking a bunch of time. Okay, so now that I have fast forwarded a lot into the scan, you can see that I have tried almost 2127608 keys. So that's more than a million keys. That's 2 million keys that I've tried. So, and it still hasn't reached switch ship 346. So what we're going to do is just to show you for demonstration purposes that this procedure actually works. Let me just shorten our guessing even more. So what we want to do is this time we want to just guess the numbers. So we will modify our command accordingly. So we just put in sweet chip and let the algorithm just guess the 346 part. So we're going to remove the alphabets from the guessing scope also. And as you guys can see, the password is almost immediately guessed because it, only 456 keys were tested. And uh, as you guys can see, it shows that the key was found and it's switched up 346. Now, let me also show you that it works with the guessing of letters, just because I don't think I've justified that letters are also guessed and not just numbers. So let me make it just guess the P part. That is sweet she, and then it should guess P and then 346. So let me just show you that. And as you guys can see, it guesses it almost immediately after just going through 15,000 keys. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this Wi-Fi cracking tutorial and also to the end of this video, which was regarding ethical hacking using Kali Linux. I hope you guys had a bunch of fun learning about Mac changes, proxy chains, and a bunch of stuff that we did like Wi-Fi password cracking. 
I hope you practice these procedures and methodologies that I've taught you only for your own educational purposes and not use it to harm anybody or do anything harmful with it. Because let me just tell you very seriously that you can be prosecuted by the law. So let's end this video on a good note by saying, please practice this for only educational purposes. Let me just show you that. And as you guys can see, it guesses it almost immediately after just going through 15,000 keys. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this Wi-Fi cracking tutorial and also to the end of this video, which was regarding ethical hacking using Kali Linux. I hope you guys had a bunch of fun learning about Mac changes, proxy chains, and a bunch of stuff that we did like Wi-Fi password cracking. I hope you practice these procedures and methodologies that I've taught you only for your own educational purposes and not use it to harm anybody or do anything harmful with it. Because let me just tell you very seriously that you can be prosecuted by the law. So let's end this video on a good note by saying please practice this for only educational purposes. If you are a hacker, pen tester, security researcher, or just another person who pings Google in front of friends to look cool, then it's likely that you must have already known about some Linux distros which are particularly made for them. Today, we are going to explore one such Linux distro, Parrot Security OS, one of the leading Linux distribution in penetration testing and ethical hacking. So let's quickly go through today's agenda first. We will begin by discussing how Linux distributions are suitable for ethical hacking and different type of Linux distros that are available for ethical hacking and penetration testing. Then we will begin with our today's topic, which is Parrot Security OS. We will discuss its features, its history, if or not Parrot Security OS is suitable for you. Moving on, we will see how Parrot Security OS is different from Kali Linux. And then I'll show you how to install Parrot Security OS using VMware software. And finally, we'll end this session by taking a look at few popular Parrot Security OS tools. So I hope agenda was clear to you guys. Let's get started then. A security focused operating system is a hacker's best friend as it helps a hacker to detect the weaknesses in computer systems or computer networks. Whether you want to pursue a career in information security or you are already working as a security professional or if you are just interested in this specific field for fun, a decent Linux distro that suits your purpose is always a must. Now, if you're wondering what a Linux distro is, it is a Linux distribution that has been curated to perform security related tasks. And most of the time, a Linux distro will have a Linux base of Ubuntu or Debian flavor, and they usually have some custom tools pre installed in it as well. As you guys know, Linux is the best choice for security professionals for obvious reasons, and hence, most of the distros are usually built on it. A Linux distro can help you in performing analysis, ethical hacking, penetration testing, digital forensic tasks, and various other auditing purposes. But guys, apart from these distros, there are other open source tools as well that you can bundle and use as per custom requirements. But using these distros have a lot of advantages. Like first of all, they save a lot of time and effort that you need to spend when you are dealing with custom requirements. Secondly, they help beginners to easily start with security testing without having to get into the nitty gritties of operating system. And lastly, the most popular reason is you have great pool of distros that you can choose from. Most of the time, Kali Linux is the obvious first choice of operating system for every new hacker. If you ask me why, the obvious answer would be because Kali Linux has a lot of cool things. It comes bundled with a curated collection of tools. Moreover, these tools are organized into easy to navigate menu and a live boot option that's very newbie user friendly, as in it's very friendly to new ethical hacker. But guys, Kali Linux isn't the only distribution which is targeted at pen testers. There are many exciting alternatives that may better fit your use case. Anyway, let's begin our discussion with Kali Linux. It was developed by Fancy Security as a rewrite of Backtrack. Kali Linux distros tops the list of best operating system for ethical hacking purposes. And then there is Parrot Security OS, which is our today's discussion. It is a mixture of frozen box operating system and Kali Linux. It's the second most popular operating system for ethical hacking and penetration testing as well. And then you have Backbox Linux. It's a Ubuntu based operating system with its focus mainly on security assessment and penetration testing. Then you have Pen2, an excellent hacking operating system with wide variety of tools that you can choose from. Apart from these, you have Deft Linux, 
Blackout Linux, Cyborg, Bugtrack, and many others. But as for today's session, we will be discussing about Parrot operating system. Parrot OS is the second most popular Linux distro for ethical hacking after Kali Linux. It is a comprehensive portable security lab that you can use for cloud penetration testing, computer forensics, reverse engineering, hacking, cryptography, and many other security purposes. Now, a little bit about its history. The first release of Parrot OS appeared in April 10, 2013. Originally, it was developed as part of Frozen Box. Now it has grown to include a community of open source developers, professional security experts, advocates of digital rights, and Linux enthusiasts from all over the world. Well, compared to others, Parrot Security OS promises a lightweight operating system and it's highly efficient. Along with its plethora of legally recognized tools, you also get the opportunity to work and surf anonymously, which is like a granted wish to an ethical hacker or any penetration tester. We'll learn about other features in the later part of the session. So moving on, since its release in 2013, Parrot has grown rapidly and currently offers many different flavors targeted towards different use cases. For example, like I said, we have Parrot Security. It's the original Parrot OS and is designed with penetration testing, forensics, hacking, development, and privacy in mind. Then you also have Parrot Home, which is targeted towards desktop users. It strips out the penetration testing packages and presents a nicely configured Debian environment. Then you have Parrot Air. It's focused on wireless penetration testing. Parrot Studio. It's designed with multimedia creation in mind. Then you have Parrot Cloud, the most popular. It targets server applications, giving the user access to full suite of penetration testing tools included in Parrot Security. But it doesn't have a graphical front end like we do in Parrot Security. Moving on, we also have Parrot IoT. It's designed for low resources devices such as Orange Pi, Raspberry Pi, and you have Pine64 and many others. So it's true that Parrot Security OS doesn't have large community of users behind it as Kali Linux does, but the distribution has been gaining a lot of momentum recent years, so things could be very different just a year or two from now. So let me convince you more. Let's just discuss the features of Parrot Security OS. Let's start with the system requirements. It's based on Debian 9. It runs on a custom hardened Linux 4.5 kernel. It uses a made desktop and light DM display manager. It requires a minimum of 256 MB RAM and works with both 32 and 64 bit systems as well as ARM compatible version. Apart from this, Parrot OS can also be installed on cloud and updated to perform cloud based security testing. So basically, it runs on Debian 9. It is compatible with 32 as well as 64 bit systems and ARM systems as well. And it requires a minimum of 256 MB RAM. So those are the system requirements. Moving on, it also supports anonymity. It offers a tool called a non serve, including anonymization of entire operating system. It comes with custom built anti forensic tools, interfaces for GPG and CRISP setup. Additionally, it also supports encryption tools such as LUKS. TrueCrypt and VeraCrypt and many others. Moving on, it also supports forensic boot option to shut boot automons plus many more. It braces Falcon programming language, multiple compilers, debuggers, and beyond. It also provides full support for developing frameworks for embedding systems and many other amazing features. So, guys, these are a few features of Parrot OS. So, basically, Parrot operating system supports anonymity. It offers different kind of cryptography tools. It also supports forensic mode and it also provides opportunity to develop frameworks for embedded systems and many other amazing features. Moving on before you go ahead and use Parrot OS, there are some important considerations that you need to take a look at. First of all, Parrot OS provides general purpose features like any other normal operating system. But guys, before you go ahead and use Parrot OS, there are some important considerations that you need to take a look at. First of all, it provides general purpose features like any other normal operating system does, but at its core, it is still tuned for security and forensics. Now let's see how different Parrot OS is from other distributions. Parrot is different from a general purpose distribution because it does not try to hide its features. For example, there is a tool called Parrot Update Reminder. It's simple yet powerful program. Using this program, you can check for system upgrades once a week. But instead of hiding the upgrade process behind a progress bar, like any other operating system, 
it shows the user the full upgrade process from the app output. So you can see the upgrade process going on. Secondly, Parrot was designed to be a very comfortable environment for security experts and researchers. It includes many basic programs for daily use, which other penetration testing distributions usually exclude. Parrot security includes its own sandbox system. I mean, it provides a secure distribution. User applications in Parrot are protected to limit the damages in case if the system is compromised anytime. So this way no harm is caused. So like we discussed earlier, it also supports digital forensics. Digital forensics experts need an environment that does not compromise their proof. So Parrot comes with automount functions which are disabled by default to allow forensics acquisitions to be performed in a very safe way. So before you go ahead and choose any of these operating system, make sure you check out their features or the services they offer and make sure if they are suitable for the tasks which you want to perform. But as for Parrot OS, these are its features we discussed earlier and these are the certain points that you should take into consideration before you go ahead and use it. Now if you're wondering who the Parrot security is made for, well, it's made for security experts, digital forensics experts, engineering and IT students, researchers, you have journalists and hacktivists as well in the list and you have the newbie hackers, police officers and special security institutions. So basically, if you ask me, it's suitable for a student or the entry level security experts as well. So first I'll show you how to install Parrot Security OS on VMware. So basically when it comes to installation, you have two options. You can install Parrot Security OS alongside your operating system using dual boot option or you can install it using any of these virtualization software like VirtualBox or VMware. As for today's session, I'll show you how to install it using VMware. So let's get started with our installation. So guys, just search for the Parrot Security OS and it's most probably the first link that you find on the net. This is Parrot Security OS official website. As you can see, there's a little bit about its history, its features. It says it's based on Debian. It's designed for security development and privacy in mind. It also includes a laboratory for security and digital forensics experts. Along with that, it also focuses if you want to develop your own software and all that. And its project goals mostly are security, privacy and development. This is the part which you should consider important development, unlike other operating systems. Its features, it's secure, lightweight when compared to Kali Linux or any other operating systems. And it's a free source. So go ahead and explore it. So as for the download options, you can go for security edition here. In the download menu here, you can see other options as well. It says home edition, security and other builds. We discussed few of the flavors of Pirate OS earlier. We discussed Pirate Home, Pirate Air, Pirate Studio and many of those. Anyway, today we're concerned with Pirate Security. 4.5.1 is the current version that's running. So you have two options here to download. First of all, take a look at the size. It's 3.7 GB and 5.9 GB. So make sure whichever you want, you're downloading it depending on your operating system requirements. And as you can see, this is a live blood installer ISO. This is a virtual appliance. You can choose any of these. If download is taking a little longer than you've expected, maybe you can go for Maris or a torrent. So I've already installed it. I'm not doing it. I have both ISO file as well as this OVA format installed as well. Next thing we need to do is install VMware. So VMware, VMware Workstation Pro. So you have a download option here. You can go ahead and download it. You have for the free option here. You also have VMware Player, I guess. Wait, here I go for the link. Sorry about that. Here in the downloads, so you can go for Workstation Pro or you can also go for Workstation Player here. Any of this, whichever suits you. I've already downloaded it. It's gonna take for a while, and then all you have to do is install, click on Next, and finish the installation process. So before you start your virtual machine, make sure you have your Parrot OS image, ISO file, or UVA format, whichever is of your choice. And then here we go, VMware Workstation homepage. Yeah, as you can see, you already have a Parrot OS operating system installed here, a virtual machine installed here. This is, I've installed it using ISO file. It's very easy. I'll show you how to do it. But if you have OVA format, all you have to do is click on this file menu here open. And as you can see, I have a Parrot security OVA here and click and import it. That's all. Click select it and click on open. So I'm not going to show you how to do that. So it's very straightforward process. That's it. This is my ISO file. Let me show you again how to install it anyway. Click on file or you can just go for create a new virtual machine here. Click on next and attach the ISO file. Browse. I have it in my local disk. Here I have Parrot security and open. Next. 
It's a Linux, it debuted the latest version, which is 64 bit, and click on next. Give any suitable name for your virtual machine, let's say Parrot Security. Okay, OS, and click on next. Let's assign about 40 GB. It again depends on what you want to do. If you're doing heavy tasks, maybe you can assign more disk. So as it asks store virtual disk as a single file or split into multiple files, I'm going to choose single file. Click on next. And uh, you can always go ahead and make this customize hardware settings earlier later. But you can do it now as well. Customize hardware. I have NAT connection as for network adapter, memory 512. Let's just say 2 GB. And uh, NAT, yeah, we set processors. I'm just designing one for now. Cool. And close. As you can see, the changes which are made are displayed here. Once you're satisfied with your settings with that you made, click on finish. You're good to go. Your security system has been displaying here. So like I said, you can always make settings later on. You have this edit virtual machine setting options here. Just click on this. Let me maximize the screen for you guys. So as you can see, the Pirate Security ISO is very flexible. There are quite a few options. You have uh, live mode, you have terminal mode, you have RAM mode. So basically live mode is just a standard live USB boot option. Just like you can see while you're installing Kali Linux. Suppose if you don't know how to install Kali Linux, there's a video on how to install it as well by Dureka. You can refer to that in the ethical hacking playlist. Okay, so coming back, sorry about that. You have a persistence mode, encrypted persistence, four and six mode. And all that terminal mode, as you can see, is another live boot option, but without graphical user interface. But the most popular one among new hackers or if you're the first time user is install option with a graphical user interface. So it's almost familiar with Kali Linux users. If you want to get a feel of Parrot security if, and all its features, maybe you can go for live mode. But if you want to get just started, then you can always go for install mode. I'm going to click on that and click on standard installer. So it's mounting all the installation uh, tools and all that. So once the machine is booted up, you'll be asked to select your preferred language in the grub menu, select the graphical installer options and click on, let's say English and uh, United States, American English. So then the loader will automatically install some additional components and configure your network related settings. It might take a while. So basically then the installer should prompt you for a host name and the root password. Let's give some root password. Give the password of your choice. Re-enter the password for verification. And now it's going to ask you to set up a user apart from the root user. So let's just say test user continue. I'm going to keep it as test continue and choose a password for the new user, which is different from the root user password that you'll have to remember. So just give this new user a password. Continue re-enter the password. Okay, let me just go back and my mistake. Let me try it again. Select your time zone. So basically, after you've set your password, it's asking you for the time zone. Let's say Central, Eastern. So now the installer will provide you four choices about the partition of the disk. The easiest option for you is to use guided use entire disk option, which is the first option here. Experienced users can always go for manual partitioning method for more granular configuration options. So yeah, guide and partitioning. I'm going to select it. Guide use entire disk. This is the disk where I want to store. So it's asking if you want to store all files in one partition or different. Let's just say all files in one partition and hit on continue. So now we'll have to confirm all the changes to be made to the disk on the host machine. Be aware that continuing will erase the data on the disk. So after that, you can just click on finish partitioning and writing disk thing. It's asking if you want to write the changes to the disk. Obviously, yes. So click yes. So once on confirming the partition changes, the installer will run through the process of installing the files. Let it install the system automatically. This may take a while. So I'm going to meet you guys once the installation is done. So once the installation is done, it'll ask you if you want to install the grub bootloader on your hard disk. Just say yes and click on enter device manually. Oh, sorry. Just click the device which is already there. Go back. The installation process is now almost complete. 
So guys, the installation is done. Once the installation is done, you can see the machine boots you into made desktop environment as in if you have chosen the install option will be presented with a light DM login screen. So basically you'll have to enter the password and the which you set up for the test user earlier, not the root password. Please do remember that. I'm sure you remember setting up a password for the user, right? That password and login. So here we go. So guys, here we are. As you can see, the machine boots you into the mate desktop environment. Let me pronounce it M A T. -E. You can call it whatever you want, Mate or Mate desktop environment. So as you can see, it's very good looking. Apart from that, Parrot Security will automatically detect when updates are available and prompt you to update the system as soon as you install it. Here it's not showing it to me because I've already updated it. But otherwise, all you can do is just go to the terminal here. You can see a terminal option here, right? Go to terminal there and just say sudo app get update. It'll ask me for the password. Here we go. It might be I might have updated in another virtual machine anyway. I installed the other one as well. Maybe it's in that anyway. It'll update for you. So let me just minimize this while it's updating. Let's go ahead and do other things. Oh, it's almost done, I guess. Yeah, as you can see, it's almost updated and it says 116 packages more can be upgraded. And if I want, I'll have to run update list. If I want to see which of those packets are, I have to just list out those using apt command here. I'm not showing you to you guys. So anyway, when you're making use of it, make sure your system always stays updated. Okay, let's go back to exploring Parrot to us. So as you can see, system is laid out in a very straightforward manner with a collection of tools that you might be familiar with if you're using Kali Linux before. The menu system is almost similar to Kali Linux and it's very easy to navigate. The real difference is that Parrot security is meant to be used as a daily driver, as in your regular operating system to do the other things as well. To prove that you can see you have sound and video options here, a lot of programming languages options as well. You have system tools and you have graphics included. You have office applications or softwares. You have a base, you have math writer and planner, just like any other normal operating system. So while you can use Kali Linux as a desktop workstation, it is really is a penetration testing distribution first. I'm talking about Kali Linux. So with Kali, you need to build the system towards being a daily use system. As in you start using Kali Linux, you need to modify or you need to customize it in such a way that you make it more plausible or easy for you to use for the daily purposes. But that's not the case with Parrot Security OS. Its interface and everything is so good, it almost appears like a normal operating system and it is like a very normal operating system. So you have your penetration distance which are there and along with that you have your day to day applications are also there in this. Now talking about the system requirements, the default Parrot security install uses about 313 MB of RAM. So as you can see here, you can see this quite little bar. It's like a task manager, which you can find it in your windows. You can click on that. It'll show you all the progress that's going on. First of all, it says the Parrot GNU Linux system and the release and the kernel, all the information about your ISO file and you have made desktop environment here and the hardware which is this and the processor it's based on available space and all that when you click on the processes it shows all the processes which are currently running sleeping just like your task manager and your windows operating system so yeah like i said it requires about 313 mb of ram approximately around that but of course this is only system related process running when compared to kali linux it's very lightweight kali linux install requires about 604 mb of ram and that too only with system related process running so like I said, it's a very lightweight system. So yeah, the bar is a task manager. It lists all the processes that are running and all that. You obviously have a terminal, which I showed earlier. The cool thing with terminal is that it goes with their interface. Other than that, it's pretty much like any other normal terminal. And then there is appearance of the interface. I mean, my first reaction when I saw it was wow, amazing, right? When compared to the plain Kali Linux. So yeah, you get to use cool collection of wallpapers as well. You have change desktop background here. You have fonts, interface, and see you have quite a lot of collection of wallpapers. And you can go ahead and add your customs as well. That's all about the interface. And like I said, it's like any other normal operating system. So it comes with a lot of programming languages and a bunch of text editors. You also have IDs as well. It uses Pluma as your default text editor. 
so that's it when talking about the normal operating system. Now talking about the performance, almost all of us know that Kali Linux is a bit laggy. And when you run it on a low end system, sometimes it's like a nightmare when you have brute force attack going on in the background or you're doing something else. It's gonna, what do you say, stuck or it's very slow. But in Parrot OS, it's very lightweight and doesn't lag much. As you can see, it's smooth. Now talking about hardware requirements, pretty much both Kali Linux and your Parrot require high end hardware, but Parrot needs low specification hardware as compared to Kali. So if I have to conclude in one word, Parrot is a good looking distro. It's very lightweight. It's resource friendly. And if you want to know how much resources consuming and all that, you can always go ahead, click on the little bar, which is available there. Click on the resources. You can see the CPU history, memory, network history, file systems and all that. So basically, it's a good looking distro, lightweight, resource friendly. All those features apart, Pirate Security OS, OS has pretty good collection of features as well, which we discussed earlier. It comes like with hell lot of tools. But if you see the sections, there are a lot of other things which are not in Kali Linux. So the most pointed tool here is that in Kali Linux, suppose you want to say private when you're doing hacking or any other stuff, you will have to install a non Tor and then enable them or proxy chain. You also have option of proxy chains to stay yourself anonymous on the system while you're doing hacking or pen testing or anything. But with Parrot OS, you already have an on pre-installed. All you have to do is click on that start button. So let me show you how to stay anonymous. So this is one of the best feature in Parrot Security OS. It has proxy chains as well as anon surf to make yourself anonymous. So you can go for this anon surf and click on anon start here. Before that, you can check your IP of your system. So it says 106.51.73. Just remember it. You don't have to note it down anywhere. 106.51.73. Now, if I go and enable this, first of all, it'll ask you for the administration password. Give that. Okay. So basically, once you enter the password, it'll ask you if you want the announcer to kill the dangerous process, which that can be de anonymize your clear catch files or modify your IP table rules and all that. It'll ask you if you want to do that. Just say yes. So basically, as soon as you click on S, as you can see the notifications here, the tool will attempt to kill dangerous processes that can de anonymize you anytime. It will clear your catch files. It will modify your IP tables, modify your resolve config file, disable your IPv6, and only allow you the outbound traffic through Tor. As you can see, it says Tor is running, started it for you. Imagine doing all this stuff by yourself if you don't have a non serve like in Kali Linux. This would be quite a bit of effort manually, but with the script already present here, it's just a click away. So Parrot Security also includes a similar script for I2P as well. Apart from that, once you've enabled, you can also check, like I said, your IP address now. So as you can see, it says global anonymous proxy activated, dance like no one's watching, encrypt like everyone is. So basically, it's saying that surf is started up. As you can see, my IP address has been changed. It was something of 160 something, but right now it's 182. So an anon surf has made me anonymous. Now I can do whatever you want in an anonymous mode. So that's all I wanted to show you here. Now going back to Firefox. It has quite a documentation part. Well, it's still in the creation stage here. As you can see documentation, it's not all that well prepared or created yet. So if you have any minor doubts, you can go ahead and refer to the documentation part here. So yeah, here you go. Okay, then let's go back to the Destro. One thing that you can point out about Parrot OS is that it has a lot of cryptography tools, such as it has Zulu script, Zulu mount, a graphical utility that will help you mount your encrypted volumes. Then there is something called Crypt Keeper. It's another graphical utility that allows you to manage encrypted folders and much more. These utilities makes confidentiality easily accessible even with the minimal experience. I mean, if you do not have any idea about cryptography, you can easily start learning here. That's what I meant. So it just doesn't stop with cryptography or a non serve You have a lot of other tools which you might not find in Color Linux. So let me show you guys that Parrot. As you can see, you have a lot of tools. You have most used tools which is Armitage, you have Wireshark, Zenmap, OWASP and all that. Then you have wireless testing tools. Give me a second. 
yeah, post exploitation. This set of tools, mostly you can't find them in the Kali Linux. You have OS backdoor tools, web backdoor tools. You have uh, Webco, Weavely, and all that. And you have something called Social Engineering Kit. If I'm right, it should be in the exploitation tools. Where's exploitation here? Ha, huh, you can see a social engineering toolkit. Just click on that password. So it has started up all that. So if I just click one, you have a lot of options. The update set configuration, you have social link attacks. So you have different type of attacks here. You have PowerShell attack vectors. You have mass mailer attack. You have phishing attack vectors and all that. So basically you can click on that and enable all the attacks. I'm not going to show you in this demo how to do it. This is just the basic introductory video about Parrot OS. So let me just close the terminal. Well, there are common tools like you have Nmap. I'm sure you know how to use Nmap. Let me just show you anyway. Nmap is one of the scanning tools. You can find it in um, information gathering. I'm sure Nmap is here. Yeah, it's one of the basic tools. OK, let's just explore Nmap and Dimitri here. Let me just show you how to use Nmap first. Just click Nmap. You have all the help or the Nmap configuration options are displayed in front of you. If you don't know how to use, just go through them. It's pretty easy. A simple example, I'm already using the one which is already there. Just say scanme.nmap.org. Okay, here I go making spelling mistake again. Sorry about that. It's going to take a little while, that's all. While it's scanning, let me just show you another tool which is Dimitri, it's a deep magic information gathering tool. It has ability. So here it is. It should be in the information gathering only. You have, yeah, here it goes. So basically, like I said, it has ability to gather as much information as possible about a host subdomains, its email information, TCP port scan, who's lookup, and all that. Well, let's just check out if the Nmap scanning is done. Here is the terminal. Yeah, it's going to take a little while. So once the scanning is done, it's going to show you how many seconds it took. What are the pores which are open and the closed pores and all that. Now about Dimitri, you can enable it from your terminal, but you can also do it from here. Information gathering and click on Dimitri password. So let's say. Huh, here we go. So let me maximize. All you have to do is you have a lot of options here. You have W, which performs a who's lookup. You can do it online as in using Firefox. As well, you have a lot of websites where you can gather all the information once you have your IP address or and all that. And you have retrieved ncraft.com information on a host, perform search for possible subdomains, email address, and all that. So basically, you can give all these options in one go. Let's say T R Y hyphen O option says the output your host.txt or to the file specified by hyphen O. So I just press click zero. Let me just give sudo. Let me just check if I have given any file here. I do have a file called test.txt. Okay. So like I said, in the iPhone option, it'll save your output to the .txt file or to the file specified by iPhone option. So basically, just specify the file name where you want to store the, all the scan info and the website where you want to website of whose information you want to scan. So let's say the blue dot pinterest.co here you go it started a scanning let me just scroll up the host name and the host ip address it's showing once you have ip address as you know you can gather almost all the information it's also showing the places where it's originated it's created lost modified you have sources you have address here and then yeah, last modified, created, source, and all that. So basically, it's showing a lot of information here. Similarly, you can, using Dimitri or a deep magic information gathering tool, you can actually gather information about any other website you want to know. Let's just check out if Nmap is done scanning. So, let's see, as you can see, it's done. So I've given a website name here. Instead of that, you can go ahead and give the IP address, which is this one, and it'll show you the same results. As you can see, there are a lot of ports. Usually Nmap scans about more than 1000 ports. As you can see, it says 992 are the closed ports and these are the open ports. And suppose you want to know information about each port because basically if you're an hacker, if you try to hack something, you don't need information about all the ports. It's basically the one port which you want to. So to know that you can, there are a lot of options which are provided by Nmap. If you want to know more about by Nmap, there's a video in the EduRaker playlist all about Nmap. It's under network security. So you make sure to take a look at that.
So while you are taking a look at Pirate Security OS, make sure you go ahead and watch a video on Kali Linux as well. So you will know how different Pirate OS and Kali Linux are, though they are similar in few parts. So yeah, that's it about system as in Pirate OS. So like I said, it's one good looking distro, which is lightweight when compared to Kali Linux and a lot of tools, a lot of unique tools as well when compared to Kali Linux. And it's very smoother, way smoother. Apart from all these good things, there are a few things that are problematic with Pirate OS. First of all, like you don't find a search bar here. That's not a problem, but that's one demerit you can say. And it's also a little problematic when it comes to launching your application. The process is a little slow, unlike Kali Linux. So guys, this is your Parrot OS. So basically, this was a crisp video on what Parrot OS is, its review, its features and all that. And make sure to watch a video on Parrot OS versus Kali Linux. So Linux has been known for its various distributions that cater to various needs. One of the most famous distributions is Kali Linux. That is a penetration testing oriented distribution which was built to bring about much needed corrections in its previous iteration known as Backtrack OS. Now since the release of Kali Linux, it has gone under various iterations in the form of updates while other penetration testing and security related distributions were also being developed all around the world. So in this session, we will compare Kali to one such distribution that has come under the spotlight and that is Parrot OS. So today in this video, I will first be giving you guys a brief introduction to what exactly is Kali Linux and then I will also give a brief introduction to what Parrot OS is. Then we will be comparing Kali versus Parrot according to various parameters. So let's move ahead. Now let me give you guys a brief introduction to what Kali Linux is. So Kali Linux is a penetration testing and security focused operating system. As the name suggests, Kali has a Linux kernel at its core. Above that, the creators of Kali, Mati Aharoni and Devon Kearns, also added the latest injection packages to help pen testers save some time. Kali Linux is developed according to the Debian development standards, and it was developed as a refined penetration testing distribution that would be served as a replacement for Backtrack OS. Currently, the development of Kali is being handled by Offensive Security, which is the organization that provides prestigious certifications like OSCP, OSCE, and OSWP. Over the years, Kali has developed its own cult following with people who would swear by the word and by the power provided by Kali. While I may not be such a staunch believer in Kali Linux, there are plenty of reasons for one to use Kali. For one, it's absolutely free. Secondly, it comes pre-installed with tons and tons of penetration testing tools and security related tools. Above that, it can be completely customized according to your needs as the code is an open source Git tree and the whole code is basically available to the public to be tweaked. Also, the kernel that runs Kali Linux comes with the latest injection packages and it also comes with GPG signed packages and repositories. Above that, Kali Linux has some true multi-language support and it was developed in an extremely secure environment. Also, Kali supports a wide range of wireless devices. Now, at this moment, Kali may seem like a very useful operating system. But as you guys might remember the great quote from Spider-Man, create power comes with heavy resource utilization. According to the official documentation of Kali, the system requirements are quite heavy. On the low end, Kali Linux needs a basic of at least 128 MB of RAM and a 2 GB hard disk space to set up a simple SSH server that will not even have the GUI of the desktop. On the higher end, if you opt to install the default GNOME desktop and the Kali Linux full meta package, you should really aim for at least around 2 gigs of RAM and around 20 GB of free hard disk space. Now besides the RAM and hard disk requirement, your computer needs to have CPU supported by at least one of the following architectures, them being AMD64, i386, and ARML and ARMHF, and also ARM64. Now, even though the official documentation says 2 GB of RAM is enough, I have personally faced numerous lag and stutter issues when running Kali on a virtual machine with 6 GB of allocated RAM, which in my opinion is a definite bummer. Now, let's take a moment to discuss about Parrot OS. So Parrot, much like Kali, is also a Debian-based distribution of Linux. 
When I say Debian based, it means that the code repositories adhere to the Debian development standards. Parrot OS 2 comes with its own arsenal of penetration testing and security related tools. Most of these tools are also available on Kali. Now, Parrot was first released in 2013 and was developed by a team of security experts, Linux enthusiasts, open source developers and advocates of digital rights. The team was headed by Lorenzo Faletra and Parrot is designed in a very unique way. While the operating system has everything that is needed for a security expert, it doesn't present itself to be a daunting learning experience for beginners who want to set foot into the world of ethical hacking and vulnerability analysis. Parrot OS can be very well used as a daily driver as it provides all of the necessary tools to complete day-to-day -day tasks. So who exactly is Parrot OS made for? Well, first of all, it is made for security experts and digital forensic experts. It can be also used by engineers and IT students who are enthusiastic about ethical hacking. Then Parrot OS can be also used by researchers, journalists and hacktivists. And last but not the least, Parrot OS is also meant for police officers and special security institution. Okay, so now let's take a moment to actually discuss the system requirements that one might need to run uh, Parrot OS. So the system requirements for Parrot is much more forgiving than Kali Linux. On the CPU side, you need an x86 architecture with at least uh, 700 megahertz of frequency. And architecture-wise, you need i386, AMD64, or AMD486, which is basically the legacy x86 architecture, or ARMEL and ARMHF, which are basically IoT devices like Raspberry Pi. On the side of RAM, you need at least 256 MB on an i386 architecture, 320 MB on an AMD64 architecture, and as a general documentation, 512 MB of RAM is generally recommended by the ParrotSec OS people. On the GPU side, Parrot OS is very surprising as it needs no graphic acceleration. That means you can run this without a graphic card. On the side of hard disk space, Parrot OS needs at least 16 GB of free hard disk space for its full installation. That is 4, G uh, 4 gigabytes left, uh, 4 gigabytes uh, lesser than uh, Kali Linux. And for booting options, both Kali Linux and Parrot OS have the legacy BIOS preferred. Now, comparing two operating systems when it comes to Parrot OS and Kali Linux that are both operating systems meant for similar purposes, that is penetration testing in this case, it becomes really tough. Most of the factors in such cases boil down to a matter of personal taste rather than an objective comparison. Now, before we move ahead with the comparison, let me list out a few similarities that you might have noticed between the two operating systems. So first of all, both operating systems are tuned for operating uh, penetration testing and network related tools. And both operating systems are based on Debian development standards. Both of the operating systems support 32 and 64 bit architecture and both operating systems also support cloud VPS along with IoT devices. And of course, both of them come pre-installed with their own arsenal of hacking tools. Now let's get down with the differences. The first uh, criteria of differences that we are going to discuss is hardware requirements. Now as you guys can see on the slide I have put down the system requirements of Parrot OS on the left hand side and I have put down the system requirements of Kali Linux on the right hand side. So as you guys can see Parrot OS and Kali Linux both need 1 GHz dual core CPU. When it comes to RAM, Parrot OS needs much lesser RAM than Kali Linux. Parrot needs 384 MB of RAM for its minimal running time, and Kali Linux needs 1 GHz of RAM on the other hand. In terms of GPU, Parrot uh, OS doesn't really need a graphic card as it has no need for graphical acceleration. Kali Linux, on the other hand, if you're trying to run the GNOME desktop version, you will certainly need a graphic card. On the other hand, Parrot OS needs 16 GB of free hard disk space for its full installation uh, and Kali Linux needs 20 GB of uh, free space. So basically, Parrot OS is a much more lightweight version. So we see that Parrot OS definitely wins against Kali Linux when it comes to hardware requirements due to its lightweight nature. Not only does it require lesser RAM to function properly, but the full installation is also pretty lightweight thanks to the use of the Mate desktop environment by the developers. So basically, if you're having an older hardware configuration on your computer, Parrot OS should definitely be your choice. 
Now the next parameter that we're going to compare the two OS's in is look and feel. Now this section completely boils down to personal choice. Personally, I prefer the minimalistic look that is given by Parrot OS. The interface of Parrot OS is built using the Ubuntu Mate desktop environment. There are two clear sections. On top, you see a pane, which contains applications, places, systems, which is much like Kali itself. Parrot also gives some cool information about CPU temperatures along with the usage graph. And the bottom pane contains the menu manager and the workstation manager, which is a brilliant addition to the Linux system. Kali Linux, on the other hand, follows the Genome desktop interface. While it still has the functionality that is offered by Parrot OS, it doesn't provide the same clean and refined look in my opinion. If you don't know your way around a Kali interface, it is pretty easy to actually get lost. Now, the next parameter that we're going to compare them is hacking tools. Now, since both these operating systems are tuned for penetration testers and ethical hackers, I think hacking tools is the most important criteria that both the operating systems are going to be compared in. So when it comes to general tools and functional features, Parrot OS takes the prize when compared to Kali Linux. Parrot OS has all the tools that are available in Kali Linux and also it adds its own tools. There are several tools that you will find on Parrot that is not found on Kali Linux. Let's take a look at a few of them. So the first one that you see is called Wi-Fi Fisher. Now Wi-Fi Fisher is a rogue access point framework for conducting red team engagements or Wi-Fi security testing. Using Wi-Fi Fisher, penetration testers can easily achieve a man-in-the-middle position against wireless clients by performing targeted Wi-Fi association attacks. Wi-Fi Fisher can be further used to mount victim customized web phishing attacks against the connected clients in order to capture credentials or infect the victim stations with some sort of malware. Another tool that is seen on Parrot and is much appreciated that is not seen on the Kali side is called Anon Surf. Now being anonymous for a hacker is the first step before hacking a system. And anonymizing a system in an ideal way is not an easy task. No one can perfectly anonymize a system, and there are many tools available on the internet that say that they anonymize system. One such tool is Anon Surf. Now, Anon Surf is pretty good as it uses the Tor IP tables to anonymize the whole system. Also, if you guys have not already realized this, Tor also also comes uh, pre-installed on Parrot while it has to be externally installed on Kali. Now, these things that you see, that Wi-Fi Fisher, Tor Browser, and Anon Surf, surely they can be imported and downloaded on Kali, but they don't really come pre-installed, and that is what counts right now. So, since Parrot OS also is designed with development in mind, it also comes pre-installed with a bunch of useful compilers for various languages and IDEs for their uh, respective development, which is completely absent on the Kali Linux side. So for this part of hacking tools, Parrot OS definitely takes the prize. Now the next thing that we are going to compare both, the, both these operating systems is release variations. Now both operating systems come with a variety of variations, but Parrot OS has much more diversity in terms of variety. So let me just explain what I mean. So as you guys can see on the left hand side, I have listed down the release variations that are available for Parrot OS. Now, aside from the full editions, which is both provided by Parrot and Kali, they also both provide pa the light editions on Parrot side and the light edition on Kali side. They are both basically the same thing, wherein minimalistic tools are actually pre-installed and you can install and customize the operating system according to your own needs. If you don't choose to uh, customize the operating system, you can very well use it as a very lightweight and portable operating system. So Parrot OS Lite Edition and Kali Lite Editions are two flavors of the operating system. Now, this is where the differences, start, differences start. So Parrot OS Air Edition also exists. So this is an edition that is used for wireless penetration testing and wireless vulnerability testing. So basically anything wireless, Parrot OS Air Edition does it faster and does it better. Then there's also Parrot OS Studio Edition, which is used for multimedia content creation. Yes, you heard that right. Parrot OS can also make content for your social media. So if you're thinking about using Parrot OS for marketing as well as security, 
Parrot OS here is definitely your go-to operating system. Kali, on the other hand, aside from its light version and full edition, offers some desktop interfaces like the E17, KDE, XFCE, the Ubuntu Mate, and the LXDE. So these are basically just skins that run over Kali and basically make Kali look a little different from one another. You can check out all these different customizations on the Kali documentation. Other than that, Kali has also support for cloud and IoT devices in the form of the ARML and ARM HF releases. These releases are also available in Parrot OS, so Parrot OS doesn't stand down. So as you guys see, Parrot OS provides you a lot of diversity in the variety that it is offering. So in my opinion, Parrot OS also takes the prize in this section. Now the main question remains, which of these two distributions is better for beginners? Well, it is to be duly noted that both these distributions are not exactly meant for beginners. If you want to learn about Linux as an operating system, you're better off using something like Ubuntu or Deepin. This also doesn't mean that you cannot learn the basics on Parrot or Kali. On the other hand, if you are already knowing the basics of Linux and want to get your hands on an operating system to learn ethical hacking, I'd personally recommend using the Parrot Sec OS Lite Edition. This is because the Lite version comes with the bare minimum of networking tools. This means as you learn your ethical hacking concepts slowly, you could develop or install tools one by one instead of being overwhelmed with a whole bunch of them from the beginning. Not only does this allow yourself to evolve as an ethical hacker and penetration tester, but it also makes sure your fundamentals are built in a methodical manner. Now, I recommend Parrot OS over Kali for one other reason too. That is because the default user for Kali is root. This makes the environment a whole lot more aggressive and mistakes tend to be uh, punished and a whole lot more difficult to deal with. So this means that Parrot OS is generally the winner in my opinion. When you get hired as a penetration tester or a security analyst, one of your main roles is vulnerability assessment. So what exactly is vulnerability assessment? Well, a vulnerability assessment is the process of defining, identifying, classifying, and prioritizing vulnerabilities in a computer system, application, and network infrastructures, and providing organization doing the assessment with the necessary knowledge, awareness, and risk background to understand the threats to its environment and react appropriately to them. So vulnerability is a situation that can be taken advantage of by a hacker or a penetration tester for their own misuse or actually for fixing the issue. So vulnerability assessment has three steps. So the first step is actually identifying the assets and the vulnerabilities of the system. The second step is actually quantifying the assessment. And the third is reporting the results. Now, vulnerability assessment is only a small part and pen testing is an extended process of vulnerability assessment. Pen testing or penetration testing includes processes like scanning, vulnerability assessment in itself, exploitation research, and reporting whatever the results are. So in the industry, one of the most widely used frameworks when penetration testing is Metasploit. So Metasploit is widely used in penetration testing, as I just said, and also used for exploitation research. So some of you might ask, what exactly is an exploit research? Well, in this world, there are tons of exploits and the way to approach each one of them is ever so different. So what we have to do is exploit all the research that is available to us and we have to find the best way to approach them. So suppose, for example, you have a secure shell login. So the best way to actually approach a secure shell login until my knowledge is that you have to get a backdoor access to this from the port numbers that you can scan via Nmap or Zenmap. Okay, so without wasting much time at looking at PowerPoint presentations, let's actually get started as to how we can use Metasploit. So Metasploit is a freely available open source framework that is widely used by pen testers as we just discussed. So to actually install Metasploit, which is easily available on Linux and Windows, I guess. Let me just check it out. So you go on your browser and you type Metasploit downloads. Now you just visit the first link. And as you guys can see, it says it's the world's most used penetration testing tool. And then you just download the Metasploit framework by clicking the download button here. So you all might also find a pro version, which is a paid thing. And this has a little bit of extra features like group support and actually helping a company work as an organization. 
but we don't actually need that when practicing our pen testing abilities. So for that, you just go ahead and download Metasploit framework and install it on your system. Above that, there's another thing I want to get, make you guys aware of, and that is Metasploitable. So when actually pen testing, we need a server or a website to actually pen test things on. So normally this is a very illegal thing to do without permission. So Metasploitable has actually created a server with a lot of vulnerabilities on it, and it's called Metasploitable 2. So Metasploitable 2 is easily downloadable from this link and it's a VirtualBox file. So you guys must have a virtual machine software on your system to actually set this thing up. I'll also go through how to actually set up Metasploitable because it has a lot of configuration and network management to go with it. So we'll get to that later. But for now, let's get started with Metasploitable. So before that, Metasploitable is written in Ruby. And if you all know Ruby coding and you all know how to make exploits, you all can also always contribute to the Metasploit community. So Metasploit is one of the most widely used pen testing tools in the industry. So what exactly is Metasploit? Well, it's a framework. And what a framework is, is it's actually a collection of tools. So these tools are majorly used for penetration testing and exploitation research. Now one might ask what exactly is exploit research? Well, there are tons of exploits out there and there are tons of ways to actually approach them. And this only comes to us from thorough research as to how we can approach each and every exploit in their best way. So talking about Metasploit, well, it's open source and it's free and it's also written in Ruby. So if you guys know Ruby coding and know how to make exploits, y'all can always contribute to the Metasploit framework. Now talking about the download part, well, y'all can easily download Metasploit from its download page, which is www.metasploit.com slash download. I'll be leaving the download link in the description. And once you're on the download page, you'll see two versions. One is the free version, which is the original Metasploit framework, and it's the core framework that everybody works on. And then there's Metasploit Pro, which comes with a 14-day free trial. So Metasploit Pro actually has a few extra features, which is great for an organization, like it helps you work as a team. But if you're a guy who's just practicing pen testing like me, Metasploit Framework, the free version, is the absolute way to go. Now also, when pen testing, y'all will also need Metasploitable. Now Metasploitable is an intentionally vulnerable target machine for actually practicing your Metasploit skills on. So we'll go over the installation of Metasploitable later, but for now, let's go over Metasploitable. So once you guys have actually downloaded the link, y'all can actually install it on your systems. And Metasploit actually has three interfaces. So we are going to be using the command line interface or the MSF console, in other words. But you all can also use the GUI interface, which is called Armitage, if I'm not wrong. So let's get started. So first of all, I've already actually downloaded Metasploit and installed it on my computer. And you all can just do the same by pressing the download button, as you guys can see. So to start up Metasploit, all you have to do is go on your terminal and so to start a metasploit all you have to do is go on your terminal on linux well we're starting a postgresql server because first of all the postgresql server is the basis of all the metasploit exploits that are stored and starting it will just make it run faster so we go service postgresql and start so that should start up a service and indeed it has. So the next thing you want to do is go in and type MSF console. And that's going to take a little bit of time because I have a very slow computer and it's going to start up our Metasploit frame. So as you guys can see, we got a big banner out here which says Metasploit Cyber Missile. And it's the banner changes every time. Don't get worried if you have a different banner. And the main thing is that you should see this MSF thing out here. So this means we are in the MSF shell right now, which is the Metasploit framework shell. So let's get started by actually clearing our screen. So first things first, the first command that you might want to run on Metasploit is the help command. So help will tell us everything that we can do with this framework. So as you guys can see, there are a bunch of commands and the descriptions to go along with it. You all can give it a quick read and find the things that are interesting to you. So as you guys can see, banner is display an awesome Metasploit banner. Y'all can change the banner. As you guys can see, there are a lot of juicy commands, like there's a banner command, which I just had used. So if you go and type banner, it'll give you a nice cool banner about Metasploit. 
And there are other commands which work very similar to Linux, like CD, which changes the current directory. You can change the color by toggling colors. And then you can connect with a host and all sorts of stuff. So Metasploit has a bunch of exploits. So before we go further, I want to make you guys aware of three important terms regarding Metasploit. So the first is a vulnerability. And we had already discussed this, that a vulnerability is a situation which can be taken advantage of by a system or a person who access. So the second part is an exploit. So what exactly is an exploit? Well, an exploit is a module which is a bunch of code written in Ruby on Metasploit that is used to target different vulnerabilities. And the third thing is a payload. So a payload is the action that you do once you actually have access to somebody's system. So basically, suppose you've hacked somebody and you've gained access to their system. Now the activities you do after gaining access is defined as the payload. So we just spoke about exploits and I told you guys that Metasploit has a bunch of exploits. So how do we see all the exploits that are there? So you go show exploits. Well, as you guys can see, we've loaded up a bunch of exploits, which is basically all the exploits that Metasploit has to offer at this moment. So let me just increase the screen a bit. And let's scroll completely to the top. Yep. So as you guys can see, show exploits gave us a bunch of exploits and it shows their name, a description, a disclosure date, and a rank. So the name and description is, as it says, it's the name of the exploit and it's a short description about it. The disclosure date is when the exploit was actually released by Metasploit and the rank is how it has fared against the vulnerability it was released for since it was actually released. So as you guys can see, ranks range from excellent, great, good, and stuff. And we have a bunch of exploits. So as you guys can see, there's an Android exploit, there's a Samsung Galaxy Knox Android exploit, there are a bunch of Windows exploit, Adobe Flash exploits, FTP exploits, MySQL exploits, ASP.NET exploits, and a bunch of other stuff. So as you guys can see, there are a bunch of exploits to use, and it can get confusing and rather troublesome to search for the exploit you actually want to use. So as a pen tester, you can always go for the search keyword, which is basically suppose you know that you have a MySQL server which has a bunch of vulnerabilities and you want to test those out. So you simply go search MySQL. Now I'll search the database for all the exploits that are related to MySQL and present them to you. Okay, so we have our results. So as you guys can see, we have a bunch of MySQL related modules now. Now it, this makes it way, way easier if you're a pen tester and you're looking for MySQL exploits. Now suppose you choose your exploit and let's see, let's choose which one do we want to use today? We're going to just use this MySQL hash dump. So to actually use this, we have to copy the name. So double click on it and it'll just select it and then you go control shift C in your terminal. So that copies it. And so if you want some more information about it, you can always go info and then just paste in the name of the exploit. So this gives us a bunch of information, actually gives us all the information you need about the exploit. So it gives you the name that it's a MySQL password hash dump. Its module name is auxiliary scanner and all this stuff. It's licensed by Metasploit framework in itself and it has a normal rank. And these are all the options that you might need to set when actually using the exploit. And this also gives you a small description. So it says this module extracts the usernames and encrypted password hashes from a MySQL server and stores them for later cracking. So seems like pretty cool stuff you can do with MySQL server and its password database. So if you actually want to use this, so you have to use the use keyword. So we go use and control shift V. So as you guys can see, it's denoted in red out here that we are indeed in the exploit that we want to use. Now, the first thing you want to do when you're using an exploit is you want to go and say show options. Now, as you guys can see, these are the options that we actually need to set before using the exploit. Now, 
the options can be necessary or they can be optional like so there's a password field out here which is not really necessary but will help your exploit if you actually provide it but you need to provide the r hosts which is the targeting host machine and the port and the threads is already set now suppose you want to set the r hosts so you can just go set r hosts and you can set it to whatever ip address you want like suppose you want to address 192.168.2.56 Something like that. So that will, that will set the R hosts. You can also set the number of threads. Now, threads are actually what the threads mean in parallel processing. That means how many parallel threads you're going to run so that you have faster computation. So this means you need GPU power if you have multiple threads running. So let's set threads to 30 for now. So we've set the threads to 30. And then you can go show options again and see that you have indeed actually set your options. So we've set the threads to 30 and our host has also been set. So that was all about how you can get into a module, know, get some information about a module and how you can also use the module. So once you're done using the module or once you're done setting up the options rather, you can go ahead and run the command run or even exploit. And this will start actually running the exploit on the system that you want to. Now I've put in a very arbitrary IP address so, and that does not have MySQL port running, so our exploit failed. Now, once you have tested out your exploit and you want to go back to the main MSF Unix shell, just go ahead and type back. It's as simple as that. So that brings us back to the MSF command line. So let's go ahead and clear our screen now. Okay. So it's time we do something interesting. So to do that, first of all, we need to go ahead and actually download Metasploitable 2. So to download Metasploitable 2, you have to go on this link. I'll leave the link in the description. So, or rather, you can just go on your browser and type in Metasploitable 2 download. So Metasploitable, as we had earlier discussed, is a Linux-based distribution and it's mostly meant for actually practicing your pen testing skills so basically it has a bunch of ports open on it so it's basically just for your ease so that you don't go ahead and test it out on some valid website and then get thrown into jail because that's a very illegal thing to do so go ahead and download metasploitable 2 and then also download oracle virtual box machine or oracle virtual box so you all can also easily download that from www.virtualbox.org. And this is because you should never run Metasploitable 2 on a system that is connected to a network. You should always use it on a virtual machine because it's protected that way so that nobody else can access it. So to actually set up Metasploitable, once you've downloaded it, you go ahead and open up your virtual box. So out here, you have to go into global tools and you create a host only network manager. Now I've already created a host only network manager and then you go ahead and enable the DHCP server by pressing this out here like enable. Then you go back and you just go new. You give it a name like whatever you want to name it. I have already named mine Metasploitable 2 as you guys can see. So we're going to call this demo for just demonstration purposes. Choose the type to be Linux and it's Ubuntu 64 bit. Click next, give it a gig of RAM and you are going to use an existing virtual hard disk. So out here, you just click on this button out here and you browse to the place where you've actually downloaded and unzipped your Metasploitable download file. Then you'll get this virtual machine disk file. This is a VMDK file and you just go ahead and load it up. So I'm not going to do that again because that's just going to eat up my RAM and I've already installed it out here. So that was all about the installation and the configuration. So now let's get started and let's start playing around with Metasploitable. So once you're done downloading and installing Metasploitable on your computer, all you have to do is go ahead and start it up in your VirtualBox machine. And the login ID and the password both are MSF admin. So first of all, we need the IP address of our Metasploitable server. So we go ifconfig and this gives us the address. So as you can see out here, our address is 192.168.56.101. So once you go ahead and start up Metasploitable, it's time that we go ahead and exploit all the vulnerabilities that is presented to us by Metasploitable 2. So to do that, 
let's head back to our Linux terminal again. So once we have the IP address, that was 192.168.56.101, if I am correct. So let's go and quickly get a little bit of information about that. So who is 192.168.56.101? So this will give us a who is on Metasploitable 2, and it'll give us a bunch of information as to how the server is set up, where it is set up, the ports that are open, and various other things. So as you guys can see, this gave us a complete who is. So to get some more information about our Metasploitable server, we're gonna be using Nmap. Now, if you guys don't know about how to use Nmap, you can go out and check my other video on the playlist. I've made a pretty good Nmap tutorial. So we go Nmap hyphen F hyphen S and V, which is steel version, and we give it the name or the domain name server. And two dot one six eight dot fifty six dot one oh one. So we've got a juicy result out here, and we can see that there's a bunch of stuff open. So as you guys can see, there's the FTP port open, which has a version of VSF TPD 2.3.4. There's also open SSH, which is 4.7 P1 Debian. There's also Telnet, which is almost miserable to have Telnet running on your computer. Then there's SMTP, there's HTTP, and there's a bunch of ports open, as you guys can just see on your screen. So it's time we actually use Metasploit, like a pen tester, to go ahead and test out these vulnerabilities. So let's choose these FTP things. So we have this FTP out here. So from the version number, which is given to us by the steel version flag on Nmap, we know that it's using VSF TPD 2.3.4. So we can easily search for an exploit of the same version. So as a pen tester, you would go search VSF TPD 2.3.4. So this should give us all the exploits that are available for this particular vulnerability. So as you guys can see, after a long search from the search VSF TPD, we found a vulnerability or an exploit that can take advantage of the vulnerability. So it's time we actually use this. So first of all, let's get some info about this. So info, let's copy down this thing, and then let's get some info about this. So as this module description says, this module exploits a malicious backdoor that was added to VSF TPD download archive. This backdoor was introduced in the VSF TPD 2.3.4 tar.gz archive between June 30th and Vala Vala. So we have the options of setting an R host. It has an available target. It's provided by these guys. And it's a pretty good exploit in my opinion. So let's go ahead and use it. So we go use and the name of the exploit. So it's visible to us that we've again entered the exploit module, which is unix slash ftp slash vsf tpd 234 backdoor. So what we are gonna do is we are gonna actually gain a backdoor access to our metasploitable system. So to actually make this more believable, so if you guys go into your metasploitable system, so you guys can see that you're in the root directory. So you can gain some root access by going sudo su and going msf admin. So we're now a root user in the msf admin or rather the metasploitable console. So if we go ls, we can see the various files. And if we go sleety slash home, we're in the home directory now. And if we do ls out here, we can see that there are a bunch of stuff. So there's an FTP folder, there's a hacked folder, there's an MSF admin folder, and there's service and there's user. So that's five folders, if you guys remember. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna gain some backdoor access into the system, and we're gonna create a bunch of folders in the home directory. So let's get on doing that. So to do that, we head back to our Metasploit terminal, and we go show options as we had already entered our exploit. So we'll go show options. So as we see, the options that we have to provide is the R host and the port number. Now the port number has already been set because it's 21, and that's where FTP runs, or rather TCP runs, and we now just have to set the host. So to set the host, we have to just put in the IP address of our Metasploitable server. So if I remember correctly, it set our hosts to 192.168.56.101. So that has set our R hosts, so we can again check that if we've done it correctly by going show options. 
and we indeed have set our hosts. Now, all we have to do is run the exploit. So we go and hit run. So as you guys can see, we have actually gained a backdoor service has spawned and it's handling and the command shell session has started. Now, you might be confused as to why do I have this blinking line? Well, this blinking line actually means that you are inside the Metasploitable server. That means we have already gained a backdoor access and this blinking line denotes that we are on the terminal of Metasploitable 2. Now, if you don't, guys don't believe me, let's do some experimenting. So as I had said, I'll create a bunch of folders in the home directory. So let's change to the home directory first. Or rather, first you can also do a who am I and instead you that you're the root user. Next, you go and do cd slash home and I'll change to the home directory. Now, let's make a bunch of folders like make directory. This is a test. So that should have made a directory. So let's go into that directory cd. This is a test. So we're already into the directory. This is a test. Now let's make a file called targets dot txt so that creates the file so just to see if we have actually done it properly let's go back to our metasploitable server now in the home directory you go and type in ls again okay so let's type in ls and see so as you guys can see we have created a, this is a test folder and it's already available there so let's go and move into that folder so this is a test and we are already in that folder. So, and we had also created a text file, which was called targets. So that was ls, and it should give us a targets.txt. So as you guys just saw, we gained a backdoor access into a remote system through a vulnerability that was available to us on the FTP port. So we first did that by scanning the entire domain name server of Metasploitable via Nmap and gaining some intelligence as to what ports are running and what ports are actually open. Then we found out that the FTP port was open. Then we went on to Metasploit and we found out exploit that vulnerability very successfully. We found out how to use the exploit, some information about that exploit. And in the end, we actually executed our commands and we are already in that folder. So, and we had also created a text file, which was called targets. So that was LS and it should give us a targets.txt. So as you guys just saw, we gained a backdoor access into a remote system through a vulnerability that was available to us on the FTP port. So we first did that by scanning the entire domain name server of Metasploitable via Nmap and gaining some intelligence as to what ports are running and what ports are actually open. Then we found out that the FTP port was open. Then we went on to Metasploit and we found out exploit that vulnerability very successfully. We found out how to use the exploit, some information about that exploit, and in the end, we actually executed our commands. Now, you guys must be wondering what exactly is Nmap and why should I learn it? Well, Nmap is a network scanner that is widely used by ethical hackers to scan networks, as the name suggests. Now, you might wonder, why do I need a network scanner? Well, suppose, let me give you an example. So, suppose you have a Wi-Fi that has been set up in your new house and you realize that your data is being actually consumed at a faster rate than you are using it. Now, you have suspected that it's your pesky neighbor who keeps on connecting to your Wi-Fi and eating up all your data. So, to actually confirm all your doubts, what you want to do is a network scan. And Nmap is a pretty wonderful tool to do that. Now. Nmap runs on Linux, uh, Mac OS and Windows and I'm mostly going to be running this on Linux because that's what I do most of my penetration testing and network testing on. So let's go ahead and get on with the installation of Nmap on your computer. So what you do is go apt-get install Nmap. Now for uh, this you have to be logged in as root. If you're not logged in as root just add sudo before this whole command and it will install it. Now I already have Nmap installed so 
I'm not really gonna install it again and again so let's just go ahead and just do a few scans on our website that is www.edureka.co and we are gonna see what we get back as results so first of all let me just show you how you can scan a certain domain name service or sir DNS so edmap we are gonna use a flag all the time now let me just tell you uh, what are flags so if you just go into nmap and type dash dash help this will give you all the flags and options that are available to actually use on nmap so if you are actually stuck and you can't remember stuff just go in and type nmap dash dash help and it will give you all the stuff now network scans generally take a long time so i'm going to be using the fast mode most of the time so for fast mode all you have to do is type in edureka.co and sit and wait for this scan to get over now when the scan gets over you will see a bunch of information and let me just wait till that information pops up and then we'll talk about the information together okay so as you guys can see our scan has been completed it took 13.71 seconds to actually do the scan now as you guys can see it shows us the ports the states and the services now the ports is basically the port number which our service that is also binded to is working on so we can see that SSH service is working on port number 22 SMTP on 25, HTTP on 80, RPC bind on 111 and HTTPS on 443 so that is how you can use nmap to scan a certain website now if you see nmap has also given us the public IP of the DNS because what nmap does is it looks up the DNS and then translates it to an IP that is recognized to the DNS server so nmap also returns the public IP so what we can do also is nmap hyphen F and 34.210.230 and .35 okay so as you guys can see that our command also works when we put in the IP address and it produces the same results now we can also um, scan for multiple hosts now suppose you are on a network and you want to scan for multiple hosts now you don't really want to run different commands for that now what you can do is just go in and type nmap and a bunch of IP addresses like 192.168.1.1 and 192.168.1.2 and 192.168.1.3 and what this will do is it will run an nmaps scan on these three different IP addresses and you did this uh, in just one command so that's a way that you can do this now you can also know about how much of your scan is left by just pressing the up button so that will tell you and give you a constant update on how your scan is going like mine is 32.4 percent done and 34.7 now and also show you kind of the time remaining okay so till this port scan is going on let me just tell you about the states now states can be of two types open closed and unavailable sometimes you'll see that it is unavailable and that's because some sort of firewall or something is running out there states can also be closed in that case mostly nmap will not return you any result unless you're explicitly finding something of the closed state so that was a little trivia on states and how they work let's see how much our scan is done so our scan is done 81 percent and it takes around another 20 seconds it should be done soon now this scan could be significantly made faster with just the f tag but i really want to give you all a good look into how this works 97, 98, 99. Okay, so as you guys can see, this is our result. It gives us a bunch of ports and services. Now, as I just said, this thing can be also closed and also unavailable. So, open and closed, we see both the examples. Okay, so that was about how you can scan multiple ports. So, you can also scan multiple ports with this command, as I will show you. So, 192. Dot 168.1.1230 now what this will do is basically scan everything from 192.168.1.1 to 192.168.1.2 up to 30 like that so this is a very useful way of actually scanning multiple IP addresses and let me just show you how that works since we have used the F flag this is going to work considerably faster now as you guys can see out here this had taken around 119 seconds so that's around two minutes now this will take a considerably lesser time 
So let's see, this was done in 29.91 seconds and we did 30 IP addresses. So we see that hyphen F surely speedens the whole scanning process. Now you can also give nmap a target list. Now let me make a target list. So targets.txt. Let me just cat it out for you. So there's nothing in it. Now all I want to do is edit this file. So let me just edit that file and put a 192.168.1.1.192.168.1.2.192.168.1.3.192.168.1.4.192.168.1.5 or 15. Boom, roasted. Now all we have to do is save it. So that saves it and control X to actually exit it. Now you can go ahead and view what is in targets.txt. So as you guys can see, this is what is in targets.txt. And now you can just pass it to nmap with the IL flag. And you can say that nmap is going to actually scan all the IP addresses that are in this file. So let that just run. So this will take a little bit of time because it's five IP addresses and it's not really running on the fast mode. 83% of our work is done. Okay, so as we see, our scan has been completed. Now, what you see out here is the scan results for whatever we had provided in the targets.txt list. So that's how you can also provide nmap input file and it will give you the results for all the targets that were specified in the file. Now, let's go ahead and talk about a little bit on port scanning. So nmap is also a brilliant tool for scanning ports and if you have a server or a website you know that there are around 65,535 ports out there on every server and almost 99% are unused. So sometimes scanning ports is really a necessity. Now you can scan ports by just using the P flag and specifying the port number and this is how you would do it and you would just specify the IP address after that. So I'm going to use www.edureca.co and what you can also do is this will scan only the port number 20 but you can also scan from port number 20 to 25. You can also put in commas and tell nmap you also want to scan all these other port 80 is HTTP and 443 is HTTPS. So you can surely do that. So let me just go ahead and run this. Okay so that gives us an information on the ports that is there. Now, something about ports also, you suppose you know you want to scan for some HTTP ports. So you can just say nmap and with the hyphen P, you can just say that I want to scan the HTTP port on www.edureka.co. So that will just go ahead and do that. And as you guys can see, that gave us a result. And you can also add in stuff like MySQL, FTP and stuff like that. So let me just see. Uh, show you how that runs okay http is not a port sct okay so as you guys can see these are the ports that are running and it gave us according to the name now if you want to scan all the ports you can use hyphen p hyphen and then the ip address at www.edureca.co now this generally takes a lot of time because you're basically doing 65,000 scans so i'm not really going to do that i'm going to quit this out Another thing that I wanted to show you all that generally takes a lot of time to actually execute is called something like an aggressive scan. So as you guys can see out here, I have done an aggressive scan on edureka. So to do that, all you have to do is nmap-a and then you go edureka.co. So let us see how much time did this take to actually execute. This took 459 seconds. That's a long time for a scan but it gives us a bunch of other information. For example, it gives us the trace route. So what is a trace route, first of all? So trace route is the route taken by a packet to actually reach the clients and the target server. So as you guys can see, our packet had 22 hops. First it went to the first hop was to the gateway router, that is 192.168.1.1. Then it went to the Airtel lease line, then it went to this IP address, then it went to the BSNL, VSNL.net, and it went to London, New York, then Chicago, and it went all the way up to wherever this thing is hosted. That was some information, and then there is some other information given to us, like the TCP open, TCP wrap, program versions, port types, port states, and all sorts of other information is given about in an aggressive scan. 
Another scan that I have previously also done and kept for y'all is because it takes a lot of time and I have done something called the service version. So nmap-s and v where v capital will give you the service version. So it tries to actually guess the version of the service that is running. So for example on the TCP port it tells us it is postfix smtpd. On the Apache it's Apache sttpd and you can see all sorts of versions that are here. Another thing Nmap is generally brilliant is for guessing the operating system that is running. Now I have already done this scan previously because this takes a humongous amount of time that I don't really have and that is 386.34 seconds and this scan together basically took me more than 10 minutes and I don't really have that kind of time for explaining all this stuff. So as you guys can see out here the OS is kind of OS detail is Fortinet, FortiGate it kind of tries to guess the OS upon the time to live that is in the response from the packets that it sends. So hyphen SV, hyphen O and hyphen A are some really cool th stuff that you might want to know. Another thing that you can do is trace route as I had just told y'all and y'all can do trace route separately. So you go hyphen hyphen trace route and then you say the name of any sort of website. So suppose I want to know how I reach netflix.com. So I go netflix.com uh, and this will give me a trace route that shows me how my packet actually reaches netflix.com. Okay, so this is basically it was a direct one hop. Okay, so that was surprising. On the other hand, if I were to do this on edureka.co, it would take a bunch of hops to actually reach there. Okay, this might just take some time to run. Okay, so it's 94% done. I'm just waiting for it to get completed. Okay, so this gave us a hop and as you guys can see, we took 22 hops to actually reach edureka.co and it's the same process. You go through a bunch of IP addresses and then you reach this thing called the US West to compute.amazon.ews. Okay, so that was about trace route. Now, just to end this tutorial, let me just tell you guys that you all can also save a file to Nmap and that is basically save all whatever you found from a search into a file and let me just show you how to do that. Now sometimes when you are working as a security analyst you will have to perform network scans on a wide area network that is huge. It's basically huge. And these scans take a lot of time and you don't really have the space on your command line to actually store that and see that in a way that is feasible for analysis. So what you want to do is actually save it in a file. So what you can do is say nmap O N and then you can say the name of the file. We could say results.txt and we could save this in file. So www.edureka.co. So whatever search result is going to be generated is going to be stored in this file called results.txt. Now this file need not exist from before. It will just be created by Nmap. And now you see if I do ls we have a targets or a results.txt. Now if I just cat out that file, let me just less it actually. Results.txt. And what you see out here is an nmap scan result that is stored. Um, another thing that I would like to show you all before I end this nmap tutorial is a verbose mode. So for verbose mode is basically when we were pressing up arrows to see how much of our scan is done, you can basically do that with verbose mode. So you go hyphen F and hyphen V for verbose and you could say www.edureka.co and this will basically give you a verbose mode of what is actually going on. It'll tell you everything and boom roasted there it's done and we have finished our nmap tutorial. And now you see if I do ls we have a targets or a results.txt. Now if I just cat out that file let me just less it actually results.txt and what you see out here is an nmap scan result that is stored. Um, another thing that I would like to show you all before I end this nmap tutorial is a verbose mode. So for verbose mode is basically when we were pressing up arrows to see how much of our scan is done you can basically do that with verbose mode. So you go hyphen f and hyphen v for verbose and you could say www.edureka.com and this will basically give you a verbose mode of what is actually going on. It'll tell you everything and boom, roasted, there it's done. And we have finished our Nmap tutorial. So first of all, what exactly is cross-site scripting? Well, 
Cross-site scripting refers to client-side code injection attacks wherein an attacker can execute a malicious script, also commonly referred to as a malicious payload, into a legitimate website or web application. Now, XSS is amongst the most rampant of web application vulnerabilities and occurs when a web application makes use of something like an unvalidated or unencoded user input within the output that it generates. Now, by leveraging XSS, an attacker does not target a victim directly. Instead, an attacker would be exploiting a vulnerability within a website or something like a web application that the victim would visit and essentially using the vulnerable website or the web application as a vehicle to deliver a malicious script to the victim's browser. Now, while XSS can be taken at the advantage of uh, within a VirtualBox script, ActiveX, and Flash, unquestionably, the most widely abused is JavaScript. This is mostly because JavaScript is the fundamental to any browsing experience. All the modern sites today have some JavaScript framework running in the background. Now, XSS can be used in a range of ways to cause serious problems. Well, the traditional is uses of XSS is the ability for an attacker to steal session cookies, allowing an attacker to probably impersonate a victim. And that just, is, and that just doesn't stop there. So XSS has been used to wreak havoc on social websites, spread malware, website defecaments, and fish for credentials, and even used in conjunction with some clever social engineering techniques to escalate to even more damaging attacks. Now, cross-site scripting can be classified into three major categories. So the first is reflected cross-site scripting. The second is stored or persistent cross-site scripting. And the third is DOM-based cross-site scripting. So out here, DOM refers to the document object model that is used while web application building. So let's take a moment to discuss the three types of cross-site scripting. So the first one we are going to be discussing is reflected cross-site scripting. Now, by far, the most common type of cross-site scripting that you'll be coming across is probably reflected cross-site scripting. Here, the attacker's payload is a script and has to be part of a request which is sent to the web server and reflected back in such a way that the HTTP response includes the payload from the HTTP request. Now, using a phishing email and other social engineering techniques, the attacker lures in the victim to inadvertently make a request to the server, which contains the cross-site scripting payload, and then he ends up executing the script that gets reflected and executed inside his own browser. Now, since reflected cross-site scripting isn't really a persistent kind of attack, the attacker needs to deliver this payload to each victim that he wants to serve. So a medium like a social network is very conveniently used for dissemination of these attacks. So now let's take a step-by-step -step look at how cross-site scripting actually works. So firstly, the attacker crafts a URL containing a malicious string and sends it to the victim. Now the poor victim is tricked by the attacker into requesting the URL from the website, which is running a website response script. And then the website includes the malicious string from the URL in the response. And then in the end, the victim's browser executes the malicious script inside the response, sending the victim's cookies to the attacker's server. OK, so at first, reflected XSS might seem very harmless because it requires the victim himself to actually send a request containing a malicious string. Now, since nobody would be willingly attacking himself, so there seems to be no way of actually performing the attack. But as it turns out, there are at least two common ways of causing a victim to launch a reflected cross-site attack on himself. So the first way is if the user or targets a specific individual and the attacker can send a malicious URL to the victim, for example, using uh, email or, for example, instant messaging, and then trick him into visiting the site. Secondly, if the user targets a large group of people, the attacker then can publish the link or the malicious URL on his own website or social media, and then he'll just wait for visitors to click on it. So these two methods are similar, and both can be very successful with the use of a URL shortening service, like one provided by Google. So this masks the malicious string from users who might otherwise identify it. OK, so that was all about reflected cross-site scripting. Let's move on to stored cross-site scripting now. So the most damaging type of cross-site scripting that is there today is persistent or stored cross-site scripting. In stored cross-site scripting attacks, it attacks, uh, I'm sorry, in stored cross-site scripting attacks, uh, the attacker is injecting a script into the database that is permanently stored on the target application. So a classic example is a malicious script inserted by an attacker in the comment field or on a blog or a forum post. 
So when a victim navigates to the affected web page now in a browser, the cross-site scripting payload will be served as a part of the web page, just like any legitimate comment would be. Now this means that the victim will be inadvertently ended up ending up executing the malicious script once the page is viewed in the browser. Now let's also take a step-by-step -step look at how cross-site scripting in the stored version works. So the attacker uses one of the website's form to insert a malicious string into the website's database first. Now the victim unknowingly requests a page from the website and then the website includes the malicious string from the database in the response and then sends it to the victim. Now the poor victim will be actually executing the malicious script inside the response and sending all the cookies to the attacker's server. So that's basically how stored or persistent cross-site scripting works. Now it's time for the last type of cross-site scripting which is document object model based cross-site scripting. So DOM based cross-site scripting is an advanced type of cross-site scripting attack. So which is made possible when the web application's client side script writer uses provided data to the document object model. So basically it means that data is subsequently read from the document object model by the web application and outputted to the browser. So if the data is incorrectly handled in this place, an attacker can very well inject a payload which will be stored as a part of the document object model and then executed when the data is read back from the DOM. Now let's see how that actually happens. So first the attacker crafts a URL containing a malicious string and sends it to the victim. Now this victim is again tricked by the attacker into actually requesting the URL from the website. This is like the primary step in actually performing cross-site scripting. Now the third step is that the website receives the request but does not include the malicious string in the response. Here's the catch of DOM-based cross-site scripting. So now the victim's browser executes the legitimate script inside the response, causing the malicious script to be inserted into the page. That is basically into the inner HTML attributes. And the final step is then the victim's browser then executes the malicious script inserted into the page and then just sends the victim the cookies to the attacker's server. Now, if you guys must have realized, in the previous examples of persistent and reflected cross-site scripting, the server inserts the malicious script into the page, which is then sent as a response to the victim. Now, when the victim's browser receives the response, it assumes that the malicious script is to be a part of the page's legitimate content and then automatically executes it during page load as with any other script would be. But in a DOM-based attack, there is no malicious script inserted as a part of the page. The only scripts that are being actually automatically automatically executed during the page load is legitimate part of the page. So that's the scary part. So the problem is that this legitimate script directly makes user input in order to add HTML to the page. So the malicious string is inserted into the page using inner HTML. So it's passed as HTML. So mostly people who are actually servicing or surveying any server for cross-site scripting attacks, they will not be actually checking the client side. So it's a very subtle difference, but it's very important. So in traditional cross-site scripting, the malicious JavaScript is actually executed when the page is loaded as a part of the HTML server. And in DOM-based cross-site scripting, the malicious JavaScript is executed at some point after the page has already been loaded because the page's legitimate JavaScript treating user input is using it in an unsafe way. So now that we have actually discussed all the three types of cross-site scripting that is, varied, uh, that is widely available today, now let's see what can actually happen if cross-site scripting were, if you were actually a victim of cross-site scripting, I'm sorry. So let's see what can happen if you actually were a victim of cross-site scripting. So the consequences of what an attacker can do with the ability to execute JavaScript on a web page may not immediately stand out to you guys, but especially since browsers like JavaScript, like Chrome run JavaScript in a very tightly controlled environment these days, and JavaScript has very limited access to users' operating systems and user files. But when considering that JavaScript has the access to the following that we're gonna discuss, we can only see how creative JavaScript uh, attackers can get. So firstly, with malicious JavaScript has access to all the same objects that the rest of the web page has. So this includes a thing called cookies. Now cookies are often used to store session tokens and if an attacker can obtain a user session cookie, they can impersonate that user anywhere on the internet. Secondly, JavaScript can read and make arbitrary modifications to the browser's document object model. So your page will just be incorporated with all sorts of scripts and viruses without you even knowing from the server side. 
Now, JavaScript can be used with the XML HTTP request to send HTTP requests with arbitrary content to arbitrary destinations. And the most scary part is that JavaScript in modern browsers can leverage HTML5 APIs, such as accessing a user's geolocation, webcam, microphone, and whatnot, and even specific files from the user's file system. Now, while most of these APIs require the users to opt in, cross-site scripting with, in conjunction with some very clever social engineering can bring an attacker a very long way. Now, the above in combination with social engineering, as I just said, allows an attacker to pull off advanced attacks, including cookie theft, key logging, phishing, and identity theft too. Now, critically, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities provide the perfect ground for attackers to escalate attacks to more serious ones. So now that we understand what cross-site scripting attacks are and how damaging they can be to your application, let's dive into the best known practices that are actually followed to prevent them in the first place. So the first mechanism that is used is called escaping. So escaping data means that taking data an application has received and ensuring that it's secure before actually rendering it for the end user. Now by escaping user input, key characters in the data received by a web page will be prevented from being interpreted in any malicious sort of way. Now in a sense, you're censoring the data your web page receives in a way that will disallow characters, especially those brackets that begin the HTML attributes, like in HTML and IMG. So these will be stopped from being rendered, which would otherwise cause harm to your application and users and database. But if your page doesn't allow users to add their own code to the page, a good rule of thumb is normally to escape any and all HTML, URL, and JavaScript entities. However, if you are running a forum and you do allow users to add rich text to your content, you have a few choices. So firstly, you'll need to carefully choose which HTML entities you will escape and which you won't or by replacement format for raw HTML, such as Markdown, which will in turn allow you to continue escaping all the sorts of HTML characters. Now, the second method that is normally used is called validating input. So validating input is the process of ensuring an application is rendering the correct data and preventing malicious data from doing harm to the site, the database, and the users. So while whitelisting and input validation are more commonly associated with stuff like SQL injection, they can also be used as an additional method of prevention for cross-site scripting attacks. So input validation is especially helpful and good at preventing cross-site scripting in forms as it prevents a user from adding special characters into the fields instead of refusing the request completely. But input, valid input validation is not the primary method of prevention for vulnerabilities, such as cross-site scripting and even SQL injection for that example, but instead they help to reduce the effects should an attacker actually discover such a vulnerability in your system. Now the third way to prevent cross-site scripting attack is to sanitize user input. So sanitizing data is a strong defense, but should not be used alone to battle cross-site scripting attacks. It's totally possible that you find the need to use all three methods of prevention in working towards a more secure application. Now, as you guys might notice that sanitizing user inputs is especially helpful on sites that allow HTML markup to ensure data received can do no harm to users, as well as your database by scrubbing the data clean of potentially harmful markup and changing the unacceptable user input into an acceptable format. Okay guys, so that was all the theory about cross-site scripting. And it's time for the demo right now. So for the demonstration now, I'm gonna be showing you guys the three types of cross-site scripting that we have discussed throughout the course of this session. So not only will this be a rather interesting to see how cross-site scripting works on a vulnerable web application, but it will also give us a better understanding of cross-site scripting in itself. Now, to perform cross-site scripting is a very big crime, so we really can't target any random web, uh, website or web application for that matter. So keeping that thing in mind, I have chosen the Broken Web Application Project. So this is brought to us by OWASP, which stands for Open Source Web Application Security Project. Now, the Broken Web Application Project, or BWAP, is a broken web application that is intentionally vulnerable and it incorporates a majority of the known bugs that are out there. And it is widely used by security enthusiasts, students, and practicing ethical hackers to mostly practice and nurture their skills in the right direction. Okay, so to get started, first of all, we need to download a few files and get things ready. 
So first of all, we'll download the broken web application project and I'll be leaving the download link in the description just in case you guys want to practice in your own free time. Secondly, we will need to download a virtual box. Now, after we have both the files ready and we have it installed and we have our uh, broken web application installed in the virtual machine, we are good to go. Now, I've already done all that boring job and actually installed the broken web application. As you guys can see, I'm already running the OWASP broken web application on my virtual machine. And this is the OWASP uh, virtual machine. So as you guys can see, it's based off Linux. And if we go ifconfig, it'll give us the IP address that it's running on. So as you guys can see, it's running on 192.168.146.4. So, if we just head over there, yeah, I've already opened that up, we get a portal. So for this particular demonstration, I'm going to be using the broken web application project and also WebGoat. So first of all, let's head over to the broken web application project. So we'll be greeted with a login screen out here and the credentials for this is B and bug, as you guys can see. So just go and enter login after you've entered the credentials. Okay, so you all will be welcome with a place where you can choose your bug and you can also choose the amount of security that you want to practice with. So since this is a very simple demonstration, I'm going to set the security to low and the first thing that we're going to test is actually reflected cross-site scripting. So reflected cross-site scripting mostly has things to do with the GET request uh, when we are actually coding on the back end, so let's see. So first of all, we go ahead and choose reflected cross-site scripting for the get method and we go and press hack. Now we'll be presented with a form. Now form is a very good way of actually showing a reflected cross-site scripting because normally when an attacker will be trying to attack you, he'll be trying to send you a form or any way you can actually input something into the, his server. So interestingly, if we go and just input nothing into these two fields and just go, we'll see the URL change out here. So firstly, you guys see that it's the fields are very clearly visible and these are the two fields and that means that it's an unencoded input. So this is a very rich place to actually practice your web uh, vulnerability and penetration testing skills. So if I were a hacker, I would try and run a script out here. So if I were to go script, and I've already practiced a few out here as you guys can see. So if you go script alert, this is an example of reflected XSS. Yeah, and if we go and just end the script out here, this is going to actually render the JavaScript input as a part of the page and we are gonna get an output because of this. So that's how uh, reflected cross-site script is actually working. So as you guys can see, we uh, the uh, what am I saying? As you guys can see, the web application has actually rendered our JavaScript, and now we can see that reflected cross-site scripting is actually working out here. So now you guys must have realized that in a practical scenario, this form must be sent to the victim and must be tricked into filling the form for the attack to be successful. Also, in more practical scenarios where sites are also having forms, they're going to be putting filters to the content of the input parameters such that you cannot run JavaScript in them. And you cannot also put any unencoded inputs into them. So that was all about reflected JavaScript. I mean, reflected cross-site scripting. So now let's move on to stored cross-site scripting, which is the most dangerous form of cross-site scripting. Okay, so as I had discussed, the comment sections are normally the best place for actual stored cross-site scripting. So, as you guys can see out here, if we already have a few comments that I had added for practicing. Now, in stored cross-site scripting, the attacker is normally attacking the data that is stored. So basically, we are going to inject the script into the database, into the server. So if the script has some malicious intent, and it can do a multitude of things if it has a malicious intent, we'll not get into that. So for that reason, let's first add a normal comment out here. 
So let's say if this was a blog, I'd say good job there, like I said, or something like, hey man, nice work. And if you go and press submit, okay, it's showing this is an example of persistent cross-site scripting because I had already inserted a malicious script. So this is that script out here, the second input. But just for demonstration purposes, let's go and input it again. So we can also input raw data that is unencoded input in the form of a script. So let's go alert. And let's just print hello world. So if we go and press submit, so it first runs that other cross-site script and then it'll say that this page isn't working. So this is also a very good example. Now we have two scripts actually running on this page. So the first one is actually, this is an example of cross-site scripting, persistent. So that was the second one. And then comes the hello world. So that's actually two scripts running back to back. So anybody, if I were to actually come back to this site any other day and these comments existed, it would just get automatically executed from the database because just because we are referring to it. Okay, so time for DOM-based cross-site scripting. And I was using this application for the first time yesterday and I realized that there is actually no way that we can actually test DOM-based cross-site scripting here. So to actually test DOM-based cross-site scripting, we are gonna be using this thing called WebGoat. Now the login credentials to WebGoat is guest for the username and guest for the password. I'd already logged in so it didn't ask me. So now if you go out here and go under cross-site scripting in XSS, you will also see that there is no options available for actually DOM-based cross-site scripting. This is because it's under AJAX security or AJAX if you might pronounce it that way. So, in, this is under AX security because if you guys remember, we had just discussed that DOM-based cross-site scripting is a client-side cross-site scripting. So things like a normal script would normally be checked on the server side. But when we are talking on client side, we are talking about languages like HTML, AX, etc. So you can put your scripts in HTML form. So suppose we were to go, so let's input a script first. So suppose we were to go script hello world. Now, if we go and submit the solution, nothing actually happens because we are actually putting in encoded inputs out there. It's the DOM that is unencoded. Now, if we were to actually go in and input in a language that the client side actually understands, for example, HTML, so we'd immediately get a result. So, first of all, it's going to actually manipulate the inner HTML attributes of the site. So, if we go image, and we put a source now let's not give the source anything and on alert on error rather on an error we're going to run some simple javascript so alert and we can say this is an example of dom based xss now as soon as i end uh, end the image tag this is going to get run because the client side is always rendering the client side page. So watch this. I'm sorry, I think I mistyped somewhere. Okay, let's go again. So image. Okay, let's use something I've already used. And you can see that it says hacked. And out here, we've not even pressed submit solution. So out here, you can see that as soon as we completed it, it's again saying hacked. So that means as soon as you complete the query or the client side HTML language, so that will completely trigger the cross site payload image tag. This is going to get run because the client side is always rendering the client side page. So watch this. I'm sorry. I think I mistyped somewhere. Okay. Let's go again. So image, okay, let's use something I've already used. And you can see that it says hacked. And out here, we've not even pressed submit solution. So out here, you can see that as soon as we completed it, 
it's again saying hacked. So that means as soon as you complete the query or the client side HTML language, so that will completely trigger the cross site payload. Firstly, let's go over what DOS and DDoS means. Now to understand a DDoS attack, it is essential to understand the fundamentals of a DOS attack. DOS simply stands for denial of service. This service could be of any kind. For example, imagine your mother confiscates your cell phone when you are preparing for your exams to help you study without any sort of distraction. While the intentions of your mother is truly out of care and concern, you are being denied the service of calling and any other service offered by your cell phone. Now, with respect to a computer and computer networks, a denial of service could be in the form of hijacking web servers, overloading ports with requests, rendering them unusable, denying wireless authentication, and denying any sort of service that is provided on the internet. Attacks of such intent can be performed from a single machine. While single machine attacks are much easier to execute and monitor, they are also easy to detect and mitigate. To solve this issue, the attack could be executed from multiple devices spread across a wide area. Not only does this make it difficult to stop the attack, but it also becomes near impossible to point out the main culprit. Such attacks are called distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. Now let's see how they work. The main idea of a DDoS attack, as explained, is making a certain service unavailable. Since everything that is attacked is in reality running on a machine, the service can be made unavailable if the performance of the machine can be brought down. This is the fundamental behind DOS and DDoS attacks. Now some DOS attacks are executed by flooding servers with connection requests until the server is overloaded and is deemed useless. Others are executed by sending unfragmented packets to a server which they are unable to handle. These methods when executed by a botnet exponentially increase the amount of damage that they are doing and their difficulty to mitigate increases in leaps and bounds. To understand more about how these attacks work, let us look at the different types of attacks. Now, while there are plenty of ways to perform a DDoS attack, I'll be listing down the more famous ones. These methodologies have become famous due to their success rate and the damage they have caused over time. It is important to note that with the advancement in technology, the more creative minds have devised more devious ways to perform DOS attacks. Now, the first type of methodology that we're going to discuss is called ping of death. Now, according to the TCP IP protocol, the maximum size of a packet can be 65,535 bytes. The ping of death attack exploits this particular fact. In this type of attack, the attacker sends packets that are more than the max packet size when the packet fragments are added up. Computers generally do not know what to do with such packets and end up freezing or sometimes crashing entirely. Then we come to reflected attacks. This particular attack is more often than not used with the help of a botnet. The attacker sends a host of innocent computers a connection request using a botnet, which are also called reflectors. Now this connection that comes from the botnet looks like it comes from the victim and this is done by spoofing the source part in the packet header. This makes the host of computers send an acknowledgement to the victim computer. Since there are multiple such requests from the different computers to the same machine, this overloads the computer and crashes it. This type of attack is also known as a smurf attack. Another type of attack is called mail bomb. Now mail bomb attacks generally attack email servers. In this type of attack, instead of packets, Oversized emails filled with random garbage values are sent to the target's email server. This generally crashes the email server due to a sudden spike in load and renders them useless until fixed. Last but not the least, we have the teardrop attack. So in this type of attack, the fragmentation offset field of a packet is abused. One of the fields in an IP header is the fragment offset field, indicating the starting position or offset of the data contained in a fragmented packet relative to the data in the original packet. If the sum of the offset and the size of one fragmented packet differs from that of the next fragmented packet, the packets overlap. Now, when this happens, the server vulnerable to teardrop attacks is unable to reassemble the packets, resulting in a denial of service condition. Okay, so that was all the theoretical portion of this video. Now it's time to actually perform our very own DDoS attack. Okay, so now that we finished the theoretical part of how DDoS actually works and what it actually is with its different types, let me just give you guys a quick demonstration on how you could apply a denial of service attack on a wireless network anywhere around you. Like this could be somewhere like Starbucks where you're sitting, or this could be a library also, or your college institution. No matter where you're sitting, this procedure will work. So the first thing we want to do is actually open up a terminal as because we will be doing most of our work on a command line basis. 
Now for this particular demonstration, we will be actually using two tools. First is Aircrack NG, which is a suite of tools which contains Aircrack NG, Airmon NG, Air Replay NG, and Aerodump NG. So these are the four tools that come along with it. And the second one that we'll be using is called Max Changer. Okay, so let me just put my terminal on maximum so you guys can see what I'm actually writing out. So first thing we want to do is actually log in as a root. So let me just do that quickly. So because we need to log in as root because most of the stuff that we're going to do right now will need administrator access. Now, if the first thing we want to do is check out our wireless network card's name, and we can do that easily by typing ifconfig. Now you can see that my wireless card is called WL01 and uh, we get the MAC address and we also get the IPv6 address. So that's my wireless network card and we'll be actually setting that up in monitor mode. Now, before we actually go into and start up our network card in monitor mode, let me just show you how you can install the two tools that I just spoke about. That is Aircrack NG and Mac Changer. So to install Aircrack NG, you can just go apt get install Aircrack NG. Hit enter and this should do it for you. I already have it installed, so it's not going to do much. To install Mac Changer, you could just go the same command that is apt get install Mac Changer and you can check if both the tools have been installed properly by opening the manual pages by typing man aircrack ng and this will open up the manual page for you and let's also do the same for mac changer so what we're going to do first is set up our network interface card into monitor mode so to do that all we have to do is type ifconfig and we need to put our network interface card down so we go wl01 down and with the command iwconfig we go mode monitor don't forget to specify the interface that you're working on. So iwconfig wl1 mode monitor. And all you have to do now is put it back up. So what we are going to type is ifconfig wl1 up. You can check the mode. It'll say managed if it's in monitoring mode. So as you guys can see, it says mode managed. So that's how we're going to go ahead. So you can check that just for your own purposes. So we can also check for only wl1 by specifying the interface. Or you could also check the mode only by passing it through a pipe function, and that is using grep mode. So iwconfig wl1 grep and mode. Well, mode begins with a capital M, so that's how you would probably return it. So as you guys can see, that has returned the mode for us. I gone along with the access point and the frequency. Okay, so that was a little fun trivia on how you could fetch the mode from a certain command that like iwconfig by passing it through a pipe and grabbing it with mode. Grab basically means grab. Okay, so now moving on, we'll get to the more important stuff now. So firstly, we need to check for some sub processes that might still be running and that might actually interfere with our scanning process. So to do that, what we do is airmon ng check and then the name of the interface. Now, as you guys can see, I have the network manager that is running out here and we need to kill that first and that can be easily done by going kill with the PID. After that, you can run a general command called airmon ng check and kill. So whatever it finds, it will kill it accordingly. And when it produces no results like this, that means you're ready to go as there are no sub processes running that might actually interfere with our scan. Now what we want to do is we want to run a dump scan on the network interface card and check out all the possible access points that are available to us. So as you guys can see, this produces a bunch of access points and they come with their BSS IDs. They also have the power, which is the PWR, that is the power of the signal. And let me go down back again. So yeah, you can see the beacons, you can see the data, you can see the channels available. And what the BSS ID is, it's the MAC ID that is actually tied in with the ESS ID, which basically represents the name of the router. Now what we want to do from here is we want to choose which router we want to actually DOS. Now the whole process of DOSing is actually we will continuously de-authenticate all the devices that are connected to it. So for now I have chosen Edureka Wi-Fi to actually DOS out. And once I send a de-authentication broadcast, it will actually de-authenticate all the devices that are connected to it. Now this de-authentication is done with a tool called Air Replay, which is a part of the Aircrack NG suite of tools. Now let us just see how we can use air replay by opening up the help command. So we go dash dash help and this opens up the help command for us. Now, as you guys can see, it shows us that we can send a de-authentication message by typing in the hyphen zero. 
and then we need to type in the count. So what we are going to do is type in hyphen zero, which will send a deauthentication message. And now we can type one or zero. So one will send only one deauthentication message, while zero will continuously loop it and send a bunch of deauthentication messages. We are going to say zero because we want to be sure that we are deauthenticating everybody. And we can also generally specify the person we also want to specifically deauthenticate. But for this demonstration, I'm just going to try and deauthenticate everybody that is there. So what we are going to do is we are going to copy down the MAC address or the BSS ID as you would know it. And then we are going to run the authentication message. Now, as you guys can see, our deauthentication message is beginning to hunt on channel nine. Now, as you guys know, and as I already know that our BSS ID or the MAC address is working on channel six. Now we can easily change the channel that our interface is working on by just going iwconfig w one and then channel and then specifying the channel. Now, as you guys can see, our chosen router is working on channel six. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, as you guys can see, it immediately starts sending deauthentication codes to the specified router. And this will actually make any device that is connected to that router almost unusable. You might see that you are still connected to the Wi-Fi, but try browsing the internet with them. You will never be able to actually reach any site as I'm constantly deauthenticating your service. You will need that four-way handshake all the time. And even if it completes, you are suddenly deauthenticated again because I'm running this thing on a loop. Now you can let this command run for a few moments or how much of a time you want to DDoS that guy for. Well, this is not exactly a DDoS because you're doing it from one single machine, but you can also optimize this code to actually look like it's running from several different machines. So let me just show you how to do that. We're going to write a script file to actually optimize our code a lot. So this script file will actually automate most of the things that we just did and also optimize a little by changing our MAC address every single time. So we become hard to actually point out. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to put our wireless network card down and maybe that's not the first thing that I want to do. Just give me a moment to think about this. I haven't actually thought this through and I'm doing this on the fly. OK, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start a while loop that is going to continuously run until we actually externally stop it. So we go while true and then we're going to say do. And the first thing that we want to do is send out a deauthentication message and we are going to send it around 10 deauthentication messages and we want to run it on a specific BSS ID. So that is the BSS ID that I had copied. So let me just put in that and then we just put in the interface that it's supposed to work on. Now what we want to do after that is we want to change the MAC address after we have sent all these 10 packets. So what we will need to do is put our, down our wireless network and as I already discussed, we can do that with ifconfig wl one down and now what we want to do is change our MAC address. So we can do that with the simple tool that we had installed and saying MAC changer hyphen R. So let me just open up a quick tab and show you guys how MAC changer actually works. Now you can already check out my other video called the ethical hacking course, which actually covers a lot of topics and MAC changer is just one of them. And you can check how to use it in depth in that video. But for now, let me just give you a brief introduction to how Mac Changer works. The Mac Changer will basically give you a new Mac address every time. Uh, let me just open up the help menu for you guys. So as you guys can see, these are the options that are available to us. We can get a random Mac address. We can also tell it to show our Mac address. And we also have to specify the interface when we want to show us the Mac address. Now let me just generate a new Mac address. Uh, so you see out here that interface up or insufficient permissions is being shown. So this means we always have to put down our interface first. So let me just do that quickly. I have config WL1 down. And now what we want to do is give ourselves a new MAC address and boom roasted. We already have a new MAC address as you guys can see from the new MAC part. Now if we put back our in network interface card and then try and show our MAC address again, we see that our current MAC and our permanent MAC are two completely different MAC addresses and our current MAC and the new MAC are identical. So this is how you can actually generate new MAC addresses to spoof your own identity on the wire. And that is very useful in this case because the person you're attacking will be so confused as to what to do because your MAC address is changing every time and there's no real solution to the situation that you're creating for him. At least I don't know of any solution. If you do know how to stop this for yourself, please leave it down in the comment section below and help the world a little bit.
Now we want to also get to know what our MAC address is every time. So let me just pipe my function through the whole thing and let me just try and grab the new MAC address. So MAC changer R001 and grep MAC. And then we want to put our info card in the monitor mode. And then we also want to put up our network interface card. Now what we want to do out here is optimize it. So we can't be attacking constantly. So let us put a sleep timer. So this will make our program sleep for a particular amount of time. I'm going to make it sleep for five seconds. So after every five seconds, it's going to send that particular BSS ID, 10 deauthentication messages. Then it's going to bring down my interface card. It's going to change my MAC address. It's going to put back the interface card into monitor mode and sleep for five seconds and then repeat the entire process. And to end the script, let's just say done. So that will denote when the loop is done. Now, let me just save it. Control O, Control X to exit. And there we go. Okay, so first of all, to actually run this, need to give it some more permissions. So as you guys can see, we already have it. Let me just put it in a much more readable format. Okay, so as you guys can see, our DOS DOS SH doesn't really have executability. So we can do that with the command ch mod. So I'm going to give it some executable permissions. So ch mod plus x and then the name of the file. So this will actually change our DOS DOS SH into a executable bash script. Okay, so it seems that we have done some error. So let's just go back into our bash script and check for the error that we have probably done. So nano DOS DOS SH. DOS dot SH. Ah, okay, so the thing that I am missing is that I forgot the hyphen A that I'm supposed to put before putting the BSS ID in the air replay NG part of the code. So let me just go ahead and quickly do that. Okay, so now that that is done, let me just save it and quickly exit and see if this thing is working. Okay, so now we are trying to work out our script. Now, you guys should know that this Edurec of Wi-Fi is my company's Wi-Fi and I have complete permission to go ahead and do this to them. Also, my company's Wi-Fi is kind of secure. So every time it senses that a deauthentication message is being sent like that, it kind of changes the channel that it is working on. So these guys are really smart, smarter than me most of the time. And this time I'm just going to try and force them to work on channel six. So let me just go ahead and run my script once. Okay, so let me just check that they're still working on channel six. Yep, they're still working on channel six. Let me just check my script once if it's correctly done. If I have the perfect MAC ID, let me just copy in the MAC ID just to be sure once again. So there you go. We've copied it. Let's go into the script and let's paste it out. Okay, so now that that is done and we have the MAC IDs and everything set up properly, let me just show you how to run the script. So you go dot and backward slash, and then you said dos dos sh. Now you see that our thing is working on channel eight. So this will definitely not work and will say that BSS ID is not there. So what we need to do, as I had showed to you guys earlier, we can go IW config WL1 and change the channel to channel six. Oops, I changed it to channel eight again. Um, this will not work. I'm sorry, that was my bad. So now that we have changed it to channel six, you can see that it is sending everything immediately. Okay, so that is actually running our script very well. And as you guys can see, the security measures that are taken by my company, it will not always work on channel six. It'll keep rotating now until it finds a safe channel. So it really can't find a safe channel. I will always be dosing on channel six and it will run sometimes and it won't run sometimes, but mostly with unsecured Wi-Fi that is running at your home mostly, uh, this will work 100% of the times. So let me just stop this because my company will go mad on me if I just keep on dosing them. So this brings us to the end of our demonstration. This is how you can always dos your neighbors if they're annoying you. But remember, if you're caught, you could be prosecuted. So this was about how DDoS works, what DDoS actually is, and the different types, and how you can do one on your own with your own system. And by my company, it will not always work on channel six. It'll keep rotating now until it finds a safe channel. So it really can't find a safe channel. I will always be dosing on channel six and it will run sometimes and it won't run sometimes, but mostly with unsecured Wi-Fi that is running at your home mostly. Uh, this will work 100% of the times. So let me just stop this because my company will go mad on me if I just keep on dosing them. So this brings us to the end of our demonstration. This is how you can 
always DOS your neighbors if they're annoying you. But remember, if you're caught, you could be prosecuted. So this was about how DDoS works, what DDoS actually is, and the different types, and how you can do one on your own with your own system. In early days of internet, building websites was straightforward. There was no JavaScript, no backend, no CSS, and very few images. But as web gained popularity, the need for more advanced technology and dynamic websites grew. This led to development of common gateway interface or CGI as we call it and server side scripting languages like ASP, JavaScript, PHP and many others. Websites changed and started storing user input and site content in databases. Each and every data field of a website is like a gate to database. For example, in login form, the user enters the login data. In search field, the user enters a search text and in data saving form, the user enters the data to be saved. All this indicate data goes to database. So instead of correct data, if any malicious code is entered, then there are possibilities for some serious damage to happen to the database and sometimes to the entire system. And this is what SQL injection is all about. I'm sure you've heard of SQL. SQL query language or SQL is a language which is designed to manipulate and manage data in a database. SQL injection attack is a type of cybersecurity attack that targets these databases using specifically crafted SQL statements to trick the systems into doing unexpected and undesired things. So by leveraging an SQL injection vulnerability present in web application or a website, given the right circumstances, an attacker can use it to bypass web applications authentication details, as in if you have login and password, user can or attacker can enter just the user ID skip the password entry and get into the system or it can sometimes retrieve the content of an entire database. He can also use SQL injection vulnerability to add, modify and sometimes delete records in a database affecting data integrity. Well, using this vulnerability, attacker can do unimaginable things. This exactly shows how dangerous an SQL injection can be. Now let's check out how a typical SQL injection is carried out. Well, let's start with non-technical explanation. Guys, I have a simple analogy here. So first, let's go through this. Once you understand this, you'll easily be able to relate this with what a SQL injection attack is. So anyway, first imagine that you have a fully automated bus that functions based on the instructions given by human through a standard web form. Well, that form might look something like this. For example, the form might say drive through the route and where should the bus stop? If when should the bus stop this route? And where should the bus stop and this condition that so when should the bus stop or the user inputs? This is where user have to enter the input into the form. Now, after putting some data into the field, it looks something like this drive through route 77 and stop at the bus stop. If there are people at the bus stop, well, that looks simple enough, right? So basically here the human or the person is trying to give three instruction. That is bus should stop at route 77. It should stop at the bus stop if there are people at the bus stop. Well, that sounds harmless. Now imagine a scenario where someone manages to send these instructions, which looks something like this. Drive through route 77 and do not stop at the bus stop and ignore rest of the form if there are people at the bus stop. And now since the bus is fully automated, it does exactly as instructed. It drives up route 77 and does not stop at any bus stop even when there are people waiting because the instruction says do not stop at the bus stop and ignore the rest of the form. So this part which is if there are people at the bus stop is ignored. We were able to do this because the query structure and the supply data are not separated properly. So the automated bus does not differentiate between the instructions and the data. It simply does anything that it is fed with or asked to do. Well, SQL injection attacks are based on the same concept. Attackers are able to inject malicious instructions into good ones, all of which are then sent to database server through a web application. And now the technical explanation. An SQL injection needs two conditions to exist, which is a relational database that uses SQL and a user controlled input, which is directly used in an SQL query. Let's say we have an SQL statement, a simple SQL statement. 
The statement says select from table users where username is so and so and password is so and so. Basically, you can think of it as a code for a login form. It's asking for the username and the password. This SQL statement is passed to a function that sends the entire string to connected database where it will be passed, executed and returns a result at the end. If you have noticed, the statement contains some special characters, right? We have asterisk here to return all the columns for selected database row. And then there is equals to only returns values that match the search string. And then we have single quote here and here to tell the SQL database where the search string starts or ends. So for user, you have starting here, ending here, and for password here, here. So basically a pair. Now consider the following example in which a website user is able to change the values of this user and password such as in login form. So if the values are put into user and password, it looks something like this. Select from users table, the username is Dean and password is Winchester's. And the SQL statement is simple enough, it's very direct. So if there is a user called Dean with password Winchester's, then all the columns of table users are extracted. Now suppose if the input is not properly sanitized by the web application, the attacker can easily insert some malicious SQL statement like this. The username might be Dean or one is equal to one and then you have double hyphen followed by password is equal to Winchester's. So basically along with the data, the user or the attacker has tried to enter a malicious SQL statement disguising it as a data here. So guys, you need to notice two things here. First one we have or one is equal to one. It's a condition that will always be true. Therefore, it is accepted as a valid input by application. For example, if Dean is not a valid user or if there is no user called Dean in the database, application would consider the next value because there is or in between. Our next value is one is equal to one, which always returns true. So basically our input will be something like this, Dean or true. And if there is no user called Dean, the next input will be true and it will be taken as an input value and the values will be displayed. So the next part, which is double hyphen. I'm sure you know what double hyphen represents, right? Basically, it's commenting the next part of the SQL query. So it instructs the SQL parser that the rest of the line is a comment and should not be executed. So the part that's password part will be ignored. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to bypass the password authentication here. So once the query executes, the SQL injection effectively removes the password verification, resulting in an authentication bypass. By using double hyphen, we're commenting rest of the comment. And before that, using one is equal to one, which is translated to true, we are trying to enter the database without even giving a valid value. So the application will most likely log the attacker in with the first account from the query result. And as you guys know, most of the time, the first account in a database is that of an administrative user. So basically by doing nothing or basically by giving some random data here, the attacker was able to extract the admin details. It sounds very dangerous, right? So that's all an SQL injection attack is all about. Basically, you're trying to manipulate the valid or the correct SQL statement as a malicious code and trying to extract data from the database. Now, what's the worst that could happen when you suffer an SQL injection attack? There are a number of things that an attacker can do when exploiting an SQL injection on a vulnerable website. First of all, he can access data without authorization. For example, by tricking the database into providing too many results for a simple query. Then he can extract sensitive information like social security numbers or credit card details. Next thing, he might somehow get in touch with authentication details of users registered on a website and then you can use this information to log in during other attacks. You can also alter data in the database without authorization. For example, he can create fraudulent records or add extra users or he might even actually delete the entire table or an attacker can easily control applications behavior that's based on data in the database. For example, by tricking an application into allowing a login without a valid password, which we saw here. I showed you how using an SQL injection attack, you can bypass an authentication mechanism or you can avoid password verification. Well, it all depends on the capabilities of an attacker. But the exploitation of an SQL injection vulnerability in a website or an application can lead to complete takeover of the database and the web server. It sounds as dangerous as it looks. Well, guys, there are different types or categories in SQL injection. Attackers can exfiltrate data from servers 
by exploiting SQL injection vulnerabilities in multiple ways. So guys, till now we have learned what SQL injection attack is and what worse could happen as a result of an SQL injection attack. Now let's explore different type of SQL injection attacks that there are. Attackers can exfiltrate data from data servers by exploiting SQL injection vulnerabilities in multiple ways. SQL injection mainly can be classified into three major categories. And that would be inbound SQL injection, inferential SQL injection or blind SQL injection, and then there is out of band SQLI. So let's begin with inbound SQL injection. Inbound SQL injection is one of the most common and very easy, easy to exploit when compared to other SQL injection attack types. Inbound SQL injection occurs when an attacker is able to use same communication channel to both launch the attack as well as gather the result. It's further divided into error based SQL injection and union based SQL injection. Now talking about the next type which is blind SQLI or we can also call it inferential SQL injection. It usually takes much longer when compared to inbound SQL attack, but it is just as dangerous as any other type of SQL injection. So in this attack, no data is actually transferred via web application and the attacker will not be able to see the result of an attack like in inbound. That is why what we call it as the blind SQL injection. So basically here an attacker reconstruct the entire database structure by sending payload by observing the web applications response and by resulting behavior of database server. So basically he observes and then attacks based on the data he finds out. It is further divided into blind Boolean based SQLI and then blind time based SQLI. And lastly, we have out of bound SQLI, which we'll discuss at the end. Okay, let's get started with error based and then we'll move forward with other types. Okay, so here we go. Error based SQL attack, it's type of inbound SQL attack. It is a technique that relies on error message thrown by your database server to obtain information about the structure of the database. So basically here an attacker will rely on the error message which is sent by the database server to manipulate the database. So an attacker can retrieve information such as table names and other content from visible database errors. If you guys notice most of the times the errors are too detailed. Well, it's not necessary for the errors to be so detailed. Well, that's one you can say a drawback of a database errors here. For example, let's consider this query. Well, don't get overwhelmed by the complicated way it looks. Anyway, you have a request here with this valid data. I'm attaching an injection point which says extract the version. Basically, that's all it is doing. The bug query returns an error in which it displays version of MySQL that I'm using. So guys, as you can see, basically I'm using version parameter here and this is my entire injection point and using this version parameter. The query will result an error in the error. It will display version of MySQL that I'm using. Similarly, I can fetch existing database tables in the database and finally the content which is present in the table. So the best way or the way to avoid here is you can avoid displaying database error messages in very detailed format, which in turn prevents hackers from fetching the information. So basically make errors as little informative as possible up to the point. So that's all about the error based SQL attack. So in simple terms, the attacker makes use of the information which is provided in the error to extract data from the database. Next type of attack is union based. I'm sure you can understand by the name itself. Anyway, in this attacker, the attacker uses a union SQL operator to combine the results of two or more select statement into a single result. And this result is then written as a part of HTTP response. So here's an example. So as you can see, I have an HTTP response here, which ID is equal to one till here. It's a valid statement. After that, it's our injection point. We are trying to use select MySQL, which is a standard database name and union operator select version. So basically this will again display the version of MySQL that I'm using. So these are two different kind of inbound SQL types. Moving on to next type, which is Boolean. So like I said earlier, guys, this inferential or blind SQL injection are referred to as blind because new data is actually transferred via web application and the attacker will not be able to see the result of an attack here. Okay, so the first type which is Boolean based. So when an SQL query fail, sometimes some part of web page or disappear. I'm sure you might have noticed, right? Suppose if you're entered something wrong in the URL, sometimes the page which you're viewing either disappears or it might change the entire website or it might fail to load anyway. These indications allow attackers to determine whether the input parameters is vulnerable and whether it allows extraction of data. 
This attack is typically very slow, especially on large databases, since an attacker would need to enumerate a database character by character. So guys, for example, you can see the query which is on the screen. With this request, the page should load as usual if the database version is 5x, but if it behaves differently, for example, like it might display an empty page or half the details of the website are gone, then you can consider the website version is different, indicating if the website is vulnerable to an SQL injection or not. So basically what he does is here, the attacker gives some sort of input. He observes what kind of response does a database server gives to that query. Based on that, he'll determine if it's possible to exploit the SQL vulnerability present in that application or if at all the SQL vulnerability is present or not. So that's all about Boolean based. Then comes the time based SQL injection. In some cases, even though vulnerable SQL query does not have any visible effect on the output of the page, it may still be possible to extract information from an underlying database. Hackers determine this by instructing the database to wait or sleep a stated amount of time before responding. So basically here, if there is no visible output from the database server, the attacker will ask the entire database to sleep for a while. If the page is not vulnerable, it will load quickly. If it is vulnerable, it will take longer than usual to load in response to the query. So to execute that, the true function is changed to something like sleep three, which instructs the database to sleep for three seconds. So basically, as you can see in this example, we are instructing the database to be asleep for three seconds. If the page takes longer than usual to load, we can assume that the database version is 5.x. Okay, then comes our final SQL injection type, which is out of bound SQL. It's not very common. Sometimes only when an attacker can retrieve information from a database is use some sort of out of band techniques. Usually these type of attacks involve sending data directly from the database server to a machine that is controlled by the attacker. So guys, these are the major categories of an SQL injection. And now that we have learned the theory part, it's better if we know how to actually perform them in reality. So let's explore at least a few of these types, if not all. So to show you guys how to perform an SQL injection, first of all, I need a web application or a website on which I can actually perform an SQL injection. There are a lot of web applications which are vulnerable. So the, all you have to do is just type PHP ID is equal to one. This should give you the applications which have SQL vulnerability present in this database. But the thing is, I'm still not sure if I can use this website. So it's almost illegal, right? Because these are actually present on the net. But that won't be posing a problem since we're just trying to learn how to perform SQL injection. There are a lot of vulnerable web applications or website which are especially made to actually perform such attacks. I'm sure you might have seen in uh, other previous videos related to ethical hacking and cybersecurity where we used Kali Linux and we used Metasploitable 2. We had different other kind of vulnerable web applications like a damn vulnerable application and mutily day and many others. As for today's session, we'll be using another such web application, which is called WebGoat. As you can see, it says WebGoat is a deliberately insecure web application maintained by OWASP and designed to teach web application security lessons. So you can install and practice with WebGoat. It not only has SQL injection, it also has other kind of vulnerabilities, which you might have seen when we were discussing the WordPress website vulnerabilities like cross site scripting, SQL injection and content delivery, many others. OK, the latest version of WebGo that's running right now is version eight. So basically all you have to do is you can search for WebGo eight. So here you go. You have a GitHub version here. You can click on that. So that's a brief introduction about web code. So basically it's a vulnerable web application where you can test your skills or actually see how the attacks happen. So all you have to do is install web code. Right now the current running version is web code eight. All you have to do is click type for web code. You can see the web code GitHub link here. Click on that. And if you scroll down here, it says download the latest release of web code. You can run it as a container using Docker. Anyway, you can just click on this. And there you have your jar file. Just click on that. It'll be downloaded. I already have it downloaded. You can store it in your favorite folder or the folder which you access very easily. So one more point is that there's a prerequisite which you need to have to use web code, which is your Java latest version of Java. So let's say CMD command prompt. Let me just check if I have Java version. So as you can see, I have latest version, which is Java 11.0.2. So if you have older versions, delete them or just update them to the new version. 
And sometimes it also says that to actually use WebGoat, you need to have Tomcat, but it runs without Tomcat as well as when it comes with the pre-installed JVM and Tomcat. But to be on the better side, please do make sure you are using JVM. Okay, guys, I have my WebGoat stored in my D folder. So all I have to do is and DIR. Let me maximize the screen for you guys. So here you go. You can see my WebGoat jar file here. So now to start using that, all you have to do is Java hyphen jar and uh, WebGoat. Let me just press tab. There it goes. Click enter. Well, it starts a WebGoat application for us. It might take about like half a minute. So guys, it has started. It says Tomcat started at port 8080 and it says started WebGoat in so many seconds. As in it says, it took so many seconds to actually install at the start the WebGoat application. Now we go back to a browser. Here I type for localhost. Okay. That's WebGoat login page. So guys, here we go. We are into the application. Well, if you haven't registered, if you're using it for the first time, all you have to do is click on this register new user and create a username and password. Okay, let's create a username. Let's say Deepthi, password, some password, and agree. It's as easy as that and click on sign up. It says it must be between six and 10. So yeah, and I'm going to say save. Here you go. This is the WebGoat application. As you can see, it's a deliberately insecure application that allows interested developers just like you to test vulnerabilities, which are commonly found in Java based application that use common and popular open source components like SQL and other components. So you have different other kinds of vulnerabilities here as well discussed. You have uh, insecure deserialization. You have access control flaws. You have cross site scripting. Under that, you have different categories. And then you have authentication flaws like JWT tokens. Then you have authentication bypass. You have password reset. And then there is injection flaws, which we're going to discuss today. Under that, you have cross site scripting as well, or XXE. And then other general like HTTP basics and proxies. So let's go for our today's topic, which is SQL injection. The first thing that you want to do is not go for advanced is a little complicated. So just click on injection here, SQL injection. You will land upon this page. So basically the first page is all about what SQL query languages that's SQL is about different type of SQL injection, not the types which you just discussed. string based SQL injection and numeric based SQL injection. And then just click next. Ignore this. It's mostly because of the network error. Anyway, it's all about basic SQL details that DML data manipulation language data definition language, which includes create alter, drop and truncate. Then you have data control language, which is grant and revoke. So it basically described what an SQL injection attack is. Basically, if you recall, SQL injection is basically entering a malicious data into an actual data this way, getting access to the database content. So the things that you can do using an SQL injection, you can read and modify sensitive data from the database. You can execute administration operations on the database by getting access to admin data. You can shut down the entire database. You can truncate the tables and you can add malicious users as well. You can recover the content of a given file from the file system. You can issue commands to operating system as if the application is of your own. There you go. Then uh, what all you can do? You can spoof identity. You can tamper with existing data. You can destroy. You can pick an administrator. And it says SQL injection is more common in PHP, classic ASP, Cold Fusion, and the other languages. If you remember, we just use PHP ID equals one to check if the application is SQL vulnerable or not. So yeah, it's more common in PHP. Moving on to next thing. So like I said, the extent to which a damage can be created by an SQL injection attack totally depends on the attacker and his level of knowledge and what countermeasures you have taken to avoid SQL injection attacks and all that and the database technology that you're using. Moving on for the sixth. So this also we discussed in the theory part as in I showed you an example on how to actually perform an SQL injection attack. So this is string based SQL injection attack. You can see there's an SQL query which says select from user table where name is username. But you can see it's using some sort of quotations here. It's using single quotes to indicate that's the start of the content and a single quote here to indicate the end of the content. Using this misplaced quotations or unnecessary quotations is how an injection attack can be easily performed. So same for the ID is just that there are no single quotations because it's not a string. 
So instead of giving some normal output, like maybe a Dean or something, user can give something like this, a name which ends with quotation or one is equal to one. Basically, by making use of the quotations or actual characters which are present in the string, an attacker can perform SQL injection. Or you can also give it as some this way. So yeah, basically you can give malicious SQL statements. Let's start with our first exercise, which is this one. Okay, so it says try it SQL injection attack. This is the user or the SQL query. It says this SQL query can be used to fetch all the information about an user if you know a username. So you don't need to know any specific username to get a complete list. But they have given a sample value, which is Smith. But let's say I don't know Smith. Let me give some other value. So as you can see, I've already done it before. So there are other values. So let's say Dean, but it doesn't give me anything because there's no user called Dean in the database. Okay, it says give Smith because Smith is a valid user. So let me just give Smith. So as you can see, it is displaying the values of user Smith. Well, this is straightforward. They've mentioned a username which we've used and we got the information. But now suppose if I want to know other users name as well, all you have to do is manipulate this data. So as you can see here, this part, there's, there was a single quotation, but right now what's showing is different uh, garbage characters. Anyway, so I'm ending with this another single quote and saying or one is equal to one, which is always true as you guys know. And there is already a single quote here, one more, so I'm not giving one here. And I'm clicking on get info. So there you go, it successfully fetched me other information about other users as well. So basically, I manipulated the data into some malicious SQL statement. So like I said, one is equal to one is always true. So basically, it accounts to Smith or true when it actually goes to database. Since true is a valid input, it's displaying me the content. Now, let's say I just want to know the first user. Are you guys actually, you can give that as this as well as and you don't have to use the quotations. Just give one is equal to one. This also works. I'm saying comment rest of the SQL query like we did earlier as in we avoided password verification, right? So whatever is after the username, it's going to avoid rest of the query. So get info. So you can see it's worked again. Let's say now I want to fetch just one user or the first or second users. Okay, let's use another name. Okay, just let me clear it. Plain or one is equal to one and I want to limit the content to one. So as you can see, it has limited the content to the first user. It's not taking the first input. It's skipping. It's coming to this part. One is equal to one and it's limiting to the one user. Let's say Dave. So yeah, since the Dave user is not there, it's skipping this part and it's going to this part, which is one is equal to one and limiting to one. Let's say two here. It should give the next username. Let's say five, five users. So there you go. Similarly, the way you want using malicious SQL statement, you can manipulate and get the data. Let's go to next exercise, which is eight. It's same as the previous one before it was string and now it's just number. So they say give one not one for the valid user. Let's give hundred. But as you can see, there's no result because there's no user with hundred as user ID. And if I give one not one, it's giving me the user one not one. Let's say let me give hundred and ten. I don't know if the user is there or not. Or one is equal to one and comment. I want to limit. Let's limit to three users. Okay, it says it's number right. My mistake. So yeah, it's displaying three users. So guys, this is a simple explanation of an SQL injection attack, or you can say an error based injection attack. Now moving on to next exercise. So this is a basic SQL injection. Now going to advanced again, click on the first. It says the purpose of this lesson is to combining multiple SQL techniques and use blind SQL injection as well. Okay, I'm going to click on one here. That's a one a second one like we discussed. If you have misplaced special characters in your SQL statement using that you can make use and you can extract data. For example, we used comment character to comment rest of the SQL query. We have colon which command or see as you can see it says star select from users and the command drop table users. Basically, I'm using two queries here. One is to select display all the users, which is a valid according to the given form details and next statement or the injection I'm adding is drop table users. And then you have concatenation plus is again the concatenation string without quotes and all that. Let's get with our third exercise. It says try it pulling data from other tables. It says one of the table in Webgo database is user system data, which has a username of character password, which is again a character and a cookie, which is again a character. 
So the first thing that we have to do is execute a query to union or join these two tables. The other table was users. If you've forgotten, let me just take you back to the exercise. As you can see, the first table is users, which have used in this query. So going back to advanced, we were in this exercise. So yeah, we need to join users table as well as user system table or do whatever you want. But the final thing they want is see if we can fetch Dave's password. Dave is one of the user. So guys, like I said earlier, the union operator is used in SQL injection to join a query and the result of this forged query will be joined to the result of actual query. So you have one query, for example, let's say you're giving username and I'm giving union there. I'm attaching another statement. So basically for the result of the previous query, I'm adding my injection point via union. We are asked to fetch Dave's password here. Well, there are a lot of ways you can do it. We couldn't do it without using union as well. Let me show you one way. Let's say I have Smith. I'm going to end this here and let me say select. Star. From user. System data and I'm again quoting it and that should do it. So sorry about that guys earlier. It was an error, right? So basically let's say Smith and I'm commenting it. And then I'm giving select star from user. What is the table name? System data in the query and comment the rest. So as you can see, it has fetched the password of Dave. This is one way of doing it. But then we explored the error based SQL injection earlier. Now I want to show you how to use union command to extract or to perform this exercise. Anyway, so basically, like I said earlier, again, you can use union to combine two results. So the first thing you need to do is you need to know the number of columns in your user tables. For that, the simple thing that you can do is Smith. You can use group by or order by both of them works fine. I'm using order by one and let me comment it. It is giving me some sort of output. So I can say number of columns is more than one or actually one. Let me try one more Two, comment. It's still giving output. Let's give three, four, five, six, seven. It's still giving me output. Let me try go for eight. Yeah, as you can see, when I have given till eight, it says invalid order by expression. It's because as you can see if I give seven, the number of columns here are seven user ID. That's two first name three, four, five, six and seven total number of columns are seven. And when I give it eight, it's giving me error because the number of columns are just seven. So this way based on the error it's displaying, you can actually extract data. Or you can actually know. So now that we know there are seven columns, I'm going to use union statement. Remember guys when you're giving union in the select statement, the number of fields or the number of columns that you're giving should be the same number of columns as in the users table. That's seven. That's why we found the number of columns. The values are needed because the two queries must have equal number of columns in order to avoid syntax error. If you have like five columns in your second table and if you have seven columns in the first table, the union won't happen properly and you're going to get the syntax error to avoid that. We found out the number of columns so that you can manipulate it in the query. For example, let's say Smith. And uh, now the union. Select user ID seven columns user ID then password. Let's give username as well. Username password then cookie. Make sure the data types is right as well. Matching then cookie then user ID. Let me just count. So I have one username two. That's three password four five six the field and seven user ID from which user table that's user SYS DEM system. Sorry about the mistakes guys data and comment the rest of the session. Now if I give get info as you can see it is fetching the information. So basically we used union operator. We combined that we are actually getting which is name. So basically we gave Smith as the user name. Along with that we attached our next query which is select. We found there are seven columns in our user tables. Since we're using union, we are adding seven tables in the query as well and asking it to display the information. So as you can see, it displays Dave password, which was same as before. That was when we performed um, Smith in the query and uh, select star 
from user data system data okay so as you can see the password now and the password earlier was also different as in same sorry about that now if i give this to check pass w zero and then i have r and capital d so it says congratulations you have successfully completed the assignment there you go guys i've showed you error based sql by finding out number of columns and in the simple sql as well after that we also learned how to use union operator to extract the data so like i said we have learned at least two types of sql injection attacks here then going to next one it says blind sql injection attack we've already learned about blind sql injection attacks basically no output or an attacker can't actually see the database input here so basically the attacker determines the answer or the data he wants based on the application's response to the query he gives and the next part is about difference so it says in a normal sql injection error messages from database are displayed and given enough information to find out how query is working or similarly in the case of union based sql as well so in case of this blind sql nothing is displayed you will start asking questions based on true or false statement and depending on the response the system or database server gives to you you determine what kind of attack can you actually perform so for example you have this sql query and it'll change to url in this form that's http this is the query is equal to four and one is equal to one this will be translated to this form you know the website is vulnerable for a blind sql injection but if the browser responds with page not found or something else you know that a blind sql injection might not work or that there is no vulnerability present in that application similarly you can go ahead and change one to two which will not return anything because obviously the query returns false which one is not equal to two right so basically it equates to some content or data and false now how do we actually take the advantage of above true or false thing so here you go i have my actual data which is http myshop.com article is equal to four and this is my injection point substring i'm trying to find database version here similarly you can also find the number of databases present the databases names tables present in database and actual content of the database and all that if the boolean blind sql injection doesn't work you can always go for time based blind injection basically here instead of true you're replacing by some time limit say sleep for 3 seconds even after giving that if the application actually loads properly it means there's no sql vulnerability if it takes a little time to load then it means that there is some sort of sql vulnerability and you can exploit that so there you go and our next assignment is it says now that you know all the basics of sql injection go ahead and log in as a tom well you can obviously cannot do the thing which we did earlier that's try smith or one is equal to one because as you know there's no user called tom there so guys go ahead and try this exercise on your own and see if you have understood the concept properly if not you can always post in the comment session below and we'll get back to you guys so as for this session this is more than enough you have explored the basic sql injection as well as advanced so there you go guys now you know what sql injection is attack is and how an actual sql injection is performed in reality so the first step you do is to discover sql injection vulnerabilities by routinely testing your application using both static testing as well as dynamic testing secondly you avoid and repair sql injection vulnerabilities by using parameterized queries i'm sure you know that programming languages talk to sql databases using database drivers right these database drivers allow an application to construct and run different type of sql statements against the database extracting and manipulating data as they need it and these parameterized statements make sure that the parameters or the input which user gives passed into sql statement are treated same way as the data rather than a part of sql command so what i'm saying is that earlier i said that all you have to do in a sql injection attack is insert malicious data into a actual proper data right so and this malicious data is treated as an sql statement so if you used parameterized queries this malicious sql code will won't be treated as an sql statement instead it will be treated equal as some data input data and there's one more way you can protect against sql injection many development teams prefer to use object relational mapping or orm frameworks to make the translation of sql result sets into code object more seamless and then comes the third thing which if you are unable to use parameterized queries or a library that writes sql for you the next best approach is to ensure proper escaping of special string characters so basically you can use escape characters in your data well escape symbol characters is a simple way to protect against sql injection attacks and many languages have standard functions to achieve this you can enforce principle of risk privilege application should ensure that each process or software component can access and defect only the resource it needs 
as in it can't access the other data which is not actually related to it well you can think of it in the same way that only certain bank employees have the access to the actual vault so applying this restricted privileges can help mitigate a lot of risk around injection attacks sensibly designing access management in this way can provide a vital second line of defense so no matter how attacker gets access to your system it can mitigate the type of damage that they can possibly do and finally you can use a web application firewall well they're not as effective of as other measures but they can help you identify sql injection attempts and sometimes help you prevent sql injection attempts from reaching the application as well so guys sql injections are popular attack methods for cyber criminals but by taking proper precautions such as ensuring that data is encrypted performing security tests and by being up to date with patches you can take meaningful steps toward keeping your data very secure there are variety of ways and hacker may infiltrate an application due to web application vulnerabilities so guys stay informed and stay alert no matter how attacker gets access to your system it can mitigate the type of damage that they can possibly do and finally you can use a web application firewall well they're not as effective of as other measures but they can help you identify sql injection attempts and sometimes help you prevent sql injection attempts from reaching the application as well so guys sql injections are popular attack methods for cyber criminals but by taking proper precautions such as ensuring that data is encrypted performing security tests and by being up to date with patches you can take meaningful steps toward keeping your data very secure there are variety of ways and hacker may infiltrate an application due to web application vulnerabilities so guys stay informed and stay alert so you remember the last time you went shopping online remember all the pictures of clothes books and electronics that you looked at what if i tell you that those images weren't really for you what if those pants you were looking at were really detailed blueprints of military installments you would never know right this is the nature of steganography steganography is science of hiding information from plain sight secret communication is very important because if your message is important and if you do not want others to know about your message then you use different kind of techniques to hide your message from third person and steganography is one such technique however criminals and terrorist organizations are using this for their own purpose so understanding how to hide data using steganography and prevent the data from being misused will be very helpful however to talk about steganography we should consider its predecessor cryptography which is science of writing and secret codes basically cryptography makes messages meaningless to the casual reader by encrypting the data using set of rules which are known to both sender and receiver only the intended receiver with the decryption key can extract the actual message thus when an attacker discovers the message it is still difficult for him to get the secret message if cryptography is a strong way to encrypt and secure a communication then why do we need a new technique answer is very simple when we are using any cryptography technique we need to send a secret key and third person can easily judge that some secret kind of communication is going on in simple terms cryptography does not try to hide the fact that secret message is being sent this is where steganography comes into picture the main reason of using steganography is that you are hiding your secret message behind an ordinary file no one will suspect the fact that a communication or some sort of secret message is being sent people will generally think it is an ordinary file and your secret message will go without any suspicion unlike cryptography which conceals the content of a secret message steganography conceals the very fact that message is being communicated so if i have to define steganography it is an ancient art of covering messages in a secret way such that only the sender and the receiver knows the presence of the message well now if you're thinking steganography is a brand new method then you are mistaken steganography is an ancient practice the word steganography is derived from greek words steganos meaning hidden or concealed and graphen which means writing or drawing before moving further let's get a glimpse of how steganography evolved from past the concept of steganography was first introduced in 1499 but the idea itself has existed since ancient times there are stories of a method being used in roman empire whereby a slave chosen to convey a secret message had his scalp shaved clean and a message was tattooed onto his skin when the messenger's hair grew back 
he was dispatched on a secret mission. On the other end, the receiver shaved the messenger's scalp again and read the secret message. Well, that was one way of doing it. Demaritus, the king of Sparta, sent a secret message on tablet covered with wax. When it was received at the other end, the wax was scraped off to recover the message. Another oldest and the most fascinating and common way to hide message is to use invisible inks. The actual message can be made visible if document was heated gently. Next came the null cipher. Null cipher refers to the method of encrypting where plain text is mixed with actual message. Next was hiding data in the images. Microdots were used to conceal a message. A microdot is a simple text or an image which is reduced in size to hide its contents. And this microdot or the images or the text which are present in a microdot are then read using magnifiers. Apart from these techniques, there were others as well, like spread spectrum, semagrams, etc. So, like I said earlier, steganography is an ancient practice. The majority of today's steganographic systems use multimedia objects like image, audio, video, etc. as cover media. Well, if you don't know what I mean when I say cover media, don't worry about it. You will know more about it as we progress through this session. But for now, cover media is a place where you actually store your hidden information or you store your secret information. So based on the type of cover media, steganography is divided into multiple types. To begin with, we have text steganography. Text steganography is hiding information inside the text files. It involves things like changing the format of existing text, changing words within a text, generating random character sequences, or using some sort of context-free grammar to generate readable text. Well, there are different methods to hide data in text. Some of the popular ones include format-based method, random and statistical generation, linguistic method. Moving on, we have image technography. This is nothing but hiding data in an image. It's one of the most popular way of hiding data because in image, there are huge number of bits present in digital representation. So it's easy to store or hide data in an image. There are a lot of ways to hide your information inside an image. Common approach includes LSP steganography, which we'll be discussing in detail later. And then there is masking and filtering, some sort of encryption techniques, and many others. Moving on, audio steganography. It sounds according to its name. In audio steganography, a secret message is embedded into an audio signal, which alters the binary sequence of corresponding audio file. Then there is video steganography. In video steganography, you can hide any kind of data in digital video format. The advantage of this type of steganography is that large amount of data can be hidden very easily. You can think of it as combination of image steganography and audio steganography. Well, there are two classes of video steganography. One is embedding data in uncompressed raw video and then compressing it later. Other one is embedding data directly into compressed data stream. And next there is network steganography. Like it sounds, it's a technique of embedding information within network control protocols like TCP, UDP, ICMP, and many others. For example, you can hide information in the header of an TCP IP packet in some fields that are either optional or not important. And finally, there's email steganography. It's not a very well known type, but anyway, email that contains the files embedded within head information using steganography can be very difficult to detect as well as read. Now that we have learned of different types of steganography, let's take a look at few features that a steganographic technique must and should possess. I'm sure you can see an image of an adorable and cute kitten on the screen, right? Well, that's our cover image or the file where we store our secret data. So the first feature that any steganographic technique must possess is transparency. It's an important feature. Each cover media, it can be image or audio or video, has certain information hiding capacity. If more information or data is hidden inside the cover, then it will result in degradation of cover media. As you can see, the stego image or our final image after hiding data inside our cover image is not proper or exactly similar to our original image, right? So there's some sort of distortion. So if attacker notices this distortion, then our steganographic technique fails and there is possibility that our original message can be extracted and damaged by attacker. Well, that's the first feature. Next feature is robustness. Robustness is the ability of hidden message to remain undamaged even if the stego media undergoes some sort of transformation like cropping or scaling and blurring or linear and nonlinear filtering or some sort of hindrance. 
So we have to make sure that technique in any way doesn't affect our secret message. And the last property tamper resistance. This is one of the most important feature because if attacker is successful in destroying the steganography technique, then the tamper resistant property makes it difficult for the attacker to alter or damage the original data. Well, you can think of it as a last step that as a sender you can do to protect your data from other people. Okay, so till now we have covered what steganography is a bit about its history and its types. Now let's go through a basic steganographic model. Well, it's pretty simple concept, but before we start, we should be aware of few technical terms that I was using earlier and which I said I'll explain later. So here we go. We have something called cover object or cover file. This is the file that we will use to hide the information. It could be an image or a video or an audio or network or the different types which we discussed earlier. And then there is our secret message. As you know, this is a secret information that we want to hide into cover object. And sometimes you also have something called stego key and I'll explain you what that is when we encounter it. So let's get started then. So there is an steganographic encoder which uses some sort of steganographic method or function to embed the secret message which is represented by M into our cover object or cover file X. So as you can see, there's a function which takes X, which is our cover file M that is secret message and another input that's K. Like I said, K is nothing but key or stego key. It is a key to embed data in a cover and extract data from the stego medium. Well, it's optional using a key provides extra security. That is all. So basically our steganographic encoder method or function takes this cover image secret message and key as an input and embeds our secret message into cover object. Embedding process generates a stego object and the stego object looks exactly like our cover object. Now this stego object is sent to receiver through the network without any encryption here. So this is where our steganographic encoding process ends. Now if on the other end, Receiver wants to extract the secret message. All he has to do is feed the stego object into steganographic decoder, which also takes key as one of its input. And then as a result, he gets secret message which was intended for him. So like I said, it's a very simple process, right? So if I summarize, you have your cover file, which could be image audio or anything, and then you have your secret message. Both of them along with the key if you want are fed into steganographic encoder. As a result, you get your stego object which looks exactly same as cover object and this stego object is sent to receiver through secure communication channel without or without encryption. On the other end, if receiver wants to extract the secret data, he feeds this stego object into steganographic decoder and he gets cover object and secret message as an output. So this is how a steganography actually works. Well, if I want to make this process more secure, I can add one more step, which is encryption. Let's see how to do that. So like I said, there's a sender before actually feeding the secret information into steganographic encoder. He encrypts this secret message along with an encryption key. As a result, he gets a cipher text or like we discussed when we were discussing cryptography, the meaningless text or the cipher text. This cipher text along with steganographic key or stego key and cover file is fed into steganographic encoder. Embedding process generates a stego object and this is where our encoding process ends. This stego object which looks exactly like our cover object is sent to receiver using a secure communication channel. Now on the other end, if the receiver wants to extract the secret message, he feeds the stego object along with stego key into steganographic decoder. As a result, he gets a cipher text and to decrypt the data, he feeds the cipher text and the key that's decryption key into decryption algorithm. And as a result, he gets the secret message which was intended for him through the sender. So there you go guys. That's simple. So like I said earlier, we discussed the most simple process. If you want to make it more secure, you can include encryption as well. So basically any type of steganographic method or technique works this way. It's just that the type of algorithm they use or the encryption algorithm or the technique they use to embed data into an image or an video or it could be anything that's cover object is different. So guys. Till now we've learned about what steganography is and how a steganographic technique actually works. It's time that we should learn about one of the most popular steganographic technique, which is LSP steganography. If you remember earlier, we talked about image steganography, you know where we hide secret data inside an image. Well, one of the popular technique to hide secret message inside an image is LSP steganography or least significant bit steganography. Now, before we jump into what LSP steganography is, Let's take a look at a few basic concepts. 
On the screen, I have an image. To be more precise, let's call it a digital image. Every digital image is a finite set of digital values called pixels. You have probably heard the term before and generally know that pixels make up an image. Pixel is actually short for picture element. Well, you can think of them as dots of illumination, typically so small that you're unable to see them. Thousands or even millions of individual pixels together make up an image. So each pixel can be one color at a time. However, pixels are so small that often blend together to form new colors. In this session, we will work with RGB color model. The RGB color model is an additive color model in which red, green, and blue light are combined together in different ways to reproduce a broad array of colors. And each of these can be represented using a binary code. So like I said, I have three values which are R, G, B, that's red, green, and blue. And each of this value is represented in a binary code. So by mixing the 8-bit binary red, green, and blue values, pixel can be any color. And the color is usually determined by number of bits used to represent it. Well, in this case, we are using 8 bits. So we can display for about 250 colors. Moving on, when we are working with binary values, we have more significant bits and less significant bits. The leftmost bit is the most significant bit. On the other hand, rightmost bit is the less significant bit. Now, if we change the leftmost bits, that is most significant bit, it will have a large impact on final value. For example, let's say I have 255 and its binary representation, which is eight ones in 8-bit representation. Now, if we change the leftmost bit from 1 to 0, the decimal value will change from 255 to 127. As you can see, the amount of change is very huge here. It has made a large impact on final value. On the other hand, the rightmost bit is the less significant bit. Now, if I change the rightmost bit, it will have less impact on final value. For example, if we change the leftmost bit, which is 1 to 0, it will change the decimal value from 255 to 254. And you can note that the change is about decimal 002%, which is very less when compared to most significant bit. So the point I want to state here is that if we change most significant bit or MSB, it will have larger impact on final value. But if we change LSB, the impact on final value is very less. This very point is made use by LSB steganography. So in this method, which is LSP steganography, least significant bit of an image or of a pixel in an image is replaced with a bit of a secret image. The result of this process alters the original output very slightly. So your cover image and your stego image, that's your final result after hiding the data, look exactly same without any difference. This technique works very good for image, audio, and video steganography. Well, let's consider a simple example. Suppose we want to insert letter A into an image. The binary representation of A is 1 followed by 5 zeros and again 1. Now, like I said earlier, we are using RGB color model here. So, and I'm using 8 bits to represent each of these values, which is red, green, and blue. So, I'll be needing about 3 consecutive pixels. That's about 9 bytes to replace all the least significant bits by the bits of the letter A. Well, don't worry about it. You'll understand once you see the next image that I show you on the screen. So like I said, I'm considering three pixels, which is about nine bytes. So these are the pixels before insertion. I've picked like random pixels. So as you can see, I have three pixels, one, two, three, and nine. So totally nine bytes I have here. And now if we replace the last bit or LSP for each byte with a bit from binary representation of A, what we get is this. So as you can see, I have replaced the zero with this one here. So as you can see, zero is replaced with one. And then I have five zeros. 0, 0, like five zeros followed by one, one, which is already one, so I'm not replacing anything here. So as you can see, all the color bits have been replaced here. So once you are done with replacing, you'll find that the final result or the stigo image is very much identical to your actual image. That's your cover object. On an average, LSP requires that only half of the bits in the image can be changed. As you can see, I've like left three or four bits unchanged here. For example, this one, this one, and the zero here. The zero in the first line, in the last line, I have two ones left without changing it. So if need required, you can hide data in the least and the second least significant bits as well. And still, the human eye would not be able to discern it. So guys, that's all about least significant bits technography. Well, that's the concept. So to summarize, every pixel can be represented using different color models. Well, in this demo, I've used RGB color model. And if each of these values are represented using eight bits. 
while you can use different number of bits as well and this number of bits used usually determine the color which pixel displays like i said we have used eight bits here and in a binary format we have least significant bit and most significant bit like i said changing most significant bit makes more changes to our final value but that does not happen when we change the least significant bit so we made use of that point so basically the least significant bits technography make uses of the fact that changing lsb doesn't make much change to our actual image so it replaces the lsbs in the cover object by the binary bits of secret message so there you go guys now you know the theory part of the concept it's time to perform a small demo in this demo we'll see how to use the concept of lsb technography and hide secret text in an image so here are the steps involved first to encode the text into image the program loads an image and looks or considers each pixel hexadecimal's value then the program asks you for the secret text and converts it into its binary form and then one by one it stores the secret message bits into lsp of image pixels which is our blue value bits of rgb model after the message is embedded into an image program adds delimiter to the end to determine when the text ends so here ends the encoding process suppose you want to retrieve the data then the program extracts all the zeros and ones from the stego image until delimiter is found and there goes our secret message so these are the steps we'll be performing in the program so guys this is what a program does well to summarize it takes our image it converts that into hexadecimal values it takes our secret text and converts it into its binary value then replaces the lsb of cover image with the bits of secret message once it does that it adds a delimiter at the end so that we know that this is where the text ended so this is how encoding is done suppose you want to retrieve the message all you have to do is extract zeros and ones from the stick object and convert the binary form into string format that way you can get your secret message or the receiver can extract the secret message well i'm using the code which i found in github and suppose if you guys want to experiment as well please do post your um, email ids in the comment section below and we'll get back to you with the code now let's get started with the demo so guys i'll be using my ubuntu system here so as you can see i have a code let me show it to you guys i have code here and I have certain images of different formats i have one of jpg and one of png as well okay let me delete this file move to trash so going back to terminal let me show you guys the code first the file name was hide file okay i think i've misspelled it wrong anyway let me just check it anyway it's hid same mistake hide dot pi here we go guys i already have code because i've already extracted it from git and i'm using it here so i'm just going to explain you the basic concept of how this code works actually so like i said we're going to convert our uh, image into a hexadecimal format so i have a code which converts rgb values to hexadecimal values before that since we're using images here we need to import certain libraries we need python library image or pil which is below well if you're using windows operating system you need to separately download it but if in ubuntu it comes by default and suppose if it doesn't work let me go back well if it doesn't work all you have to do is make sure you have python 3 version installed for that check python 3 version and make sure you have pip installed again you can uh, check using version command itself okay so as you can see i have pip installed and suppose if you don't have please do install it the command is simple all you have to do is the sudo apt install python 3 pip that's it i just click enter and it'll install i'm not doing it again because i already have it installed like you guys saw and once you've done that to install pillow sudo pip install pillow that's all and then it'll work that's just the way of installing pillow library let me clear the stuff let's go back to program so since we're using images, like I said, we need to use certain libraries. Here we'll be using Pillow Library. So if you get an error while using this program, please do install pip and Pillow. So getting back to program, like I said, here we're using an image and converting that to its hexadecimal format. And similarly, while retrieving it, we're using the inverse function of it. And our secret message, which is in string format, we're converting into binary and binary to string. And then there is encode. Basically, it goes through the hex code and places the binary bit of a secret message into the hex code. Similarly, the inverse program is decode. It will decode the hex format. First, it will check if for the zeros and ones, and then it pulls the data from that. So basically, we have four main functions here, which is encode, decode, hide, and retrieve. Like I said, encode and decode. Like I said earlier, it checks for the hex code 
hexadecimal code and then replaces the bits and decode it checks if the hex code has zeros and ones it'll extract the data if hex code doesn't have any zeros and what it'll return none so there you go now uh, these are the basic functions and then comes the complex function which is to hide a message i have a hide function here just go through it it's very, very simple so basically as you can see this hide function it takes file name and the message it opens the image library where it gives the file name as input and then converts the message from string format to binary format and uh, at the delimiter as we discussed in the theory part of the session so that while extracting you know that you have reached the end of the text so basically first it checks if our image in, is in rgb format or not if it doesn't and then it converts to it and then there it goes and uh, basically it takes each and every bit checks if the bit is in proper format if the actual bit of the secret message can fit into this and all that and then replaces the bit and once it has encoded the secret message completely into our image it returns a message saying completed if the mode of the image or if your file doesn't exist and for all that it returns a message saying incorrect image mode couldn't hide now the retrieve function is as very simple the most simple one it's taking the file name from which you'll have to extract the data if it checks first it checks if it's in the rga format i mean that's red green blue format and if it's not it's going to convert into it properly and from there it's going to extract the data and then it retrieves all the zeros and ones until it finds delimiter once it is found the delimiter it gets to know that it has reached the end of the text and then it displays the message success otherwise it will give you an error message finally we have our main function so basically we're going to give like string you have switch option while writing code right either in java or c++ anyway just like that i'm going to give a code well it's not going to display to the user but anyway it's in this code according to the code you need to use a command like python the file name as in the file name and which contains the code iphin e to embed the data and the image and the text which has to be embedded and all that oh we'll get to know when we actually perform the demo so let me just summarize what we've learned in the code again so just basically go through it. it's very simple so like i said we are using pillow a library for that we need to install it properly if not the program doesn't work so make sure you have python and after that install pip and through pip install pillow and like i said we are converting our uh, image into his hexadecimal format using this function and inverse using this function and our secret message to binary and binary to string and code it basically checks for each and every hexadecimal of our image and replaces that by zero or one of a secret message and then you have decode it checks if the hexadecimal code has zeros or ones if it does it extracts the data otherwise it returns not and then there's our hide image which actually embeds the data into our image so it will take file name and message as input it checks if the image is actually in uh, rba format and before that it converts our message into binary format and all that and then based on certain conditions it embeds the data properly into the image if there is some error regarding the mode of the image you're using or if the text file doesn't exist it shows an error message same goes for the retrieval as well it checks for the zeros and ones extracts until it finds a delimiter and then it gives you a success message so there we go guys the program is simple so if you guys want a copy of the code and please do post your uh, email id in the comment section below and we'll get back to you with the code and now that you've understood the code let's go ahead and see if this works properly for that i'm going to exit before that like i said i have my uh, few images here docs dot jpg then cat and cube and all that i need a text file to hide right so here i go okay i've just typed some random message board meeting is on tuesday please do send weapons lawyers and food so i'm going to save it in my home page itself let me just give it a name msg.txt and click let me close it so now going back to files as you can see i have a file here which is msg.txt now i'm going to use a dogs a docs jp the image oh sorry i forgot to tell you this program only works for png images so i can't use docs image it let's take cube.png so python because we are using the python code i meant the file is in python format right python and uh, the file name is have py e to embed and the file name which is cube.png enter a message to hide well basically this doesn't actually take a file which contains the message it directly asks you to enter the message to hide but don't worry the file which we just created i'll show how to use it for while we are discussing the steganographic tools anyway getting back to what we were doing i had a message so so it says it's completed now let's get back to files 
now if in case i open qpng it's same as before you won't find any changes here getting back to terminal if i want to extract the message siphon d and enter success it says the message is extracted which is how it's and we weapons do you know where so that's easy guys well it's a very simple program it's just taking an image it's taking is asking you to enter the message and it's embedding in that so well you can take this as a base code and create your own code which performs many things or advanced steganography as well so basically to summarize in this program what we did was we converted our secret message into its binary form and we took the file the bits in the binary code and replace the least significant bits or the blue color bits of rgb color model by these bits of secret message so basically we are replacing the least significant bits so that our cover image that's cover object as well as a stego object both are same and look identical now let's get back to ppt so guys earlier we discussed about the instance stegographic methods there are various ways of achieving the stegography in this digital communication world however you do not need to perform coding to achieve this there are various software tools are available for stenography this software can hide your secret message behind the image file or audio file or video file or any kind of file basically so we are going to take a look at few such uh, tools and i'm going to show you how to use them maybe at least two or three so there we go the first tool is stego suite basically here you can hide any kind of text inside an image then you have stego hide it hides a secret file in an image or audio file then you have sio stenography it's a free software where you can hide your files inside bmp images or wav files that's wav files and then there is suite pixel which works as in it's similar to other tools where you can hide data and images but the way it works is slightly different i show you how it actually works so don't worry about it for now then there is open puff where you can conceal all the files in an image audio or flash files and then camouflage tools that let you hide any type of files inside any other file so these are very few there are other tools outside as well as for today we're going to explore three to four tools which is stego suit other one is stego hide then sio stenography and suit pixel so there we go guys let's begin with stego hide let's go back to our ubuntu so this tech hide is an open source stenography software that lets you hide your secret file in image or audio file you will not notice any change in the image or audio file it is a command line software therefore you need to learn the command line to use this tool and therefore i have come back to ubuntu here So I already have it installed. It's very easy to install. App get install steg hide. It'll install. Use the command just sudo apt get install steg hide and click enter. I'm not doing it. It's going to take time. Since I've already done it, I'm going to straight away use it. So steg hide. Well, as soon as you enter the command steg hide, it'll show you the help command related to the steg hide. So basically, it says the first argument should be one of the following. That is either you should embed the data or extract the data. and uh, you have various options that you can add in commands to use your cover object or the stego object or your secret message and you have options to compress and encrypt the file before actually putting it into an image or hiding it as well and then suppose if you want entire information about your file after encrypting it you can use different commands as well which for example let me yeah you have uh, info command here if you use that command it will display all the information about your file and when you're trying to embed data it will ask you for a passphrase basically it's nothing but just like key you can think of it as a key or a password basically it's making sure that you are the right user who has entered a uh, hidden the data or extracting it so well to make it easier for people using it they also have given few examples here so usually the command begins with steg hide the command name and embed to embed the file if in cfs refers to your cover object it's the name of your cover object and then you have your secret message and for that you're using if in ef let's do that so stig hide embed before that let me go back to files so i'm using this docs jpg and the message dot text which we created earlier embed if in cf so that's docs dot jpg and if in ef which is our msg dot txt right cool it says enter passphrase which let's say a b c d it says embedding and it's done now to check if it's done that properly or not let's go back to files i'm going to move it to desktop click on enter cool now let's go back to desktop here is our file now to extract i'm using extract command before that i need to go to my desktop right because that's where my file is stored here we are and stick hide 
extract. SF is what you use to extract your Stego file. You can see it in the help session. And the name was docs.jpg. It's asking for the passphrase, more for security purposes. So it says extracted to message.txt. Now to check the file, you need to go back to desktop because that's where our file should be. And if you open that with editor, there you go. We have successfully extracted the data from the image. Now let's try a few other commands. Let me come back. Okay, let me try it here. Seg hide. What was that? Info command, right? Info. And let's say, so as you can see, it's extracted the information about the file. It's in format, it's capacity, and it says they want to get information about the emitted data as well. Why? Could not extract any data with the data phase because already extracted the secret message from that file. Well, if you hadn't extracted, then maybe it would have showed the embedded content as well. So that's how you use a stay guide. You have multiple other options as well. Like, for example, when you are trying to embed, it asks you for the passphrase, right? Instead, if you don't want it to ask like this, you can use p command and enter the passphrase. You can add it in the command itself here. And then it actually skips that step and actually goes back to this embedding message and done step. So yeah, that's all about stay guide. Now let's go back to other tools. So the next tool we'll be using is a Stego suit. It is a free steganography tool, which is written in Java. And with Stego suit, you can easily hide in confidential information and image files. So I have a file called sample here. I have certain images. It's in JPJ format. It's a BMP file. And then there is a PNG file as well. So first tool that we're going to explore is Stego suit. So Stego, yeah, there we go. This is the Stego suit tool. It looks very simple. Basically, there's nothing here. So click on file open and select the file in which you want to embed the text or the secret data. Let's go back to sample. And here I'm using this PNG image open. Here it's ask you for the test which you want to embed in the image. So this is the secret text I want to hide. If you want, you can give the password and embed. It says embedding completed. The file is saved to desktop sample image embed.jpg. Let's go back and check sample. And here we go. You have an image and properties. It's a JPG file. Let's try opening it. There you go, guys. It looks similar to our actual message. Well, it doesn't look different at all, but the data is actually hidden inside it, right? To know that, all you have to do is let's just rename this. Let's say image E. That's the embedded format of our image. It says the image is open. Okay, I'm gonna close take a suit. So yeah, you can see the image here. Let's uh, rename it image E. Now, if you want to retrieve the message, stego suit file open select the file in which the text was embedded which is image e and open enter the password which is and extract so as you can see it has extracted the text message which earlier i hid into the image hey this is a secret test i want to hide well go ahead and try to use it it's fun it doesn't have any other functionalities apart from these it's a very basic simple tool let's go to our next tool which is sio steganography well, it's a free software that can be used to hide secret files in BMP, that's bitmap images or WAV files. Use of this tool is very easy. You can just open the software, load any BMP image or WAV file to its interface, and then add a file which you want to hide. And this also supports encryption, multiple formats. Well, instead of telling all this to you, let me just show it to you. So as you can see, I have it already installed. It's just one step installation. And to add the file, as in to encode, you need to click on this add files option to extract. You can use this. First, let's try to add files. So the first name, all you have to do is load your BMP or WAV file. And sample, I have one BMP image. I'm going to load it open. Well, uh, as you can see, the size is slightly bigger. Click on next here. So now that you've loaded your cover image, you'll have to load the image or the file which you want to store in this cover image. For that, you click on add file option here. Let's say I want to store this image. Let's try open and uh, next. So as I said, it shows different encryption formats here. So you can select from various algorithms like RC4. Then you have triple DS, DS, triple DS with 1112 and many other formats. And it's asking for the password. Give some password. Click on next. So the embedding is done. It's asking you to name the file. Let's say bird and save. So the final file is 
similar to the actual BMP image. You can't make out any changes, right? But there is a secret data which is hidden inside it, which is another image. Now let me close, finish. Let's try to extract it. Click on this extract files and load the source file, which should be a bird. Then open next. It's asking for the password. So A, B, C, D, that's what I'd give it. And extract file. Image two dot j save file extract successful okay finish let's go back to the location and see so here we go we had tried to store this image too in the bird but after that we tried to extract it so there we go guys the image has been successfully extracted this way you can store any kind of file it can be your excel file or word file document file or powerpoint file or image or anything so that's your sios technography tool so like I said, you can add the files, but to extract the message, you'll have to start using this file from the beginning again. And then uh, let's go back to our next tool, which is a suit pixel. It's here. Let me just check. I have uh, installed it. I'm going to extract all. Let's store it in our desktop and OK. Now, if you go to desktop, this is our application pixel click on that so guys even this is a tool where you can store any kind of hidden information but it has a different approach when compared to other tools it uses image file as a key to protect your hidden text inside an image that is to hide and unhide text inside an image you need to enter another image as a key so as you can see you have three images here original image that's your target image and delta image which acts as a key Instead of giving some password or anything, it takes another image as a key or passphrase. So open original image desktop. Let's go to samples. Let's try fly. Now uh, you need to enter the message. Hi. This is the text I want to hide. And here I'm clicking on encrypt message. Save image. Let's try and save it somewhere else. Desktop. Let's store it in the documents. File name. Uh, my image and save now let me open the thing again or you can just say reset exit here now if i open the application again let's try to extract what we just hid so open the original message which is in desktop right sample that's flying open decrypt image so there you go so let me show it to you again all you have to do is reset click on the open original image give the original image which you try to encrypt that would be flying and open and then say decrypt image so like i said it uses an image as a key to extract or hide anything inside your image and now give your actual image as in the encrypted encoded image or your stego image and click on open yeah and just say yes so as you can see it has extracted the data which i was trying to hide so I'm sure you might have observed, right? The way it functions is slightly different from other uh, steganographic tools, right? Sample that's flying open. Decrypt image. So there you go. So let me show it to you again. All you have to do is reset. Click on the open original image. Give the original image which you try to encrypt that would be flying and open and then say decrypt image. So like I said, it uses an image as a key to extract or hide anything inside your image. And now give your actual image as in the encrypted encoded image or your stego image and click on open. Yeah, and just say yes. So as you can see, it has extracted the data which I was trying to hide. So I'm sure you might have observed, right? The way it functions is slightly different from other uh, steganographic tools. Now let's talk about the roadmap to become an ethical hacker. How your ethical hacking career begins depends on your current field of work. If you're not in an information technology field, you should definitely try shifting into one. Even though most jobs require you to have a bachelor's degree in computer science or cybersecurity related fields, exceptions are made for people with sound knowledge of operating systems, databases, and networking. Also, it is nigh impossible to directly become an ethical hacker. Most ethical hackers begin their career as tech support engineers who climb their way up by earning certifications like CCNA and CISSP before working towards the ultimate CEH certification. 
After earning your CE Edge certification, it is time to market yourself as an ethical hacker. Okay, now let's go over the roles and responsibilities of an ethical hacker. Now there seems to be a general misconception that a person with an ethical hacking career is only responsible for penetration testing of systems and applications. This is not true and an ethical hacker is responsible for much more. For example, he is responsible for scanning open and closed ports using reconnaissance tools like Nessus and Nmap. Scanning is a set of procedures for identifying live hosts, ports and services, discovering operating systems and architecture of target systems, identifying vulnerabilities and threats in the network. Network scanning is used to create a profile of the target organization. Secondly, it is the responsibility of an ethical hacker to engage his organization's member in social engineering awareness activities. Social engineering for the purpose of general hacking has proven to be one of the most effective ways over time and knowing how to avoid any form of social manipulation is key to organization security. Thirdly, an ethical hacker also gets to test new patch releases and software updates pertaining to the company's product and peripherals. It is their responsibility to identify any vulnerability that might exist in the patch and notify the appropriate team to fix them. Fourth, ethical hackers are also responsible for building and maintaining effective intrusion prevention systems and intrusion detection systems. They will also try to evade IDS and IPS systems, firewalls and honeypots just to demonstrate how they could be attacked. Intrusion detection is the process of monitoring events occurring in your network and analyzing them for signs of possible incidents, violations or imminent threats towards your security policies. Intrusion prevention on the other hand is a process of performing intrusion detection and then stopping the detected incidents. These security measures are available as IPS and IDS systems which become a part of your network to detect and stop potential attacks. Last but not the least, ethical hackers are responsible for employing strategies like sniffing networks, bypassing and cracking wireless encryption and hijacking web servers and web applications for testing and security of a system. An ethical hacker strives to replicate the working of a black hat hacker by analyzing the defense protocols and social engineering aspects of an organization. His job is to make sure an organization reacts to these situations well enough if they're not already doing so. Okay, so those were the roles and responsibilities of an ethical hacker. Now let's go over the skill sets that you might need to become an ethical hacker yourself. Now a person with an ethical hacking career is expected to be proficient in database handling, networking and operating systems and also have excellent soft skills as they need to communicate problems regarding security to the rest of the organizations. Other than these generalized skill sets, an ethical hacker also has to have a good grasp on the following skills that we're going to discuss now. Now the first skill is network traffic sniffing. Sniffing is a process of monitoring and capturing all the packets through a given network using sniffing tools. It is a form of tapping phone wires and to get to know about the conversation. It is also called wiretapping and applied to the computer networks. Next, ethical hackers should also know how to orchestrate different types of network and database attacks as their main job is to predict black hat hackers and to do this, one must be able to think and act like a black hat hacker. Third, ethical hackers have to deal with different kinds of operating systems on a daily basis with Linux being the daily driver. So, it is obvious that an ethical hacker needs to have an in-depth knowledge of the working of operating systems in general. For example, they should know how to look for exploits in buffer vulnerabilities. Next, ethical hackers also have to deal with different kinds of database formats. Whether it be SQL, PostgreSQL, NoSQL, an ethical hacker at least needs to have a general knowledge of their working and architecture. Fifth, an ethical hacker should also be proficient in cryptography and cryptanalysis which is basically the deciphering of ciphertext without knowing the key. This is also the fundamentals of password cracking using different methods like brute force, dictionary attacks, rainbow table attacks, and so on. Now, ethical hackers generally are endowed with the responsibility of network traffic monitoring. Therefore, they must be proficient in intrusion detection and prevention techniques, session hijacking knowledge, and an overall in-depth knowledge of networking in general. Last but not the least, ethical hackers also need to make custom softwares to tackle the use case specific security flaws that might be affecting the company. Now this requires a general knowledge of programming languages so that you can execute the solutions to the problems that you find in the organization. Above that, programming will also help you automate a lot of tasks that would generally take a lot of precious time. Apart from all this, an ethical hacker must be a creative thinker 
because black hat hackers are constantly coming up with ingenious ways to exploit a system and it is an ethical hacker's job to predict and prevent such breaches. Now let's talk about the job trends that is in ethical hacking industry. Now as I had discussed in the beginning of this video, cybersecurity has emerged as a high growth field of 2017 and possibly of the entire decade. During the five years between 2012 and 2017, listings of cybersecurity jobs increased by a whopping 75% according to the analysis made by Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now this has led to a lot of unfilled positions, so jobs are plenty and they pay well too. Now let's go with the companies that are hiring ethical hackers. Now an ethical hacker finds a job in any company which has an internet facing site or anything to do with the web. These include college institutions like MIT and even private companies ranging from logistic services to data warehousing companies for example Wipro, Ernst & Young, Infosys and even IBM. Now apart from these you can also get a chance to work for the military and top secret intelligence gathering agencies like CIA, Mossad or NSA. Now coming to the final question, that is how much money does an ethical hacker make? So a certified ethical hacker makes an average annual income of $88,000 according to payscale.com. Now the average starting salary for a certified ethical hacker is around $95,000 according to the EC Council Senior Director Stephen Graham. Also the founder of Nova Security Eric Gayo estimates a more or conservative $50,000 to $100,000 per year in the first years of working depending on your employer experience and education. And those with a few years of experience can pull up to $120,000 and upwards per year particularly those who work as an independent consultant. Okay guys so that was all about ethical hacking and a career in ethical hacking. We spoke about how you can become an ethical hacker yourself and the roles and responsibilities and skills of an ethical hacker. Above that, we also discussed how much salary you'll get as an ethical hacker and the different companies that you could work for. So the first question is, what do you mean by cybersecurity? So as an interviewee, I'd expect that the candidate should first tell me the need for cybersecurity, his views on cybersecurity. So the candidate should be like this. Today's generation lives on the internet, and we general users are almost ignorant as to how those random bits of ones and zeros reach securely to our computer. For a hacker, it's a golden age. With so many access points, public IPs, and constant traffic, and tons of data to exploit, black hat hackers are having one hell of a time exploiting vulnerabilities and creating malicious software for the same. Above that, cyber attacks are evolving by the day. Hackers are becoming smarter and more creative with their malware and how they bypass virus scans and firewalls still baffle many people. Therefore, there has to be some sort of protocol that protects us against all these cyber attacks and make sure our data doesn't fall into the wrong hands. This is exactly why we need cybersecurity. Now for defining cybersecurity, here goes. Cybersecurity is a combination of processes, practices and technologies designed to protect networks, computers, programs, data and information from attack, damage or unauthorized access. Okay, so moving on to the next question is, what do you have on your home network? So a home network gives you a test environment for experimentation. Active Directory, Domain Controller, a dedicated firewall appliance, and a net attached toaster. As long as you are learning and fiddling with it, that's what matters. I've augmented the router my ISP provided with an Apple Airport Extreme, which provides better wireless performance to some devices. From there, I've extended the wired part of the network into two parts of the house using five port ethernet switches, my office and living room, each with four devices. In the office, I have a network attached storage device which provides shared data folders to every device. For movies and TV streaming anywhere in the house as well as backups. In the living room is a range of gaming consoles, a TiVo box and an Android media player. Despite owning a smart TV, it's not hooked into my network simply because the device we own do a far better job of anything the smart TV offers. Okay, now moving on to the next question is what is encryption and why is it important? Well, a process of converting data into an unreadable form to prevent unauthorized access and thus ensuring data protection is called encryption. Encryption is important because it allows you to securely protect data that you don't want anyone else to have access to. Businesses use it to protect corporate secrets, governments use it to secure classified information, and many individuals use it to protect personal information to guard against things like identity theft. Okay, so that explains encryption and why it is important. Moving on, tell me the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Okay, so if we compare on the basis of keys, 
Symmetric encryption has the same secret key for both encryption and decryption, whereas asymmetric uses different keys for encryption and decryption purposes. Performance wise, symmetric encryption is fast but is more vulnerable, while asymmetric encryption is slightly slower due to high computation. Some examples of symmetric are DES and 3DES, while asymmetric, the most popular is RSA and Duffy Hellman. Okay, so time for the next question. So, what is the CIA triad? Now, in this question, the candidates should explain what is CIA triad and what it is used for. So, here's the answer. The CIA triad for information security provides a baseline standard for evaluating and implementing information security, irrespective of the system and or organization in question, where confidentiality is all about making sure that data is accessible only to its intended individual, measures undertaken to ensure confidentiality are designed to prevent sensitive information from reaching the wrong people while making sure that the right people can in fact get it. Integrity, on the other hand, is all about making sure that data is kept properly intact without it being meddled with an unauthorized way. Data must be changed in transit and steps must be taken to ensure that data can be altered by unauthorized people. These measures include file permission and user access controls. On the topic of availability, well, it is all about making sure that data and computers are available as needed by authorized parties. Moving on to the next question is, what do you understand by risk, vulnerability, and threat in a network? Well, threat refers to someone or something with the potential to do harm to a system or an organization. Moving on, vulnerability refers to a weakness of an asset that can be exploited by one or more attackers. In other words, it is an issue or bug that allows an attack to be successful. Last but not the least, risk refers to the potential for loss or damage when a threat exploits a vulnerability. Okay, the next question is, how do you report risk? Well, risk needs to be assessed first before it can be reported. There are two ways you can actually analyze risk. The first is, it can be either quantitative or qualitative. This approach is suitable for both technical and business guys. The business guys will see the probable loss in numbers while the technical guys will monitor and assess the impact and frequency. Now, depending on the audience, the risk can then be reported. Moving on, how do you differentiate between IPS and IDS systems? Well, first of all, IDS stands for Intrusion Detection System and IPS is Intrusion Prevention System. Now, IDS just detects the intrusion and leaves the rest to the administrator for assessment and evaluation or any further action. IPS, on the other hand, detects the intrusion and takes necessary actions to further prevent intrusion. Also, there is a difference in the positioning of devices in the network. Although they work on the same concept, the placement is very, very different. Moving on, what do you know about cybersecurity frameworks? Well, cybersecurity framework is a voluntary guidance based on existing guidelines and practices for organizations to better manage and reduce cybersecurity risks. Besides helping associations oversee and decrease probable risks, it was intended to cultivate risk and cybersecurity administration communications among both inner and outer authoritative partners. Most frequently adopted cybersecurity frameworks are PCI DDS, which stands for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards, the ISO 2701 and 27002, which is the International Organization for Standardization, then CIS, which stands for Critical Security Control, and the most famous cybersecurity framework is NIST. Moving on to the next question, which is what is weak information security? Well, information security policy is considered to be weak if it does not meet the criteria of an effective one. The criteria include distribution, review, comprehension, compliance, and uniform. Information security is weak if the policy has not been made readily available for review by every employee within an organization, or the organization is unable to demonstrate that the employees understand the content of the policy document. This is when an information security is considered weak. Moving on to the next question is, what's the better approach of setting up a firewall? Okay, so following are the steps you should take to configure your firewall. The first is a username and password. Modify the default password for your firewall device. Next is the remote administration, which will disable the feature of remote administration from the outside network. Then comes port forwarding. For certain applications to work properly, such as a web server or FTP server, you need to configure appropriate port forwarding. Next comes the DHCP server which is installing a firewall on a network with an existing DHCP server will cause conflict unless the firewall's DHCP server is disabled. Then is logging. Now, in order to troubleshoot firewall issues or potential attacks, you want to make sure to enable logging and understand how to view the logs. 
last but not the least we need to actually go through the policies now if you want to have solid security policies in place make sure that your firewall is configured to enforce those policies moving on to the next question is can you explain ssl encryption now ssl stands for secure socket layer and it is a protocol which enables safe conversation between two or more parties it is designed to identify and verify that the person you are talking to on the other end is exactly who they pretend to be we also have https which stands for hypertext transfer protocol secure which is actually http combined with ssl which provides you with a safer browsing experience with encryption so this is a very tricky question but ssl wins in terms of security moving on which one is more secure ssl or tls well ssl is meant to verify the sender's identity but it doesn't search for any more hazards than that ssl can help you track the person you are talking to but that can also be tricked at times tls is another identification tool just like ssl but it offers better security features it provides additional protection to the data and hence ssl and tls are often used together for better protection moving on what are salted hashes well salt is actually random data when a properly protected password system receives a new password it creates a hash value of that password and adds a random salt value then the combined value is stored in its database this helps defend against dictionary attacks and known hash attacks example if someone uses the same password on two different systems and they are being used using the same hashing algorithm the hash value would be same however if someone of the system uses salt with the hashes the value will be different moving on to the next question which is how can identity theft be prevented okay so the following steps can be ensured to actually prevent identity theft first of all ensure a strong and unique password secondly avoid sharing confidential information online especially on social media third shop from known and trusted websites only fourth use the latest version of the browsers fifth install advanced malware spyware and tools next use specialized security solutions against financial data and always update your system and software and last but not the least always protect your social security number now moving on to the next question is how can you prevent a man in the middle attack okay so an mitm attack happens when communication between two parties that is systems is intruded or intercepted by an outside entity this can happen in any form of online communication such as email social media web surfing etc not only they are trying to eavesdrop on your private conversation they can also target all the information inside your devices and the outcome could be pretty catastrophic so the first method to prevent this attack would be to have encryption preferably public key encryption between both the parties this way they both will have an idea with whom they are talking with because of the digital verification secondly to prevent this it is best to avoid open wifi networks and if it is necessary then use plugins like https force tls etc moving on to the next question which is state the differences between encoding hashing and encryption okay so the purpose of encoding is to transform data so that it can be properly and safely consumed by a different type of system that is example a binary data being sent over email or viewing special characters on a web page the goal is not to keep information secret but rather to ensure it's able to be properly consumed examples include ascii unicode url encoding and base64 now the purpose of encryption is to transform data in order to keep it secret from others example sending someone a secret letter then only they should be able to read or securely sending a password over the internet rather than focusing on usability the goal is to ensure that data cannot be consumed by anyone other than the intended recipients examples include aes blowfish and rsa now hashing serves the purpose of ensuring integrity that is it makes sure that if something has changed you know that some change has taken place technically hashing takes arbitrary inputs and produces a fixed length of string example are sha3 md5 which is now obsolete and sha256 etc now moving on to the next question which is what steps will you take to secure a server now secure server uses the secure socket layer protocol for data encryption and decryption to protect data from unauthorized interception here are four simple ways you can actually secure a server so the first way is that you make sure that you have a secure password for your root and administrator user the secondly the next thing you need to do is to make new users on your system these will be the users you'll use to manage the system step 3 is remove remote access from the default or root administrator accounts and the last step is to configure your firewall rules for remote access okay so the next question is what is a ddos attack and how is it mitigated okay so ddos stands for 
distributed denial of service. When a network is flooded with large number of requests, which is not recognized to handle, making the server unavailable to the legitimate request senders. DDoS can be mitigated by analyzing and filtering the traffic in the scrubbing centers, and the scrubbing centers are centralized data cleaning stations wherein the traffic to a website is analyzed and malicious traffic is removed. Okay, so the 20th question is, why do you need DNS monitoring? The domain name system allows your website under a certain domain that is easily recognizable also keeps the information about other domain names. It works like a directory for everything on the internet. Thus, DNS monitoring is very important since you can easily visit a website without actually having to memorize their IP addresses. DNS has an important role in how end users in your enterprise connect to the internet. Inspecting DNS traffic between clients' devices and your local recursive resolver could be revealing a wealth of information for forensic analysis. DNS queries can reveal both botnets and malwares connecting to the CNC server. So this is why DNS monitoring is very essential. Moving on, what is a three-way handshake? The TCP three-way handshake in transmission control protocol is the method used by a device on a network to set up a stable connection over an internet protocol based network. TCP's three-way handshaking technique is often referred to as the SYN, SYNAC, or more accurately, SYN, SYNAC, and ACK because of there are three messages transmitted by the TCP to negotiate and start a TCP session between two computers. Moving on to the next question is, what are black hat hackers, white hat hackers, and gray hat hackers? So like all hackers, black hat hackers usually have extensive knowledge about breaking into computer networks and bypassing security protocols. They are responsible for writing malware, which is a method used to gain access to these systems. Their primary motivation is usually for a personal or financial gain, but they can also be involved in cyber espionages, protests, or perhaps just addicted to the thrill of cybercrime. Now, white hat hackers choose to use their power for good rather than evil. Also known as ethical hackers, white hat hackers can sometimes be paid employees or contractors working for companies as security specialists that attempt to find security holes via hacking. They employ the same method of hacking as black hats with one exception, that is they do it with permission from the owners of the system first, which makes the process completely legal. Now there comes gray hat hackers. As in life, they are gray areas that neither black nor white. Gray hat hackers are a blend of both black hat and white hat hackers. Often gray hat hackers will look for vulnerabilities in a system without the owner's permission or knowledge. If issues are found, they will report them to the owner, sometimes requesting a small fee to fix the issue. Okay, now moving on, how often should you perform patch management? Well, patch manage should be done as soon as it is released. For Windows, once the patch is released, it should be applied to all machines not later than one month. Same goes for network devices. We should patch it as soon as it is released. And proper patch management process should be followed too. Question number 24, what do you know about application security? Application security is a practice of improving the security of applications using software, hardware, and other procedural methods. Countermeasures are taken to ensure application security, the most common being an application firewall that limits the execution of files or the handling of data by specific installed programs. Moving on to the next question, which is differentiate between penetration testing and software testing. Now, penetration testing helps identify and address the security vulnerabilities, whereas software testing, focuses on functionality of the software and not the security aspect. A good penetration tester truly thinks differently than the other two. They don't care about the proper behaviors of the system or software, and they are crafty, looking for that one small chink of vulnerability that was not mitigated. And software security testers generally have a fair amount of crossover as they usually know the full details of the system or software, and they know how it's supposed to properly behave when properly used and they can test for a lot of the common end user misbehaviors. Moving on, when to use tracer or trace route. So trace route is a command which can show you the path a packet of information takes from your computer to the one you specify. It will list all the routers it passes through until it reaches its destination or fails to and is discarded. In addition to this, it will tell you how long each hop from router to router takes. Now, when you connect to a website, say howtogeek.com, the traffic has to go through several intermediaries before reaching the website. The traffic goes through your local router, your internet service provider's router, onto larger networks, and so on. Okay, so moving on to question number 27, which is tell me something about the common cyber attacks that plague us today. I'm gonna to be discussing eight cyber threats. Firstly, it's malware. Now, malware is an all-encompassing term for a variety of cyber threats, including trojans, viruses, and worms. 
Malware is simply defined as code with malicious intent that typically steals data or destroys something on your computer. Next is phishing. Now, phishing often posing as a request for data from a trusted third party. Phishing attacks are sent via email and ask users to click on a link and enter their personal data. Phishing emails have gotten much more sophisticated in recent years, making it really difficult for some people to discern a legitimate request for information from a false one. Phishing emails often fall into the same category as spam, but are more harmful than just a simple ad. Next is a password attack, and a password attack is exactly what it sounds like. That is a third party trying to gain access to your system by cracking a user's password, usually using some algorithm like brute force, dictionary attacks, or software which is a keylogger. Next is a DDoS attack, and a DOS attack focuses on disrupting the service to a network. Attackers send high volumes of data or traffic through the network until the network becomes overloaded and can no longer function. Next is a man in the middle attack. And a man in the middle attack is an attack where somebody is impersonating the endpoints in an online information exchange. For example, if you're a banking online, the man in the middle would communicate with you by impersonating your bank and communicate with the bank by impersonating you. Next is drive by downloads. And this is a malware which is actually implanted into a legitimate website and a program is downloaded to the user's system just by visiting the site. It doesn't require any type of action by the user to actually start to trigger the download. Next is malvertising, and malvertising is actually malicious code which is hidden behind advertisements on websites, and it is also downloaded to your system without your knowledge. Last but not the least is rogue software, which is malware that masquerades as legitimate and necessary security software that will keep your system safe. Okay, so moving on to the next question is what are different OSI layers and what is the job of the network layer? Okay, so OSI or open system interconnection is a reference model for how applications communicate over a network. A reference model is a conceptual framework for understanding relationships and the purpose of the OSI reference model is to guide vendors and developers so the digital communication product and software programs they create can interoperate and to facilitate a clear framework that describes the function of a network or telecommunication system. The seven OSI layers are application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and the physical layer. Okay, so the network layer is actually used for controlling the operations of the subnet, and the main job of this layer is to deliver packets from a source to a destination across multiple links. Moving on to the next question, which is how would you reset a password protected BIOS configuration? Now, since BIOS is a pre-boot system, it has its own storage mechanism for its setting and preferences. In the classic scenario, simply popping out the CMOS battery will be enough to have the memory storing these settings lose its power supply, and as a result, it will lose all its setting. Other times, you'll need to use a jumper or a physical switch on the motherboard. Still other times, you'll need to actually remove the memory itself from the device and reprogram it in order to wipe it out. The simplest way by far, however, is if the BIOS has come from the factory with the default password enabled, try the whole word password. Now for question number 30, what is cross-site scripting or XSS? Now XSS refers to client-side code injection attacks wherein an attacker can execute malicious scripts, also commonly referred to as malicious payload, into a legitimate website or web application. XSS is amongst the most rampant of web application vulnerabilities and occurs when a web application makes use of unvalidated or unencoded user input within the output it generates. By leveraging XSS, an attacker would exploit a vulnerability within a website or web application that the victim would visit, essentially using the vulnerable website as a vehicle to deliver a malicious script to the victim's browser. Now, what is data protection in transit versus data protection at rest? So the answer to that is that Data in transit or data in motion is data actively moving from one location to another, such as across the internet or through a private network. Data protection in transit is the protection of this data while it's traveling from network to network or being transferred from a local storage device to a cloud storage device. Wherever data is moving, effectively data protection measures for in transit data are critical as data is often considered less secure while in motion. Now data at rest is data that is not actively moving from device to device or network to network, such as data stored on a hard drive, laptop, flash drive, or archives, slash stored in some other way. Data protection at rest aims to secure inactive data stored on any device or network. While data at rest is sometimes considered to be less vulnerable than data in transit, attackers often find data at rest a more valuable target than data in motion. 
The risk profile for data in transit or data address depends on the security measures that are in place to secure data in either state. Moving on to question number 32 is tell me the differences between cybersecurity and network security. Okay, so cybersecurity describes that the policies and procedures implemented by a network administrator to avoid and keep track of unauthorized access, exploitation, modification, or denial of the network and the network resources. Network security describes the process and practices designed to protect network, computers, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. In a computing context, security includes both cybersecurity and physical security. While cybersecurity is concerned with threats outside the castle, Network security is worried about what is going on within the castle walls. The cybersecurity specialist is the crusading knight defending the kingdom, and network security focuses on the barbarians at the gate and how the castle connects to the world around it. Moving on to question number 33, which is how will you prevent data leakage? Data leakage is when data gets out of the organization in an unauthorized way. Data can get leaked through various ways, that is emails, prints, laptops getting lost, unauthorized upload of data to public portals, removable drives, photographs, etc. A few controls can be restricting uploads on internet websites, following an internal encryption solution, restricting the mails to internal networks, or restriction on printing confidential data, etc. Moving on to the next question, which is what is ARP and how does it work? Okay, so address resolution protocol or ARP is a protocol for mapping an internet protocol address to a physical machine address that is recognized on the local network. On the topic of how it works, when an incoming packet destined for a host machine on a particular local area network arrives at a gateway, the gateway asks the ARP program to find a physical host or MAC address that matches the IP address. Now the ARP program looks into the ARP cache, and if it finds the address, it provides it so that the packet can be converted to the right packet length and format and send it to the machine. Now if no entry is found for the IP address, ARP broadcasts a request packet in a special format to all machines on the LAN to see if one machine knows that it has the IP address associated with it. So for question number 35 is, what is 2FA and how can it be implemented for the public websites? So an extra layer of security that is known as multi-factor authentication requires not only a password and username, but also something that only and only that user has on them. That is a piece of information only they should know or have immediately to hand, such as a physical token. Authenticator apps replace the need to obtain verification code via text, voice call, or email. For example, to access a website or web-based service that supports Google Authenticator, the user types in their username and password. That is a knowledge factor. Okay, now time for question number 36, which is what techniques can we use to prevent brute force login attacks? So here the attacker tries to determine the password for a target through a permutation of fuzzing process. As it is a lengthy task, attackers usually employ software such as Fuzzer to automate the process of creating numerous passwords to be tested against target. To avoid such attacks, password best practices should be followed mainly on critical resources like servers, routers, exposed services, and so on. Okay, so now time for the next question, which is what is cognitive cybersecurity? Now the applications of artificial intelligence technologies pattern on human thought process to detect threats and protected physical and digital system. Self-learning security systems use data mining, pattern recognition, and natural language processing to simulate the human brain, albeit in a high-powered computer model. This is exactly what cognitive cybersecurity is. So what is port blocking within LAN? Well, restricting the users from accessing a set of services within the local area network is called port blocking. Stopping the source to not to access the destination node via ports as applications work on the port, so ports are blocked to restrict the access filing up the security holes in the network infrastructure. Okay, so time for question number 39, which is what is the difference between VPN and VLAN? Okay, so VPN is related to remote access to the network of a company, while VLAN basically means to logically segregate networks without physically segregating them with various switches. Now, while VPN saves the data from prying eyes while in transit and no one on the net can capture the packets and read the data, VLAN does not involve any encryption technique, but it is only used to slice up your logical network into different sections for the purpose of management and security. Okay, so it's time for question number 40. So the question is, what protocols fall under the TCP IP internet layer? Okay, so I'll be going through the five layers that consist the TCP IP protocol, and I'll also be listing out the protocols that are inside every layer. So starting with the physical layer, the protocols that 
reside in the physical layer are the Ethernet IEEE 802.3 and the RS-232 from one of the many protocols. And moving on to the data link layer, we have the triple P protocol, the IEEE 802.2 protocol. Then moving on to the network layer, it's governed by the IP protocol, the ARP protocol, which is basically the address resolution protocol, and the ICMP protocol. Then moving on ahead is the transport layer. Now the transport layer has two main protocols, namely the TCP and the UDP protocols. And last but not least, we have the application layer, which is governed by a multiple of protocols, namely NFS, NIS+, DNS, Telnet, FTP, RIP, SNMP, and various other protocols as such. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the general interview questions that might be asked in any cybersecurity interview. Now moving on to the scenario based questions. So first I'll be reading out the scenario and then I'll ask the questions regarding the scenario too. Okay, so for scenario number one we have you receive the following email from help desk. So the email goes as follows. Dear UCSE email user beginning next week. We will be deleting all inactive email accounts in order to create space for more users. You are required to send the following information to continue using your email account. If we do not receive this information from you by the end of the week, your email account will be closed. So then the email actually goes on to ask the various credentials like name, email, login, password, DOB, and alternate email. And then it says, please contact the webmail team with any questions and thank you for your immediate attention. So in such a scenario, what do you do and justify your actions for doing so? Okay, so this email is a classic example of phishing trying to trick you into biting. The justification is the generalized way of addressing the receiver, which is used in mass spam mails. Above that, a corporate company will never ask personal details on mail. They want your information, so they don't respond to the mail, instant message, text, phone calls, etc., asking you for your password or other private information. You should never disclose your password to anyone, even if they say they work for the UCSC, ITS, or any other campus organization. Moving on to the next scenario, which is a friend sends an electronic Hallmark greeting card to your work email. You need to click on the attachment to see the card. What do you do and justify your actions? Well, this one has four big risks. Firstly, some attachments contain viruses or other malicious programs. So just in general, it's risky to open unknown or unsolicited attachments. Secondly, also in some cases, just clicking on a malicious link can infect a computer. So unless you are sure a link is safe, don't really click on it. Third, email addresses can be fake. So just because the email says it is from someone you know, you can't be certain of this without checking with the person. Fourth, finally, some websites and links look legitimate, but they're really hoaxes designed to steal your information. So what we have to do is actually not click on the email and actually ignore it completely. Moving on to the next scenario, which is one of the staff members in ITS subscribes to a number of free IT magazines. Among the questions she was asked in order to activate her subscriptions, one magazine asked her for a month of birth, a second asked for a year of birth, and a third asked for a mother's maiden name. What do you infer is going on in this situation and justify? Well, all three newsletters probably have the same parent company or are distributed through the same service. The parent company or service can combine individual pieces of seemingly harmless information and use or sell it for identity theft. Then it is even possible that there is a fourth newsletter that asks for a day of birth as one of the activation questions. Often questions about personal information are optional. In addition to being suspicious about situations like the one described here, never provide personal information when it is not legitimately necessary or to people or companies you don't personally know. So now time for scenario number four. Well, in our computing labs and departments, print billing is often tied to users login. People log in, they print, and then they get a bill. Sometimes people call to complain about bills for printing they never did, only to find out that the bills are indeed correct. So what do you infer is going on in this situation and justify your inference? Sometimes they realize they loaned their account to a friend who couldn't remember his or her password, and the friend did the printing and thus the charges. It's also possible that somebody came in from behind them and used their account. Now, this is an issue with shared or public computers in general. If you don't log out of the computer properly when you leave, someone else can come in from behind and retrieve what you were doing and use your accounts. Always log out of accounts, quit programs, and close browser windows before you walk away from a general public computer. 
Now, moving on to scenario number five, we have that we saw a case a while back where someone used their Yahoo accounts at a computer lab on a campus. She made sure her Yahoo account was no longer open in the browser window before leaving the lab. Now, someone came in behind her and used the same browser to reaccess her accounts. They started sending emails from it and caused all sorts of mayhem. So, what do you think might have gone wrong here? Well, the first person probably didn't log out of her account. So the new person could just go into the history and access it. Secondly, another possibility is that she did log out, but didn't clear her web cache. This is done through the browser menu to clear pages that the browser has saved for future use. Time for scenario number six now. OK, so two different offices on campus are working to straighten out an error in an employee's bank account due to a direct deposit mistake. Office number one emails the correct account and deposit information to office number two, which promptly fixes the problem. The employee confirms with the bank that everything has indeed been straightened out. So what is exactly wrong here? Well, account and deposit information is sensitive data that could be used for identity theft. Sending this or any kind of sensitive information by email is very, very risky because email is typically not private or secure. Anyone who knows how can access it anywhere along its route. So as an alternative, the two offices could have called each other or worked with the ITS to send the information in a more secure fashion. OK, moving on to the next scenario, which is the mouse on your computer screen starts to move around on its own and click on things on your desktop. What do you do in such a situation? A, call your coworker over so they can see. B, disconnect your computer from the network. C, unplug your mouse. D, tell your supervisor. E, turn the computer off. F run an antivirus or G all of the above. So we have to select all the options that apply in the situation. So the options that apply are B and D, which is basically disconnect your computer from the network and tell your supervisor. So this is definitely suspicious. Immediately report the problem to your supervisor and the ITS support center. Also, since it seems possible that someone is controlling the computer remotely, it is best if you can disconnect the computer from the network and turn off wireless if you have it until help arrives. If possible, don't turn off the computer. OK, time for scenario number eight. So below are a list of passwords pulled out of a database. Now, which of the following passwords meet the UCSC's password requirement? OK, so the third password, which is option number C, is the only one that meets all the following of the UCSC's requirement. It has at least eight characters in length. It contains at least three of the following four types of characters which are lowercase characters, uppercase characters, numbers, and special characters. And not a word is preceded or followed by a digit. So it's the third option which is correct in this situation. Moving on to the second last scenario we have for today is you receive an email from your bank telling you there is a problem with your account. The email provides instructions and a link so you can log in to fix your account and fix the problem in doing so. So what should you do? Well, we have to delete the email. And better yet, use the web client that is Gmail, Yahoo Mail, etc., and report it as spam or phishing and then delete it. Any unsolicited email or phone call asking you to enter your account information, disclose your password, financial account information, social security number, or any other private or personal information is suspicious, even if it appears to be from a company you are familiar with. Always contact the sender using a method you know is legitimate to verify that the message is indeed from them. OK, so it's time for our last scenario of the day which is a while back the IT folks got a number of complaints that one of our campus computers was sending out Viagra spam. They checked it out and the reports were true. A hacker had installed a program on the computer that made it automatically send out tons of spam email without the computer's own knowledge. So how do you think the hacker got into the computer to set this up? Well, this was actually the result of a hacked password using passwords that can be easily guessed and protecting your password by not sharing them or writing them down can help to prevent this. Passwords should be at least eight characters in length and use a mixture of uppercase, lowercase letters, and numbers and symbols. Even though in this case it was a hacked password, other things could possibly lead to this are that out of date patches and updates, the lack of an antivirus software or an out of date antivirus software, or clicking on an unknown link or attachment, or downloading unknown or unsolicited programs onto your computer. OK, guys, so that was it for the session on cybersecurity interview questions. If you all have any questions regarding any of the questions that were discussed here, please put a comment down below. If you all also want the PowerPoint presentation that's shown out here, you all can also comment for that. And if you all want any other cybersecurity related specific interview questions, please do comment for that. I'll make a video on them soon. 
that's it from me. Goodbye. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!